Button Press presents Unleashed. Written and narrated by Cindy Gunderson. Copyright Button Press, 2022. Part 1. Mila. April 23rd through April 24th, 2161. Chapter 1. Love. Was that even a word I was qualified to use? I kept my eyes closed as the last few hours were played in my mind. Sean, driving the vehicle forward into the brush, while Sloane pleaded with him to pull up. Zane opening the side door of the transport and jumping with his body wrapped around mine as we tumbled over unforgiving earth. Cammy bandaging Zane up and then we were here, on this crumbling rooftop. My finger rested on Zane's wrist and I braved opening my eyes to look at him. I'd said the words, I love you, and he'd responded with silence, just stood there. A hollow pit opened up in my stomach. Had I scared him by admitting the depth of my feelings? Or put him in an awkward position because he didn't reciprocate? Before I could muster the courage to speak up, I registered his frown. He stared over my shoulder. I dropped my hand and whipped around, then stepped closer to the narrow gap in the broken boards and cracked brick to survey the ground below. What are they doing? I whispered. We were higher than I thought. It didn't seem like we'd climbed that many stairs in the fallen church tower. Zane placed a hand on my lower back and leaned close. I don't know, but I don't like it. The community troops below stood at attention. I sniffed. Why are they keeping people here? If their goal was to find us, shouldn't this be over? They don't know they have us yet. Zane grunted, and I remembered Case instructing us to keep our masks pulled up. Zane breathed in, then exhaled audibly as I continued to observe the men on the ground. What were they doing? My heart pounded as my mind zipped through myriad possibilities. They were waiting for further instructions? They decided we weren't that much of a threat, so they were going to pack up their things and head out? I laughed internally at this thought. If only we could be so lucky. What if they did know we were here? Maybe they'd been told specifically to bring us in alive so Bryn could torture us himself. My shoulders tensed as I remembered the sting of metal cutting into my wrists and the chill in that cold, sterile room. Maybe he only wanted me and Zane, and they'd let the rest of the reels go. I could live with that option, given the alternatives. I shivered and turned. We have to go find Case. Zane's jaw flexed. He's probably with them. He'd helped us once before, but how friendly would he be now? How many risks would he take for reels he barely knew? Zane tugged on my waist and pulled me toward the door at the top of the stairs. I wasn't upset that he'd gotten distracted after my unexpected profession of love for him. I don't know what I would have done had our roles been reversed. There were much more important issues at hand, and I love you too, Mila. Zane whispered as he pulled the door open to reveal the staircase. I'm glad you said it first. I inspected his face to make sure he wasn't teasing. Why? He shrugged. You don't say as much as I do, and you like to make people happy. If I would have said it, I don't know. I would have wondered. My cheeks flushed as I followed him down the steps. Those were fair points. Even now, I didn't exactly know what love meant. How could I? I was 17 years old and hadn't been in a single relationship. I'd barely had a few crushes. However, I did know what love looked like. I'd watched my parents my entire life. I'd witnessed their secret gazes and silent communication. In hard times, they turned to each other first and knew the other person was there for them without question. The way Zane and I were together felt that kind of familiar. As we neared the bottom of the stairs, a horrifying sound slammed into us. My stomach dropped, and I raced forward, barely staying upright as I skidded around the corner and bolted into the main room. I spotted Sloane in the middle of a crowd of people. They circled her apprehensively as her screams filled the open air of the sanctuary. I slowed to navigate over and around the other reels. When I finally pushed through the crowd, I found Sloane doubled over on the tile floor. 
I dropped down next to her and placed a hand on the curve of her back. Sloane, it's me, Mila. The words caught in my throat. There was only one thing I could think of that would bring Sloane. Tough, hardened, practical Sloane. Literally to her knees. He's gone, she whimpered, and her body spasmed under my touch. Sean, I whispered. Sloane hyperventilated at the sound of his name. Are you sure? I lifted my head and searched the faces surrounding us for corroboration. Darius lowered his eyes. One of them came looking for you a few minutes after they dropped her off. Did he say anything? Darius shook his head. He was so stupid. Sloane's voice was hoarse. I told him to pull up. You heard me, didn't you? She lifted her head and looked at me with pleading eyes. I nodded quickly. Yes, you did. You told him to pull up. Sloane grimaced, and she wiped her cheeks with her fingertips. It doesn't matter. She barely got the words out between spastic breaths. He's dead. He's dead because of the communities. Because of you. I flinched as she pointed an accusatory finger in the direction of the troops outside the walls. The sky darkened quickly outside the windows, and my head began to throb to the beat of my heart. All of us needed rest. But how could we sleep when we had no idea what was happening outside these walls? Sloane, I squeezed her shoulder. It wasn't your fault. And you're right, I added quickly before she could protest. That isn't going to change anything, but I think you know why Sean did what he did. Sloane's eyes glistened, and a whimper escaped her trembling lips. He was scared. Scared of what they would do. He didn't listen to you when you told him to pull up. I told him. She sobbed into her hands. I know, I soothed. He's gone, she repeated. He's gone. I held her and rubbed her back until her breathing returned to normal, then stood up and scanned the silent room. Weary faces stared back at me, but I knew what I had to do. Sloane had asked Sean to pull up, and he'd refused. I wasn't going to make the same mistake. We think the community troops are here for us. I pointed between me, Zane, and Sloane. I'm sorry you were dragged into this, and we're going to make it right. I motioned for Zane to come closer, then lowered my voice. I think we need to go out there. He frowned. To do what? To turn ourselves in? Maybe they don't know who we are. Maybe if we told them we could save... Zane shook his head. No, Mila. If we do that, they're going to take us in. Who knows if it will help these people or not. But what if... Case knows we're here. He already knows, Zane growled. If he doesn't tell the rest of his club out there, it's for good reason. I drew a breath and nodded slowly. He was right. Case knew who we were, and we'd arrived with Sloane and Sean, which meant he knew they were helping us. If he'd gone out on a limb for us earlier, maybe we could count on him again. Maybe. We don't care why they're here or who they're after. Tom stood on our left. I'd been so distracted I hadn't realized he'd made it. They've disrupted our way of life for the last time on my watch. He stepped into the circle and scratched his chin under his scruffy beard. He looked riled up and ready for a fight. Half of my settlement refused to run. They'd rather be controlled by these tyrants than have to live this way. We're doing nothing to aggravate the communities, and this needs to stop. A low murmur bubbled up from the crowd. They think they can storm in and take whatever they want? They think we're a threat? Tom shook his head and the murmur grew louder. Maybe it's time we became one. My heart pounded heavily in my chest as I observed the crowd. Angry faces. People who had been pushed too far too many times past their limit. No, Zane called out. His deep, rumbling voice paired with his eyes commanded attention. Did you not see their weapons? Because we did. First hand. He motioned to the rubble sitting on the ground outside the window. I don't know if you're planning to use sticks and stones or something, but you aren't going to get very far. The room grew quiet. We need to be patient. We have friends with the coalition that are working to... The coalition. 
Tom scoffed. They've never been able to help us in the past, so why should we wait around for them now? Heads again nodded in agreement. Darius spoke up. We made contact with them, and they did say they were working on something. A meeting with the council. There was something about the way his mouth moved, the way he formed his words, that reminded me of Channel. But besides that, the only thing I could see that they had in common was their light skin color and bald heads. The council isn't going to be on our side. Tom's face twisted in a scowl of disgust. We've been on our own here, and we'll continue to be on our own. Reels protect reels. We've only got each other. More nodding, this time with enthusiasm. I glanced out the window. The community troops were no longer gathered. Two soldiers walked down the hill where our transport sat smashed in the underbrush, and I couldn't help wondering if Sean still lay there. His lifeless body sprawled over the dash, crushed by the crumpled metal and the tree trunk on top of it. I turned as Darius tried again to talk reason into the buzzing crowd. The scene seemed to unfold in slow motion. Darius raised his arms in front of me and motioned to Zane. A woman lowered her eyes and pulled her young children closer against her hips, while the man next to her shouted something in rebuttal. People spoke over each other, their voices blending into a solid hum, a cacophony of anger and frustration. Fear oozed off them, and I shivered. Suddenly, their faces shifted in my mind to the ones that I knew. Mom, Dad, Nea, even Alejandro. People from Southwest Territory standing together in the auditorium. It was the same. We were thousands of miles apart, and yet, our conflict was the same. I wanted to believe that people in my home would treat the situation differently, that they'd be willing to sit and have a peaceful, rational conversation about what we should do next. But I knew that wasn't true. If community troops had rounded our families up without giving us any information, I doubted even Dad would be willing to wait and have faith that something or someone would solve the problem for us. The sounds around me finally crashed through my mind fog, and I reached out to touch Zane's arm. He turned, and I pulled him to the back corner away from the chaos. We're not going to change their minds. I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't. They're going to die if they do this, Mila. Zane bent so close, his lips grazed the curl of my ear. There's no way they can go up against them with the resources they have. I know, I know, I nodded. But who's to say they'll be more successful if they wait? Zane considered this. At least this way they have some control over when they die. He pulled back and met my eyes. You think those troops are going to kill everyone? I shrugged. Remember Sloane's story? The communities have been forcing assimilation for a long time. Why would this be any different? So, maybe not death. Zane breathed as his eyes drifted back to the reels. But not much better. He nodded. Do you want to join them? No. I shook my head. I'd rather take my chances. We know Case is on our side, at least partially. I do think Kenna is up to something that could help us. I let out an exasperated sigh. I don't know, Zane. I have no idea what the best choice is. We don't have enough information. The noise from the reels began to dissipate, and three men, two of which were Darius and Tom, talked animatedly while the rest of the group filtered back to the small patches of floor they'd claimed as their own. Zane reached out and wrapped his large hand around mine. He tugged me forward, toward the threesome. We stopped a few paces away and waited patiently for them to acknowledge our presence. Two in the morning. The real I didn't recognize spoke. I'm telling you, they've had a long day and they won't see it coming. Darius shook his head. We have no idea where they'll be sleeping. Easy enough to figure that out, the man insisted. We can send out a few scouts before we launch our attack. I counted 15 of them when we arrived, Tom added. We have more than triple their numbers. Please, tell me you aren't counting children? Darius's lips pulled into a tight line. Tom's eyes darted toward the floor nervously. You're really planning to overwhelm community forces with no weapons, while rallying support with numbers including kids? Tom grunted. We do have weapons. Not like theirs. 
Darius glared at him, and there was history in that look. They'd both led neighboring real settlements for who knew how long. This wasn't their first disagreement. What if we wait? Zane jumped into the conversation. We have a friend in their group. We can talk with him. And confirm the safety of all present? Tom gestured at the people scattered throughout the church. I... Zane started, but then closed his mouth. We can try. I knew full well we couldn't promise anything, but delaying an attack would be beneficial, regardless of the outcome our efforts produced. Give us an hour. An hour to do what? Zane asked as I pulled him away. To find Case. To figure out what the soldiers are planning to do. Chapter 2 we walked hand in hand back to the window and peered out at the soldiers milling about the yard. With their helmets and masks on, it was impossible to tell one from any other. We're going to have to get his attention, I whispered. Make him come to us. Zane looked at me like I was crazy. What if we get the wrong soldier's attention? That was a definite risk. Hopefully Case will see us first. I couldn't think of a better option. If we walked out there blatantly, we might not even get a chance to explain ourselves. On the other hand, if we waited here, there was no way he'd break ranks to search us out, even if he wanted to. What about right there? I pointed to two small steps leading down to the ground from a side door at the front of the chapel. Zane blinked and his brow furrowed. We could step outside that door and sit down. I explained. It would be obvious we weren't trying to cause trouble, just two kids being dumb and not following orders. If someone saw us, they'd tell us to go back inside, Zane mused. Exactly. But hopefully it would cause a little buzz? Enough that Case would notice us and offer to take care of it. I nodded. Give him easy access. What do you think? Zane turned away from the window and moved a step closer looking down to meet my eyes. I didn't think I'd ever get used to this feeling, the way my insides seemed to lift and float when his eyes were on me. Not bad. The edges of his mouth curled upward. In Zane speak, he may as well have called me a genius. We sat on the stone steps barely a few minutes before a soldier noticed us. He stared our direction, and I quickly averted my eyes, then smiled as if Zane had said something adorable. Zane raised an eyebrow as I made a show of it. If adults were going to constantly assume we were too young to be taken seriously, I may as well play into it. They're watching. My voice lilted, as if I was telling him I'd found a spring of fresh water. Zane nodded, doing his best to participate in my ruse. That made me laugh for real. His face screwed up in what I could only assume was supposed to be a smile, but with his tense shoulders and furrowed brow, it looked like he was in pain. I chortled, the moment hitting me with such hilarity that I momentarily forgot why we were sitting on the steps in the first place. Until a stern voice sent a jolt through my entire body. You can't be out here. The soldier strode toward us with energy and purpose. I shrunk, and Zane automatically put an arm around my shoulders to pull my small body safely against his large one. You've been instructed to stay inside the building. No exceptions. It wasn't Case. His proportions were all off. What? I played dumb. It's so loud in there. We wanted some space to talk. The soldier stopped a few paces in front of us with his fists clenched by his side. You don't even have your masks on, he muttered, and looked between the two of us. If we were going for stupid teenagers, I was sure we were nailing it. Whoops. Zane sighed, and the man's eyes flicked to him. I cleared my throat. We don't want any trouble. There are just... Go back inside, okay? There was a hint of exhaustion in his tone, and I felt a twinge of compassion in my chest. A month ago, I wouldn't have thought it possible for me to feel anything other than distrust and reticence around unreals. But now, it didn't feel so simple. He wasn't the one in charge of this operation. He wasn't Bryn or one of the P7 community leaders. He probably hated being here just as much as we did. When Zane and I didn't immediately move to obey his request, he stiffened. 
My smile faded, but before the tension could heighten, another soldier came jogging toward us. The unreal in front of us turned at the sound of his boots on the cracked stone walkway. These two giving you trouble? The approaching soldier called out, and I breathed a sigh of relief. Case. The soldier shook his head. I told them to go inside. Case put out a hand and clapped him on the back appreciatively. I don't think this door will work from the outside. He charged forward and stepped over our knees to yank on the handle. The door didn't budge. The possibility of being locked out hadn't occurred to me. I'll take them around front. Case dropped back to the ground. Make sure they don't get any other ideas on the way over. The soldier behind him nodded, then turned to walk back to the others. Case motioned for us to get up and follow him. When his friend was out of earshot, he finally spoke. What were you thinking? He kept his face trained forward with his chest lifted in a show of strength and authority. We needed to find you, I muttered. The people in there are going stir-crazy. We need to give them something to keep them from... I wasn't sure whether I should say anything about what we'd overheard. From what? Case scoffed. Everyone in there needs to stay put if they know what's good for them. What's good for them? Zane's voice was hard. You've invaded their property with no explanation, and this isn't the first time. Not you, I added. He means the communities. Zane's jaw flexed, but he thankfully stayed silent. The last thing we needed was to make an enemy of Case. They're nervous, and we don't understand why we're all being kept here in the first place. Wasn't this whole thing about tracking down us? Especially Sloane? Case's shoulders drooped, but he didn't respond. We turned the corner of the church and the front doors quickly approached. I swallowed and tried again. Why can't we let the others... You three provided a convenient excuse. Case hissed, and my heart plummeted. An excuse for what? I shouldn't have asked. I knew exactly what he meant. Sloane's story flooded into my mind, bolstered by what Tom and Sean had talked about before we started running. We stopped in front of the doors. So, we're supposed to go in there and tell them to hang tight while you plot to assimilate? Zane's voice was nearly a growl. You two need to go inside. Case's blue eyes were firm, but apologetic. I can't. He stopped short and drew a deep breath before turning on his heel and stomping away from us. Case, I called after him. We can't, either. Darius cleared his throat. Eat, and then let's try to get some rest. You all know what to do when your wake-up time comes. It hadn't taken long before Darius, Tom, and the others came up with a plan after we'd talked with them. Within minutes of their decision, the Reels had organized resources to provide a last, sustaining meal before we would take on the seemingly impossible. Darius had pushed for escape, but he knew almost immediately he'd lost the argument. We didn't have enough transportation, and nobody knew where to seek refuge. It was too risky to amble out into the wilderness, especially if more community troops were waiting. Tom won out, and in five hours, we would launch an attack on the troops who currently held us captive. For now, the reels had set up two long planks along the main aisle between the pews, stabilized by buckets, to make a table of sorts. Supplies and food items were stacked high, the entire surface filled with what everyone had been able to gather and carry with them. We can't eat this. I gaped at the sheer abundance. This is everyone else's food. Darius shook his head. You know as well as I do that what belongs to one reel belongs to all. We're there for each other. His words triggered a memory within me, and I was suddenly a 12-year-old girl, standing in the kitchen with Dad. Why would you do that? Alejandro doesn't deserve any of our resources, I shouted. Dad sighed as he sat down on his rocking chair. Mila. No, Dad, those were our last berries for the season, and you gave them to that snake? Mila, stop. Dad's voice was stern, and I snapped my mouth shut. What has gotten into you? Is this the kind of thing that goes through your head when you're quietly playing or working outside? Only when he's involved. So you're mad at Alejandro. 
You aren't? Dad smiled wryly. Mila, I have been frustrated. That's true. But never mad at Alejandro. All of us are trying to do the best we can with what we have. That's not his best, I scoffed. He's only looking out for himself. And his family, Dad pointed out. He paused a moment, then raised an eyebrow. I didn't say he was right. This made the corner of my mouth twitch. Then what are you saying? Dad smiled and motioned for me to sit on the chair next to him. I know you love those berries. They're my favorite, I pouted, and Dad chuckled. We've enjoyed weeks of harvest, and Alejandro hasn't had such luck. I felt a nasty comment burble into my mouth but refused to let it out. Alejandro and his family are a part of our real community. I always give to my community. Even if they give nothing back? Alejandro does give back, Mila, even if you don't see it. But yes, even if members of our town didn't give back, I trust that when they can, they will. I have, so I give. If they have not, I don't expect them to give. What if they have and they choose not to give? I asked stubbornly. Oh, so you're the judge now? You're going to go around and figure out whether everything is fair? Dad reached out and tickled my ribs. It's not our job to judge, Mila. What belongs to me belongs to all. I hadn't fully understood then what he meant, and maybe I still didn't. But standing in this church taking from others when I had nothing to give made me feel like I understood something. So we ate. Foods I'd never seen before and some I recognized, but I didn't think twice about any of it. Even though I'd always appreciated Mom's cooking, I'd never thought much about food being something to bring pleasure before meeting Channel and Ave. I missed the meals from home, but it wasn't a big stretch to eat whatever we had available now. When we finished eating, I leaned over to Zane and Sloane. Let's go back over there. We can lie down on the pews. Get some sleep? Sloane hadn't talked the entire meal, but the fact that she'd sat next to us made me think she was open to companionship. I was wrong. As I reached out and rubbed her shoulder, her arm snapped up to slap my hand away. Leave me alone, she hissed. I pulled back and rubbed the stinging skin. Zane's jaw flexed, but I waved him off. She was in a dark place and the information we'd offered an hour before hadn't done anything to help with that. We walked back to where Cammie was still sitting with the medical kit next to her on the floor. Just waiting for another injury to treat? Zane smirked. Cammie looked up. How's the bandage holding up? Zane pulled up his shirt. Seems fine. She nodded, then turned her attention back to the small box in her hands, sorting through something that looked like fishing line. Is this bench taken? I asked. She shook her head. The wooden pew stretched across half of the room, and while it didn't look exactly comfortable, at least it wasn't the hard stone floor. I picked up my pack and set it on the seat. Zane slid it away from me, but before I could complain, he set his down next to it, and I understood. I lay down on my side and he did the same, our feet pointing opposite directions and our heads resting next to each other on our bags. I don't know if I can sleep. My head begged for relief from the pressure, but adrenaline coursed through my body. I was on high alert, and I worried I wouldn't wake up when we were supposed to. Zane reached up and ran his fingers through my hair, then lightly massaged my scalp. I closed my eyes, instantly relaxing at his soft touch. I sank into my pack, my muscles finally giving in after the chaos of the afternoon. Images flashed through my mind. The community troops appearing ahead of us, Sean's face before we jumped out of the transport, Case lifting his mask. But then, spurred by Zane's calming touch, other scenes replaced them. Alec laughing in the grow house. Mom trying to kick him out of the bed. Alec and Channel blushing when I caught them holding hands. Zane's expression in the back seat of Sean's transport. The way the tree trunks looked outside the window as his finger tapped my wrist. My heart rate slowed, and my breathing deepened. 
A slow smile spread across my lips as I dropped into a peaceful sleep. Chapter 3 I woke to a stiff back. A dull ache pulsed from my shoulders down through my hips, and I rolled to my side, curling into a ball on the hard bench. My spine cracked as it curved. I rubbed my puffy eyes and yawned. Time to go, Darius whispered, and the night before rushed back into my mind. I sat up. All around me were sounds of shoes scuffing on floors and bodies shifting on benches. You okay? Zane sat up next to me. He was only an outline in the dim light. Tom and the others set up a few lights before we went to bed, so it wouldn't seem strange for there to be light in the building in the middle of the night. It was enough to find our things, but not enough to see details. My stomach roiled. I could have blamed it on waking up in the middle of the night or my near-constant state of hunger, but that wasn't it. We were about to start a fight we had no business winning. Do you think we could convince them to sneak away instead? I squeaked. Not likely. Zane's voice was groggy. You heard what Tom was saying. They're sick of running. They want this to end. I couldn't imagine feeling desperate enough that I'd gladly risk my life. I laughed under my breath. The four of us already had. Sure, there hadn't been an army standing in front of us when we left Southwest Territory, but our odds couldn't have been much better. I sighed. I still think we need to wait for the coalition. We gave them the information. They know we need help. I don't trust them to act fast enough to keep community bugs out of my head, Zane muttered. We don't have time to wait. I know. I leaned down and pulled on my now four-day-old socks. I didn't know which was worse, the fact that I stank to high heaven or the fact that I no longer noticed. What I wouldn't give to wash clothes next to Kay in the stream. We dressed, then picked up our mostly empty packs and trudged toward the center aisle with everyone else. Darius, Tom, and two other men I didn't recognize stood next to Sloane and Cammy. Silently, they tapped people on the shoulder and separated them into groups. When they got to us, I held on to Zane's arm. I wasn't going in a group without him. Darius looked between the two of us, then motioned to Sloane. Her eyes were still puffy from the night before, but her face was as hard as it had ever been. She didn't acknowledge us when we stood next to her, and I didn't push. We waited patiently as the men organized our group. Two women gathered the children from Fowler's Bluff and took them to the side of the church away from the others. At least Darius had been able to convince Tom that including children in this attack was ludicrous. Are they staying here? I leaned close to Sloane and kept my voice low. She didn't move and didn't look my direction. They're going to exit out the back. Relief flooded through me. Even if we weren't successful, they'd get a head start. Here. Darius thrust something into my hand. I inspected the object. What is this? When you get close to your assigned target, close your eyes and open the top. I lifted the small opaque packet. It was tightly bound and sealed at the top with a thick, shiny substance. What's inside? Chili powder. It's under pressure, so be extremely careful with that until you need it. They wanted us to fight community troops with chili powder? They'll be wearing masks. Masks don't protect your eyes, Sloane quipped. Here's this. Darius handed me and Zane a knife each. I gaped at the long blade and the weight of it in my hands. How was I supposed to hold on to this and somehow break the seal on the powder? Was he expecting me to use this on someone? Bile rose in my throat and I passed it back to him. I don't need one. The guys out there are going to come after you with everything they've got. Darius's face was ghostly in the dim light. I shook my head. I can't do it. I have no training. I've only ever used a knife to cut up chicken for dinner. I think you'll find it's not that different. Tom walked up behind Darius, but I barely noticed. No, I hissed. Last night, I'd understood their arguments. I knew this was a fight for our lives, for our freedom. But I hadn't considered what it would look like to fight back. You said they'd be sleeping, right? Tom nodded. That's the goal. So, what if we stole their weapons, disabled their transports? If they didn't have those, there would be nothing keeping us here. Tom scoffed. 
You think if we do that, they'll leave us alone? No. We must send a message. They've killed hundreds of our people. You think if we kill theirs, they're going to leave you alone? I asked with feeling. I'd heard enough about the battle my ancestors fought in. When one side escalated, the other side did too. This wasn't going to be the silver bullet he was hoping for. Tom shook his head, exasperated, and Darius handed the knife back to me before walking away to distribute weapons to other groups. Sloan still stared straight ahead. There has to be a better way, I repeated. Sloan snapped her head sharply toward me. I think it's time you grew up, Mila. Sometimes you have to fight back. Sometimes you have to do the wrong thing. Sometimes you have to throw a person overboard. Her words stung. If I'd let her throw Hank overboard, none of this would have happened. But the idea of being so blatantly callous filled me with a darkness I'd never felt before. Was I a coward? Right then, I understood why Lily had stayed. It wasn't that she didn't want to fight for her freedom. It was that she'd done the calculations and believed she couldn't win. I struggled to breathe. Zane cleared his throat. We can do it our way. We don't have to use these. He looked down at the knife in his hand. We do, Tom blustered. If they come after us, our only option is... Darius snapped his fingers and we froze. All eyes were on us. Tom drew a breath and gathered himself. Your group leaders have your assignments. We don't have ideal information, but it's important that you do exactly as they tell you. Our goal is to strike at the exact same time so they don't have a chance to spread the word and tip their people off. Darius folded his arms over his chest. They tried to assimilate the wrong group. A low murmur rose from the crowd around us as the men and Cammy walked to their groups. Sloane turned to me, Zane, and the ten other people who had been assigned to our group. Her eyes were shadowed and her jaw was set. Have any of you ever gone on missions like this before? Nobody answered. I have. Which means you need to listen to instructions and not do what makes sense to you. Understood? She looked pointedly in our direction. Her dark hair swooped across her left cheekbone, making her features look even more severe than they already did in the dim light. I swallowed hard. We've been assigned the area to the north of the visible transports. We don't know what we're going to find, so stay close. She spun on her heel and we followed. It was eerily quiet in the church, and our steps against the stone floor were deafening. We were the first group to reach the door. Sloane opened it as quietly as possible and stepped outside. We followed, creeping along the ground. I tucked the knife under my arm momentarily so I could pull my mask over my mouth and nose. I shuddered. I'd forgotten to hand the weapon back to Tom in all the commotion. It felt wrong in my right hand, but I held the handle tightly and wrapped the fingers of my left hand protectively around the pressurized packet. The night was dark and still. Sloane had the only light, and though she'd turned it on, she shielded it, so it wasn't much help. We walked cautiously forward after her silhouetted figure. We approached and then rounded a line of transports, and Sloane stopped abruptly on the other side. Two tents appeared in front of us, low to the ground, not large enough to hold more than two people. Sloane held up a hand and all twelve of us froze. The wait for her instructions felt interminable. By the time she gave us the go-ahead, I was shivering so badly that I didn't trust myself with either weapon gripped in my hands. Sloane dropped her mask and held the light in her mouth, motioning with her hands and splitting us into two groups. I wished I could lean over and talk to Zane, ask him how in the world we were going to attack two, possibly four, sleeping men. But talking wasn't an option. Maybe we'd open the flap and they'd be so terrified they'd hand us their weapons. Maybe we wouldn't have to hurt them at all. Sloane pointed at Zane and another strong-looking man in our group and motioned for them to come to the front. Was she sending them in first? No. Zane was not going to be the person that poked his head in there when we had no idea what we were up against. I shook my head and put an arm out to block him from moving forward. Sloane glared at me, but I held my ground. Zane gently lowered my arm and met my eyes, then stalked forward, gripping the handle of his knife. Sloane pointed at the tent on our left, and Zane positioned himself directly in front of what looked like the entrance. No. The pressure built inside me until it felt like I might explode. Zane reached for the tent flap, and my heart skipped a beat. I couldn't do this. I couldn't watch. 
I turned away, but that was almost as unbearable. As I stood there listening for something, anything that would tell me Zane hadn't just been shot as he opened the tent, I had an idea. The transports. They were used for transporting things. People, supplies, weapons. Sloan's light was pointed at the ground, but it gave enough ambient light to see the vehicles we'd passed a few moments ago. I glanced over my shoulder. Sloan was fixated on the tents in front of her, and I could barely see the top of Zane's head as he bent over. It was now or never. I crept forward, inching toward the transport. The absolute silence gave me confidence, and I moved a little faster until I was close enough to touch the back door. These vehicles were sleek, closed on top with only one door on the back. I tried the handle, and it clicked as it opened. I couldn't believe my luck. I slipped through the gap and searched the interior. A blue glow emanated from the floor, lighting the storage compartment. I set the packet and knife carefully on the metal floor, and my heart raced as I scrambled to pick up anything I could find. There was no time to inspect them. I simply opened my bag and shoved in the strange objects. Canisters, packets, a mask, and a long tube. I'd barely finished zipping up the bag and was about to pick up my own weapons when a hand yanked me backward. I thought I told you to follow my instructions exactly. Sloane hissed, her face inches from mine. I worked to catch my breath as she pulled me out of the transport. If Sloane was here, where was Zane? What hap- You would have known if you'd stayed with the group. She stalked back around the vehicle with zero attempt to quiet her steps. I straightened the straps of my bag over my shoulders and jogged to catch up. Sloane lifted her light toward the tents, illuminating Zane's face. I ran to him. He was okay. But how was he okay? The tents looked the same as when we'd come upon them, and I didn't see any extra bodies, especially none that looked like community soldiers. Where? I started to whisper, but before I could finish, Sloane threw open the flap of the tent closest to us. She shone her light inside, and I gasped. Empty. Chapter 4 How could the tents be empty? Noises started to sound around the camp, and Sloan marched back to the open space with the rest of us following behind. As soon as we rounded the transports, I spotted other handlights bobbing up ahead. We walked quickly, finally meeting up with at least two of the other groups. Where are they? Sloan growled, illuminating Darius's face in front of her. I don't know. Darius scanned the area as if he'd somehow be able to see something we couldn't. What do you mean you don't know? She hissed. You think they just took off and left? Walked back to P7? Darius's jaw flexed and he stood up to his full height. With his shaved head, beard, and burly physique, he was intimidating to say the least. But Sloan didn't back down. She was hurt and ready for a fight. Since she didn't get one with the communities, it looked like she was picking one with whoever else she could find. Zane stepped forward, moving past the other reels in our group. More people congregated near us, their shadows falling in with ours. Maybe they're scouting something. Scouting what? Darius asked, annoyed. I don't know. Other settlements? Are there more people in the area? Darius looked over at one of the other group leaders, a man from Fowler's Bluff. He nodded. They're small, but they do exist. They could be rounding up more people, doing the same thing we were doing and trying to take them by surprise, Zane said. Which means we could leave, I said excitedly. We could grab resources, load everyone up, go somewhere else and regroup. I shifted my now full bag on my shoulders. It was starting to get heavy. And then what? Sloane put her hands on her hips. Continue to starve? Realize we don't have a water source? N no, I stammered. I don't know. We could find our way to Kenna. Meet up with the coalition? Do you know where they are? Has their plan worked? Darius asked. We don't know yet. Zane jumped in to take the pressure off me. We haven't been able to communicate with them. Maybe we could call. Don't transports have communication capabilities? I asked, getting more excited by the minute. Not only was I not going to have to stab someone, we just might have a shot of getting out of here alive. I looked down at my empty hands, realizing I wasn't holding either of the weapons Darius had given me. The transports, I repeated, 
They're open. I already checked, and I think I left my... You checked? Darius asked, the tone in his voice stopping me in my tracks. Yeah. I realized there might be something useful in there, so I opened the back. Darius pondered this, his eyes narrowing. The communities track everything. There's no way we could take those things and avoid being found. It was a fair point. Is there a way to disable the system? Zane asked, looking at Sloan. The way you did, on the breeze? Sloan took a deep breath. I'm sure there's a way, but I don't have any experience with those. I couldn't guarantee it. Darius paused, a thought suddenly occurring to him. He looked up, holding his light into the air and scanning the faces in the circle. Where's Tom? As soon as he asked the question, I realized it had been strange that nobody had jumped in talking about how we couldn't run, how we needed to teach them a lesson and stand up for ourselves. Has anyone seen Tom? Or his group? Darius asked again, but nobody answered. And then something fell into him, knocking into him from behind. He jumped, moving out of the way, and Sloane shone her light on the ground. A woman lay face down in the dirt, a small black cylindrical object protruding from her right shoulder. The group panicked as another person fell, landing somewhere in the collection of people on our left. We're under attack, Darius growled, lifting his light and shining it out over our heads. The beam glinted off masks, and my heart sank. We were surrounded by the community troops, their weapons drawn and pointed toward us. Drop your weapons, one of them commanded, and we did as he said. Lights began to blink on all around us, but before my sight was blinded by the intense beams, I caught a glimpse of something that made my blood run cold. A tall, wiry frame and a scruffy beard. Chapter 5 Everything clicked into place. How Tom had arrived at the church before us. Why he'd been so adamant that we gather everyone up and fight back. Of our own volition, we'd packed up our things, separated children from their parents, and gathered as a group, primed and ready to be loaded into the transports and shipped off to wherever they had planned. Had it been that easy for him to betray us? And for what? What could the communities have promised him that was powerful enough to send your own people to the chopping block? Now I really wished I had my knife. The soldiers walked closer, still leveling their weapons at us. I held up my hands, looking down at the two people lying flat in the dirt. The black buttons stuck out of their backs ominously. You five, come with me, one of the troopers said, pointing to the group closest to them. And you? You're with me. Another one hissed, siphoning off a handful of people from the other side of the group. We slowly shrank bit by bit, the reels being guided in small groups to different transports. You four, a man said, pointing at me, Zane, Sloane, and Darius. Though it was still dark, I knew the voice. I lowered my head, not wanting to bring any attention to the fact that we knew our captor or that I was relieved and elated that the four of us would be traveling together even if it was to be assimilated. Get in, Kay said, and I looked up to find the same transport I'd pilfered items from earlier. He didn't look too closely at us, or search my bag as he opened the sliding side door and told us to take a seat, and I noticed we weren't the first to enter. Another two rows were already filled behind us, but I could barely see the tops of their heads over the seats. These were some of the children I'd hoped had escaped. My eyes filled with tears, imagining their mothers in another vehicle, unsure whether they were safe and alone or captured right along with them. As we stepped one by one into the vehicle and sat down, Case instructed us to put our hands down next to our sides. He kept his weapon trained on us and pressed a button on his suit. Restraints snapped up from between the seats and out of the base, looping around our wrists and ankles, then retracting to hold them tightly. I wanted to scream. The tension on my arms bringing back every drop of despair I'd felt in P7, but I kept my mouth shut. Zane nudged my shoulder. It'll be okay, he said, glancing hopefully toward Case and then lowering his eyes. I got the message, but I didn't know if I shared his confidence. Case hadn't warned us or spilled that Tom was in the process of betraying everyone. He hadn't given us a chance to escape, so why would I think he might help us now? On the other hand, what did I have to lose? 
If he wasn't going to help us, then asking him to do so wouldn't hurt our cause. But if there was a small part of him that was too afraid to act, I looked around, realizing this might be my only shot. He was alone, and I doubted it would stay that way for long. I cleared my throat, eyeing the barrel of the gun. I wish we could send a message. To Kenna and the Coalition. I turned my head to look straight out the windshield. I'd want her to know what was happening and where we were headed. I paused, my heart pounding. I could feel Zane's eyes on me, but I kept going. I'd want her to know if we had a friend. Someone with a bruised forehead? My voice caught, and I swallowed hard. Darius looked over, his brow furrowed, and then he glanced over at Case. And that message would need to be sent from a dummy account. So nobody could trace it. Exactly, I breathed, sinking into the seat. I'd done it. If Case wanted to help, he had Kenna's name and information. He'd likely had it already, given the fact that they were after other members of the coalition, but still, it couldn't hurt to remind him. Case didn't flinch or acknowledge he'd heard a word of what we'd said. For all I knew, he was listening to something else entirely and missed the whole thing. But at least I'd tried. Moments later, another two soldiers appeared next to Case. Transports are loaded, the tall one said. Are these real secure? Case nodded, lowering his weapon for the first time. My bag sat at my feet, and I wished I could move them to pull it back out of view. I didn't know what was in there, but I could think of a few things that would work to at least hit someone over the head with. Though how that would help us, I didn't know. My mind searched for solutions as the two soldiers and Case got in the front seats. The tall one sat in the driver's seat, and I wasn't sure if that was to our benefit. Could we somehow get out of these restraints? When the engine came to life and the vehicle moved forward, I decided to experiment. Wiggling my arms, I attempted to pull backward, but my elbows were blocked by the seat behind me. Not great. Curling my fingers under my palm, I tried lifting my wrist and pulling them underneath. The strap bit into my skin and I started to sweat. Won't work. Darius whispered. I looked up at him. Well, I at least have to try. Trust me. You keep pushing like that and they're only going to get tighter. He kept his voice low and I had to lean in to hear him fully. I felt Zane press against my right side and I sat back, trying to give him a vantage point to read lips. Have you been in one of these before? I asked. A few times. Darius nodded and my eyes widened. How did you get out? I didn't. But, well, you aren't. I'm still real, he said, and I nodded just as one of the soldiers up front turned around in his seat holding his gun. No talking, he commanded, and I sat up straight, nodding my compliance. I stared forward, shifting in my seat as much as I could so my arm was touching Zane's. I wanted to be held by him, or at least to reach out and hold his hand. Our worst-case scenario was coming true, and I was terrified. Or I logically knew I was terrified, which was why I couldn't feel anything. I'd barely started to wake up, to feel the highs and lows and embrace them, but as the vehicle bumped along the ground, I only felt hollowed out and empty. So, I did what I knew I'd be doing if my emotions weren't stonewalled. A live Mila would touch Zane as much as she could. A live Mila would start to breathe quickly, her heart would race, her lip would tremble, and tears would pool in her eyes. So I leaned close. I rushed my breathing, and I bit the inside of my cheek, reveling in the moisture that collected under my eyelids. These soldiers had my body trapped, but I wasn't going to allow them to trap my soul for a second longer. Part 2. Channel. April 24th through April 30th. 2161. Chapter 6. This is the one benefit to not having enough resources, I said to Ames, lugging one of the last boxes to the back of the transport. It turned out not one of us was capable of taking the day off as I'd suggested. After sitting around for less than 45 minutes, all of our nervous energy nearly drove us out of our minds. We'd rest someday, but that day was not today. You're complaining, but you didn't have to load everything up in an hour flat. 
Ames dropped her box next to mine. She knew I was teasing, but the reality of what we'd all been through over the past few days sobered me. Had it really only been five days ago that Alec and I escaped out of P3 and fell asleep in the back of our stolen transport? It felt like a lifetime ago. My mind spun thinking of our time with the Vivientes, how Ave had almost died, and then how we'd tried to join back up with the Coalition but ended up knocking on the doors of an empty warehouse. Everything past that was a blur of panic and desperation. It had felt so good to be useful, finally, to find a way to give us a chance. But now that we were packing up to leave, the reality of what we were about to do began to set in. Had I really promised that we'd build a new system in only nine months? No, I reminded myself. We'd said a year, which was still overly ambitious, and they'd countered. At the time, nine months had seemed like a lot. And then I remembered we didn't have on hand what we needed to build a new carbon reuptake energy system. And that we had to build a new carbon reuptake energy system in P3. There was also that. I forced myself to take a breath and scanned the yard in front of the house. Most of the transports had already left, filled to the brim with coalition members, and we were officially the stragglers. Alec burst out of the front door, a pack on his back. Is that everything? I asked, and he nodded. I watched him descend the steps on the side of the house and walk toward us. His face was serious, focused. It seemed like it had also been a lifetime since I'd seen him smile. The kitchen and all the longhouses are clear. Just waiting for Kenna to finish organizing her equipment. Alec stopped next to me and my heart sped up. I was almost getting used to the way my body reacted when he was close. After spending much of last night worrying he didn't want to be near me, I didn't take it for granted. Is this our ride? I forced my gaze away from his face and turned to Ames. It was strange not having Nat here checking tires or talking to us about maintenance or community history. Ames sniffed. It's this or riding with Sky and Tree. Those are the two options left. I nodded, turning to Alec and shrugging my shoulders, asking silently if he had a preference. Before he could answer, Sky and Tree walked out of the house, followed closely by Ave and Kay. Every time I saw Ave, I found myself inspecting him carefully, looking for any sign that his condition might be deteriorating. He was eating regular meals as of today, as much as any of us were at least. His digestion... His digestion seemed to be fully functioning, and that thought was one I never thought I'd have. Two weeks ago, if someone had told me I'd be worrying about my best friend's digestive tract, I would have laughed out loud. As mundane and strange as it was, it didn't escape me that I was stressed about another person. I was concerned about Ave, about Alec, about Nat and Simeon, about Vera. There was a very long list of people that ranked in my mind over myself which made me feel just the tiniest bit proud. What? Alec asked, and I looked up, meeting his eyes. Hmm? You're smiling. Is that weird? I grinned at his curiosity. No. He exhaled, looking down at the ground a second before lifting his head. I don't know. It looked like you were thinking about something good. I raised an eyebrow, watching as the corner of his mouth threatened to curl upward. You're coming with us. Tree pointed at me and Alec, then turned to include Kay and Ave in the directive. You're going to the warehouse? I asked, forgetting the official name Kenna had given it when she was talking to Clearwater. Tree nodded. And then home. I thought of when they'd found us in the desert outside of P3. We'd driven less than a full day to get to their San Francisco. We'll be going both places, and we have a lot to talk about. Kenna walked outside to join us, her hands gripping her tablet as she held a bundle of equipment in her arms. His words haven't changed in the last hour, Skye muttered, her eyes flicking toward Kenna before she flung her braids over her shoulders and folded her arms over her chest. Whose words? I asked. Kenna rolled her eyes. Are you talking about... No, they couldn't be. When I'd brought up the Viviente's technology in the meeting with the council, I'd looked at Kenna for the go-ahead. You nodded, I breathed, walking past Alec to stand next to her as Ames helped her unload. I assumed the chief would be thrilled with us getting him access to the uranium they needed. 
Kenna said, and I whirled to Tree and Sky. He's not happy? Tree looked between the two of us, but didn't open her mouth. Clearwater said that's what you needed. I don't... You unreals don't understand cost. Sky snapped, her eyes searing into mine, before she turned her attention to Kenna. You mistake your emergency for ours. Kenna slammed her hands on the floor of the transport and spun to face tree and sky. Do you really think the communities will honor their treaty with you when we're out of the picture? She asked vehemently. Kenna strode forward, her eyes flashing. I am not trying to be disrespectful, but our emergency is your emergency. Stopping in front of tree and sky, I realized just how much taller she was than the two women. I told you what they said today. She actively restrained herself from raising her voice. They consider all reels a drain on their perfectly ordered system. That includes the Vivientes. We also know who exactly is running things on the council these days, Skye said firmly, standing her ground. And do you think that if we hand over our technology to them, they'll willingly give it back? Kenna balled her hands into fists. We wouldn't be giving them anything. We'd... His words haven't changed. Sky emphasized each word. Kenna pursed her lips and turned back to the transport. You will drive with us, she repeated, pointing at us. After that display, I wasn't about to argue with her. The three of us marched obediently behind her and tree toward their transport. When we'd settled in and started driving, our vehicle falling in behind Ames, Kenna, and the few coalition members still needing a ride. I finally took a full breath. For the next couple of hours, there was nothing else I could do but wait. No amount of stressing or overthinking was going to make this drive go any faster. So, I might as well relax and enjoy it. Ave had already sprawled out across the empty seat next to him. Kay leaned against the window, staring out at the barren landscape. I wanted to ask her what she was thinking of all this, and I almost started a sentence three times before Alec finally said something I hadn't considered. You don't have to come. His voice was gentle, and without looking, Kay knew his words were for her. There's nothing for you back home, and there's a lot for you here. Kay's head bobbed slightly, her eyes glassy. I want there to be something for me there. I know, Alec breathed. He paused, and for the millionth time, I wished I could understand, truly understand what it had been like growing up real. You'll always have us, he said, and Kay blinked back tears. Be brave enough to cut the ties that are holding you back. Tree's voice floated back from the front seat, and the air was instantly knocked out of me. I leaned over hanging my head between my knees as arcs of light spread across my vision. I'd been trapped, unable to move past a wall of my own mind's making, until I'd started clipping my links. Was it possible that Kay felt just as stuck in the real world? You okay? Alec put a hand on my back. I nodded, not lifting my head. I want this out. I pointed at the wires that served as a constant reminder that my brain— still wasn't completely mine. At some point on the drive, I'd fallen asleep, finally giving in to the emotional exhaustion and lulled by the rhythmic motion of the vehicle. As my consciousness surfaced, I heard voices and tuned in. Our people scattered in the years before Kempi, Sky said. We'd been hurting for years before that. And you really think I could be somehow related to you? A descendant? Alec asked his voice quiet and low. She didn't answer immediately, and I tried to make sense of the conversation I was jumping into. A descendant? Of the Vivientes? It wasn't the craziest thing I'd ever heard. Would it matter if you were? She spoke slow and deliberately. Then it was Alex's turn to think before speaking. I pondered her question. Had I ever thought once in my life about where I'd come from? I knew nothing about the people who came before my parents, right along with everyone else in P3. Of course, I knew my parents had parents, I wasn't that oblivious, but nobody in my community ever talked about them. We were focused on the future, 
on what the next generation would accomplish, not about what hadn't been achieved in the past. Would it matter if you were? I don't think it would change anything. Alec answered finally. I have a good family, good parents, and even though I never got to meet them, they have good parents too. He paused, and just when I was about to open my eyes and lift my head from the side of my seat, he spoke again. But I think it would matter to know if we had a legacy. I sat up and looked over, noticing the sky was beginning to darken. Alec's eyes were thoughtful and his face more peaceful than it had been when we left. You already do have a legacy, I cut in. Your family stood against the communities. You've survived on your own, providing entirely for yourselves. What better legacy is there? Tree turned in her seat, studying me a moment. Do you know who you are? A channel green? I laughed lightly. 106831, born July 12th, 2144, P3 Community. Bah! Tree scoffed, waving her hand. Those are identifying pieces of information the world has made up to keep track of you, not for you to keep track of yourself. She fixed her eyes on me again, this time with such intensity my hands felt cold. Do you know who you are? I... I don't know how to answer that question, I stammered, looking over at Alec to see what he was thinking about this line of questioning. He shrugged. I risked a glance back at Tree and her eyes glinted, like she was about to let me in on a secret. Would it matter if you did? My mouth opened, but no words came out. What was she talking about? Of course I knew who I was. I'd told her who I was, but that hadn't been acceptable for some reason. Those might be arbitrary identifiers, but they were my arbitrary identifiers. Channel. Alec's voice was tense. I followed his gaze out the front windshield as the vehicle began to slow. I couldn't make sense of what I was seeing. A black cloud of smoke billowed into the air, so thick there was no way to make out where it was coming from. But then I saw a line of transport stopped up ahead, and my stomach dropped to my knees. The Warehouse Chapter 7 It's not safe, Skye scolded, motioning for me to stay in the car after we stopped next to Kenna. I looked over, but there weren't any visible faces in the front seat. If Kenna and Ames could get out, so could I. Channel... Sky's protestations died behind me as I pushed the door open and pulled my mask up over my face. The sudden heat was intense, and I wasn't prepared for the sound. Crackling, hissing, like the building was groaning in complaint as fire ate it from the inside out. I rushed forward, searching for Kenna, and quickly spotted her walking about fifteen meters out from the perimeter of what used to be the warehouse wall. Kenna! I called out rushing forward and jumping when I felt a hand on my arm. I looked up in surprise to find Alec next to me. Without a word, together we jogged forward and fell into step next to her. How could they do this? She shrieked, following the wall to the back and rounding the corner. The heat wasn't as intense back here. Whatever they'd used had been mainly focused on the front of the building. We had a deal! I swallowed hard already disliking the words that were about to come out of my mouth. This probably happened well before our deal. Kenna's eyes flashed. We didn't stay here because we knew this was a possibility, right? The expression on her face made me backtrack. Not that that makes it better in any way, I'm just saying. Maybe Straya didn't know. Bryn knew. Kenna spit still stalking toward the space between the warehouse and the grow houses where the bathing pool was. I nodded, bile rising in my throat. Bryn had known, which meant he'd been aware we'd be losing many of our resources when he'd negotiated for a shorter timeline. Straya was right. He wasn't going to make this easy on us. The air cleared in front of us. A cross breeze pulled the smoke in the opposite direction, and water rippled on the ground in front of us. The pools were intact, and I breathed a sigh of relief. Kenna stopped, her body rigid as she surveyed the damage. We can't stay here, she muttered, 
and my eyes widened. Had she only come to that conclusion right now? The toxic cloud of fire and smoke out front hadn't convinced her? I'm so sorry. Alec's jaw was tense. I can't imagine losing my home. I glanced between the two of them as pressure built in my chest. This was a tragedy. Most of the tools and technology we were counting on were inside that building. We had to find a way to work with P3 leaders, and now we'd be bringing nothing to the table. Was Bryn sabotaging everything there, too? Was he going to do everything he could to make our task impossible? Despite the fear coursing through me at the reality of our situation, when the words, losing my home, left Alec's lips, they felt like a betrayal. He'd asked me, told me, to lose my home. I'd left not only my home, but the only family I had left. Or at least all I thought I'd had left until yesterday. My mind reeled at the thought of my dad on his way to P7 with Zane and Mila. I shivered. Would I have to give him up a second time? I dropped his hand and wrapped my arms around myself, squeezing tight. I felt for them. I really did. But some of us didn't have a home to lose anymore. Kenna's arms started to shake as she stared at the ruined structure. We can't stay here, she repeated. We can't. Hey, Kenna. Alec jumped forward as Kenna's legs wobbled. He helped her sit down on the edge of the weathered stone patio next to the bathing pool. Deep breaths he instructed, then reached up to ensure her mask was firmly secured over her mouth and nose. The air was bad enough on its own, but with the smoke adding to it? I can't do this, Kenna mumbled. I walked forward to sit next to her. Can't do what? Any of this. I'm done. I frowned. I don't think we have the option to- I'm done! She screamed, hysterical as she leaned over her knees and began to hyperventilate. I'm 24 years old. I was a world builder for three and a half years before I chose community exile. Three and a half years. Even that wasn't enough to get our team out of P3 safely. I looked at Alec, perplexed. What was she talking about? Kenna, I don't know. It took you. A 17-year-old coder from P3 with no real edge experience to solve that problem. She grimaced. Ah. She was talking about the night the reels went in after Ave. I shrugged. That was a lucky coincidence. If I wouldn't have chosen that for our project, it doesn't matter. If you hadn't come up with something, they would have been lost. You would have figured out a solution. No. Kenna shook her head. I've been doing this for too long. I'm a product of the system I was raised in, even the way I code. She stopped short and glared at the ground. A little kid was able to come up with something more creative than I could. I pursed my lips. A little kid had come up with something more creative than I could, too. Watching her like this, so broken and unsure of herself, rocked me. Kenna was the one who was always sure, who always knew what the right answer was, even when I disagreed with her, and who had the experience to lead the charge against the communities. If she didn't think she was good enough to keep going, then none of us were. In our meeting with the council, I had no ideas. When they came back saying they'd known what Bryn was up to all along, my mind went blank. She furiously tugged at the hair around her mask. I'm done, she repeated for the third time, then dropped her head into her hands, defeated. We sat in silence, listening to the faint crackling and hissing behind us. I knew how she felt. This was every day of my life before she'd pulled me out of P3. The weeks after? Even now. What could a 17-year-old coder from P3 with no real edge experience offer a team of ex-world builders? I don't think about the world the same way you do, I admitted. As a world builder, you probably learned to keep all the rules. But I was never good at that. I chuckled wryly. Don't get me wrong, I wasn't a troublemaker, but I was never satisfied. I ached to innovate, to be creative. Alec watched me closely and I gave him a half smile. I knew what he was thinking, that I should be satisfied with the world around me. I knew he hoped I'd want simplicity, and I did, to a point. 
But I couldn't deny this drive within me to find ways to improve, to optimize and create. The excitement I felt at being able to problem solve and build something new and innovative was overwhelming. Is that how the communities happened? People with unsatiated curiosity that didn't know how to leave well enough alone? Kenna, you taught me to look past the stories the communities were serving me every day on a platter. You're the one who told me to think about what was happening behind the scenes. You're the one who pulled me out. So I even had the opportunity to know there were other options. How can you think you don't have something to offer here? She shook her head and groaned. These people count on me. And our team. And I... You've kept them safe. Every single one of them. Not Nat. Not Simeon. That's different. They chose to go on that mission, and they knew the risks, just like everyone else. I hesitantly glanced at Alec. That was a leap, since I hadn't been there. The point is, you've caused enough of a stir that we have a chance to build a new system, a new community. One that serves all its members and gives the power back to the individual. That never would have happened without you. It never could have happened without losses. She tapped her toe aimlessly in the dirt as smoke roiled behind us. We have nothing. We have resources in my settlement, Alec offered. And in P3, I added, as long as Cass didn't destroy them all. I kept that thought to myself. You think those two areas can suddenly absorb a large group of people? She scoffed. There are at least 90 of us. Alec let out a low whistle. That would double Southwest Territory. Exactly. I can't focus on building a new world when I know my people have nowhere to go. I tapped my chin. One of those groups might not be able to absorb everyone, but we have the Vivientes, too. With access to the resources they need, they'll easily be able to provide for more. We could split people up. Alec nodded, but Kenna vehemently shook her head. His words haven't changed. She hoisted her beleaguered body from her knees. Alec scowled. What? Their principal. He doesn't trust the communities, and I don't blame him. I'm not sure if they trust us fully. A tree's brother. I bolted from my seat. We could look for him, offer to pull him out, or arrange a meeting. Kenna's eyes narrowed. Arrange a meeting? I... I mean, she said he was linked. If he was lucky enough to be in a group that wasn't cut off from resources, and if we can find a way to link Tree with his feed without an implant. Those are some massive ifs. Kenna gaped at me. Link someone without an implant? I threw my hands up in the air. I don't know. That's something we could offer them. They might have other people who have been taken by the communities. Maybe they'd be more willing to take people in and give us access to their carbon reuptake technology if we offered more in return. Kenna considered this, and my eyes roamed over the apocalyptic scene behind her. Alec shifted on his feet. I know this isn't exactly a good time, but could we set up the transmitter? See if Mila is trying to reach us? No. Kenna lowered her eyes. The last message we received from them was through a community member. Probably that guard you knocked out since he seemed to be with them. Even better, we could look in your messages. We wouldn't have to rely on radio waves. It seemed like a better option until I remembered the reason for the switch. They were in custody, with no autonomy to communicate with us. I can check messages, but I can't afford to take power from the vehicles right now. We don't have time to stop and charge. We need to keep moving. Kenna dusted off her slacks and stood. The warehouse. Their safe place and ours was in the past. All we could do was watch it burn and hope there was a refuge in our future. Chapter 8 Having nowhere to sleep, we drove on and hoped the transports would hold out until we made it to the Vivientes. With the sun well below the horizon, we had no way to charge them if they died, so we wore our masks and turned off the cabin filtration, then dimmed the headlights to save whatever energy we could. I closed my eyes multiple times, but couldn't sleep. My body was restless. 
anxious about the unknowns that lay ahead. What would we do if the Vivientes refused to participate? We didn't have any other way to produce the energy we'd promised to Straya and the Council, and it wasn't going to take long for them to notice. I felt sick about Mila and Zane. Sometimes I could convince myself they had a friend there, but most of the time I was positive that small addition in their message meant nothing. Even if he was still supportive of our cause, how much influence did one guard have? Especially when the last time Reels had been under his watch, they'd escaped. They'd been with Sloan, Talia's contact. We knew that much. That likely only made it worse for them. With other Reels, they could hide their identity and hope nobody figured out they'd been there before. But with her? The communities had sent troops after Sloan. She wasn't going to go unnoticed, which meant neither were they. Hey, Alec whispered. Hey. Are you uncomfortable? His face was an outline in the ambient light from the headlights. No. Why? You're fidgeting. That's what I do. Not when you're comfortable. I sighed. He wasn't wrong. I didn't realize I was fidgeting. I'll try to stop. He leaned closer. I'm not mad about it. He sounded the slightest bit amused. I was trying to help. I stretched and sat up a bit higher so our faces were on the same level. Nobody can help with this. I should have thanked him. I should have reached out a hand and asked him how he was doing, given the fact that it was his sister and friend stuck in enemy territory. I wanted to have the energy to comfort him, but the words didn't come. Like Kenna, I felt empty. Alec turned and settled back in his seat. Our dim lights glinted off of rock I'd only seen once before, but remembered all too well. We were almost to the cliffs. Almost to the top of that hill that would allow us to coast down through the canyon into San Francisco. What they did with us then, we had yet to find out. We were all disoriented when we finally pulled to a stop. I hadn't been able to sleep, but my mind was moving in and out of conscious thought. Kenna parked in front of town center like before, but this time felt different. There was no mystery anymore, and instead of frustration washing over me, I felt trepidation. I doubted we'd receive the same hospitality we'd been greeted with last time, and we needed their help in more ways than one. Tree and Sky left the vehicle. Tree walked purposefully into town center and Sky headed straight toward Clearwater's door. Their dark braids disappeared into the inky night. What happens now? Ave asked softly from the seat behind us. I yawned. Your guess is as good as mine. Do you think they'll let us stay? Kay asked. A handlight bobbed in the air coming closer to the vehicle. When it stopped next to the door, I could barely make out Kenna's features as she rapped on the window. I pulled on the door handle and pushed, and Kenna moved to the side so I could step out. Ready? She asked. I looked at her quizzically. Ready for what? We're going to have to go in there and plead our case. At this time of night? I glanced back into the vehicle, Kenna's light barely illuminating my three very sleepy friends. I don't know how that's going to go. Don't really have a choice. Unless we want to make everyone here sleep in the transports. Right now, that honestly sounded like the better option. Do we all need to be there? Alec poked his head out of the transport door. Kenna shrugged. You can come if you want, but I don't think anyone is absolutely necessary besides Channel. I think Alex just as necessary as I am. I jumped in quickly. He and Kay are our link to Southwest Territory. We can't make plans without hearing their opinion. Putting a hand on her hip, she considered this. True. You're right. I think you should come along. So, the only one who's unnecessary is me, right? Ave called from the back seat. I rolled my eyes. Ave, just come, I groaned. You'll want to know everything and we're not going to have the energy tomorrow to repeat it all. Speak for yourself, Ave grumbled. Kay will tell me, right? If Kay replied, it wasn't audible. They both exited the vehicle behind Alec a few moments later. Kenna nodded for us to walk with her and her handlight illuminated tree walking next to a very groggy clear water toward the building. I rubbed my eyes. Is there principal even here? It's the middle of the night. 
I'm not sure if he's back, Kenna admitted. The last time we talked, he... Was a projection, I remember. How did they do that, by the way? I fell into step next to her. Do what? She asked. Make it look so real. Kenna chuckled. Tree and Sky didn't fill you in on everything while I was gone? You knew about the carbon reuptake, so I assumed you knew about everything. I shook my head and waited as Kenna opened the door to the building. We followed her inside where low lights lit the atrium. The projections aren't anything new. Kenna led us around the large pillar and turned right toward the room we'd met in the first time. They use the same tensor holography we all use, but they have a better algorithm. I scrunched up my face. Wait, algorithm? They code here? Of course they code here, Kenna scoffed. How else do you think they run their grow houses and energy systems? I'd lumped the Vivientes in with the other reels and assumed they knew nothing of our advances. Alec and Mila didn't have access to this kind of technology. Even though I'd seen evidence of tech within the first moments of meeting Tree and Sky, I hadn't thought much about what that meant. What makes theirs better? The algorithm they have, I asked sheepishly. Kenna paused next to the door but didn't reach out to open it. We bunched together in the hallway. You understand how algorithms work? Kenna asked. And just as Ava and I said yes, Kay and Alex said no. Kenna smirked. When a traditional camera takes a picture of an image, it's recording color and brightness, which, while allowing for a realistic image, ultimately yields a picture that's one-dimensional. Holograms, however, are created by recording the brightness and the phase of that reflected light. Light travels in waves. Alec's brow furrowed as he attempted to make sense of what she was saying. Exactly. So the light that reflects off my ear, for example, is going to have to complete more phases to reach your eye than the light that reflects off the tip of my nose. Kay sniffed. It counts them. Kenna nodded. By gathering that data, a realistic three-dimensional image can be transmitted somewhere else. You said their algorithm was better than the one we use in the communities, I repeated. How? Kenna's eyes lit up, and it was comforting to see energy in her that wasn't defeatist. It's better because our algorithm functions are based on learning data from a set database. Years ago, someone somewhere created a database of complex images with equal distribution of pixels from the foreground to the background, the community algorithm learned from the physics-based calculations to create its own system of analysis. It can take anything it sees and transform it like that. Kenna snapped her fingers. Without having to do the calculations over again. But the Vivientes algorithm's database isn't set. What do you mean isn't set? I asked. How could you efficiently run an algorithm that was constantly having to reanalyze information? It replicates. Kenna shrugged, and I blinked. Every time they use it to transmit an image, it stores the data and sends it to a supercomputer that can perform the calculations. It takes more time and energy, which is why we don't use that method for day-to-day -day communication. My eyes narrowed. Every image? Kenna nodded. Those images and calculations are added to the database, and a new algorithm is born as soon as a new data threshold is reached. I considered this. If they only transmit a few images one week, it won't replicate as quickly, but if they send a lot the next, you could be getting a new algorithm every few days, Kenna finished for me. It was smart, incredibly smart. But why would they do this? I asked. Sure, it was impressive, and I of all people understood the desire to make things the best they could be, even if you didn't have a good reason for doing so. But performing calculations like that perpetually would use a lot of energy and computing power. It started out as an experiment, Kenna answered. I was fascinated by it, so I learned as much as I could. Who knows what will come out of it in the future? Isn't that how most discoveries are made? Alec asked. Curiosity and data? If we don't set aside resources for experimentation, how would we ever make progress? Kenna mused. Alec's face clouded over. Must be nice to have extra to set aside, he muttered under his breath. Kenna didn't hear him, and I didn't bring attention to it, but he was right. When you could barely feed your family, 
How could you begin to think about being curious or making new technological advancements? The door next to us swung open into the hall and we jumped. Tree poked her head out. We're ready. Chapter 9 Walking into the meeting room felt eerily identical to last time except there wasn't any light emanating through the portholes on the ceiling. A ring of blue light glowed from the floor around the perimeter of the room, which still made it look ghostly. The principal sat in the same seat as last time, but the other stools were empty, barring one. After our discussion in the hall, I peered closer, trying to find some glitch or weakness in the projection. I couldn't find a single aberration with my naked eye. Tree hastily divvied out blankets, and we arranged them on the floor to take our seats. I couldn't help but wonder where the principal was if he wasn't here. Did the Vivientes have more settlements? Was he traveling for a purpose? We're very sorry to wake you, Ken sighed apologetically. The principal smiled slowly. His clothing was muted. He wore a loose shirt and robe draped around his torso, all the colors of earth. I've been told you didn't have much choice. His black hair, streaked with silver, was pulled into one long braid that trailed down his back. We didn't, Kenna agreed. We've contracted with the communities. I know all about your contract. The principal glanced at Tree, who lowered her head respectfully. I've been following your progress closely. I frowned. We barely had the ability to send messages to the communities with edge access. Unless... Tree and Sky had used Kenna's radio wave transmitter when we weren't looking? I scanned the side of Tree's face and looked for the thin silver disc she often had there, sitting on the bone behind her ear. It was too dark to make anything out. Then you know we secured access to the monolith. We'll be able to get the resources you need. The communications we received from Straya gave instructions on a distribution zone near P6. The map appeared in my head. We were west of P7, which stretched from the top of the gulf upward. If I remembered correctly, P6 was west of their northern boundary, which meant their southern boundaries were probably just north of those tribal lands. The principal nodded. That is very interesting, yes. Interesting? Wouldn't that be monumental news? I wished Alex Blanket was closer so I could lean over and comment. What is the trade? The principal asked. The trade is that we're offering our compliance for an opportunity to show the communities that there would be a better way to meet all of our needs. Kenna had prepared for that question. The principal shook his head. No. What is the trade? Kenna blinked and her brows pulled together. He continued. The communities could take all of us out at any moment if they wanted to, as evidenced by your burning settlement. Kenna flinched. We've outsmarted them so far. I think they recognize that we're not going to be as easily stamped out as they'd hoped. The principal shrugged. That may be true. But if I've learned anything from our negotiations with the council over the past 30 years, it's that they don't give anything for free. 30 years? How old was he? How was it possible he'd been alive so long, serving in this capacity no less? He narrowed his eyes. You do not know what you have traded, do you? I do. Kenna pursed her lips. We promised. A whisper sounded in my ear, drawing my attention from what she was saying. Have you ever thought about how Bryn's experiments don't make sense? Ave had scooted next to me and leaned over my shoulder. I stiffened, both at his words and the fact that I was sure whispering to each other during this meeting would be frowned upon. I reached a hand behind me and shooed him off while keeping my face blank. Ave ignored me. It doesn't make sense, Channel. What information could they possibly be gaining by starving people of resources? They're getting inundated with code they can use to world build, I hissed back. But how much do they really need? Ave persisted. They don't need it from everyone. And why only do it in certain places? I don't know. There's something... Is there a problem here? Kenna turned to face us. No. I shook my head as my cheeks flamed. Yes? Ave settled back on his blanket. My eyes widened. The principal eyed us. 
you may speak your concerns. No, I thought internally. Don't bring this up now. We can talk about it later. I don't think we know what we've traded. Ave drew a deep breath, and Kenna's eyes flashed. Why is that? She asked through gritted teeth. Because we don't actually understand what the communities are trying to accomplish. His voice gained strength as he talked. We have theories, sure, but there's something missing. What is that? Kenna's voice was ominous. I'm not sure, exactly. You're not sure. And yet you're bringing this up now when we have the entire coalition sitting outside in transports? Ave cleared his throat. All I know is that the council is calculating. Thorough. And all we're seeing is a bunch of sloppy decision-making. It doesn't add up. You don't think it's sloppy? The principal cut in. Ave shook his head. It only looks sloppy because there's something else going on that we don't understand. Which means we don't know what we traded. He looked pointedly at Kenna. We might have been leveraging something we weren't aware of. The principal nodded approvingly, and his eyes crinkled as he smiled. I agree. Which is why I'm unwilling to give access to our energy systems during the simulation. Kenna looked ready to spring forward and strangle Ave. Her face reddened, and her arms began to shake with sleep-deprived rage. You should give it. Alex spoke up next to me. I spun toward him in shock. What was happening? Since when did Ave and Alex speak up in public gatherings? Why is that? The principal asked, amused. Because you have something that could benefit other reels. It's not the reels I'm worried about. Alec nodded. I know. But reels will be a portion of our team, and you can trust them. My heart swelled and broke with his words. How could we ensure the technology was safe when there were so many moving parts? How could we... I froze mid-thought. What if we could promise that the communities would never get access to your technology? The principal eyed me quizzically. Isn't that the whole point? Part of the trade? That you'd replace your energy usage and make it worth their while? Kenna hadn't said any of that. Tree had been keeping him updated on our progress. I cleared my throat. Having access to the energy we produced was the whole point, but we didn't ever tell them they could have your system for carbon reuptake. What if we could use the technology without them getting access to the details? I paused, but when he didn't respond, I continued. They know it exists. That isn't a secret and probably hasn't been for some time. The principal crossed his arms over his chest. What if we are not only worried about them? I smiled, expecting this. It wasn't just the communities he didn't trust. It was us, too. We were from the communities. We had family there, and it made sense that he'd be concerned. How deeply were we committed? Would we keep our word if the situation changed and other options became more attractive? This is your treasure. I drew a deep breath and settled my nerves. It's massive. World-altering technology. I don't think I'd trust me with it, and definitely not her. I pointed to Kenna. It was supposed to be a joke, but her clenched jaw told me she didn't find it funny. So, what are you proposing? That you come with us. Kenna blinked, and the principal's eyes widened. You're not here in San Francisco now, which means the Vivientes are doing fine without you. I hurried on, not giving him the chance to interrupt. What's more important than securing resources for this and other technologies? Even if our experiment fails, you'll still have whatever you can glean during this time, which, I'm guessing, would be more than what you could get on your own. If you could secure the carbon reuptake, you'd have lost nothing. The principal scratched his chin. Would it be possible? To keep it contained? I asked. Absolutely. Kenna jumped in. If only Vivientes worked on it. I assume you trust your own people. They could build it. Do everything, I explained. Even run the power grid if you want. Where would this be located? He asked. I looked to Kenna. We hadn't discussed this. Outside of P3, it would have to be, she mused. We'll have to move the reels there. Alex stiffened next to me, and I met his eyes. He nodded slowly. 
I'd known this would be the end result, but had he made the connection yet? My stomach flipped uncomfortably. I hated that he hated this part of it. I wished there was an easier way, that we could somehow bring P3 to them. Though that would probably be worse. Really, I wanted to snap my fingers and make the world different so they could live on without having to adjust. We would need to go with you. Live in the communities. The principal rehearsed slowly. You'd sacrifice for nine months to gain the resources you need. I emphasized the word need because we needed them to say yes. We needed them to help make all of this possible. Otherwise, we'd be in breach of our agreement. Without carbon reuptake, there weren't enough solar panels in the world and not enough in the transports out front to make up the difference. The reels, without even realizing it yet, were relying on us. But we were relying on the Vivientes. Part 3. Mila. April 26th through April 30th, 2161. Chapter 10. I groaned. Something solid jabbed into my lower back. I lifted my arms, but they didn't budge, and panic fluttered in my chest. My eyes flew open, which didn't help the situation. The room around me was oppressively dark, and if it hadn't been for the cold floor beneath my hip, I wouldn't have known which direction was down and which was up. I clenched my core muscles and gingerly lifted myself up to sitting. As I shifted forward, I realized the objects pressing painfully into my spine were my own bound hands, clamped tightly to the wall behind me. I remembered the last time I'd been in this position and rolled to my knees, then slid my wrists upward. They slipped easily. Were we in the same room, held by magnetic cuffs like we'd been before? I scrambled to my feet and desperately stretched my legs, then longed to do the same for my aching shoulders. Allowing my arms to hang slack helped a little. Mila? A voice croaked from somewhere in the room. I'm here. My eyes strained to see in the pitch black. Zane? Yeah, it's me. He coughed, then scuffled against the floor like I had moments before. Where are we? My best guess? P7. If not Bryn's den, then something similar. Zane groaned as he stood. Perfect. Is anyone else here? I knew he wouldn't have an answer for me. Hello? I projected my voice. No answer. If Darius or Sloane were here, they weren't conscious. At least not yet. Suddenly, a light flicked on, and I reeled back in pain as I squeezed my eyes shut. You made it. A sickly sweet voice echoed through the room and I shuddered. P7 it was. Bryn, Zane growled. Metal clinked and rattled as he strained against his cuffs. Bryn chuckled. I'm so glad you could come back and join us. I dared open my eyes a slit. Maybe he was a dream? This could all be a dream, right? I opened them a bit further and my stomach sank. Bryn stood right there in front of us. Did you have fun while you were away? Zane didn't answer, and I wasn't going to give him the satisfaction of a response. Instead, I clenched my fists and tried to clear the tears forming in my eyes because of the bright lights. The last thing I wanted was for Bryn to think he'd evoked any sort of emotional reaction out of me. I hoped by bringing you here you'd be reminded of what the rules are in P7. He tapped a console he held in his hands. Not like that really helped last time. The restraints snapped open, and our arms dropped free. I sighed at the relief of holding my arms straight, then tentatively touched the red, irritated skin around my wrists. Bryn watched as we gathered ourselves. Can we have a heart-to-heart? -heart? He ignored our silence and continued. I never had any intention of holding you captive here in P7. My eyes narrowed. Then why restrain us in the first place? Ah, she talks. He sneered and blood rushed to my cheeks. Zane stepped forward to stand between us. Bryn clicked his tongue. I said, I never had any intention of holding you, but there were some members of your party who had no intention of having a discussion with me. I was left with no choice. What discussion did you want to have, exactly? Zane asked flippantly, and I watched Bryn's face for a reaction. He didn't give one. 
I wanted to talk about what I've learned so far in my experiments, discuss how we could partner in our efforts to make the communities a better place instead of always fighting with each other. The coalition fought against you because you're not trying to make the communities a better place, I spit. You're using people for, I don't know, for your own benefit. What benefit is that exactly? Bryn asked. You know the world is healing, but you don't want to share resources with others. You're using people for code and innovation. I repeated the sentiment I'd heard frequently when we were with the coalition. The idea that Bryn was trying to fulfill ethical obligations with the council while still ultimately getting what he wanted. The power to choose who got to live in this new world and who didn't. Bryn nodded thoughtfully. Perhaps. Yes, I could see that argument making sense to some. If he didn't stop talking to us in such a patronizing tone, I was going to have a hard time not slamming something into his face. Or maybe I'm not interested in this healing world at all. I kept my face blank. He was messing with us, trying to distract us so that he could... Do what, exactly? We still had no idea why we were here alive and unlinked or what Bryn wanted from us. Where are our friends? I asked finally. Who? Sloan and Darius? The names rolled off his tongue and I flinched. How would he know that? Unless they told him. They're working on a project. You'll be able to see it in a few days, but for now, you should probably get some rest. I nearly laughed out loud. If he thought I'd be capable of resting in this sterile, cold room, he was kidding himself. I'd like you to come back at some point, he continued. If you want to know more about the project I'm working on with your friends, of course. But if you'd prefer not to, I understand. Bryn gave a slight nod, then turned on his heel and stalked out the door at the front of the room. The light stayed on, but I couldn't find their source. I looked at Zane in confusion. We were unrestrained. As far as I could tell, that door Bryn had walked through was still slightly open. What is he playing at? Zane stole the words right out of my mouth. I took a hesitant step forward, but froze. What was waiting for us outside that door? What would happen if we chose to follow him out? We're free to go, I murmured as I rehearsed how we'd left this room before. We'd made a right, down the hallway, but then the turns were fuzzy. Had we turned left, to enter the waiting room with Case? Oh, Case, we didn't know where he was either. I don't think anything is free here, Zane muttered. We may as well get this over with and see what's on the other side of that door. I agree. I reached for his hand. Together we crept forward until we reached the door. Zane put out a hand. I braced myself. I didn't know what I expected to see, but reality didn't live up to my imagination. We peeked out into the brightly lit hallway. The walls were white and sterile, just as I remembered. Now that we weren't being led along by force, I noticed the floors were a pale gray, freckled with dots of black and blue. It was surprisingly pretty. Zane lumbered forward and I followed. No alarm sounded, no lights flashed. We walked down the hall and took the last door on the left. This looked familiar. I held my breath and stepped into the stairwell and stayed as close to Zane as possible without kicking him in the back of the leg. The sound of our feet on the metal stairs echoed off the walls around us, and my heart raced. Was Bryn going to let us walk out of here a second time? Why even bring us back to B7 if he was going to let us go? Zane, I pulled up before we reached the bottom landing. What about Sloane and Darius? I flashed back to Nat and Simeon and shivered. We couldn't leave anyone here. Not again. Something flickered across his expression. Can we figure out where we are and what's going on first? Then decide what our next step is? My face fell, and Zane climbed back up the steps to stand next to me. He softened. I promise we won't leave them, but I want to make sure you're safe first. He squeezed my hand. Whatever waited for us outside that door, it had to be better than what we'd just left. Or been allowed to leave? My head spun with confusion as Zane reached for the handle and opened the door. Unlike the hallway, P7 looked very much not the same as I remembered it. Mostly because last time we were running in terror for our lives. It turned out, 
Details of my surroundings were not what my brain had latched onto in that moment. I gripped Zane's arm and fought the urge to run and hide. What were we doing here? Anyone here could see us and report. I scanned the street. We were so exposed it made me queasy. Bryn already knows we're here. What would they report? His words were meant to bring me comfort, but they had the opposite effect. If I knew anything about Bryn, none of this was what it seemed. Where should we go? We walked forward and weaved around oblivious P7 community members dressed in gray. Zane scowled and pulled his arm away from me roughly. Do I know you? He inspected my face and blinked rapidly. Ha ha. I put a hand on my hip. Not funny, Zane. We're already in enough trouble without you pretending. I'm not. Joking. His eyes were deadly serious. Who are you? And why are we here? Chapter 11 I gaped at him and waited for the corners of his mouth to lift or to see a twinkle in his eye, anything that would let me know he was messing with me. It didn't come. My jaw hung slack as I attempted to process what was happening. I need to go. Zane shook his head and glanced from side to side. Something was very, very wrong here. He turned and bolted. Where? I had no idea, but I wasn't going to let him go without me. Zane! I called out, my mouth finally working. He didn't turn down the side street, and I had no choice but to chase after him. I pumped my legs to keep up. Zane was faster than I gave him credit for. After carrying him up and down a mountain, I wouldn't have thought it possible that he could pick up this much speed, but I was running as fast as I could and wasn't gaining. My lungs were on fire. Zane! I shouted again. What was happening? Why had it suddenly seemed like he'd forgotten who I was? Had he forgotten who I was? That didn't seem possible. It couldn't be. Maybe he'd hit his head when they took us in from the transport. What had happened after the transport? I gulped in a breath and thought back to that moment. What had happened after we'd gotten into the transport with Darius and Sloane? Case wasn't driving, that much I knew. I'd talked with Zane and Darius. Someone scolded us. But after that, I was drawing a blank. Zane finally slowed as we approached the end of a row of gray square houses. He whirled and glared at me accusatorily. Why are you following me? Because, I gasped for breath. Because I love you. He blinked in confusion. You what? My thoughts began to swim, so I crouched and hung my head between my knees. Love you. I couldn't breathe. Why was it so hard to breathe? That's not possible. Zane shook his head. I've never met you before in my life. His words seared into my chest and sucked any remaining breath out of my lungs. I coughed. He cleared his throat. I'm sorry. I need to go. Go where? I shouted as I lifted my head. Where are you going to go, Zane? What was happening? Why was he acting this way? I should grab him by the shoulders and shake. Force him to stop whatever charade this was. I... He turned his head, disoriented. I'm going home. What home? I motioned around us. The Unreals either hadn't noticed our disembodied voices or they were extremely good at pretending. They walked around us with blank faces. This isn't our home. Zane's brow furrowed deeper, and I panicked at the vacant look in his eyes. I closed the distance between us and threw my arms around his neck so I could kiss him, remind him who I was and who we were together. But he stiffened and pulled back. What are you doing? I dropped my arms and stepped away as pressure built behind my eyes. I clamped my arms over my midsection. Listen. He dropped the edge from his voice. I'm sorry if I hurt you. I don't know who you are. I nodded as tears filled my eyes. I swiped at them and tried to keep them from falling down my cheeks. The pain of Zane's rejection expanded and spread through my entire body. It was all I could do to stand straight and attempt to hold myself together. Then, there was heat. A strange warmth crept across my skin, and I turned to find the source. 
Next to the building we'd just come out of stood a gargantuan cylindrical tube that stretched from the dirt into the sky. It glowed red, the heat from its surface inviting and strangely comforting. How had I not noticed how chilled I was? I turned and walked toward it. It pulsed and hummed pleasantly as I approached. I briefly considered inviting Zane to go with me before I remembered he didn't have any clue who I was. I snuck a glance over my shoulder and found him watching me, his arms folded across his chest and his face a mask of ambivalence. That lit a fire in me. How could he stand there and stare at me walking away from him, like he couldn't care less that I was going in the opposite direction? Without him? I marched faster toward the light, more resolved with every step. I was going to see what that light was, and I was going to do it without him. The light swelled and enveloped me with warmth. I couldn't pull my eyes away. The brilliant color flowed and undulated within the tube. Whatever this place was, I needed to see it. More than that, I needed to be a part of it. The warm glow increased as a portal appeared at the base of the cylinder, and heat rushed out and rolled over me. I sighed and closed my eyes to revel in the cozy comfort. Zane didn't remember me, which meant there was nothing here for me anymore. Sure, I was free. But what did it matter if he wasn't with me? The others were non-existent. We had no idea if their plan had worked. And if it didn't, they wouldn't be hanging around waiting for me either. Besides, this... This felt right. The red glowing light tugged me forward into a promised warm embrace. This is where I should have been all along. I resumed my walk toward the tube with a smile of gratitude. The heat radiated against my skin. Almost there. I could nearly reach out and touch it. Sweat prickled the skin around my hairline. Was it too much? The warmth had felt so good moments before, but as I approached the doorway... The heat became overwhelming. My body screamed at me to stop, that I'd burn up if I got any closer. But I had to get inside the tube. I paused with both voices warring with each other. The pull forward was intense, and I stumbled. Just let go. I needed to quit fighting and allow the light to envelop me fully. I took another step, but the heat was too intense. I dropped to my hands and knees and scrambled back, stopping in the same spot I had moments before. Dread filled my chest as sweat dripped down my back. Mila? I turned toward the voice. Sloan stood just inside the entrance at the base of the tube. Mila, come on! She smiled brightly and waved me forward. Why was she so happy? The last time I'd seen her, she'd been miserable, stony, cold refusing to talk to anyone on the transport. I couldn't blame her. If I'd been the one to lose Zane? My heart sank. Zane. I looked over my shoulder and spotted him walking aimlessly around the square. He didn't remember me. But was I going to leave him? Confused and alone? Bryn had let us go with zero explanation. We knew something was odd about that. Maybe walking out of the building did something to him, snapped or triggered something in his brain. Mila! Sloan called again, and I briefly glanced at her before fully turning back and fighting against the pull to walk back to Zane. The warmth and light were incredibly tempting, but he'd never leave without me, and I couldn't abandon him. Mila! Sloan's voice was urgent. The pull toward the light dissipated as I dragged myself further away from its warm glow. My eyes locked on Zane, and I stood, then forced myself into a jog. I called his name and he whipped toward me. Why are you still here? I choked a laugh. I can't leave without you. But I don't know who you are. I know, I nodded. I'm not going to do anything weird, I promise. But it seems like you aren't sure who anyone is. Zane blinked. Maybe you don't know where you are either? I know where I am, he muttered. I just can't seem to figure out. He trailed off as he scanned the town, and fear flickered across his expression. It's okay. I resisted the urge to reach out and comfort him. I'll help. Searing light flashed in my field of vision and momentarily blinded me. I doubled over and pressed my hands over my eyes, 
Then, as quickly as it had come, it disappeared. I dropped my arms, stood straight, and opened my eyes. There was a large boy in front of me, and I jumped. Excuse me, I muttered as I shuffled back a few steps. He observed me curiously, his dark brown eyes staring into mine as he reached up and ran a hand through his long, dark hair. Why was he just standing there? Why did it look like he was waiting for me to say something? I'm sorry, I shook my head. But who are you? Chapter 12 The boy scoffed. You said you knew me. You called me Zane. His brows pulled together in confusion. He was tall, at least two heads taller than I was, and his body was muscular and broad. I said I knew you? I asked skeptically. My heart sped as I scanned the area and attempted to gain my bearings. Gray buildings stood on either side of us with a wide path between them. A woman walked past without acknowledging us. She wore dull, simple clothing, and her hair was pulled into a bun at the base of her neck. She was young, about my age or slightly older. I winced at this thought. How old was I? I held out my arms, inspected them, and then took stock of the clothes I was wearing. My pants were a dark fabric, torn along the bottom with dust streaks in too many places to count. My hands trembled. Zane? My voice caught. I don't even know who I am. Panic filled my body from head to toe. How could I have forgotten who I was? Okay. Zane nodded. Okay. My legs buckled. I started to crumple to the earth, but Zane reached out and grabbed my arms to hold me upright. His hands were strong and stable. A minute ago, you told me some things. He cleared his throat. He was obviously uncomfortable touching me, and I didn't blame him. A perfect stranger, mentally breaking down in front of you? Who wouldn't feel awkward in that situation? What did I tell you? I was desperate for any shred of information. Something flickered across Zane's face. It wasn't anything that would give us answers. He loosened his grip on my arms as I stabilized. Us? He closed his eyes, as if trying to focus on some internal thought that was just out of reach. I don't remember who I am either. Or why we're here. I took this in. Not sure whether this was good or terrible news. On one hand, at least we were in this together. On the other... Neither of us had any idea where to start. I nodded my head. Right. We need to get help. Get help? The boy asked skeptically. From whom? I scanned the open space. From them. I strode forward to intercept a man shuffling past with a young boy in tow. Excuse me, I called. I'm wondering... The man startled, hugged the boy to his side, and hustled in the opposite direction. I scowled after them. My clothes weren't in good condition, but did I really look scary enough for a grown man to be afraid of me? I tried again, but this time the woman I approached yelped and bolted forward, leaving me alone in front of the market. Hello. A voice sounded behind me and I spun. A clean-cut man, dressed in a crisp white shirt that perfectly accented his dark features, stood on the street. Hi. I breathed a sigh of relief. Finally, someone who would talk to us. Be careful. Zane crossed the road to stand next to me. Even though I had no clue who this boy was, it was comforting to have him close. I nodded. We... Could I say we were a we at this point? We were wondering if you could tell us where we are right now? The man smiled. Of course. You're in a transition zone. I cocked my head to the side. A transition zone? I scrutinized his face as he smiled. The left side of his mouth lifted more than his right, and the smile didn't reach his eyes. Right. He chuckled. It's normal to experience some cognitive delays before your final destination. Final destination? Zane asked. The man pointed over my shoulder. Ahead of us stood a tall cylindrical tube that stretched high into the sky. I couldn't see the top of it. What is that? 
It looked familiar, and I wanted to move closer. That's your destination, the man answered simply. Zane and I stared at the glowing portal. Something about it drew me in. Why are we here? I asked. Because you want to move forward. I jumped. How had he moved next to me without me noticing? The man smiled gently. You've been waiting for years for this next step in your development. It's finally here. Where do we go? Once we enter, there. Zane pointed at the tube. His voice was low, calming even, and I wanted to hear more of it. You'll move to the next level, the man explained. You'll have new opportunities to grow with your friends and family. My heart swelled at this. I had friends? A family? Why don't we remember them? The man grinned. Because you're experiencing cognitive delays. Right. Before our final destination, I repeated. He'd already told us that. I stared at the portal. The colors shimmered. It seemed strange that I couldn't remember anything before this. Not how I got here or who I'd be excited to see in the next place. Why did we need to transition? I had a million questions, but the ones I'd already asked weren't getting us anywhere. Can we wait until the cognitive delay has passed? The man looked at me quizzically. It will pass as soon as you enter. I just... I trailed off, not sure how to say what I was thinking without being rude. I didn't want to go in there without knowing why I was here. It felt wrong to make a decision with no clue what had led up to it. Was I here because I wanted to be? Had I known I wouldn't remember? I'm with her. Zane folded his arms over his chest. I think we should wait. Until the delay has passed. Then we'll go into the creepy tube thing. The man's smile slowly faded as he looked between the two of us. We don't have time for this. Your family is waiting for you. A pang of guilt hit my stomach. I didn't want to make my family wait, but something about this was off. It should be fast, right? We'll wait for our memory to start working, and then we'll go right in. I promise. Zane nodded his agreement. Grateful for the moral support, I turned back to the man, but he was gone. I searched the area, wondering if he'd started walking back to one of the buildings, but I couldn't find him anywhere. I couldn't find anyone. The entire area was vacant, and I shivered. What now? I breathed. Zane shrugged. We wait, I guess. The sun faded on the horizon, and a chill crept over my skin. I rubbed my hands on my arms for warmth. Maybe we should find shelter? I don't know how long this is going to take. I glanced again at the portal in front of us. We could walk for less than a couple of minutes and be there. We wouldn't have to figure anything else out or navigate this strange reality. It was tempting. Right. Maybe in there? Zane pointed to the taller building behind us on our left. It was long and had windows in four different rows stacked from the ground up. I shrugged. It seemed like as good an option as any. We started forward, but before we could reach the door, a woman with a slight build and angular features barreled down the path. Careful, Zane muttered as we jumped out of the way. The woman fought for breath and stopped dead in her tracks, then flicked away the dark swoop of hair that fell over her eyes. The woman fought for breath and stopped dead in her tracks, then flicked away the dark swoop of hair that fell over her eyes. You talk? Zane scoffed. Yes. No, right, of course. The woman brushed dirt off her dark slacks. It's just that nobody else has talked to me. I tried with a few other people, asked them some questions, and nobody would answer. I sniffed. I tried talking to someone and they got scared, just ran away. The woman nodded excitedly. Either that or they ignore you completely. Who are you? Zane asked. Her nostrils flared as she backed up a step. Who are you? I'm Zane. Her brows pulled together. Where are you from? That's a harder one. I don't know. We're experiencing a mental delay, I explained. Someone told us it was normal. The woman barked a laugh. This is not normal. Can you remember anything? Her eyes flashed. 
Sorry, I thought... I wondered if... I shook my head. If maybe you were like us. The woman opened her mouth to speak, but before any words formed, a deafening, high-pitched ringing shattered the still air around us. I clapped my hands over my ears, but it didn't help. The shrill scream pierced through my hands and rattled my brain. In desperation, I squeezed my eyes closed and gritted my teeth. Then all three of us dropped to our knees. Chapter 13 My teeth and bones vibrated so violently, I thought they might crumble into dust. Please stop, I begged internally. Stop! I repeated the command over and over inside my head until finally, just as suddenly as it started, the sound disappeared. The relief was instantaneous and acute. It brought tears to my eyes. I sucked in a deep breath and opened my eyes to search for the others. They were still on the ground, curled into balls and covered in sweat and dirt. I rushed to Zane's side first. Hey! I shook his shoulder, but he didn't respond. His face was still scrunched in agony. Hey! I called louder as I leaned down close to his ear. Tell it to stop! Just tell it to stop! I screamed the words and tugged at the hand clamped to his ear without any luck. Every muscle in his impressively large body was tensed. There was no way I was going to overpower him. I jumped up and ran to the woman. With effort, I was able to peel her right hand off her ear to give enough of a gap to yell my instructions. Tell the noise to stop! I waited a few seconds, then repeated my sentence with emphasis on the word stop. I crossed my fingers and hoped something was getting through. The man from earlier appeared in front of me, his shirt still impeccably white. They won't be able to free themselves. His face drew into a worried frown. You must get to the portal. That's the only place you can help them, Mila. Mila? That was my name. As that word left his lips, images and stories began to flood into my brain. My whole body warmed from the inside out as light seemed to infuse into every inch of me. I had a family. I had a brother. I was trying to get to them but couldn't because of... I gasped, and my eyes locked onto the man in front of me. You... My mouth dried up and my heart raced. You're the reason we're here. Of course I'm the reason you're here. The man smiled widely. I'm here to help you transition. No. I shook my head. I remember now. You're Bryn Lee. You're the one who ordered our capture, who pretended to be setting us free, but... I glanced down at Zane and... I knew her. Sloane. This was Sloane. We'd ridden on her boat across the ocean and landed in a real settlement. I spun in a circle. The sky was nearly dark now, the glow barely visible on the horizon. Something was wrong. Even though I'd never seen P7 in daylight hours, this wasn't how I remembered it. There weren't enough houses, enough buildings. It was like it was only half created, half remembered. This isn't real. I whispered under my breath. I turned to face Bryn. What did you do to us? His nostrils flared. I assure you this is very real, especially to those two. My stomach flipped as I watched them writhe in pain in the dirt. The only way you get out of here intact is by going through the portal. His voice shook the ground under my feet, and I stumbled back. You can save them, Mila. You can... No! I screamed. I needed him to stop talking so I could think. If this wasn't real, then we had to be linked. I didn't understand what that meant besides what Channel had described. Cerebralink was embedded in our brain. It interacted with our consciousness. It learned from what we thought and felt. I hadn't ever had the chance to talk with Channel, but she was with Alec, which meant she'd found a way to get out. Somehow. That meant we could, too. I want you to leave. I focused all my energy on Bryn. I imagined him fading into nothingness, bursting into flames, melting into a puddle. I told it to happen with as much intensity as when I'd commanded the sound to stop ringing. Bryn chuckled. 
it doesn't work that way. But you're smarter than I gave you credit for. Obviously, this isn't going to be as easy as I thought with you. He glanced down at my friends, still curled in the dust. I think I'll have more luck if... Don't. I gritted my teeth. Make it stop ringing. Ah, Bryn smiled. Is that what you want? I clenched my jaw and refused to answer him. I'll make it stop, Mila, for a few moments. He walked closer and rubbed his chin as if considering his next words carefully. But after that, it comes back at double the intensity. My heart pounded against my ribcage. That was impossible. My head felt like it had been about to explode the first time. Double the intensity would kill them. You can talk to your friends and make a plan. If any of you go to the portal, the ringing stops, okay? He sneered. You can make it all go away. He gave me one last pitying glance before fading into the background. Zane groaned behind me and I rushed to kneel next to him. Are you okay? I remembered how I'd found him splayed on the ground after we'd jumped out of the vehicle by the church. Without thinking, I reached under his shirt to feel for his bandage. It wasn't there. I lifted my face to find him staring at me. I, I'm sorry. I pulled my hand from his skin. I, you were injured there, and I was checking. I remember. He lifted a hand and traced the edge of my jaw. You do? I whispered, as relief, frustration, and grief swirled together and rushed through me in a wave. Sloane coughed next to us, her body spasming as she pulled herself off the ground. What was that? I gripped Zane's hand as he sat up. There's something I have to tell you both and we don't have much time. Sloane turned to face me, and Zane reached back to massage the muscles in his neck as he listened attentively. How could I tell them this? I didn't know what Bryn's information meant for us or whether... Get on with it! Sloane barked, then winced and pressed a hand to her temple. Right. I swallowed hard. We're linked! I spit it out, not buffering the information at all. Sloane blinked. Linked? I nodded. They integrated us? Zane asked, and I nodded again. Channel talked about it, remember? Cerebralink. Everything is happening in our minds. It's not real. A few minutes ago, I was able to make the sound stop by telling it to stop. We have control here, and... Control? Sloane asked. There's an implant in our brain that anyone out there could tell what to do. And you're telling me we're in control? No, I mean, yes, we do have some control. Blood rushed in my ears and my throat felt more parched than when we were in the desert. We don't have time. He's going to do it again. Do what again? Zane asked. The sound! The thing that just happened, making us feel pain! I stumbled over my words, trying to make him understand. He said the only way that we could make it stop was to go into the portal. But if Bryn wants us to go in that portal, that's the last thing we should do. What is that thing anyway? Sloane asked. She hunched with exhaustion, her body depleted. I have no idea. I got a hollow feeling in my gut as I stared at the light. It glowed in the darkness, welcoming us. But I can't watch you do that again. You watched us? Zane asked. I nodded. I felt it too, but then, I don't know. Somehow I was able to make it stop. How? Sloane asked. I don't know, I shrugged. I kept insisting it stop, and then it did. Channel talked about this, Zane mused. How Cerebralink integrated with your brain to build all the senses. She said it better. Sloane nodded. It's a full sensory integration. We should be able to control at least some aspects of it. She shook her head, laughing to herself. What's so funny? I asked. Nothing, she groaned. It's just that Talia was very clear about how Cerebralink was being used. My brow furrowed. What did she say? Sloane started laughing in earnest. It's this. She motioned with her arms at the two of us. You aren't really here. This is my mind making it up. Talia told me nobody was actually linked together. They were all in their own closed system. 
which is hysterical because I'm explaining this to my own brain. She clasped her stomach, doubled over, and laughed so hard she couldn't speak. Was it possible that I was a figment of her imagination? I looked down at my hands and the rest of my body. It felt real. I felt real. Plus, why would Bryn have talked to me when Sloane was incapacitated? Something wasn't adding up. I don't know what Talia told you, Sloan, but I'm real. I mean, as real as I can be in this weird place. Sloan wiped a tear from her cheek and wheezed. <laughs> That's what the fake version of you would say to me right now. I started to argue with her, but then realized there was no point. It didn't matter if she believed me or not. It didn't matter if I believed me or not. I had no idea when Bryn was going to start this whole scene all over again, but I wasn't ready to find out. We have to figure out what we're going to do. Maybe you two can find a way to shut it down like I did. Or maybe we should just go into the portal. Zane peered warily over my shoulder. No way. I vehemently shook my head. You said it yourself, Zane argued. We have no idea what that thing is. Why are you so sure it's a bad thing? Now I was beginning to wonder if Zane was a figment of my imagination. Are you serious? Bryn is the one telling us to go in there. You think he has our best interest at heart? No, but maybe in there we'd be able to figure out a better solution. I'd rather suffer here than do anything Bryn wants me to do. I crossed my arms over my chest. The corner of Zane's mouth lifted slightly as he inspected my face. Whatever happens next, you need to stay focused. Find a way to take control, whatever it takes. Sloan wiped the tears from her cheeks and nodded. Okay, Mila. Her voice was overly sober, which meant she had to be kidding. Whatever you say. If this was being made up in my own brain, I was both disturbed and impressed with myself. Stay in control, I repeated sternly, and Sloan rolled her eyes. The tips of my toes tingled, and I wiggled them. I'd been sitting in the same position for a long time, so I stretched out my legs. The tingling didn't stop. It slowly crept up my feet, the fuzzy sensation strengthening by the second. Are your... I started, but my breath caught in my throat. It felt like tiny needles were stabbing into my muscles, thousands of them, prickling at first, but then stabbing harder and deeper. I jumped up and slapped at my skin to make the sensation stop. It spread through my ankles and lower legs. My heart began to race as panic exploded in my chest. It wasn't stopping. I couldn't make it stop. A strangled sob escaped my lips as I looked up to see every muscle in Zane's body so tense he was shaking. Out of the three of us, Sloane was the first to start screaming. Chapter 14 no! I roared inside my head and tried to catch my breath long enough to make demands the way I had the first time. The pain was all-encompassing. It felt like every part of my body was being pierced and branded all at the same time. I forced my eyes open, barely able to visualize anything over the bursts of light and pressure in my head. Zane wasn't in front of me anymore, and I searched for him. Nothing. Sloane was next to me on the ground, her mouth still wide open as she thrashed. Stay in control, I gasped, mostly for myself. I crawled forward, my fingers digging into the dirt as I forced my arms and legs to move. Where was he? I fell onto my face, my muscles so tense and exhausted that they couldn't hold me upright. With my cheek against the dirt, I finally caught a glimpse of Zane's dark hair. No! This time I called out loud through gritted teeth. Zane used every ounce of strength he had to pull himself along the ground toward the portal. No, I croaked, trying to get his attention. The corners of my vision began to cloud. I needed to tell him to stop. I needed him to stop. Our current agony wouldn't be anything compared to what Bryn had waiting for us through that tube of light. Tears rolled freely down my cheeks as I stretched my hand forward. My muscles strained so intensely that my fingers cramped into claws. I opened my mouth to try calling out again, but my words wouldn't form. Zane. I thought his name, desperately trying to get it to leave my lips. 
don't do this. Bryn was never going to stop. If we followed him now, what would he ask us to do next? We had to find a way to escape this on our own. Think. The darkness crept closer and I could barely make out Zane's figure in the distance, only meters from the entrance. Think. My mind reeled, spinning out of control, unable to make sense of anything. My thoughts were slippery, yanked from my grasp repeatedly as my mind begged for release from the pain. I forced my eyes open. Zane crawled farther, almost to the entrance. I needed to tell him. With all the energy I had left, I envisioned myself next to him. I visualized placing my hands on his shoulders and sucking whatever this was from his body. We'd put our minds together and burst through to wherever Bryn was playing his sick game at our expense. Suddenly, I felt my mind lift. Something broke, and I pulled away from the stinging pain, floated above it. New life exploded through me with such force, I wasn't sure if I was alive or dead. I needed to tell Zane. I zoomed forward, no longer limited by my crippled muscles and spiraling thoughts. Heat enveloped me, but my body wasn't there to feel it. Not fully. The temperature rose each second, but unlike standing next to the portal before, now I could handle it. I knew what I needed to do, and I wasn't going to stop until I got there. Zane panted on the ground, clawing his way forward, and I slammed into him. I didn't wait to talk or prepare him gently. I simply flew forward and reached for him. I rolled my body around his like he'd done for me in the brush. I braced myself for a collision, for my breath to be knocked out of me as I landed against his broad shoulders. But it never came. Instead, the heat enveloped me and turned me to dust as I surged into Zane, through his skin and muscles and into his very core. I was dead. I had to be dead. I tried to panic, but I had no heart to pump, no blood to rush in my ears, no sweat to form on my forehead. Stop, I commanded as light pulsed in streams around me, whatever I was now. Silvery strands danced in the darkness, moving in all directions at speeds I could both barely comprehend and fully interpret at the same time. Stop, I repeated with calm intensity, and this time, the world listened. Part 4. Channel April 30th through May 3rd, 2161. Chapter 15 I sat on the ground propped against the side of the building because sitting out by the transports was anything but peaceful. Even though it was the middle of the night, children weren't sleeping like they normally would be. I couldn't blame them. Nothing about this situation was relaxing enough to allow for closed eyes and rest. What are you thinking about? Alec rested his hands on his knees as he sat down next to me. I looked past him and waited for Ave to join us. He didn't. Nothing, I sighed. Everything? If the Vivientes don't agree to go with us, I don't know what we're going to do. I know. Alec bit his lower lip, and the world seemed to slow as I watched his profile. I'd been so wrapped up in solving our problems, I hadn't taken the time to stop and see him. If I was being honest with myself, I'd kind of been avoiding it. Since that moment after we'd reached our agreement with the council, after I saw the look on his face, it was easier to look elsewhere than to see that disappointment again. Even if they come, this is going to be hard, maybe impossible. Alec looked down at his hands, a stillness in his expression. I cleared my throat. I didn't understand or maybe didn't want to understand how much of a shift this would be for people, for reals. I wanted to believe this would be a win for all of us. Ever since I'd met the group from Southwest Territory, they'd talked about how things were bad enough back home to make them want to leave and seek help. It had been easy to convince myself that this was something helpful. The truth was, even though it could be helpful in the long run, it was going to hurt first, in more ways than one. They might not go for this. Alec's voice was low. I've gone over the moment a million times in my head. What moment? He sighed. 
the one where I tell my mom and dad that we have to leave our home and join the communities. Not, I know. He held up a hand. I know it's not the communities. But they don't understand that. I took this in. To them, Kenna and I would look exactly like everything they'd despised. Everything that had taken so much away. We'll have to show them. Prove to them that we're on the same team. Alec fiddled with a loose string on the edge of his pants. I'm on your team, Alec. You know that, right? I know that. He didn't look up. Alec. I know it, he repeated, tearing the string and finally meeting my eyes. But I don't think either of us knows where this is headed. It's not like we see the end point. I... I paused and formed my words carefully. I know what I want the end point to be. Me too. I put a hand on his knee. He reached out and wrapped his arm around my shoulder and I leaned in. I wished I could close my eyes and stop thinking about all of it. About whether the Vivientes would choose to help us with their mission. About whether the Reels would come willingly to P3 or how we'd provide for everyone even if they did. I wanted to forget the warning Straya had given us about Bryn, and the fact that we still had no idea whether Bryn, Zane, Nat, Pash, and Vera were safe. The friends we'd left behind were starting to add up, and every time I thought about that, I died a little inside. There was nowhere I could go to escape the million questions and unknowns racing through my mind. When I slept, they were still there, making me toss and turn, Worried I'd miss something or that I would miss something that could cost another friend their safety. I couldn't simply close my eyes to this, to any of it. Channel. Alec's voice was urgent. Look at this. I sat up, my body ready to spring into action if needed. But there wasn't any threat. Instead, Alec pointed up at the sky. I adjusted my mask so it didn't pull on the skin around my eyes, and I stared upward. My eyes widened as I followed Alec's finger, gazing into the darkness. Up, in the midst of the inky blackness I'd grown so used to, sat a hazy outline of a white crescent. A thick crescent, not just a thin sliver, but a full-bodied swoop across the sky. Is that? I couldn't finish my sentence because it was too unbelievable to say out loud. Could it be the moon? The actual moon? I've never seen it before. Alec whispered in awe. I don't think anyone has. At least not anyone I've known. I couldn't stop staring at it, the way it stayed completely still as the haze moved slowly across its surface. It doesn't make its own light, I murmured. It reflects... From the sun, Alec finished. Our only star. I couldn't decide which was more fascinating in this moment, the newfound rock hanging in the sky, or the boy I'd seen every day for the past few weeks, who suddenly looked very different to me. There you are, Kenna scolded. I looked out by the transports and couldn't find you. Without saying a word or asking why she'd come searching in the first place, I simply pointed upward. She looked, and her lips parted slightly as she caught sight of it. Wow. Incredible, isn't it? My chest warmed at the thought that we'd been able to share this beauty with someone else. If I wasn't so content with Alec's arm still draped across my shoulders, and if it hadn't been the middle of the night, I would have been racing through town yelling at everyone to look skyward. It really is, Kenna whispered. She took a few more moments to gape at the miracle in the sky before shaking her head. We need to go back in. The principal has reached a decision. My heart sped up. This was it. We wouldn't have all the answers, but at least we'd have this one. Whether good or bad, we'd at least have some data to go off. Alec pulled his arm away, but I reached up and held on to his hand. One second. We'll be right in. Kenna nodded, then spun on her heel and disappeared around the corner. What was that? Alec stared at me curiously. I thought you'd be dying to get in there and find out what's happening. I am. I drew a deep breath to keep my hands from trembling. But I wanted one more second here. I want a lot more than a second. Alec brushed his lips against my cheek before looking back up at the sky. 
I grinned and reveled in his closeness. There was something different between us. The protective bubble around our relationship was leaking air. We couldn't live in the Coalition or the Viviente's world anymore, sealed off from the brutal reality of our situation. I didn't know if we were strong enough yet, if the simple truth that we meant something to each other could carry us through the next few months, facing things I could barely begin to imagine. The haze swallowed up the strip of moonlight in the sky and plunged us back into darkness, leaving an emptiness in my chest. Alec and I stood reluctantly, and his hand slid down my back and across my waist. As he led me forward, I couldn't help but glance back, hoping I'd catch one more glimpse. The moon was still there. It continued reflecting light as it had been a few moments before, even though we couldn't witness it. No matter what happens, we'll figure it out, Alec assured me. I nodded and tore my eyes from the sky, still wishing I could see our miracle for just a moment more. Then we're agreed, Kenna said, and the principal nodded. My jaw hung open, and I quickly closed it. After we walked back inside, we were given a rundown from Tree, Sky, one of the Viviente's elders, and the principal about how our plan was risky and problematic. For ten long minutes, I sat next to Alec, Ave, and Kay, running through potential Plan Bs and coming up empty. I couldn't have been more shocked when that verbal dressing down had ended with a yes. I will send people to your site. They will be responsible for all setup of the micro-energy station. And they will also take it down at the end of the nine-month mark, the principal continued. Nobody will have access to our system, except for those appointed. Kenna nodded. I understand. You have my word that we'll do everything within our power to make sure it isn't compromised. If you have any trouble getting the resources you need, you can let us know. My eyes narrowed. How were they going to let us know? As far as I could tell, the only way the Vivientes communicated was through those strange flat discs they wore behind their ears. Kenna didn't have one of those, although whoever they decided to send us with might. But could it really cover that kind of distance? It was selfish to even think it, but I wished I could be involved in this project. I was dying to see the inner workings of their carbon reuptake system, but I was probably one of the last people they'd want to give access to, considering. Ave whispered something to Kay. He hadn't said more than a few words to me since we left the safe house. He didn't seem mad about everything with Alec, but I also wanted to give him his space. Mostly. I wanted things to go back to the way they were before. Back when we could be friends without all the complications. We have another problem we need to discuss, Kenna added hesitantly. I swallowed hard. We'd already asked for the Viviente's help in a massive way, and now we had to somehow explain why the entire coalition was sitting outside on their street. The principal raised an eyebrow. Could it have something to do with the transports parked outside of this building? Chapter 16 Wherever the principal was, he was aware of the current situation. Although, it was probably important for any leader to know if the population of their city suddenly doubled. We don't have anywhere to go. Kenna slouched, tired and defeated. We would never ask something like this if your people can stay. The principal smiled kindly. It wouldn't need to be all of them, Kenna added quickly. We'll take as many people as we can to our site in P3. I'm sorry you lost your home. His words hit me squarely in the chest. We'd gone from an intense meeting with the council to immediately making plans for next steps, then slammed with the reality that a large portion of what the coalition had built was gone. Not once had we stopped to come up for air. Kenna's voice was shaky when she spoke. Thank you. You'll build it again. Tree turned to Kenna and nodded her agreement. For now, your people can stay here. In this building. It will not be very comfortable, but at least it is shelter. Tomorrow, we can work together to find them something else. Thank you, Kenna repeated in barely a whisper. My eyelids were heavy, and my muscles ached, antsy and uncomfortable. Kenna stood. I'll bring them in. We can discuss details in the morning. 
There is one more thing we would like you to consider. The principal took a seat. I couldn't get over how realistic this projection was. I scoured the ceiling for signs of the technology they were using while trying to stave off the yawn that was itching at the back of my throat. The principal folded his arms over his chest. You've talked about how Cerebralink is an experiment of sorts. Correct, Kenna answered. Why were they bringing up Cerebralink? We've discussed this at length with our elders and are having trouble making sense of it. The principal's face was a mask of concern. What is he trying to accomplish? We don't know exactly, Kenna admitted. When I worked on Cerebralink, we never discussed the need to collect data besides that which was integral to the technology itself. We wanted to know how people reacted to it, how their brains adapted, what Bryn has been doing, the data he's been collecting. He's using it for world building. I hadn't intended to jump in, but the words poured out of my mouth. To improve the edge and its simulations in a fraction of the time it would normally take. And use less resources as a whole, Kenna added. We believe he's using this as a population control tactic. The principal nodded. We believe you are correct in your assessment. However, we feel there is something more. The data you mentioned is not consistent. There are different variables. The streams we looked at varied in groups. Which means Bryn's being methodical, Kenna finished. I noticed that too. But couldn't that be for curiosity's sake? He wants to know what would happen if? I mentally recounted all the times we'd studied scientists and inventors who stumbled into their next great discovery simply by asking that question. Not that I thought Bryn was anywhere close to someone we'd venerate in our history books, but at this rate, he was certainly going to be notable. Could be, the principal mused, but we do not think so. I didn't think so either. It was easier to believe his practices weren't for a purpose because then we didn't have to live in fear of what that purpose might be. A scientist running experiments for fun was much less worrisome than Bryn running experiments with an end goal in mind. Something to think about. Kenna stifled a yawn. Rest, Tree sighed. Fluids and rest. She winked at me and my friends, then stood up and motioned for us to follow her out into the hall. The next morning arrived too quickly. I blinked awake to the sound of a child, multiple children, crying. Their wails were partially absorbed by the walls built into the ground and didn't echo like they had in the warehouse. I rolled over and blinked. My eyes felt like they'd been sandblasted. Our group was spread throughout the building, covering every inch of floor that was available. I didn't remember any of these coalition members setting up camp next to us. After the meeting, I'd walked with my friends into the atrium and claimed a spot in the back corner behind the entrance to the room where we'd eaten lunch the other day. My stomach grumbled. Hey, I smiled. Alec's eyes were open. His troubled look sent a swoop of worry through my gut. Are you okay? I kept asking that question, and every time wanted to kick myself. Had a bad dream. He rolled to his back and rested his head on his arm. We hadn't waited to see if the Vivientes had any blankets the night before. We'd slept in our clothes on the bare floor, and my back was stiff enough to prove it. About Mila? I knew the answer before he nodded his head. Alec. I'm going to talk with Kenna. He drew a deep breath. Do you want me to come with you? Alec shook his head. He sat up and stretched his arms and legs, then stood. I'll be back in a minute. I watched him go took comfort in the gate I'd become so familiar with. I wanted him to find answers, but who knew where Kenna was in this mess? If she hadn't been able to sleep at the safe house, there was no way she'd gotten any shut-eye here. I pulled my knees to my chest and looked over only to find the space next to us empty. Ave and Kay had slept here last night, hadn't they? Now I worried my memory was playing tricks on me. I'd been so tired walking out of the meeting last night. I'd zonked out the second we were horizontal. I rested my chin on my knees and watched the movement around me. Mothers and fathers snuggled tightly with their children. Other people sprawled out, creating a tangle of limbs that others weren't yet aware they were part of. How they were still asleep with all the noise was beyond me. 
A dull pain throbbed at the base of my skull, but I ignored it. I didn't like sitting here alone. I was glad that Ave and Kay were becoming friends, but selfishly wished he still needed me. I'd gone and built a friendship with Alec and hadn't asked Ave's opinion about that. It wasn't fair to want our relationship to only move my direction. At the same time, I'd found value in being the most important person in his life. I'd only been special to Mom and to Ave. That was it. Now I'd been replaced by a fake, better version in one place and relegated to old news in the other. I clenched my jaw. I didn't need to be needed. We were different people now. Stronger. More independent. I needed to let go of who I'd been. Who I'd been to them. And embrace the person I was becoming. I looked up to find Alec waving for me to join him. He stood outside the food room and my heart leapt, hoping I was interpreting the situation correctly. What I wouldn't give for some weird vegetables right about now. Despite his gloomy expression, the corner of Alec's mouth lifted as I approached. There isn't any food yet. My face fell and he laughed. There will be soon, though. Then why did you make me get up? I groaned and my whole body drooped. Making Alec laugh made my skin tingle and I suddenly had the urge to pull goofy faces or tell a joke just to hear it again. Then I remembered why he'd left our spot on the floor in the first place. Any news? Alec shook his head. They haven't heard. My heart ached. There was nothing I could do to make this better. While I hadn't been responsible for Mila and Zane leaving, I wasn't even with them when they decided to split up. It was my fault that Alec had to leave them. He'd come for me. I couldn't help but feel responsible. So, what now? I sighed. Can we contact someone there? Someone Talia knows? They've tried. They've been working on finding Nat and Simeon, too, but it's radio silence over there. They're trying to contact them over radio waves? My jaw dropped. A laugh burst out of Alec and I jumped. No, that's just an expression. The sight of his eyes shining, the small creases around his mouth, and the almost dimple in his left cheek made my heart skip a beat. Right, I murmured distractedly. As quickly as it had come, his smile faded. He cleared his throat. It means they haven't heard anything back, from anyone. Because of that, we don't think it's safe enough to go in looking for them. You were thinking of going to P7? Of course I was. He leaned against the wall. Of course he was. He'd traveled all the way to P3 to find me, knowing nothing about what they'd run into. How could he not be considering that for his own sister? His face was conflicted. Split between Mila and his parents. Both people he loved. Both in limbo. Alec, I could go to P7. What? No. I could. The thought gained traction in my head. You could go back to Southwest Territory with Kenna and help get things started. Talk to your parents and all that. I could go with Talia. Since she knows the area, we'd be able to figure something out. Find Mila, Zane, maybe even Nat? No, Channel. Alec growled. If Mila and Zane aren't responding, it's because Bryn isn't honoring our agreement with the council, which means you wouldn't be safe there. Which means they aren't safe there. He clenched his jaw. I realize that. Then we need to do something. I can't go back to your home without you. My face blanched at the thought of walking into Southwest Territory without Alec to smooth things over. I can't let you. My dad's with them, Alec. I used this piece of information as a weapon. Based on his reaction, I knew he wasn't going to get on board with me going back only for people he cared about. Never mind the fact that I cared about them too. He needed to think I was acting in my own self-interest as well as his, which didn't have to be true to be convincing. Of course, I wanted to see my dad again, but I'd barely found out he wasn't dead. And the questions revolving around that revelation were terrifying. I both wanted and didn't want to come face to face with him and whatever answers he held. Staying with Alec was safer. But staying with Alec while his sister was in trouble wasn't an option. I'll go talk to Kenna. I strode past him before my face could betray the fear that welled up inside of me. Alec grabbed my hand and yanked me back to stand next to him. I can't let you do this. His words were sincere, but the look in his eyes told me everything I needed to know. He didn't want me to go.
but he also hoped I would. I know. I lifted onto my tiptoes and brushed my lips across his cheek, then slipped my hand from his and walked quickly down the hall. Chapter 17 Tree handed me the thin silver disc. This transmag will be your only reliable form of communication. Reliable? I asked skeptically as I ran my finger over the smooth metal. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean you can't count on it. She raised an eyebrow. I looked up at Talia hopefully. She shook her head. I can't be the one to wear it. I don't understand the language. I sighed. Explain it to me one more time. Tree smiled. It's transcranial magnetic stimulation. When you place this properly, the device will create electric signals that can be interpreted by your brain. By me, I translated. At first by you, yes. You'll need to translate, Tree explained. But eventually, you won't have to take that step. It will look like flashing lights, I asked. If you'd put it on, I would show you. I ignored her dig. I couldn't put it off forever, but I wanted a few more details before I took the leap. It's in Colubrid? Tree nodded. That is the coding language, yes. I'd worked in Colubrid all my life, so at least there was that. So, the lights flash, and I interpret those. Translate them into words? Initially, yes, but like I mentioned, right, it will become natural. She smiled and motioned for me to put it on. My heart pounded as I lifted it to my head. Here? I positioned it on my skull. My hair was a few centimeters long at this point. I worried it would get in the way until I remembered Tree had more hair than I did. Tree reached up and helped me get it into place. My eyes widened as the disc warmed and points of gentle pressure formed around its edges, as if suctioning to my bone. When she was satisfied, she took my hand in hers and placed my pointer finger on a small bump at the base of the disc. Press, she instructed, and I obeyed. Nothing happened. Each device has a number, she continued. Yours is twelve. Mine is twenty-seven. Right now it's calibrating to your energy. I nodded, pretending that made any sense. My energy? Brains functioned with two things. Chemicals and electricity. But how could this small device get enough information externally to work with that? Talia watched me curiously as Tree placed her own communication device. I braced myself for something intense. Possibly painful? Disorienting, at least. But then the light overhead seemed to flicker. My brow furrowed. Maybe it's not ready? Tree grinned, and the lights flickered again. Realization clicked. Send it again. This time I focused on the flicker. I replayed the short burst of light, followed by a longer one. Yes! I blurted. You said yes! I beamed at her. Tree clapped her hands. Now try sending something back. My face dropped. I have no idea how to do that. Before I knew it, Tree's hands were on the sides of my face. Her hands were rough and warm and smelled faintly of peppermint. Close your eyes. She drew a deep breath as she closed hers. This part is easier. The transmag will convert your thoughts. You don't have to code them. I nodded hesitantly, and my cheeks rubbed against her palms. Your job is to keep your mind clear and empty of anything other than your message. First, think of my number. Twenty-seven. I did as she instructed. It didn't do anything. Just because you didn't see anything does not mean it didn't do anything. She continued calmly. Keep your mind clear, and then think of typing something else. A simple message. Again, I followed her instructions. Twenty-seven. I visualized the number and breathed deeply, grounding myself. Then, before I could get distracted, I thought of a word. Just one. When I was sure I'd sent it as powerfully as I could, I opened my eyes. Tree blinked and met my stare. No? No! I laughed out loud. I'd done it. I'd sent and received my first message. But Tree, those were easy. What happens when I'm gone and I can't ask you whether my interpretation was right or not? I will send each message multiple times. I will give you time to think between each one. What if someone else sends me a message? 
How will I know it's you? How can I be sure? Only I will send you messages. Not everyone here has a transmag. If someone else needs to send you one, they will send their name and number first. I nodded nervously. If you do not understand, send me a word. Something you would never say in normal communication as an answer to a question. I thought for a moment. A word I wouldn't normally use. Something that would let her know her message hadn't been received. Pass. That's a simple word I don't typically use. Tree nodded. I will watch for that. I'd forgotten that her hands were still on my cheeks until they finally dropped. My skin missed their warmth. You must keep this safe. Do not use it in a public space. Do not allow others to see unless you trust them. Right. I nodded soberly and turned to Talia. She pursed her lips. We should leave sooner rather than later. Kenna has enough on her plate, and I already feel guilty about leaving her empty-handed. I know. But if we know what's going on in P7, we'll have a better idea of what to expect moving forward. Talia nodded in agreement. If the council wasn't keeping their end of the bargain, we weren't going to get very far in P3, with or without all of us arriving there safely. Raindrops soaked our packs as we loaded them into the small transport a few hours later. Even with the promise of increased resources, Clearwater hadn't been willing to allow us to take one of the Viviente's smaller vehicles. Talia, even Tree, had argued with him, but he was adamant. We didn't know enough about P7 to trust that it wouldn't fall into the wrong hands. When he explained that it ran on a lithium carbon dioxide battery, using the same carbon recapture system he'd shown us earlier to recharge and run the battery in the vehicle, I understood. Bryn had already killed for much less. Instead, we were in a coalition transport, unneeded here since much of our group was staying put. When I get back, I'm taking a ride in one of yours, I informed Clearwater. He smiled and gave a cheeky shrug. When you get back, you're going to be too busy to play around in vehicles, Ave teased as he walked up behind us. I turned to see him, Kay, and Alex standing on the path. What are you doing? You're going to get soaked. I stood safely under the back hatch of the transport. You thought we weren't going to say goodbye? I shrugged. I hadn't wanted to think about it. Even though I complained about not getting to say goodbye to Alec last time, it certainly made it easier to leave when I was mad at him. Now, I was just sad. Worried. Pressure built behind my eyes and I clenched my jaw. I sniffed. We are going to take our time. Come back when you've done the hard work. So I'll have plenty of time to play around in vehicles. Ave laughed and stepped forward to give me a hug. His shirt was drenched, and the water immediately soaked into my clothes as he wrapped his arms around my shoulders. Good luck. He squeezed tight and stepped back. Something flickered across his expression before he nodded and made room for Kay to move in for an embrace. That was it. Good luck. I didn't know what else I'd wanted him to say, but those two words weren't it. In a matter of weeks, our lives had been completely flipped upside down and I didn't know where we fit with each other, if we even fit at all anymore. He walked back to the building with Kay and I felt a pang of jealousy. Then my eyes landed on Alec. His hair pressed against the sides of his face and water dripped down his skin, landing in his eyelashes and falling to his cheeks. He wasn't wearing a mask and my eyes lingered on his flushed lips. They stood out against the muted and dreary backdrop. Pash walked past him and clapped a hand on his shoulder as he darted for the vehicle. Talia was already seated as the driver, so he hopped in the front seat next to her. Water dripped into the back, so I took off my mask and placed it next to my things, then reached up and swung the door downward. The rain immediately pounded against my head and shoulders, and I shivered as I turned back. Alec walked closer, his hands stuffed into his pockets. The tip of his nose was pink. Now it made more sense why Ave had only spoken two words to me. How could I possibly say anything that would convey what I was feeling right now? Since being linked, I had a newfound appreciation for my brain and what it could do. How it could protect me from the things that hurt and draw me into the things I wasn't even aware I wanted. Despite all that, it wasn't equipped to handle a simple goodbye. I barely noticed the rain as Alex stopped in front of me. My heart hammered against my ribcage as I watched his face. 
Should I say something first? His eyes flicked toward mine and then back to the ground. It wasn't like him to be shy or uncertain. He was always so sure of himself. But over the past few days, he'd been withdrawn. Given the circumstances, I couldn't blame him, but I'd come to rely on his strength. A little too much. I wanted to say goodbye, he whispered, when you left the warehouse. I know. I took in every detail of his face as it lifted. I don't know what I would have said. And now. His voice caught, and he cleared his throat, then lifted a hand to tuck his hair behind his ear. You're going to see your parents. I shivered as water dripped down my back. Alec nodded. I wanted you to be there with me. I will be. Plus, they'll love me because I'll have Mila with me. I flashed an impudent grin. Probably a little more than they love you. Alec laughed and my heart swelled. I didn't think I'd ever get sick of being the cause of that sound. The grin faded from his face. I'm grateful, Channel, that you would do this for me. For our family. We're family, I thought. You're my family. It felt too soon to say it out loud. Instead, I nodded and smiled with all the feeling I could muster. I'll do everything I can to bring them back. I know. I'll do everything I can to get the people back home on board with this crazy plan of yours. I scoffed. Is that what you're calling it? Rude. Another smile broke out across his face and he reached for me, sweeping me up in an embrace I didn't know I needed. I needed to feel needed. And wanted. Like someone would miss me if I was gone. Unlike Alec, nobody back home was hoping and waiting for me to show up. I breathed him in as my wet cheek pressed against his collarbone and my nose touched the rain on his neck. He smelled of earth and citrus and everything good. I loved how I felt in his arms. He looped his thumbs over my shoulders and pulled me back just far enough that he could see my face. He traced his hand slowly up the back of my neck, then grinned as he ran it across my short hair. I'm going to grow it out, you know. He raised an eyebrow. I'll miss it. My stomach swooped as he pressed into my lower back and dropped his hand to rest along my jaw, his fingers pressing where the transmag sat earlier. My skull felt sensitive there. Not painful, but aware. Paying attention in a way it hadn't before. Alec leaned in and kissed my forehead, then tilted my head and kissed my temple and the top of my cheekbone. I closed my eyes and felt the rain on my face and the gentle touch of his lips on my skin. Talia and Pash were probably watching, but I didn't care. We can do this, I whispered. I know we're both scared, but we can do this. Alec nodded and his nose brushed mine. I don't think you get scared. You're wrong. My legs started to tremble. I'm wrong a lot. His lips found mine and I poured my soul into our kiss. I wished there was an easier way. A way where I could stay with him, where we didn't have to split up and complete each task alone. I pulled back, worried if I didn't, I'd never be able to get in the transport and leave. I'll see you soon. Alec's breath was ragged. Soon, I agreed, my head spinning as his arms dropped to his side. My whole body ached to stay. But I clenched my fists and turned, then opened the door of the vehicle. Chapter 18 I cried in the back of the transport until the raindrops stopped battering the windshield. It was a less than useful way to track time, but it was the only mechanism I had. My face was plastered to the seat, stuck to the slick upholstery by tears mixed with drying rainwater. I snuggled into the blanket Tree had given me when I'd first gotten into the vehicle. My wet clothes hung over the empty seat next to me. I reached over my head and felt my shirt. Still damp, but just barely. Another clue as to how long it had been since I'd walked away from Alec. This memory broke open the hollow pit inside of me afresh, but I had no tears left to physically spill out. Instead, I scrunched up my swollen face and focused on my breath. Just then, the engine changed pitch and the car began to slow. I perked up at the much-needed distraction. Are we there? No, Talia answered. We need to recharge, but it's too cloudy for that. Not great news. 
How much farther to P7? Pash sniffed. Another day's drive? I stared at the back of his head and wondered what his story was. He looked older than the others, at least older than Kenna, with his salt and pepper beard and no hair left on his head. I couldn't quite tell if it was a forced look or a style choice. Are you feeling better? Tilia asked as she pulled the transport to a stop. Better? There wouldn't be a better until we were back in Southwest Territory with everyone safely out of Bryn's clutches. My heart twinged as the reality of our situation sunk deeper with each passing hour. Had Alec felt this way driving to P3? The unknowns were unbearable, and I couldn't allow my brain to focus on them for long if I wanted to stay sane. I think so. A dull throbbing in my head made my mind feel slow and thick. Talia nodded absently, opened her door, and stepped out onto the road. At least we didn't have to walk in the mud. We're going to be here for a while. She inspected the clouds in the sky. By the time this clears, it'll be too late to charge. We can sleep now. Start charging at sunrise, Pash suggested, and Talia nodded. With the car still and the air silent around me, my body sank easily into the seat. Sleep was exactly what I needed right now. Sleep sounded perfect. I awoke to light in the sky and a slightly better perspective on life. Only slightly. At least my mind felt clear. I quietly sat up and pulled on my now dry clothes. Talia and Pash still snoozed in their seats. I'd seen the solar panels pulled out enough times. I could get that started and give them a few more minutes to rest. I cautiously opened the door and stepped up on the side bumper to reach onto the roof of the transport. The compartment stuck, but once I encouraged it to open, the panel slipped out and unfolded easily. I slunk back into my seat and peeked at the front console to find the green light that confirmed the vehicle was charging. I smiled inwardly. There was one thing going right this morning. My muscles were restless, so I reached into the back and found my mask, strapped it on, and left the transport. I walked up the road a ways and stretched my arms and legs. Today was going to feel intolerable. Zero distractions and far too many pent-up emotions. The sky was shockingly clear, and after making a quick trip into the brush to go to the bathroom, I found a small chute, different than the ones we'd seen outside of P7. If it hadn't been so small, I would have thought it was an actual tree. I plopped down on the ground next to it. Sitting here took me back to the moment this all started. Really started for me. Sure, the Coalition had pulled me out of P3, but that only made me more loyal to the communities at first. It wasn't until Kenna's words started to make sense. It wasn't until I saw that small shoot on the hill with Alec that serious doubt crept into my heart. I ran my fingers along the tender plant and allowed myself to imagine, for the briefest moment, what my life could look like when this was all over. Are you feeling better? Talia's voice startled me. Same question as last night. I think so. I hesitated less than I had the first time. She smiled. This time you might mean it. I laughed and shook my head. Did you sleep okay? I think so. She raised an eyebrow and grinned. Thanks for setting up the panels. She settled down next to me and lifted her face skyward. It's beautiful. Clear from all the rain. I nodded. Panels might charge faster than usual. Talia crossed her fingers. What happened? I asked. When you were looking for Nat and Simeon. Talia shook her head. Everything? We tried accessing the system through an outside console and were immediately detected. Bryn had set up additional firewalls. He knew we were going to try something, but unfortunately, I didn't have the same set of skills that Kenna does. A pang of guilt pierced my chest. Kenna was off with Alec and Ames driving to P3 to help us. If they'd stayed back, would Nat be safe right now? Then my contact reported us, Talia continued. Called us in as if it was nothing. Really? I gasped. This was a friend? I thought so. Not anymore. How did you get out? Thankfully, Pash picked up on it and we had a few minutes head start. But we couldn't risk going back in. At least Mila and Zane got out. Yeah, I scoffed. Only to be brought back in. 
I thought of Vera and couldn't imagine how hard it must have been for Talia to leave her friends. Talia slapped my knee. Hey, we don't know what happened out there. They met with the reels. That's the most important thing. Not if they're all integrated. You know as well as I do that's a problem we can solve. I looked at her skeptically. With Bryn there? Extra firewalls? With only seven seats in our transport? We can stuff way more than that in there, she laughed. Since when do you focus on the problems, miss? I've got a solution for everything. I shook my head. Talia didn't know me as well as I did. Those were lucky guesses. Someone can have a lucky guess. But when you have lucky guesses, it isn't considered luck at that point. I swallowed hard, remembering how Mom had said virtually the same thing about my world-build projects. Their argument made sense, and for anyone else, I would have agreed wholeheartedly. But for me? I had no clue what I was doing. If someone had knowledge or skills, weren't they supposed to feel more capable? More sure of themselves? Come on. I'm guessing you haven't had any food or water yet this morning. Talia nudged my shoulder. I stood up and took one last look at the friendly tree. I'm betting we've charged 6% at this point. Seven, I shot back automatically. Winner gets an extra breakfast bar? She waggled her eyebrows and I laughed. Hey guys, Pash called out. You need to come see this. Both our smiles faded with his insistent tone. We broke into a jog and headed back to the transport. Chapter 19 You could have said it in a more upbeat way, I teased. Like, hey, you guys, you need to come see this. You nearly gave us a heart attack, Talia muttered. Pash grunted. I'm not that excitable, as a person, in general. Talia smirked. Well, at least now we get to feel relieved and enjoy the miracle that is these panels charging faster than I've ever seen anything charge before. I pushed myself up on the hood of the car and let my legs dangle off the front of the vehicle. Is it really only going to take another hour? At most. Pash squinted as he looked up into the sky. I couldn't train my eyes directly at the sun without them tearing up. The world is really changing, isn't it? I was still scared to believe even when the proof was right in front of my face. I took my mask off, Talia admitted, for two hours yesterday. My eyes widened. When we were packing up, just completely forgot to put it on, and my lungs felt fine. Do we know if that's safe? I asked reflexively. I mean, even if it feels okay, do we know anything about whether it will have long-term effects? We don't know anything at this point. Talia leaned up against the transport next to me. I'd always admired her long chestnut hair, but in the sun it looked even more mesmerizing. Light glinted off the strands, making it look shimmery and almost auburn. Could Alec honestly like my hair short? Alec. My heart dropped. Talia sniffed. Things are changing so quickly now. We can't rely on the information we've been given in the past. Then what do we rely on? I asked. How were we supposed to make good decisions without any good information? People inside the communities don't know this. They don't know that the life they're living is a lie. That's how it's been through most of human history, Pash grumbled. There are always people at the top who make decisions about the narrative, good or bad. He sat halfway down in the driver's seat to check the console again. His eyes lit up and I stifled a laugh. What? Talia asked. For someone not very excitable, he's getting pretty into those charging numbers. Talia grinned. It's the small things that make life doable. I nodded and looked down at my hands. It was the small things. Until the big things felt unbearable. I couldn't sleep at all on the drive that day. It was torture to have to sit in a vehicle, stare out the window, and bounce my knee just waiting until we could actually do something. We had to find our way to Mila, Zane, and my dad. That was it. Find them, and then we could figure out what to do next. We had resources, and we had a transport to get us back. Just find them and get out. Even though the task was simple, it wasn't going to be easy. 
which meant my brain spun the entire ride to P7 through possibilities and potential barriers. Maybe Bryn had set up extra security. Maybe he'd already killed everyone and was waiting eagerly for us to show up. Should we sneak into P7 and hope he didn't notice us? Should we assume their committee was going to notice us immediately? That would change things. Maybe Bryn had already found a way to hack into our communications. Stop. I squeezed my eyes shut, reached into the zipper pocket of my pants, and felt for the thin disc I'd placed there. I breathed a sigh of relief when my fingertips hit the smooth metal. I pulled it out and placed it behind my ear, squirming slightly at the pressure against my head. I still wasn't used to that. I needed to wear this as much as possible, but I took Tree's warning to heart. There was no way I was letting this fall into community hands. I took a deep breath and focused on a single point in my mind's eye. It wasn't easy to wait for all my muddled thoughts to clear out. I had to take three more full breaths before I finally felt my thoughts settle. Then, just like Tree had taught me, I imagined her number. 27. I formed the words almost there in my mind. I repeated the words a second time. The whole process felt foreign. I had no idea if it would work this time, especially now that we were who knew how many miles away from San Francisco. Thankfully, I didn't have to wait long for an answer. My heart sped up as light began to flicker in my vision. I gasped, and Talia nearly swerved off the road. Sorry. I sat up straight in my seat. I'm getting a message from Tree. I held up a hand when Talia tried to interrupt and fixed my gaze on the dash. Leaving, I announced exuberantly. I was able to make out Southwest and safe in the second repetition of the message. The third time it came through gave me confidence that I'd interpreted it correctly. They're leaving for Southwest Territory. Everyone's safe, I reported, and Talia and Pash nodded. Hopefully they meet friendly faces there. Talia poured over the map and pulled into the brush. I doubt we're going to have that luxury. I peered at the boundaries outlined on the console. How close are we going? We're coming at P7 from the north this time. I don't want to take any chances with them finding our transport, so do you see that craggy area there? She pointed, and I nodded. It's by a dried-out natural spring. She looked at Pash. I know that because when I was working in P7, I was tasked to see if that could be a water source. If it's dried up, nobody goes there, he concluded. Exactly. Plus, plenty of places to hide. It's about a three-hour walk into the main community, but I think we could make it faster. I nodded. Walking, even running, sounded perfect right now. I needed to do something with all this nervous energy pent up inside of me. Pash pulled the transport into the brush and turned off the engine. No need to pull out the solar panels. The tree trunks were too thickly packed here to let in much light. We stepped out onto the ground and met on Talia's side of the transport. Then what? I asked. Hmm? Talia kicked at the brush near her feet. Once we get into P7, then what? Talia sighed. We have a few options. Kenna and I discussed using a safe house, a place I know with coalition connections where we could work on finding the information we need. But you said Bryn put in digital protections. Talia pursed her lips. He did. What information will we actually be able to find? When she didn't answer, I continued. It seems like we might have enough to go on. You knew Cerebralink was being implemented differently than we thought, which I'm assuming means you at least know where linked community members are held. We know the procedure happens in the building you were kept in the first time, based on what Alex said. They took you to a room. I remember. Talia nodded. I know the building. Okay. I drew a shaky breath. I know how people are connected to Cerebralink. Since I have these, I pointed to the wires still protruding from the base of my skull. I can link in as needed. You can do that? Pash asked. I've done it twice, successfully. At least successfully in terms of me not getting stuck there. I swallowed hard. I think I could do it again. Talia stomped forward and circled the vehicle. The only thing we don't know is whether the people we're looking for will be kept there, or whether they've moved things since I left. I can't imagine it would be easy to move that kind of infrastructure in such a short amount of time, I countered. In P3, 
Everyone who was linked was given a number. It was in a database, searchable on-site at the stacks. The stacks? Talia asked. A shiver traveled down my spine. Where bodies were stacked. Linked up. Talia nodded. It's the same in P7. Pash cursed under his breath. I suddenly recalled how we'd used Rapian's sensor. But we needed access, to get into the building and access the console. I bit the inside of my cheek. Does the person at your safe house have that? Talia shook her head. No. Access like that would only be for committee members or someone specifically assigned to work there. You were a committee member, but I was stripped of my P7 access long ago. I nodded. I assumed that. But maybe you'd know where we could find another person who'd have that access? Talia paused and tucked her hair behind her ear. I might know just the one. Chapter 20 The three of us worked together to cover the transport with loose branches, hoping to disguise it a little in case someone happened to walk by. With all my extra energy, I practically jogged the whole way into the city. I only stopped to wait when I noticed I'd gotten too far ahead of Talia and Pash. I never had to wait long. As old as they were, they were hardworking and fit. When Pash had lifted an entire trunk with branches attached and Talia took it from him and set it next to our vehicle, I knew they'd be able to handle themselves if things got ugly. That was comforting. Talia's comment about not wearing a mask made the wearing of one torturous. Every time I felt it rub against my skin, I wondered if it was necessary, if I really needed to be wearing it anymore. I remembered the way my lungs had felt in P3, and I knew what inhaling particles, even ones we couldn't see, could do to the tiny air-filled sacs inside of them. But the pull to live in a world where breathing without equipment was a reality was too intoxicating to ignore. When we reached the lights that stood sky-high and created the P7 boundary, I slipped the mask off my face. I would be patient but I could also push the boundaries a little. We're going to keep our distance from the area where community leaders live, Talia instructed. The person I'm thinking of should still be inside her office. She stays late because she's heavily involved in the Cerebrolink project. Once we get there, we can reassess. I knew what that meant. We didn't know what we were walking into and nobody knew what they were doing. Perfect. I thought back to my time with Vera as we walked quietly and carefully along the path. We did our best to mix in with other groups of Unreals, and at least we were wearing the uniform. Kenna had made sure of that before we left. We still stuck out like sore thumbs. For one, we were carrying backpacks, which was odd. Second, we just looked wrong. There was no other way to put it. I remembered how safe I'd felt in Vera's disguise how we'd waltzed right into the community center and taken what we needed. I had to get back to her. We needed to get our friends and get back to P3 so I could help her. It was ridiculous to believe I could do anything more for her than Kenna could, but the guilt at leaving her behind ran so deep, I didn't think I could put it behind me until I was the one who set her free. Slow now, Talia whispered under her breath as she ducked behind the side of a plain gray building. Pash and I followed and hid as best we could. The committee offices are inside that building straight ahead. Anyone can walk in, but we'll need to find a way into the offices. They know your face, I mused. It has to be me or Pash that goes in there. Pash raised an eyebrow. Your hair is suspect. But I've done this before, and most people don't suspect a teenage girl of anything. I'm not sending you in there alone, he shot back. I nodded. Okay, we do it together. Dad and daughter? Pash frowned. What? We need a backstory, in case someone asks. His nostrils flared slightly, but he nodded. Talia pointed at the ground. Leave your packs here. All we need is a wristband, I know. My heart sped in my chest, and I struggled to stand still. Ready, Daddy? I smiled sweetly, and Pash pretended to gag. I stifled a laugh grateful for something to break the tension. We were going to find a committee member, in P7, where we obviously weren't welcome, with my fake dad to find my real dad and my friends, as long as they weren't dead yet. Right. 
Pash and I strode casually out into the open toward the building Talia had pointed out. I cleared my throat. We should be talking. Do dads and daughters talk? I wouldn't know. Pash didn't find that funny. You don't have a dad. I mean, I do. Just not here at the moment. Or any recent moment. But he's here. Your dad. Who told you that? Pash shrugged. It was kind of a big piece of news. Fair. I drew a deep breath and mentally calculated how long it would take us to reach the front doors. Twenty seconds. Biggest piece of news I've received lately, and that's saying something. Pash cracked a grin as we closed in on the entrance, just as my heart dropped to my knees. Talia. She didn't tell us which office to look for. Pash stiffened next to me as we slowed. She didn't. I shook my head as we reached out to grab the handle to the front door. We were too close. It was too late to turn back. I... The words died in my throat. As soon as the door swung open, my eyes landed on a pair of beady eyes and cropped blonde hair that sent chills of terror down my spine. Without a word, I spun on my heel and left Pash standing alone on the threshold. Chapter 21 Pash didn't follow me, but to be fair, I wouldn't have noticed if he had. I didn't look back. I walked as nonchalantly as I could back to where Talia was waiting. Her eyes widened when she saw me alone. Where's Pash? She barked. I pursed my lips as tears filled my eyes. Where's Pash? She repeated. The floodgates burst and I broke into sobs. Terror and shock pulsed through me my mind unable to make sense of what I'd just seen and done. Cass, I started, but couldn't choke the rest out. Channel, calm down. Talia reached out and gripped my shoulders. I can't. Deep breaths. Follow me. She slowly drew in a breath. I did my best to mimic her. I coughed and tried again. We stood there for what felt like forever, Talia breathing in and out while I matched her as best I could. Now tell me what happened. I sniffled. We walked up to the doors, no problem. I swallowed and drew another deep breath. Then we realized you hadn't told us who to target. Talia blinked. It's okay, I added hastily. We all had a lot to think about. But as we were going inside, I looked up and saw. My breath caught as Cass's face appeared again in my mind. Her head bent, looking at her tablet, lifting her eyes as the door swung open. Saw who? Talia shook my shoulder. Cass. She stared at me blankly. One of the committee members from P3. The woman who linked me. Who Alec and I used to get the data we sent back to Kenna when we escaped. She knows my face. I started to hyperventilate. She's here? Talia dropped her arms. Did she see you? I don't know. As soon as I saw her, I bailed. My voice raised in pitch with each sentence. Pash didn't leave with you? I shook my head. I came straight here. I just, I don't know. As soon as I saw her face, I freaked out. Talia's eyes darted past me as she took this all in. I gulped air through my mask and clenched my fists. What do we do now? Wait, she growled. There's nothing else to do. If Pash doesn't come back, we can think up another plan. A weight had settled on my chest. Why would Cass be here in P7? How was she here in P7? Talia slumped against the wall. Before I could settle in next to her, Pash barreled around the corner. Without thinking, I jumped forward and flung my arms around his neck. He stiffened. I'm so sorry. I stepped back and straightened my shirt. What happened? Talia got straight to the point. Pash simply held up a wristband. Whose? The woman in the entry. I nearly choked. The one with the short, blonde hair? The one looking at her tablet? Pash nodded. You saw her and lost it. I figured she must be important. My head lolled, and I put an arm out to steady myself. Pash had taken Cass's wristband. Cass's wristband. How? Talia's toe tapped nervously. I walked in, talked to some woman sitting in the room. Talked to some woman? Could she see you? She asked. Pash scoffed. I'm not an idiot. 
A woman standing by the desk looked up and smiled. She wasn't augmented. I talked with her until the other woman left and walked down the hall and turned right. I pretended I had to find someone immediately and followed her. Down which hall? Talia asked. Pass shrugged. I don't know, the main one? Led straight back from the entrance. I turned where she turned and saw a door slightly ajar. Figured that was probably the one she just went through. I was right. And? I remembered how Vera had given me a tranquilizer to use on Rapian. Pash held up a small black cylinder in his other hand. What is that? Talia looked visibly relieved. So we have about 45 minutes. As long as nobody finds her before she wakes up. I cleared my throat. What is that? Talia motioned for us to start walking. Taser. High-powered and specially targeted. Pash and I followed her to the street on the other side of the building. Where did you find that? The woman at the front desk, Pash answered. You stole it? I gaped at him. How? I told you, I'm charming. I shook my head, imagining him leaning over the desk, flashing a broad smile, which I couldn't quite envision because I'd never actually seen it myself, and quickly sweeping the taser off of the desk while the woman wasn't looking. If Cass is here... She has to be involved in the cerebraling project in this community, I thought out loud. Talia motioned for me to lower my voice as we approached a small group of unreals. I waited until we passed, then continued. But I don't understand why she would be, unless Bryn isn't here. What did Cass do in P3? Talia turned right and cut between the gray block houses. I don't know, I admitted. She's on our committee, and she did all of our community announcements. She interviewed us before we got Cerebralink. She can't code, at least not well. I was positive that the building in front of us was where we were headed. It looked exactly like the stacks in P3, but it was off on its own, not near the community leader's housing, which was a bonus for us. Talia's shoulders tensed as we approached. There was nowhere to hide. Talia motioned for Pash and me to stay back as she scanned the wristband over the sensor at the door. I held my breath and waited for an alarm to go off or guards to swarm us, but all we heard was a gentle click as the lock disengaged. We hurried inside, blinking at the sudden lack of light. I worked to orient myself. Tables were stacked here, just like in P3, but there was something off. They weren't single file. They were in groups of two. Why? I walked forward and swallowed the bile that rose in my throat as I remembered the emaciated bodies I'd seen in P3. As I approached the tables, hope swelled in my chest. These people looked normal. Their exposed skin was flushed and they were fully clothed. They looked as if they'd wandered in here for a peaceful afternoon nap. Elation, anger, and jealousy reared up at once inside of me. How could they have left P3 in such terrible condition if this was possible? Everything I'd known, or thought I'd known, went out the window. Vera said they were decreasing resources. Kenna believed the council, or at least Bryn, was trying to preserve the world for himself and others like him by using Cerebralink as population control. But now this? It didn't make any sense. Channel. Talia called me back to the present. I focused on the task at hand. I scanned for an access point. There. I pointed to the console sitting on the wall just like the one in the stacks back home. Scan the wristband. I jogged over. Talia followed and did as I instructed. In P3, we'd had identifying numbers for Ave and Mom, but here we were going to have to be more creative. Once I was logged into the database, I searched by anything I could think of. Names got me nothing, as expected. I queried by age and found over 300 results, but when I cross-filtered for date of procedure... I was left with less than ten. That was something. My face scrunched as I processed. An idea occurred to me and I turned to Talia. Who was your contact? She looked at me blankly. The person who took Mila and Zane to the reels. Sloan, she answered. Do you know her ID number? Talia nodded and I opened up another window so she could type it in. I crossed my fingers. The message we received with Kenna hadn't mentioned anyone besides the guard Alec had knocked into. I didn't know if Sloane was with them or not, but if she was, I could potentially narrow the treatment window and limit the results. When Talia had finished, I added the filter and laughed with relief. She was here, 
and she was linked. The timestamp took me down to four possible results within our age range. Out of curiosity, I did the same search for someone in my dad's age range, but received far too many results to be practical. We had to start here, and hope Sloan would lead us to everyone else. Just as I was about to call up Sloan's table, my eyes narrowed. Her location was different than the others I'd seen on the list with the older community members. I scrolled to the other four. Two of them had red listings, a string of numbers that didn't match. They might not be here, I murmured. My fingers trembled as I pressed on the number, trying to call them like I had with Ave and Mom. An error message popped up. Patient unavailable at this location. Talia leaned over my shoulder and her eyebrows furrowed. They aren't here. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. We'd wasted 20 minutes getting here and searching the database, and now we had no idea how to find them. Talia shook her head. We have to go back. To the lab. I blinked. The place where we were kept. When we were forced here in the first place. It's called the lab? I asked. She spun and darted back to the door. Passion and I followed, and we quickly weaved our way back between the houses. The lab is where a lot of our research is done, Talia huffed. They hold people there? I asked. Talia scoffed. That isn't something they advertise, but apparently yes. Pash strode effortlessly next to me while I panted. The balls of my feet began to ache. Talia slowed and walked cautiously as we wound our way back to where we'd been earlier. I spotted the office building, but this time we crossed the road and made our way up a side path. We'll go in the back. Use the stairs, she instructed, and I groaned. My legs were already tired from walking through the brush. We rounded a building that I could have sworn was a bathhouse. I ran into Talia's back and she yelped. I shuffled back. Her eyes flashed, annoyed as she held a finger to her lips. With her free hand, she pointed ahead and I spotted the building we were heading toward. I'll go first, she commanded. You follow. Wait until I'm safely inside. I'll prop the door. Passion I nodded. I held my breath as Talia stalked forward, her long hair swinging behind her back with each step. She confidently strode toward the side door, all while keeping her face angled toward the ground. My heart stalled when she reached out and scanned the wristband. Again, no warning bells as she slipped inside. I turned to Pash and waited for his nod, then followed in Talia's footsteps. Blood rushed in my ears as I kept in rhythm with Pasha's stride. Just as he had earlier, Pash reached out and gripped the door handle, but this time, when he pulled, it didn't budge. Adrenaline tore through my system and my eyes widened with panic. Pash tried again, but the door was stuck tight. Without warning, the door swung forcefully open and knocked Pash to the ground. A hand shot out, grabbed my arm, and heaved me into the shadowed stairwell. Chapter 22 I screamed, but before the sound could travel far, a hand stripped the mask off my face and clamped over my mouth. I thrashed, kicked, scratched, grabbed at any part I came in contact with as I struggled for air. The door swung open again to reveal a man with reddish hair backing into the space, dragging Pash with him. Stop fighting. A man's voice hissed in my ear. His hand still covered my nose and cut off my air supply. My eyes bulged as my lungs screamed for me to draw a breath. Dark spots appeared at the edges of my vision, and my arms went limp. When my head felt fuzzy, the man's grip loosened, and I gulped in a desperate breath. Disoriented and weak, my legs faltered, but the man held me up and pulled me away from the door. We're not going to hurt you. The man's voice was a whisper. Hold still, and we'll explain. When I didn't fight back, he relaxed further, keeping a light grip on both my shoulders. I turned and saw Talia on my left. You should have let me take care of it, she growled, staring daggers at the man panting by the door. You could have killed him. I didn't mean to. What's going on? I barked as I yanked my arms away from my captor. I spun and took him in. He was older, rugged, and obviously fit. Talia crossed her arms over her chest. I walked in here, and he nearly took my head off. The younger man looked chagrined. You nearly gave me a heart attack. He helped a groggy Pash to his feet. Talia shook her head. This is Case. I recognized him as soon as he stopped lunging at me. Case rolled his eyes. 
He helped us get out of here last time. I'm on the upper-level security team, Case explained. Talia raised an eyebrow, soon to be dismissed. Whenever someone finds out about this. About what? Pasha's voice cracked as he stretched out his neck and held a hand to his forehead. About trying to break people out? Case muttered. I don't think I'm going to get away with it a second time. What people? My heart raced. If he knew Talia, he must be the friend Alec talked about. Alec hit you in the face when they left P7. Case nodded. You're trying to help our friends, but who are you? I whirled on the man who held me captive moments before. I'm nobody, he said, but something about the way he said the words, about the way his mouth moved. He looked a little like Pash with his head shaved and close-cut beard. His eyes lifted to mine, and my blood ran cold. You're him. His face softened, and he stood up a little straighter. You're my dad. Darius stood stock still, frozen in shock. For a moment, I worried I was wrong. Maybe he was some random guy who also happened to open his mouth on the right a little more than his left when he formed his vowels. Then he took a hesitant step forward. Then another. This time, when his arms wrapped around me, I found it hard to breathe for a different reason altogether. The thing I'd wished for ever since I could remember was happening. I was hugging my dad. As soon as I thought it, anger rushed through me and I pushed him away, then stomped back and wiped the moisture from my eyes. I'm sorry, Channel, I... How dare you? I spit. How dare you leave us with no explanation and then pretend like everything is fine? I didn't. I can't talk to you right now. My hands trembled. I turned to Talia. How much time do we have? Five minutes, Pash answered. What do you mean, five minutes? Case asked. Talia held up the wristband and his eyes widened. Whose? Don't ask. Talia rushed past me and Darius to the steps. Where do we go? Case hesitated and Talia gritted her teeth. Did you hear we have a slight time crunch? Third floor. Case stumbled over his words. Kenna climbed the stairs two at a time and I jumped to follow. We think we know where they are. Darius cleared his throat. We couldn't access the system. I tried. Case cut in. I didn't have clearance. We were leaving to figure something out. It's figured, Talia yelled back. We had no time left. The chances of Cass sitting in her office with nobody finding her in 45 minutes had to be slim to none. Security was likely already on their way. My breath came in fits and spurts as we climbed. I pressed my hand to my lips. No mask. It had to be on the floor where Darius had knocked it off. How are you walking around free? I asked. He'd been with Mila and Zane the last time we'd talked. Darius knew the question was for him. He choked out a response as he climbed. Your friends. They had some useful items in their packs. Case cleared his throat. And Case might have helped me a little. I did my best to help all of them. Case added. Questions poured through my mind. What was in their packs? How did he help? Why weren't they able to get Mila and Zane out? But we'd arrived at the third floor landing. Talia flipped her hair over her shoulder. What are we walking into? Case rested a hand on the railing and leaned out to be seen around Darius's broad shoulders. It's hit and miss. We need to enter the hall and turn right. We'll pass three, maybe four doors before we hit the one we need. I'm able to scan us in through the door, but I can't access anything else in there. Talia put a hand on her hip. Guards? I don't know. I'm not on duty today. There are only two places they could be. Bryn won't let anyone in or out. Same floor. They'll either be in the room I'm about to take you to, or the one at the other end of the hall. Talia nodded. Almost out of time. Pash announced from somewhere lower on the stairs. Case, you first. Pash, you still have the taser? Talia didn't wait for him to answer. As soon as Case made it to the door, he pushed out into the hall, and we followed. Our path was clear, and we raced to the door we needed. Case scanned his wristband, and we hurriedly scrambled into the room and closed the door behind us. Chapter 23 Talia stepped to the side and cleared my view. I steeled myself, and as Case hit the lights, my jaw dropped. 
The room was massive. Rows of tables like the one we'd seen in the stacks were set up in neat rows. They were wider and looked more advanced. More wires, more tubes, and had a screen attached to each link point. The tables closest to us were empty. I searched for an access point even though I'd seen the screens. I wouldn't find a central database here. It didn't matter. Before I could synthesize this information, Talia ran toward the back corner of the room. I darted after her as I honed in on what she'd seen. There were bodies on the tables there. I scanned each face as we passed. Their heads were shaved, and they were all dressed identically in community gray. I shuddered. Cold metal against my skin. Nobody we passed had golden skin color like Mila and Zane's, and I started to panic. Something was wrong here. These patients, their chests were still. Their bodies weren't gaunt like the people I'd seen in P3, not like Aves, but they looked off. Talia? I started, but before I could get the rest of my sentence out, I found her frozen in front of me. This time I stopped before crashing into the back of her. Let's go. Talia spun, her face full of rage. They aren't here. Talia! I tried again, but her hand bit into my shoulder as she forced me in the opposite direction. Talia, stop! I ripped her arm from mine. He's dead! Her face contorted with rage and her eyes filled with tears. Both of them. They're dead. My mind went blank. Dead? What was she talking about? Talia dropped to her knees as Darius' passion case gathered around us. Darius frowned and Talia's words finally sank in. Dead? Both of them. I stepped over her and marched down the aisle. She had to be lying. There was no way Zane and Mila were dead. They couldn't be dead. I balled my hands into fists and forced down the panic as I scanned face after face. I had to go back to Alec and bring him his sister. They couldn't be. My blood ran cold. His face was barely recognizable. There were slashes across his flesh, a thin trail of dried blood from his ear to his neck. His skin was so pale it looked almost translucent. The other tables were empty. Bryn had left him here. My eyes flicked to the side and I saw her. Dark skin. Thick black hair matted against her head. Who are they? Darius asked behind me. I opened my mouth to answer, but Talia's sobs echoed off the walls. I tried, she groaned. I tried. She repeated the words and I turned in horror, unable to look at their faces for a second longer. Their names were Nat and Simeon, members of the Coalition. I blundered numbly back down the aisle, refusing to look up at the man I'd always thought I wanted to turn to for comfort. Pash wrapped an arm around Talia and forced her to her feet. We can't stay here, he whispered. They're not here. I stalked past Case. We haven't checked. They're not here, I hissed and headed straight for the door we'd come through moments before. I hadn't checked every table, but I wasn't going to. Mila and Zane had only been here for a few days. This room was for the dead or dying, and I refused to believe they were at that point. I didn't look at the other bodies as I passed. The image of Nat was burned on my retina, and I couldn't bear the thought of adding to it. But as I skirted around the corner, something pulled my focus. Movement. I looked down and saw a man's chest lifting and falling with rapid breaths. He's still alive. I scrutinized the man's face. His eyes were heavily bandaged. We have to take him with us. Channel, we can't. We have to take him with us! I cried, my voice hoarse. Something raged inside of me, making it impossible to think clearly. We couldn't save Nat or Simeon, but this man was still alive. I wouldn't walk out that door without him. Refusing to wait for someone else, I felt along his arms. Nothing. No equipment attached besides the cords connecting Cerebralink to his console. I knew nothing about him. I didn't know where his brain was at or how long he'd been linked. Cerebralink would run without power, but his world wouldn't. When I pulled these wires, Cerebralink would have nothing to run on, no code to continue whatever links had already formed. I knew this. But this man was going to die just like Nat if I did nothing. I reached behind his head and pulled, then held my breath. Nothing happened. His chest continued to rise and fall. 
I reached under his arms and pulled with all my might. I barely succeeded in lifting his torso from the table. He jolted, and I nearly dropped him. Case reached out and grabbed him by the shoulders. What? The man's mouth formed sluggish words. We're taking you out of here, I commanded. We didn't have time for a full explanation. You're safe with us, Case grunted as he swung the man onto his side, then hoisted him up to sitting. Holding onto the man's arms, Case leaned over and pulled him onto his back. Darius rushed forward and hurriedly opened the door as Pash supported Talia. Her jaw was clenched, and her cheeks were slick with tears. The hall was still clear, and we moved as fast as we could with two of our people struggling to support others. My hands shook as I crept along the floor. The hall seemed interminably long. Finally, Case stopped and faced a door. Pash had already taken the wristband from Talia, and he passed it to me. I held it out and scanned. The door clicked and I pushed it open. This time we didn't need to turn on the lights. A blue glow permeated the room, accompanied by the low humming of electronics. The effect was momentarily comforting. If the machines were on, so were the humans. Strips of red flashed above the tables, six of them, three on the bottom and three on the top. I scanned for a central console, but I didn't need numbers or locations. Within seconds, I saw her face. Mila. Part 5. Mila. May 3rd through May 5th, 2161. Chapter 24. I existed in this new space. Light pulsed in a fabric, a net around me. Whatever it was, it was beautiful, electric and alive. I moved toward one of the strands and images began to flash in front of me, behind me, inside me. The pictures were me. I would have gasped or jumped if I could have, but without any physical sensations, I embodied shock and surprise as the pictures pulled me forward. There was a light, a bright red light ahead of me, and this made me feel something. A wall of pain flooded through my senses and I screamed, jolting as I realized the sound was audible. I could hear it. Outside in the world? Another voice suddenly filled my head and I gasped as hot air filled my lungs. What's happening? Why can't I move? The voice reverberated through me. I looked toward the light, so close I could practically touch it. Why was I going here again? You can't move because I need to stop this. I need to stop the pain. I spoke back. You can't stop the pain. The deep voice rumbled through me and this time realization struck. I reared back, rolled over the pictures and scrambled backward as fast as I could. The pain now dominated my awareness, every muscle aching and spasming under the stinging in our skin. Zane, I called out. It's me, Mila. I knew that voice. This was Zane's body, not mine. I turned my awareness and found myself collapsed in the dirt. I'd left. I'd pushed myself out of my own body and somehow entered Zane's head. What reality was I living in? I'm going crazy, Zane growled. I shook our head. You're not crazy. It's me. I... Zane pushed us up to sitting, his spine stiff and arching with pain. The pain... It's making me go insane. I have to get... No! I screamed inside our head so loudly that even I had to take a minute before I could react. Zane, something isn't right. This shouldn't be possible, me being in your head. Bryn's done something to us. He's figured out a way to get in. I gasped, and my awareness flew backward, zooming out and into the web of light. I was linked. I'd already figured that out, but it was more than that. We were linked. Zane and I. Possibly Sloane since she'd been here a few moments ago. We were linked together. What else could explain this? I pressed forward again, but this time the pictures that flashed in our awareness were different. I was staring at me. Dressed in my clothes from back home. Carrying my pack and staring up into my face. What was Zane doing? Why was he... You're kind of out of it, aren't you? My voice replayed with an echo. I, me, Mila, looked up into my face. What was happening to me? 
No matter what I did, I couldn't move this memory. I was stuck, staring into my own face. Something warm spread through this body. My heart sped up and the tips of my fingers still remembered the touch of her, my skin, and tingled. I was Zane. I felt what he felt. Yet I remembered this moment from my perspective, how disoriented I was and how embarrassed I'd felt at nearly running headlong into one of the communities. I struggled against the pull and retreated enough to remove myself fully from the physical sensations. I watched my hands tremble and faintly felt Zane wishing he could reach out and feel them, make them calm and hold still. Instead, he ran his hands through his hair as his chest rose and fell. The strength that pulsed through him was intoxicating. Against my small frame, he was hulking and powerful. I marveled at the swell of his ribs with each breath, the expansion in the muscles of our, his, back. I watched my real self look up and inspect his face. My mouth opened and I asked, You too? I remembered the circles under his eyes, how I'd turned and spotted the lights. Is that? The scene continued. Zane stepped closer. I'm not sure which community it is, but yeah. What else could it be? His body surged with the need to be closer, to reach out and protect me from whatever lay beyond the pillars, but he held himself back. Even at half power, the feeling was so intense I had no idea how he stayed put. Why would there be lights only around the perimeter? I asked. And why is it completely dark inside? It's the middle of the night. Zane's heart increased. He was anxious. Nervous because he wanted to tell me the answer, but he didn't know it. Not completely. My real self turned to him. I know, but even in the middle of the night, there's got to be someone awake. I don't see a single pinpoint of light in there. Maybe they're not allowed to use electricity at night, he offered quickly. His heart sped and a nervous sweat broke out across his forehead. Maybe they have to conserve. You know as much as I do about any of this, so why are you pretending to have all the answers? I watched my own face, the way my jaw was set, and how I looked at him with steely eyes. I was intimidating. I didn't know that was possible. Why are you asking me your questions? An emptiness opened in Zane's chest. I wanted to reach out and smack myself. Why was I being so mean to him? Why was I making him feel this way? I pursed my lips, and Zane's body suddenly erupted with pleasure so intense I had to brace myself against the pull. I watched myself say the words. I was thinking out loud, but couldn't quite hear them. Zane's body was loud. Zane's giddiness made me want to laugh out loud. You did say I know everything. His mind burst with emotion and the memory dissolved. I landed back within the lights and recalibrated. What just happened? I'd seen that entire moment through Zane's eyes. How? Why? No, not important. Whatever Zane was doing, I had to focus. I had to turn him around, force him to walk away from the light, then somehow get myself out of his head. I pushed forward again, and the pain slammed into me. He wasn't much closer to the red glow, and I silently celebrated. I could do this. Zane? I called out to him. I'm here. We have to go back. I can't, Mila. His voice was weak. I have to stop this. He said if we went in, we could stop this. Bryn is a liar, Zane. He's using us. Going in there isn't... I... Zane's voice faded. I have to stop it. Zane! I pushed my thought forward with all the intensity I could muster. Where was he? We were lying on the ground, our bodies shivering in pain. He wasn't moving. I lifted our hand and felt him surface. That's it, I urged gently, trying to ignore my own voice that screamed for me to do something. We're going back up the hill. I lifted the other hand and pushed us up, then forced our arm forward. The pain hijacked my thought patterns. I stared straight ahead at my real body lying in the dirt. Suddenly, my head lifted. My body the body I wasn't in, lifted up off the ground and looked directly in my eyes. Chapter 25 
someone else was in my head. Someone else was inside my body. The realization that I was losing control over the very thing that made me me pulled me forward faster than I could make sense of what was happening. I sped through the lights, exploded through the air, and slammed into myself, my real self, with so much energy that the world cracked open. Light flashed around me so brightly it made my stomach churn. I closed my eyes and waited for my velocity to slow and for the pain inside my body to take hold. Instead, I lurched to a stop, unable to move. My eyes flew open, but the world was dark. No lights, no heat. There were voices and shadows moving above my head. Mila? One of their mouths seemed to be saying. Mila, are you okay? I blinked. A woman's face moved closer, her eyes directly above my own. Something about her seemed familiar. Her long hair. I... I can't move. My voice sounded nothing like myself. My throat was swollen, and my tongue was slow. Easy, the woman murmured, and I blinked. I knew her. I couldn't think of her name, but I knew her. She was upset. Her eyes were swollen, panicked. I glanced over and saw another face behind her. Case. I knew him, too. He'd helped us, done something for us, but I couldn't remember what. Something about his body was off. His shoulders seemed to blend into his head, and he leaned over unnaturally. It's me, he grunted. We're here to get you out. He squatted and separated something from his back. Another person. He'd been carrying someone. He set the man down gently, then straightened and rolled his neck. Something about the motion snapped me back to reality. I was awake. At least I thought I was. The pain was gone, which meant something had changed, but... Zane. My eyes darted frantically around the room. Zane's in trouble. Bryn's doing something to our minds. He's pushing something painful into our bodies. The light. It's red and big, but we can't... Whoa. Talia held up a hand. That was her name. Talia. She worked with Kenna. She'd helped us before... Before what? Stop. A voice sounded next to me. Be careful with that. If you pull that out of her arm, it's going to trigger an alarm. We can't do that until we're ready. I turned my head and nearly laughed with relief. Channel. Hi, Mila. Her worried face broke into a quick smile. She leaned over and hugged me as best she could with me still connected to the table. Can you see and hear everything okay? It's blurry. Hazy, I answered. Channel nodded. It's going to feel strange for a little while. You were brought into P7 and... Blinked. I cleared my throat. I know. She frowned and I suddenly remembered Zane, where I'd left him. Channel, Zane's in trouble. He wasn't responding when I... I paused. Unsure how to explain this. My words came out in a rush. We were all linked together, and I sort of, I don't know, jumped inside him? He was there, and then he wasn't. Or maybe he was, but we were in so much pain. I tried to get him to turn, and he started to fade. Channel stood up, careful to avoid the table stacked above me, and lurched away. I could only watch so far before she disappeared from my line of sight. This might feel strange. Talia brushed her hair over her shoulder before she leaned over me and reached behind my back. Pressure built along the base of my skull, and then suddenly, I was free. I tried to lift my arms, to touch whatever was back there still brushing against the nape of my neck, but couldn't. Hold on. Talia put a hand on my arm. Something cold slid against my skin, and there was an audible click. There you go, she whispered. You should be able to sit up now, but go slowly. I took her hand and pulled, obediently taking my time. Though my vision was hazy, I first noticed my clothes, gray like channels. I ducked to keep from hitting my head as I rose. This has to stay. Talia pointed to a tube protruding from my arm. My stomach flipped as I realized there was something inside me, not only in my arm, but inside my head. I think I might throw up. Heat rushed to my face. Talia gripped my hand as she searched for a receptacle. Pash, I need you to... No, wait. 
I think I'm fine. The nausea began to fade. You sure? She asked. I nodded. As long as I didn't look at my arm, I could keep it at bay. I focused on the table Channel was standing over, past the one next to me. Sloane was there. Even though my sight wasn't good enough to fully make out her face, the dark swoop of hair over her forehead was unmistakable. Which meant Channel was with Zane. I had the urge to jump off the table and run to him, do whatever I could to get him back here. But I couldn't do anything Channel wasn't already doing. I needed a distraction. Where are we? I asked Talia. Darius stood behind her and I smiled weakly. Our favorite building, Talia announced sarcastically, in P7. Case? I leaned to the side and worked to force my eyes into focus. You... you helped us? He nodded as he kept watch over the man sitting by his feet. I turned to Darius. Were you... No. He shook his head. I wasn't linked. I got away. Thanks to you. I blinked. Your backpack? My brow furrowed. My pack? Darius waved me off. We can talk about it later, but you... Where's Bryn? Zane's voice erupted into the room. He's not here, Channel explained. He's... Zane coughed and thrashed his legs. He was here. Or there. He was with me before. Before you just did whatever you did. Channel whirled toward Passion to Leah, her eyes wide. Then she looked over their shoulders. A door swung open at the back of the room, and a slight woman wearing a blue jacket walked in. She gasped as she looked up from her tablet. Without hesitation, Pash threw his arm out and pointed a black handheld device toward her. The woman's body went rigid, then slammed against the wall as her tablet crashed to the floor. The woman followed. It won't turn off, Pash growled and rushed forward. Don't touch her! Talia screamed, and I reeled back, hitting my head on the table. Channel jumped up and nearly crushed my fingers. It won't turn off, Pash repeated. I didn't know where to look. Channel clanged against the table above me. Zane was barely moving. Sloane still lay lifeless on the table in front of me, and I could barely see the top of the woman's head on the floor, but she wasn't moving. Pash grew more agitated by the second. There's nothing you can do. Talia's breath came in bursts. It's not your fault, Pash. She's going to die, Pash yelled, his face red with anger even in the pale blue light. He circled her, shuffled right and left as he searched for a solution to a problem I didn't understand. Suddenly, the woman went limp. Her head dropped, and Pash leapt forward. What's happening? I whispered. Talia didn't answer. What's- Channel, no! Darius threw himself forward and wrapped his arms around Channel's legs, knocking me sideways into Talia's arms. Channel's body fell, and she slammed against both of us. Talia put an arm out to brace her fall and caught us all in a tangle of arms and legs. Darius scrambled up from the floor, letting go of Channel's lower half so she could stand. She didn't move. Her body pressed against mine as Darius backed away. His face was stricken, and he stared down at something she held in her hand. I shifted my arm and craned my neck. Scissors. Thin, long, and sharp. Dripping with blood. Chapter 26 I gasped and extricated myself from Channel and Talia's arms. Channel flinched and sucked in a breath as I cautiously moved to the side. Hand them to me, Darius commanded, just as a siren blared in the hall. I didn't mean. Channel's voice shook. He tortured Nat. Channel, hand me the scissors, okay, honey? Don't call me honey, she growled, her words interrupted by erratic breaths. Darius put up his hands. You're right, I'm sorry. I don't deserve to call you that. But that alarm just went off, which means we need to get out of here. Channel nodded shakily as tears streamed down her cheeks. I didn't. I know. Darius took a tentative step closer. He reached out again, and Channel handed over the scissors, her hand shaking so badly he could barely take hold of them. As soon as the weapon was out of her hand, Talia slipped her fingers around my arm. The console on the wall next to us beeped and flashed red. No need to wait for this, 
She yanked the tube and the needle it was attached to out of my skin. I flinched and sucked in a breath as she pressed her thumb over the exit point. A high-pitched ringing sounded around us, and lights flashed near the exit. Everyone still stared at Channel, stunned into silence. Pash, take care of Zane, Talia barked. I need to pull Sloane out. She pushed past me and Channel, whipped around, and leaned over the table on my left. I've got Zane. Darius jumped into action. You help her. Pash nodded and slid in next to Talia. I couldn't make sense of anything. There was too much chaos around me. Zane had woken up and asked about Bryn. Bryn had been in our minds. Had he actually been there? I craned my neck to see the table above mine. As soon as Zane had mentioned Bryn's name, Channel had looked up. At that table. The woman had come in. She was working on something, monitoring something on her tablet. Could. We can't go out that way. Case pointed at the door on my right. There's an adjoining room and a balcony. You want to pull people who can barely walk off a balcony on the third floor? Talia asked, incredulous. With an emergency ladder, Case finished, clenching his jaw before he grabbed a small rolling shelf. He tossed its contents onto the floor and pulled it over to the door, then wedged it under the handle. Channel took a step, but she still shook like a leaf. I laid a hand on her shoulder, and she jumped. Shh. I used my most calming voice. I'm right here. It's Mila. I'm right here with you. I didn't want to do it. Channel turned and looked directly at me. But he was never going to stop. He kept hurting people and... Shh, I repeated, and flexed my feet as I leaned against the table, trying to make them work normally. Next to us, Sloane's eyes flew open, and without any explanation, Pash expertly removed her tubing and pressed against her arm. All while reaching around her back and lifting her over his shoulder. We have to move. Now. Case hunched and lifted the man on the floor to his feet. He seemed to be moving on his own now, and Case didn't lift him up onto his back. Something was wrapped around the man's head, and Case guided him forward. Hold on. Pash grunted as Sloane's body flopped over him like a dead chicken. He slid out from between the tables with more grace than should have been possible for a man carrying an extra human. I took another step forward and stumbled. Channel instinctively reached out for me and slipped her arm around my waist. My legs felt gelatinous. They melted under me even when they were solidly on the floor. Stomp a few times, Channel whispered, sounding a little more like herself. It'll help. I sloppily lifted my right foot, then my left, and could almost feel the individual nerves remembering how to fire. We're out of time, Pash yelled as he readjusted Sloane's weight on his shoulder. Going as fast as we can, Talia called back as she followed Case to the back of the room. Those two were first, followed by Sloane and Pash, then Zane, Darius, me, and Channel. We pathetically shuffled through the door to the other room, with the siren blaring at full force. We weren't going to make it. There was no way. The alarm had been sounding for what felt like forever, and at this pace, it was going to take us a year to get down three flights of stairs. Even if we managed to get out before they burst through the doors inside, it would take them all of five seconds to figure out where we were. Wait, Channel called out, just as she helped me step over the woman sprawled on the floor and walk through the doorway. She pulled me to a stop and brought her face directly in front of mine. You said something earlier, about you jumping into Zane? Her eyes were crazed, darting from side to side. I nodded, and adrenaline coursed through my veins. What was wrong with her? Why was she stopping to ask a question right now? I don't know how it happened. I think we must have all been linked together. Talia said nobody was communicating before, but nobody was communicating before I left, Talia clarified. But nobody was in a setup like this either. She waved back at the room we'd just vacated. Move! Case darted out of our line and violently slammed into a cabinet that stood beside a desk near the front of the room. He slid it out of place until it was perpendicular to the wall, then pushed against the top, rocking it until it fell with a crash against the door. They're going to be here any second. That should at least give us a little more time. He wiped the sweat from his forehead, then ran back to the glass door leading to the balcony and pulled. 
Channel pressed her fingers against her head and squeezed her eyes closed in concentration. I stifled a gasp at the dark stains on her knuckles. Her lips mumbled, but her voice wasn't audible. Pash pulled Sloane through the back door, following Case out onto the balcony and panic pulsed through me. We needed to go. Go ahead. Channel waved on Darius and Zane. They stumbled forward, Zane's arm over Darius's shoulders, and I longed to be next to him. I needed to look in his eyes and see that he was okay. Zane's head lolled forward as he slipped through the door. I couldn't stay put. I couldn't just stand here and wait for whatever Channel was trying to figure out while my heart was on the balcony. Someone pounded against the door in the other room, barely noticeable over the sirens. The throbbing in my head was all-encompassing, and I wondered if I'd imagined it. Channel? Channel let go of my waist and darted back into the other room. I grasped at the doorframe to hold myself upright. Before I could drop into full-blown hysterics, Talia rushed back through the exterior door and slipped her shoulder under my arm. Her pack was gone, and she gripped the weapon Pash held earlier. With Talia's help, I hobbled forward as Channel's voice raised above the alarm. You left your body, and went into Zane's? I took another step, and this time my leg held. With Talia still by my side, I carefully walked, exhilarated by this tiny bit of progress. Yes! I shouted over the cacophony. I already told you that. Channel searched under the tables we'd been attached to moments before, and now I was positive the pounding at the door was real. We can't stay here, I shrieked, and Talia leveled her weapon at the door. My heart slammed against my ribs. What was Channel doing? We needed to get out of here. Channel followed the cords with her fingers, tracing them between the tables and into a center console. Why? Why would he be treating Lynx differently? It doesn't make sense, she shouted, and Talia, after making sure I was stable, rushed forward. What are you looking for? She yelled over the alarms. Channel showed her the wires. These were connected. All of them were connected. The wires stop here. We knew that already, didn't we? Talia tensed as she angled herself toward the door that now rattled on its hinges. No. Channel shook her head. The wires stop here. This console is storing the data. We know they aren't broadcasting any of it over the edge. Talia blinked, but then her eyes widened. Quickly. She handed Channel Cass's wristband. Channel scanned it and quickly swiped across the screen. Her fingers flew, searching for something. Jumping from windows and folders, she froze and scanned the room frantically. The door groaned and gave way, slamming against the shelf Case had wedged there. Those pieces of metal kept it from opening completely, but it was only going to give us seconds. I shuffled toward the back door as fast as I could without falling flat on my face. Channel dropped to the tiles and hunted through the items dumped from the shelf until she found what she was looking for. I had no time to be curious. I had to get to Zane. The door slammed against the shelf. I had to get out of this room before whoever was on the other side of that door broke through. Chapter 27 Deep voices shouted in the hall, and the shelf screamed against the floor, adding to the absolute chaos around us. A hand snaked around the edge of the door and searched for the obstruction. How much longer? Talia cried out. Just as I reached the door, Channel yanked something from the side of the console and snatched the black box from Talia's hand. She pressed the button and slammed it down into the screen, hard. Sparks flew, and the acrid smell of burnt plastic filled the room. I could see him now. Bryn. Lying peacefully on the table above where I'd been connected. The console flickered and died, and Bryn's body jolted. Talia shoved Channel away from the tables toward me. I gulped and hobbled as fast as I could. Together we barreled through the door and slammed it behind us. Just as the shelf gave way and staccato shots, identical to the ones we'd heard by the church, rang out behind us. Run! Talia locked the door as I forced my leaden legs forward. Channel grabbed onto my waist, and together we dashed across the balcony. Talia was close behind us, but just as she made it to the door, she hesitated and turned to look over her shoulder. Her jaw dropped, and her eyes widened with shock. My stomach lurched and everything moved in slow motion. Talia! I called her name, but before I could say anything else, 
she looked me dead in the eyes and pulled the door shut between us. No! I screamed and scrambled to free myself from Channel's grasp. Talia's body jolted, then slammed against the glass. Channel grabbed onto me and forced my body back toward the steps. She closed the door! I sobbed. She... Move, Mila! Channel commanded with an authority in her tone that shut me up. My lip trembled as I stumbled down the steps next to her. Mila, your brother is waiting for you. Your parents are waiting for you. We are not going to disappoint them. Her words punched through my chest and grounded me to reality. I had a family. Had I forgotten I had a family? My mind had been all consumed by escape and Bryn and the lights. How had I forgotten that they were the reason I was here in the first place? Images and memories flashed through my brain manically, and I struggled to focus on the path ahead. A crash sounded on the balcony just as we reached the ground. Pash ran, grabbed onto me, and tore forward as Channel sprinted toward the edge of the building. I could barely breathe, but as I rounded the corner, I locked onto Zane. He was standing and awake. I stumbled forward and landed against his chest. Move. Pash forced our group away from the houses and into the brush. With half of us staggering forward unsteadily and the other half sweating bullets as they dragged us along, we scrambled over years of accumulated dead wood. Voices shouted from behind, and Darius motioned for all of us to drop to the ground. I collapsed, barely able to breathe. I scarcely had time to recognize that I didn't have a mask before branches landed on top of me, and I hurriedly closed my eyes. Weight landed on my legs, then my arms, and finally my head. The shouting moved closer, and I stiffened. Scuffling. Then silence. Then more voices and loud footsteps crunching through the brush, snapped branches and thumps landing heavily on the earth. Nothing here, a man called. Are you sure? More stomps on the ground. This way, another voice shouted. They must have gone the other direction. There's no way they made it farther than this. My breath caught in my throat. They were looking for us. The footsteps came closer, and though my lungs screamed for air, I forced my body to remain frozen and still. A sharp pain exploded up my left arm, and I nearly cried out. I couldn't do this much longer. Erratic footsteps, more shouting. I lay completely still, the branches stabbing my skin as I kept my eyes clamped shut. Then, finally, it was quiet. I hadn't heard anything for what seemed like ages, but I still couldn't force myself to move. My arms and legs were frozen, the fear inside of me still so all-encompassing that I couldn't activate my muscles. I'd been wounded in ways my brain struggled to process, and the silence forced me to contend with my thoughts. Blood on Channel's hands? What had she said about Nat? Talia's face as she'd hit the glass replayed in my mind repeatedly, and my stomach roiled. The brush rustled next to me and my heart leapt into my throat. My lungs were going to explode if I didn't draw a full breath soon, but I couldn't make myself do it. What if those men were still close? What if they saw my branches moving? The rustling started up again and I panicked. My heart nearly exploded as the branches piled on top of me shifted to the side and exposed me. Mila, a voice hissed. I stayed frozen. Mila? They're gone. We need to move now. Channel pulled at my camouflage, and I convinced my arms to push upward and help open a hole I could climb out of. Around me, Zane, Pash, Darius, and Sloan exhumed themselves from their own arboreal graves, lifting themselves up and brushing the dead plant matter from their hair and shoulders. Sloan was awake and lucid. She smacked away Pash's hands when he tried to help her stand. The relief on Case's face when he noticed Pash was now available to help carry the man with the bandages was almost comical. The man looked weak, in worse shape than Zane and Sloane and I put together. Pash must have thought the same thing because he reached into his bag, pulled out a small package, and squeezed something into his mouth. He choked it down, barely able to lift his head long enough to finish it. Even though nobody from P7 was here at this precise moment, we had no guarantee that they wouldn't appear any second. Their voices were intermittently audible in the distance, and each time I picked up a shout, adrenaline surged through me. Let's move. 
Pash led us forward. Pash, Channel started, but he shook his head. She continued anyway. She closed the door between us. There was nothing I could do. Talia never made a decision. She wasn't a hundred percent committed to. Pasha's voice was hoarse. Talia? Sloane sounded weak. Where? I said, let's move. Pash commanded through gritted teeth. He swung one of the blind man's arms over his shoulder. Channel bit her lip and fought back tears. She couldn't have done anything. Talia made her choice and Channel was stuck helping me. Guilt washed through me. I wanted to thank them. To make them understand how overwhelmingly grateful I was to be free of Bryn. But with everything we'd just witnessed, the right words didn't exist. A few minutes ago, I'd been trapped. And even though there was no guarantee we'd get through this safely, I would take my chances with this group over P7 any day. None of us had the mental capacity to make conversation, even if we hadn't been terrified of being discovered, so we walked in absolute silence. I didn't question Pash. I simply focused on putting one foot in front of the other. Darius fell into step next to Channel. She didn't seem warm toward him, but given the circumstances, I doubted she would be warm and fuzzy with anyone, except maybe Alec. Thoughts of my brother opened an empty pit in my stomach. If the Coalition had sent a rescue party, everything must be okay. But I was dying to know details, to know what exactly had happened from the time community troops had forced us into those transports. As hard as I tried, I couldn't remember anything past that conversation with Darius in the vehicle, strapped to the seats, sitting behind Case and the other guards, or soldiers, whatever they were. It was like my mind just stopped against a wall. Then it jumped directly to the strange room with Bryn and Zane. It was unsettling. I pulled up the gray shirt I wore and inspected my skin. Had they done anything else to me besides invade my brain? I had the urge to strip down and search every piece of myself. My breath came in short bursts, and the edges of my vision faded. I dropped my shirt and trained my eyes on Channel's back. One. Two. I counted my steps. If I thought it was difficult to walk on a flat floor and down a set of stairs— it was infinitely more difficult to walk across an uneven forest floor full of unpredictable obstacles. I gripped whatever trunks and branches still protruded from the ground to steady myself. We were in a different section of land outside of P7, but I couldn't help comparing the new green shoots to the ones we'd seen before we were captured the first time. Here they were taller and fuller. Some had wide, flat leaves I hadn't seen before. Between the plant diversity and the repetitiveness of my counting, I was finally able to settle into an easy rhythm. What are you thinking? Darius asked ahead of me, and before I answered automatically, I realized it wasn't me he was paying attention to. Channel didn't answer, didn't even look up. I couldn't see her expression, but her shoulders visibly stiffened. It was Bryn, in the bed, wasn't it? Darius asked and again Channel remained mute. He cleared his throat. You made the right call. I only wanted to protect you from having to live with that. He quieted and walked alongside her without another word. Channel had killed Bryn with a pair of scissors. I gulped and imagined what it would feel like to plunge a sharp object into a living chest. The pressure, the sound, it made me want to throw up. Deep down, I also felt relief and hope knowing he was gone. Hope because I wouldn't ever have to see his face again or have to worry that he would inflict pain on me or the people I loved. Relief because I wasn't the one that had to take him out. Chapter 28 With sticks caught in our hair and dirt smudged over every inch of visible skin, we followed Pash farther into the brush. We struggled along and stopped intermittently for people to rest and once to hide when we heard an engine in the distance. Our ragtag group pushed forward with grunts and heavy breathing, but no complaints. Not one. We knew how lucky we were to have gotten this far, and each painful step or ache in my side served as a reminder that I was still alive when others in our group hadn't been so lucky. Our somber procession came to a stop when Pash held up a hand 
then glanced down at his wrist. Setting the blind man down he tromped ahead of us. Channel ran forward and motioned for Darius to join her. Within a few minutes, they returned and helped us move forward. I nearly dropped to my knees with relief when I saw the transport. We didn't have to walk anymore. We didn't have to walk anymore. It wasn't until that moment I realized how bone-weary I was, how weary we all were. Nobody spoke as Pash opened the doors and gestured for us to get in. We ducked and slipped into our seats as the able-bodied stashed packs in the back. Case situated the blind man in the back between the supplies and helped him rest his head comfortably. Channel climbed in next to him and waved Darius off when he tried to take her place. It was then I saw her eyes for the first time since we'd started walking. Cold. Disconnected. Not fully there. After all the fear I'd felt over the last few hours, this was the sight that made my blood turn cold as I squeezed in next to Zane. She wasn't okay, and there was nothing I could do about it, because I barely had enough energy to move my own body. Bleary-eyed, I leaned against Zane and finally allowed my eyelids to fall shut as I listened to his heart thrum in his chest. We slept and drove, then slept and drove some more. At one point I woke up and found Pash sitting next to us with his head resting against the side of the vehicle and his mouth hanging in sleep. I panicked momentarily, until I looked forward and saw Darius taking a turn at the wheel. A rush of gratitude overwhelmed me. These people had risked their lives for us. For reals they barely knew. The moment was short-lived. I fell back against Zane's shoulder as my lids drooped. The next time I woke, the sky was dark and the vehicle was still. The only sounds around me were slow breathing and an occasional slip of someone rubbing up against the seat. I turned toward the door and found the seat next to us empty. I took advantage of the space and folded over, stretched my arms, and drifted. The jarring sound of metal scraping against metal woke me the third time, and I started. For a second, I couldn't remember where I was or how I'd gotten here. I sat and oriented myself. The noise came from the roof. I was in a transport. We'd been rescued, taken out of P7 where we'd been linked. My hand traced along my neck until I felt evidence of this fact. I shuddered as my fingers explored the base of my skull where the wires were still attached. I'd been linked. I'd experienced the unreal world and it had been terrifying. I was still linked, technically. Even though I wasn't connected to the edge, I had something foreign inside my body. Something that could change the way I saw the world around me. It felt wrong on more levels than I could count. I wished I'd asked Channel more questions about Cerebralink. I had no idea if it could be removed without causing permanent damage. I vaguely remembered her talking about those details, but at the time, I hadn't paid particular attention. Now that it was relevant, I didn't want to pepper her with questions. Movement caught my eye outside the window and I had to get out. My legs were restless and my back ached. I needed a break from this transport. I searched for my mask and when I came up empty, remembered I didn't have one. My chest tightened at the idea of leaving the filtration inside the vehicle, but my lungs had nearly recovered from our walk the day before. After that amount of time outside with no mask, a few minutes wasn't going to make much of an impact. I slid across the seat, careful to avoid knocking into Sloane's arm, and slipped as quietly as possible out the door into the morning glow. Pash, Darius and Case had extended the solar panels on the vehicle and now sat hunched over, rummaging through a pile of supplies splayed out in the dirt. My stomach rumbled as I shuffled over to join them. Hungry? Pash glanced up at me with haunted eyes. Every time I looked at him, I saw her. I nodded, and he handed me a bar. I scarfed it down without even pausing to say thank you. My mother would have been horrified. He passed me a filtration straw and nodded his head to the right. There's a spring, just down the hill. Walk carefully. There's erosion in the stream bed. I nodded gratefully and headed off. As hard as it was, it felt good to walk, especially now that I had something in my stomach. My body felt surprisingly normal. My muscles ached, but that was to be expected after what we'd gone through. I walked along the spongy ground, and the closer I got to the sound of gurgling water, the more nervous I became. 
when was the last time I'd heard this? I was with Kay and Zane and Alec. Had it been a stream or a lake? The haze in my head was maddening. How long had we been in P7? How long had it been since we left the transport? What had happened while we were fighting against Bryn as unreals? What had he been trying to accomplish? Why had he done those things to us inside Cerebrolink? And why had he linked with us personally? The questions were endless. Though I didn't remember all the details about linking, I did remember Channel explaining how community leaders weren't unreal, or at least not permanently. So why would Bryn have opted for Cerebralink when he was at the very top of community leadership? I cautiously placed one foot after another down the bank so I didn't slip, then got down on my hands and knees next to the water. I inserted the straw and took a long drink. The water was cool and fresh against my throat. I wanted to gulp it down as fast as I could, but I took my time and allowed it to settle before I drank more. A branch crackled behind me. My heart went from zero to a hundred as I whipped my head around and nearly dropped my straw. When I saw Zane, I rolled my eyes. He smirked, amused by my reaction. They said I'd find you here. They were right. The sound of his voice sent a shiver through me, and I settled back to kneel on the soft ground. A little warning would have been nice. You nearly scared me to death. Zane grinned, then motioned to the straw. I handed it to him. He kneeled next to me and dipped his head to take a drink from the water. That's really good. He sat and wiped away the dribble of water that fell down his chin. I nodded. Did you sleep okay? I used you as a pillow. Zane chuckled. I did. It was good to have you close. My heart fluttered. I hadn't realized how alone I was feeling until he spoke words that made me feel connected. I missed feeling safe. All I wanted was for someone to wrap me up and take me away from here. Away from the running and the pain. Away from the traveling and fear and worry. It was a fantasy, but one I wished for desperately. Tears pooled in my eyes and one slipped down my cheek before I could wipe it away. Zane looked up from the stream and frowned. Mila, I want to go home, I whispered as my lip began to tremble. Zane reached out and pulled me to him. His strong arms encircled me while I cried. We will. He rubbed my shoulders. We are. How? I asked weakly. We don't know where the rest of the coalition is. My thoughts spun. But I guess they'd have to be kind of close if they came here to get us. Our families are so far away, Zane. Not only that, we didn't know if they were safe. I'd been able to keep this worry at bay for the most part, but now it was all I could think about. I was a terrible person for not thinking more about Talia or Sean, or Nat and Simeon. I'd seen Talia fall, and I still couldn't accept that she was gone. The guilt from losing a friend was too great, too heavy for me to hold. There was no way I could handle losing my parents, too. I needed to see them. I needed to see Alec. I needed to know that all of this had been worth it. I'm having trouble remembering. Zane's voice was a whisper. Remembering what? I pulled back and searched his face. He shrugged. A lot of things. I nodded. I know. The last thing I can remember, before we were stuck in that strange world, I mean, was us sitting in the transport with Case, Sloane, and Darius. Zane didn't say anything, just looked down at his hands. You remember that, don't you? My heart sank as I remembered the way he looked at me when we were linked. How his face didn't register mine. I have bits and pieces, he answered finally. Every time I try to latch onto it. He shook his head. It slips away. I put my hand on his. Bryn had access to our minds. I don't know what he did or how he did it, but I'm sure it'll take some time for our bodies to recover. Zane's cheeks flushed and his face screwed up in consternation. I don't remember who that is up there. Who? The man in the back, with the bandages over his eyes. I paused, then burst out laughing. Zane looked hurt and I backpedaled. No, I gasped. It's, 
It's not funny. It's just... I couldn't get the rest of the words out because I was laughing too hard. I waited for the giddiness to pass before I attempted to give him an explanation. You don't know him. I wiped my eyes. I don't know him either. He was just there in the room when I woke up. Relief washed over Zane's face as he processed this. I shook my head. I'm sorry I laughed. It was kind of funny, if you enjoy dark humor. I smiled. I wasn't normally macabre, but fighting for my life seemed to have shifted things. Should we go back up? I'm sure we'll have to wait a little while for the transport to charge. Zane nodded, and we pushed ourselves up from the dirt. My lungs tightened as we climbed the embankment, which added yet another entry to my list of things to worry about. It wasn't enough to stress about friends and family dying. I also needed to worry about air quality and my own respiratory wellness. Thankfully, as we approached the transport, Pash waited for us with masks in hand. Talia figured we probably wouldn't have time to get these on the inside, so she planned accordingly. He smiled tightly. Thank you. I held the mask in my hands a moment. For this, and for coming back for us. You should thank your friend in there for that one. It was her idea. He pointed at the transport. I couldn't see through the tinted windows, but I knew who he meant. As her broken expression from the night before flashed through my mind, I couldn't wait another moment to talk with her. I moved past Pash and found the back of the transport hanging open. Without thinking, I crawled in and lay down next to Channel and wrapped an arm around her. She was awake. I was sure of it. Her muscles flinched under my touch, but I refused to let her shrug me off this time. She needed a friend, and I was at least able to be that. I drew a deep breath. I'm right here. You don't have to say anything, but I wanted you to know I'm right here. Her shoulders shook softly, and I didn't loosen my grip. I closed my eyes and simply held her. I knew that was what she needed because I needed it, and she'd been shouldering more of the burden the last 48 hours than I had. Chapter 29 I was halfway between waking and sleeping when Channel shifted next to me. I slid out of the way and gave her space to move. She rolled to lie flat on her back, then put an arm behind her head and turned to face me. Alex safe, she stated. He wanted to be the one to come and find you. Why didn't he? Love and gratitude filled my entire being at hearing the words out loud. I wouldn't let him. A small smile turned up the corners of her mouth. Could you imagine what would have happened if all of us turned up in Southwest Territory without either of you? I laughed at the thought of what my dad would have done. That must have been hard. I lifted myself up onto my elbow and looked out the window at Zane perched next to Darius and Pash on a stump. Hard for Alec to let you go, I mean. I'm sure you had no problem leaving him behind. This got a small laugh out of her, and the sound made my heart swell. Is he still being as stubborn and bossy as usual? Surprisingly, no. Something clouded Channel's expression. I don't think he quite knows what to do with himself when all we've been talking about is code. Not his forte, I muttered, and Channel looked at me quizzically. It means that it isn't something he's good at. She rolled her eyes and I grinned. The man with the bandages on her right shifted, and Channel snapped into action. Hey, she murmured. You're safe in the back of a transport. If you're awake, let me know and I can help you get what you need. The man moved his legs and lifted an arm to his face. I can't see he complained groggily, and my eyes narrowed. Something about his voice, even his tired, scratchy voice, was familiar. Can you take this off? He explored the edges of his bandage with his fingers. Realization crashed into me, and I scrambled over Channel to sit next to him. I picked up his hand and held it. Sean? Sloane, who I thought had been sleeping in her seat up front, shot upright. That's not funny, Mila. She growled. Not funny? Did she think I would joke about something like this? I ignored her. Sean, is that you? He cursed under his breath as he pulled against the bandages. They were adhered tightly to his skin. Stop. I reached out and held his finger still. It's me, Mila. 
We were traveling with you, with the reels. You drove us to Fowler's Bluff? He froze. Sloane didn't say a word as she left her seat and crawled toward the back. Sean? Sloane whispered hopefully. I thought you were dead. His throat worked, but he didn't answer. Sloane pushed the black swoop of hair away from her eyes and tucked it behind her ear. She had dark circles under her eyes, and her face didn't hold its usual color. Between her and Channel, I was glad I hadn't been able to get a look at myself. What happened? Sean finally formed words, and I waited for Sloane to give a snarky response. To tell him that he didn't pull up when he should have, or that he risked all of our lives by plowing forward into the trees and forcing us to jump from the vehicle. She didn't. They found us. They... She inhaled sharply. I thought you were dead. Sean struggled to breathe and Sloane continued. They wouldn't let me go back to the transport. He'd accused her of leaving him the first time they'd met. At least this time, it was out of her control. Her face contorted. How is this possible? Channel cut in as Sloane shrunk into herself. Can you walk? It would be good to move your body and get something to eat. Sean nodded slowly, and I slid out of the back of the transport to make room for them. Sloane exited from her side and mustered her courage to help. Together, she and Channel were able to get Sean onto his feet before Pash and Case rushed over. Did you know about this? Sloane's eyes flashed Case's direction. Case shook his head and gripped Sean's arm to help him walk toward the others. This was our driver, Sloane called accusatorily. The one who crashed into the tree? The one who never showed up inside the church. Case settled Sean next to a tree. Pash stalked back to his supplies and grabbed him something to eat. Case stood up and brushed himself off. Believe it or not, I don't remember every single reel I come in contact with. Sloane clenched her jaw. You don't remember coming across the crashed vehicle with a reel inside? Just a few days ago? Her voice was ice cold, and Case's cheeks flushed. I wasn't the one to handle that, he argued. If you remember, I was slightly busy trying to keep those two safe. He pointed at me and Zane. It was true. He'd escorted us to the church building. He'd also warned us, told us to keep quiet about who we were. Then, on top of that, he'd sent a message to the coalition like I'd asked. Even if he had known about Sean's survival, we were in no position to criticize his efforts. Sloane's nostrils flared but behind her eyes hung a deep sadness, something I was beginning to recognize in all of us. The transfer charged faster than expected, and within a few hours we were back in our seats as the transport rumbled along. Sometime during the night, we left the rough terrain and ended up on this road. My body couldn't have been more grateful. Channel sat up near us with Sloane in the back next to Sean. Darius, Pash, and Case took turns at the wheel. It was Case's turn and I loved it when he drove. He was cautious, and that meant the vehicle moved smoother with him in charge. Channel and Darius still hadn't exchanged more than a few words to each other, so when he finally turned around in his seat to talk to us, I was taken aback. Is everyone okay back there? He asked. Channel briefly nodded before she settled against the backpack next to her and closed her eyes. We're good. I smiled gently. Zane winced as if something inside his head was hurting. He'd done it a few times already this morning, and worry niggled at me. What happened? I turned my attention back to Darius purely so I didn't have to watch Zane hurt. You said you got away, and you aren't linked. So, what happened after we were on the transport from Fowler's Bluff? Darius leaned his arm over the seat. It was a long, boring drive, but I don't need to tell you that. I didn't remember, but I nodded anyway. When we arrived in P7, they removed our restraints. A reel in one of the other vehicles put up a fight, which allowed me to search for something I could use as a weapon without them noticing. He raised an eyebrow. You kicked your backpack toward me, and when I reached in, I found a tube with a button on it. Buttons are always good. He lifted his hand as if he could still feel it in his palm. I didn't know what it was but it looked community-made, so I took a chance. What did it do? Zane leaned forward in his seat. I'm not exactly sure. He chuckled to himself. 
As soon as they pulled me out of the vehicle, I pressed down. A cloud of gas exploded in front of me, right out of the top of the can. I dropped the thing and ran in the other direction as fast as I could. Darius looked down sheepishly. I wanted to bring all three of you with me, but there was no way for me to go back. I didn't know what the gas was or how long it would last. Then I decided the most helpful thing I could do would be to make sure I got out, so I could come back for you. He turned his head toward Case next to him. I'm sorry about the gas, by the way. I still don't have my sense of smell, you know, Case muttered. Darius stifled a laugh. It's not my fault. You're the ones carrying that junk around. Case shook his head, and Darius turned back, glancing down at Channel's seemingly slumbering body. He sighed. I don't know what happened to you after that point. All I know is that I hid in a community member's house, scared one lady so bad she almost had a heart attack. She heard something moving in the corner but couldn't see me. He chuckled, then eventually found a way to get in touch with this guy. He pointed to Case. We did a little sleuthing, but we never would have gotten you out without their help. He nodded at Passion Channel. How did you find each other? I scrambled to piece everything together. Ran into each other in the stairwell. Literally. Case glanced in the rearview mirror, just as Nat used to do. My stomach clenched. It was lucky he knew who you were. Darius nodded to Pash. I thought you were all P7 unreals, and I was prepping to fight. Cass was there. Channel cut in. Talia had her wristband, and she was in the office buildings, and Pash stole it from her. That was the wristband we used? Case's eyes widened as he turned, then quickly looked back at the road in front of him. No wonder the alarm went off. Channel recognized our confusion and elaborated. She was one of the committee members back in P3, where I'm from. She readjusted her head on the backpack. It doesn't make sense. Case shook his head. She's been around. Had no idea she was from P3. She has clearance for Bryn's work. Channel's brow furrowed. Talia knew there was something strange going on in the P7 committee. She just couldn't figure out what. Pash ran a hand over his bald head. Sounds like she was onto something. Community leaders are pushing for their own agendas, Darius added. It was already happening back when I was in P3. He glanced again at Channel, hoping she'd take the bait. She didn't. From the outside, it looked as if she'd finally drifted off to sleep. I didn't leave my family, you know, Darius continued. I swallowed. Why was he telling us this? Then I looked over and saw Channel shift slightly, and it made sense. I wasn't the person he was trying to reach. Chapter 30 On the one hand, I didn't want to betray my friend by listening to her estranged father when she didn't want to. On the other, we were stuck in a moving vehicle, and I didn't have much choice. I was a world builder, and the committee at the time gave me a task. They wanted a few of us to work on an advanced project. Integrations, neuropathy, all things that I'm sure were eventually needed in the development of Cerebralink. Darius paused and drew a breath. To be honest... I was excited about it. I spent more hours away from home, but I nearly doubled our resource contributions. Since we'd already started our family and were thinking about having another child, it felt like the perfect situation for me. Channel's finger twitched. Darius sighed. Then I started noticing things. What kinds of things? Zane asked. Darius's eyes lit up, grateful for willing ears. Some of the data we'd collected disappeared. No record of it. I know how to look for scrub data, trust me. But it was as if it didn't exist. Had never existed. He shook his head. Then there was Manila. My friend named it that. He smiled to himself, but the expression quickly faded. If I could go back and stay as far away from that project as I could, I would. What was it? Sloan asked as she sat up behind us. I hadn't realized she was listening. That's the thing. It wasn't anything special. Darius threw out a hand to emphasize his point. We were looking at edge integrations. 
trying to find a way to make updates faster and more cohesive, and found some anomalies. There were areas of the community that were receiving different versions of world-building code. We presented it to the committee, and it did not go as planned. I thought they'd be grateful. They weren't? Zane guessed. Darius nodded. That night, they told us we had to shut it down. It was irrelevant information, and we were wasting our time. Did you? Shut it down? I asked. No. He shook his head. We said we would. That was my first mistake. Second mistake was telling my wife about it. He shook his head. I had to know. They were making such a big deal out of it, and I felt deep within me that there was something I was missing. There had to be a reason for it. And if I could solve it, I couldn't let it go. I tried. He tapped his temple. I gave it my best, but every night, the wheels here were turning. Until eventually, I couldn't leave it alone. You searched? Sloane asked. Darius shook his head. Worse. I realized that when we were giving our presentation, the committee members were on board. Excited, even. Until it got to one particular point. He tilted his head as if seeing the scene over again in his mind. It wasn't all of them, either. It was one member in particular. Once she spoke up, nobody was willing to explore any other options. He drew a deep breath and exhaled. My digging was focused. Why would this information be so controversial? That led me to discover that these discrepancies in the code were purposeful. Certain sections of the community were being fed information that the rest of us weren't. What kind of information? Sloane leaned over the seat. Exaggerated statistics on resources and how real populations were hindering our progress? Guess who was getting that information? He paused for dramatic effect. The Reels, who had only recently been integrated. Why? Zane asked. I'm not sure. My best guess was that they were trying to use those people to convince others to integrate. That was the only thing I could think of. I talked to Quinn about it that night. I hoped she would say something to make me believe it wasn't as bad as I thought. I wanted her to give some explanation to make it all make sense and disappear. He shook his head. She didn't. She saw how dangerous it was and was furious I'd continued looking into it. We didn't talk much for a few days, and I wrestled with what to do next. What were my options? I either had to turn a blind eye, ask them to explain, which there really was no explanation and they'd already avoided it, or leave P3. There was no in-between for me. I couldn't reconcile how a community could have our best interest at heart if they were willing to purposely deceive their own constituents. His cheeks flushed, and he took a moment to compose himself. It was clear that our committee wasn't interested in listening, and in the end, I couldn't move forward knowing this could impact my family. I talked with Quinn, and hoped she'd have enough time to process so we could have a real conversation about it. We'd been on the same page with so many other things that I thought this would be the same. I laid it all out, how I thought we should request removal from P3. I'd heard of others who had done it, even world builders like me, and I knew we'd be able to join a real settlement close by. He looked up, his eyes serious. At that time, I had no desire to fight against the communities. I simply didn't want to be a part of it. What did she say? Case asked, as fully engaged in the story as we were. She said she understood my feelings but that I was wrong. Every society had its problems, and she wasn't denying that, but she couldn't force our little girl to live in the real world. I pleaded with her, told her how this could be more dangerous than anything out there, but she wouldn't budge. So you left? Zane asked. No. Darius shook his head. No matter how disenchanted I was with Paradise 3 or how wrong I thought my wife was, I never walked away from my family. I stayed, and tried to find ways I could continue to monitor the infrastructure and committee members authorizing it. I opened up a few times, and Quinn got nervous about me breaking rules. She asked me to give it up, to stop digging. I tried. I really did. His voice broke. Darius cleared his throat. Then, one day, I was sitting at my desk, and two men like you showed up. 
he motioned to Case. They escorted me home to collect my things. I'll never forget the look on Quinn's face when I walked into our house. She'd set her form to have a flat smile. No emotion. She wouldn't let me see her face. And I knew right then that she'd been a part of it. You think she turned you in? Sloan asked. Darius nodded. I felt betrayed for a long time. But now that I've been away for so long, I understand why she did what she did. I mean, look at us. This is what the communities do to people who don't listen to them. He scratched his chin. Quinn was only trying to protect Channel. I was too. We disagreed on how to do that. I glanced down to see what Channel's reaction was to all this, but her eyes were still peacefully closed. Had she heard any of this? Where did you go? Case asked. Darius exhaled. They had the decency to drop me outside of a real settlement. It wasn't Southwest Territory, he added, preempting my question. Just a small settlement south. Doesn't exist anymore. After a year, I set off on a journey much like yours. He nodded toward me and Zane. I haven't thought about all this in a long time. You showed up, and they allowed you to join them? Even though you were unreal? Zane asked. I had an extremely valuable skill set. Right. He was a world builder, which meant he had a lot of experience with the edge and technology in general. What we wouldn't have given for someone like that back home. He shrugged. I was able to help with their communication equipment, got their radio transmitters working. But long story short, yes, they let me in. Only a few questions asked. Zay nodded, but I wondered. If someone like that had wandered into our town, would we have been so welcoming? Even as I questioned, I knew the answer where my family was concerned. My dad would help anyone, regardless of real or unreal status. Darius sniffed and dropped his arm from my seat. Anyway, I wanted you to know. I settled back in my seat when Zane flinched. His face contorted in pain and he gasped for breath. I reached for him, but wasn't fast enough. He dropped like a rock and hid his head on the seat in front of us. Part 6. Channel. Chapter 31. May 5th, 2161 through May 11th, 2161. The entire time Darius was talking, I couldn't look up. Everything he was saying, this story he was repeating, went against everything I'd believed my entire life. I'd always believed Mom was the one who'd worked to hold our family together. But what if he was right? What if she was the one who broke it apart? My arm had gone numb, but I stayed still, not wanting to give any indication that I heard his story. How could she have told me he'd been sick? That he died? I spent my whole life wishing things could have been different, but now that I had it, it didn't feel like something to celebrate. When Zane passed out, I still couldn't bring myself to show awareness. It hurt too much. I wanted to help. I wanted to spring into action and take care of my friend. I couldn't. I was empty, depleted. My hands were still caked in Bryn's blood, and I'd just listened to an alternate version of reality. Hearing Darius's interpretation of my life story should have made things easier. And in some ways, it did. But the anger I'd felt at seeing him in the stairwell lingered. Why hadn't he come back? Why hadn't he tried to fight for me, for us? Why did he join another group instead of battling for a way to make us whole again? His rebuttal was obvious. Of course he couldn't do that. He probably had tried. But like he said, he'd left knowing how Mom felt about him and what he was doing. She'd believed he was a danger to us. She wouldn't have let him come back even if he had made an effort. Still, it would have been nice to feel like I was someone worth fighting for. I was forced to open my eyes and get up when we finally made it back to San Francisco the next morning. Mila was already gone with Zane to get medical help. A part of me hoped that Alec, Tree, Kenna, and the others would still be there, but I already knew they weren't. Tree and I sent messages back and forth intermittently, updating each other on our journeys. 
They'd arrived at Southwest Territory yesterday, and even though I missed him, it warmed my heart to know that Alec was safely back home, that his parents knew their children survived. Kay and Ave showed us around the temporary camp the Vivientes had set up for our coalition members. I'd expected that Kay would stay back, but seeing Ave there was a surprise. The best surprise. I needed a distraction from everything that had happened in P7, and he was the perfect one. I assumed he'd waited here to travel to Southwest Territory with me. Why else would he have stuck around? We didn't mean the same things to each other anymore, but this showed we still meant something. Plus, the Vivientes needed extra hands. Clearwater bounced around from one place to the next to help with the meals, manage the grow houses, and settle disputes. He had Kay and Ave trained up within days as his second and third set of hands. If there was ever a time when the Vivientes needed all their leaders, this was it. I hoped the principal and other elders were on their way back. Mila hadn't said much to me since Darius's monologue in the car, and that didn't change over the next day and a half. She was distracted, but also made a point to stay close. She was there, even when I wished she'd give me my space. The only time I had true solitude was in the bathhouse, but even then, my mind wouldn't let me rest. I busied myself with missing Alec so I didn't have to think about the people right in front of me. After we rested, restocked our supplies, charged the transport, and replaced parts to keep the vehicle in working order, we were ready to set out again. Pash rounded us all up and gave us a 15-minute warning. I left the last few bites of the greens Clearwater had insisted I try for lunch, threw my plate in the compost, and darted out into the atrium of town center to find Ave. Last I'd heard, he and Kay were acquiring medical supplies from trees. I set out down the road, and when I saw them walking toward me, I broke into a jog. Hey! I called out. Ave, we're ready to go. Do you have your things? His brow furrowed, and he turned to Kay. I wasn't close enough to hear their conversation, but she took the package he held in his hands, nodded, and then ran toward me. Thank you. She squeezed me tight. For what? For saving our friends. I smiled as she pulled back from the unexpected embrace. It wasn't just me. I know, but thank you. You're welcome. I accepted her thanks, mostly because she'd used the word our. We were friends, all of us. Kay flashed a bright smile, waved, then ran on to meet Clearwater. I shook my head as Ave approached. She looks so happy here. He grinned. She is. She's been through a lot. I looked at him quizzically. Has she shared all of that with you? Most of what I know has come through other people. Ave shrugged. We had a lot of time to talk while you guys were gone. I rolled my eyes. You make it sound like we were on vacation. Vacation, risking your lives in enemy territory, same thing, right? I laughed and turned to walk back up the road, but Ave reached out and pulled me to a stop. Channel, we need to talk. The tone in his voice made my heart race. We needed to talk? About what? He couldn't want to talk about Alec. Or me and Alec. Or me and him. No. I'd made everything perfectly clear, hadn't I? Ave cleared his throat. A lot happened while you were in P7. Ave, whatever you've heard, it's not who I am. I did it because I had to. My hands went numb. How had word traveled that quickly? Ave frowned. What are you talking about? My cheeks flushed. What I did? When Mila and Zane were linked... I didn't want you to think. What did you do? My stomach dropped and my hands went numb. He didn't know. Nothing. Forget I mentioned it. We can talk about it later. Or never. Why had I thought he'd heard about that? I looked down at my hands, fiddling with a chipped nail. When he did, he wouldn't look at me the same. I wasn't ready to see the disappointment on his face. Okay... I plastered a smile to my face. What were you going to say? Right. A lot happened while you were in P7. 
I had quite a bit of time to think while I was running errands for clear water. My palms started to sweat. Thinking about what? If he suddenly professed his love for me, I didn't... I'm not going back to P3. He blurted, and I blinked. Not going back? The words didn't compute. Like right now? You want to wait a little longer? Ave shook his head. I don't think I'm going back. Ever. My face dropped. Ave? Not coming back to P3? Not helping out with the ultimate world build project? I don't understand. We have this new community to build and I need your help. <laughs> you don't need my help. Ave chuckled. You've never needed my help. You've been nice enough to integrate my ideas in the past, but you've always been capable on your own. My mouth opened, but I closed it again. It wasn't like Ave had come up with something monumental in the past, but he was a good coder. More than that, he was a good human. Ave, you do help me. You push me in new directions, help me see things in different ways. I, I hope I do the same for you. I laughed nervously. I can't imagine. A lump formed in my throat and my voice caught. I think you have plenty of those people. One in particular. Ave nudged my shoulder. The longer I keep tagging along, the harder it is for me to figure out what I want to do with my life. You've always been so sure. No, I haven't, I muttered. Oh. Are we doing this again? Ave smirked, then reached out and pulled me into a hug. I buried my head in the space between his neck and shoulder as tears welled in my eyes. He ran a hand over my short hair. You're going to be just fine. Even if this whole thing doesn't go the way you hoped. I'm so proud of you, Channel. I pursed my lips. The last thing I wanted to do was cry right now, but this moment was not making it easy to hold back the deluge of emotion I'd stuffed down for the past 24 hours. I'm proud of you too. I coughed to cover up my emotion. He pulled back and clapped me on the shoulders. I'll walk with you up to the transport if you want. I nodded and he slung an arm over my shoulders. He was breaking up with me. Not even for the reasons I thought he should. All this time, I thought I'd been the one to define our relationship, the one in control of how we moved forward. It turned out, Ave was a whole person and not simply a person who existed in my orbit. It was ridiculous and selfish that I'd expected him to stay there forever. I saw the past few weeks and years in a new light. I'd been a terrible friend, and now I wouldn't have the chance to do better. I sniffed. What will you do? He shrugged. I've been talking with Clearwater. I want to learn about healing. Really? Yeah. Learn all that stuff Tree did to save my life. Ave stopped a few meters behind the transport as I continued forward. I stopped and turned to look at him. You'd be good at that. Of course I would. I'm good at everything. He flashed a cocky grin and I laughed. He shoved his hands in his pockets. Be safe? I nodded. See you soon, okay? Right. See you soon. The corners of his mouth lifted, then he abruptly turned toward town center. Ave, I called, and he looked over his shoulder. Thank you. For being the best friend. He smiled. And that time, it was real. Chapter 32 Mila and I were the first two people in the transport. Sitting next to her afforded me the comfort of knowing I wouldn't have to sit next to Darius. I stared straight ahead and waited for everyone to load up. Anxiety gripped my heart. All the time. I caught my knee bouncing more than once in the few minutes we'd been sitting here. If Kenna were around, I knew exactly what she'd say to me. We were in a war which meant we were going to see and do things we never thought we would. It was normal and expected. Nothing about the past few days was normal or expected for me. All I'd wanted to do was help. 
I hadn't wanted to know what it would be like to watch a person die because a taser malfunctioned. I hadn't asked to watch a friend get shot and collapse in front of my face because she stayed back to buy us time. I didn't want to know what it felt like to be so scared and angry that I was driven to kill another human being with the closest sharp object. I started to sweat. How Zane? I had to get out of my own thoughts. Better, I think. What's wrong with him? Guilt swirled in my gut. We'd been here long enough that I should have checked on him, or at least asked earlier than now how he was doing. I was a terrible friend. Tree calls them ghosts. Mila smiled sadly. Echoes of being linked. Bad connections. We hope over time the effects will dissipate. I nodded. I'd felt so much hope that our plan had worked, that we'd finalized an agreement with the council which should have meant we could breathe easy for the next nine months. But Bryn hadn't been abiding by it, and people were still getting hurt. Which meant my faith in their ability to give us the resources and time they'd promised was non-existent. Now that he was gone, would things go smoothly? At least I had physical proof that Cass wasn't going to be in P3 when we arrived. It still didn't make sense why she was in a different community, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a benefit. If we didn't have to contend with her the second we got to P3, maybe we'd actually have a sporting chance. Mila sighed next to me and I flinched. Sorry about Zane. I'd gotten lost in my thoughts and left her answer hanging. I couldn't even converse like a normal person. The back door of the transport flung open, and Sloane helped Sean into his makeshift seat in the back. Sean was walking on his own, and all Sloane had to do was guide him forward. My curiosity got the better of me, and I leaned closer to Mila. What happened? With Sean? It's a long story, she whispered. Short version? Mila drew a deep breath. Sloane and a group from P7 worked on assimilation missions years ago. They went into Sean's community and they hit it off. I raised an eyebrow. But then it all ended tragically because the community troops weren't allowing people to choose real or unreal. There was a fight, and Sean stayed. He's been fighting to stay free ever since. Then we showed up. I skipped a lot in the middle. Wow. First time seeing each other after all that? Mila nodded. Community troops invaded followed after us, just like we explained on the radio. I nodded and thought back to that conversation. Sean had a girlfriend, but she didn't want to run. He drove us to Fowler's Bluff, where Kenna told us we'd be safe, but you weren't. That's where they took you in. Right. It was one of Sean's friends that facilitated that, she muttered, and her eyes flashed. But that happened after Sean tried to avoid the troops and ran our transport directly into a tree. My eyes widened. We thought he was dead. We broke apart as everyone else piled in, and within a few minutes we were on our way. This was the kind of story I needed. Something dramatic enough I felt less like a virus eating away at healthy code. Zane, tired and sullen, rested in the back next to Sean. I didn't join in as Darius and Case expounded on their experience with the Vivientes in San Francisco. Their awe was understandable. After seeing the place multiple times, I was still wonderstruck by their settlement. Even that commonality didn't inspire me to break my silence. A few hours in, Mila suggested we play a game, and I couldn't bring myself to do that either. All I could think about was Alec asking, Would you rather? The question that played on repeat in my mind was, Would you rather leave your enemy lying defenseless, knowing he would hurt you again, or stab him with a pair of scissors? Even now, after I'd made my choice, I couldn't decide which option was better. I wanted to believe I'd acted out of a desire to protect not only the people I loved, but all people in our communities. I wanted to believe it was a rational choice and not a manifestation of my rage. The problem was, I couldn't convince myself it was true. Which was why I couldn't bring myself to talk about it. That choice had solidified the knowledge that deep down, I wasn't any better than Cass or Bryn. I'd been willing to do the wrong thing for what I thought were the right reasons, just like them. That's all anyone was doing. 
We were all villains when given the opportunity. If even we couldn't make the right choice when we had a million reasons behind us, then what made us worthy to fight in the first place? Mila handed me a piece of fruit and I took it gratefully. It was shriveled and brown around the edges, but at least it wasn't green and if Clearwater had sent it with us, I trusted it would be good for me. I was happily surprised when I bit into it and found a light, sweet flesh underneath the outer skin. Delicious. The longer I was in the real world, the more appreciative I was of moments like this, especially when they punctuated stretches of dark existence. The rest of our trip passed in a blur. Drive, sleep, recharge the solar panels, repeat. Now that everyone was in better spirits and somewhat recovered and rested, there was much more conversation and friendly banter. I wasn't a part of it. I didn't want to be. I wanted to get to Southwest Territory and then move on to P3 so we could do what we set up to do and solve this problem once and for all. Maybe then I'd feel like this was all worth it. I sent Tree a message when Pash gave an update on our ETA. We were approximately five hours out, and that's when reality set in. I was going where Mila and Alec grew up, where Zane and Kay lived through the horrible experiences they'd told us about, where weeks ago the four of them had pulled together resources and left on a journey across the country. Pieces of their story had always seemed like fantasy to me, but now it was suddenly coming to life. I surreptitiously observed Mila as she leaned over her seat to talk to Zane. They joked and smiled, but there was something under the surface. Mila didn't smile as freely as she used to. Zane's face was more drawn. None of us had escaped without ghosts. I fingered the thin storage drive in my pocket. If what Mila described in P7 actually happened, if they had actually been linked and she found a way to leave her body and enter Zane's, I traced the side of the smooth metal and hoped I held the key to answer one of my questions. Maybe one of our ghosts wouldn't get to haunt us forever. Chapter 33 The vehicle rolled to a stop and my body knew exactly what that meant. I woke with a start. Mila had gathered things, ready to jump out as soon as the door opened. Zane pulled on his mask and rallied to go with her. What were these people going to think about us? About me? How much did they already know, and had Alec and Kenna been able to make any progress with relocating them to P3? My mind raced, but as soon as I stepped out of the vehicle, I saw him. He was right there, waiting. Just like that, everything slowed. The wall I'd carefully constructed cracked and began to topple piece by piece, stone by stone. Emotion trickled, then poured over me, filling my entire being, and the only thing I could do was run. I bolted forward and threw my arms around Alec's waist so tightly I thought we both might burst. My heart swelled and broke at the same time. I needed to choke the hurt out of me. I wasn't the same person who'd left Alec with the Vivientes. He didn't know it yet, but as soon as he took a good look at my face, He'd see something. I had to tell him. I had to spill everything. I pulled back, but before I could speak, Alex started in a rush. We've got everybody on board. It wasn't nearly as hard as I thought. Things were bad while we were gone. A grow house malfunctioned and bacteria contaminated our water supply. He shook his head and smiled like he used to. Anyway, I don't want to bore you with all the details, but Kenna is sending transports, and within a day or two. Kenna's not here? I tried to process everything he'd laid out. Alec shook his head. She had to take the Vivientes into P3 to get started on our energy production. He took in my panicked expression and put his hands on my cheeks. Hey, I'm sorry. I jumped in and didn't even say hello or ask how you were doing. My stomach twisted and I swallowed hard. She left you here all by yourself? I didn't want to answer that question. Talking about Kenna was safer. Alec frowned, then pointed across the dirt toward a woman with curly hair helping Pash and Darius unload the supplies. Ames. She was always first in line. That's my dad. 
I blurted and pointed to Darius working next to her. Alec nodded as if it wasn't weird at all to be meeting someone he'd thought was dead. Speaking of parents, there are two people I'd really love for you to meet. Alec reached down, grabbed my hand, and pulled me forward further into the crowd. No, this was not how I wanted to meet Alec's parents. They'd see... Mom, Dad, Alec called out. This is Channel. Alec's mom was the first to break her tearful embrace with Mila. She rushed forward and pulled me into her arms. She was shorter than me, much shorter than Alec, yet she held me with unexpected strength. She was beautiful with her tan skin and smile lines. We can never thank you enough for bringing her back to us, for bringing hope back to all of us. She pulled back and patted my cheek. It wasn't all me, I... Just take the credit. They're not going to listen to a word you say. Alec laughed as his dad pulled Mila and Zane toward us and forced us all into a massive group hug. It was awkward, strange, and exactly what I needed, all at the same time. When they finally set us free, I got a better look at their faces. Alec's dad looked uncannily like his son, but Mila and their mom looked more like sisters. Related, but different somehow. Mila smiled so wide that I thought her face might split in two. A stark contrast from a few moments before. Even Zane's eyes sparkled, even though his family was nowhere in sight. I scanned the area. The houses on this street weren't large or exciting by any means, but there was something about their unique style that was charming. I smiled to myself. Weeks ago, I would have looked at this with disgust. It was all relative. I drew a deep breath and pushed aside my insecurities for the moment. I didn't deserve this, but I took it anyway. Can I see your house? Alec's eyes twinkled. He nodded and pulled me away from the group. We walked down the dirt road and the chatter of celebration and reunion faded behind us. There's nobody around, I commented, taking in the vacant houses. No, Alec sighed. But your parents are okay? Yeah, for the most part. I nudged him. Even with everything that happened while we were gone? He shook his head. Not ideal, but they're surviving. They're good at that. What happened when you showed up? Alec laughed. My mom almost died of shock. Did they see the transport coming? Alec shook his head. No, we got in late enough that I went and knocked on our door. That door, in fact. He motioned to a light brown home with a pitched roof. This is it? This is it. He shoved his hands in his pockets and walked up to the front door. After this, you'll show me the grow houses, right? And the beach? Aren't you a little tired from your journey? I shook my head. The only thing I'm tired of is waiting. Chapter 34 that night, we sat around a fire built by Zane's dad, Alejandro, in Alec and Mila's backyard. The tension between him and the rest of the group was palpable. I made a note to get the rest of Zane's history from Alec later. We ate a soup made by Alec's mom, and Pash gave them a filtration kit to help the water situation. He'd handed them out like breakfast bars all afternoon. The reels here didn't have enough fuel to boil water every time they needed a drink, and their gratitude was unmatched. Darius and Alec's parents had already gone to bed, but Pash, Case, Sean, and Sloane stayed with us. This is something else. The reds and oranges of the fire glinted in Case's eyes and gave his face a soft, warm glow. Is this your first time outside of the communities? Alec asked. Not my first. He leaned over to warm his hands. Case was in Fowler's Bluff with us, Mila explained. That was where you were when you called us? Alec asked. That was where we were right after we called you. Mila's eyes flickered toward Sloane and Sean. Why did you do it? Zane asked. You helped us once, so why help us again there? Case scoffed. I wasn't planning on it, if that makes you feel any better. I didn't like the idea of you all being assimilated, 
but there were plenty of justifiable reasons for bringing you in. He rubbed his hands together. The message changed my mind. What message? Zane asked, and I realized we hadn't told Mila, Zane, Darius, or Sloan anything about what the Coalition did while they were in P7. Do you all know why we're here? I asked before Case could answer, and my chest tightened. I'd been so wrapped up in myself, I'd ignored them for hours on our various drives when I could have explained everything. Zane shrugged. I wondered why we came here instead of the warehouse. I figured it was because Alec wanted to come home. I laughed to cover up my embarrassment. Alec wanted to come home, but the warehouse was going to be our first stop. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore. The sharp intake of breath around the fire was audible. The communities, or Bryn personally, burned it to the ground. Mila's eyes flashed. You had nowhere to go. I told Darius all of this. Was that when you two were down at the river? Pash asked. Zane shrugged and Mila rubbed his arm. We wondered why the coalition was in San Francisco, but we had a lot on our minds. Zane's face clouded over. I kept talking to give him space and looked pointedly at Mila. The hot pools are still there. She sighed with relief. What about this message Case is talking about? Zane brought us full circle. I nodded. Remember when we told you we were working on a plan? When we talked over the radio waves? I leaned closer to the fire and launched into an explanation about how we spammed community inboxes, how we finally got an audience with the council, how Bryn fought against our ideas, but then Straya finally agreed to a contract for a trial hybrid community in P3. I saw the message you sent, and then received a notification soon after about Cerebralink protocol changes. I assumed we'd be letting everyone go, but when we arrived, we... Case ran a hand over his face. They didn't let everyone go, I whispered. Case stared into the fire. They processed everyone for linking. Children, families, the three of you. Like nothing had changed. When I asked about it, they wouldn't give me any answers. Zane let out a low whistle. When Darius found me, it was just the push I needed. So that's why mom and dad are packing? Mila asked. Yep. Alec nodded. We'll leave as soon as the transports arrive. But why? Mila dropped her chin into her hands, her feet propped up against the fire pit. They weren't willing to leave when we went east. So why now? Alec shrugged. As soon as they found out that they could be with us and have input in how the system was built without being forced to integrate, they were all in. He leaned over and nudged her shoulder. I think it mostly had to do with being with us, though, if I'm being honest. Mila's face flooded with warmth. So we go to P3. Zane ran a hand through his hair. Do they even want us there? Alec exhaled. I guess we'll find out. But it doesn't really matter. It's not like they have a choice. We spent the next morning in town and at the grow houses. Everyone left in Southwest Territory wanted to get a glimpse of the newcomers, and I couldn't blame them. The only people they'd ever seen from the communities were people like Case, people who enforced resource allocations and took away the people they loved. I tried to remember the faces and names that Alex spouted out, but it was impossible to keep them all straight. We walked the dirt streets between houses, stopped at the community center, and then made our way to the fields. Alex's dad was understandably upset about leaving his crops. He proudly showed me house after house, detailing what they had to do each day to keep everything thriving. Alec pointed out all the ways these grow houses were inferior to the coalition's, and nowhere near the ones we saw in San Francisco. He told his dad about the fish and hydroponics, and I laughed at their exuberance. They puttered around and fell into the routine they'd had for years, and I couldn't help but think these little grow houses were exactly right. What's that? I pointed at a line of amber that bubbled up near the corner of the glass and metal beneath it. Tree sap, Alex's dad explained, 
thrilled that I showed any interest. Even though the trees are dead, this substance is still stored in particular trunks. We harvest it, and it makes an excellent sealant. You helped with all this? I asked in awe, and Alec nodded. I wished we could remove our masks and breathe in the smell of growth and life like we had with Clearwater. But even now that we were leaving, Alec's dad didn't want to do anything to disrupt the CO2 balances in the houses. Our next stops were the bird and cricket houses. You eat these? I grimaced as we moved closer to the small window and caught sight of the tiny hopping insects. Alec's dad chuckled. Beggars can't be choosers. It took me a minute, but I figured out that phrase all on my own. Alec smiled proudly. What are you going to do with them? I asked. When we're gone, you mean. Alec's dad pursed his lips. Alec sighed. My parents aren't convinced. It's not that we aren't convinced. It's that we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket. This one was beyond me. What are you talking about? Alec's dad crossed his arms over his chest. Let me ask you this. This project we're all jumping into, it's going to be for nine months? I nodded. What happens after that? We hope it will be successful. If it is, then we would continue to live in our new system, begin expanding it to other communities. Alec's dad smiled, and even though he looked like an older version of Alec, that expression reminded me wholly of Mila. What if it isn't successful? I pondered this a moment, then chose my words carefully. I knew what it meant for the reals, for all of us, if we couldn't make this work. But I wasn't sure what Kenna had told the people here. I didn't want to overcomplicate things, especially things they had no control over. I didn't meet Alec's eyes. If we're not successful, then we'll have to go back to doing things the way we did before. Alec's dad smiled. Exactly. Which is why we don't want to give up everything and leave. We think what you're proposing is interesting. So interesting that we're willing to abandon our homes for nine months and work together to see what we can accomplish. But we don't trust them. We couldn't ever be completely beholden to the communities, even if we were convinced that they would hold up their end of the bargain. It wouldn't be safe for us. I didn't want to rely completely on them either. None of us did. Which was why we were doing this in the first place. So what will you do? I asked. Who's going to stay and make sure everything here in Southwest Territory remains in working order? Alejandro and his boys are going to stay back. I doubt Mila will be okay with that, Alec muttered. His dad looked at him quizzically. I thought Mila would be the last person to care about Alejandro's family. Alec chuckled. A lot has changed since we left, Dad. I stifled a laugh. Dad, I think I'm going to take Channel down to the beach. She's never seen the ocean before. His eyes widened. Never? I shook my head. I'd seen pictures of it, even videos of waves crashing on craggy shorelines and white sandy beaches. How are we getting there? I asked. Alec chuckled. With our feet. I raised my eyebrow. You can walk to it? Alec's dad laughed. Sure can. You're telling me there's an ocean so close that we can walk, but we can't see it? Or hear it? Alec motioned for me to follow him. You'll be able to hear it soon. Chapter 35 We waved goodbye to Alec's dad and walked in the opposite direction of the grow houses. I nudged his shoulder. You love this place, don't you? His face seemed softer and more relaxed here. Is that normal? He asked. To be happy when you're home? If you're lucky, I guess. Alec paused, then reached out and pulled me to a stop next to him. He stared into my eyes and I swallowed hard. I lowered my face, but he caught my chin. You don't have a home anymore. He said the words matter-of-factly, but hearing them out loud felt more final than when I'd thought them over and over in my head the past few weeks. We're going to build a new one. His hand slipped down to hold mine. 
I loved that he thought it would be that simple. We walked in silence up the road, until my ears perked up. Is that? I cocked my head to the side and tried to tune in. The corner of Alec's lips turned up. Every few steps, the sound got louder, and the anticipation grew too intense for me to keep walking. I took longer strides, then finally broke into a jog and pulled Alec with me. We reached the top of a small hill out of breath, and I gasped. Below us, the world seemed to open up. Soft dunes of velvety sand shimmered under the afternoon glow. They curved around chunks of rock stacked together and tapered down into the vast swaths of blue. I could barely catch my breath. The pictures I'd seen didn't come close to capturing the magnitude of this place. Everywhere I looked, there was deep blue. It seemed to go on forever, barely contained by the shoreline. How does it work? I whispered. Alec laughed out loud. What do you mean, how does it work? I bounced, unable to contain my excitement. I mean, is it safe? Can I touch it? Which part? All of it, Alec! He was laughing so hard he could barely get the words out, but I couldn't help myself. I was too excited to worry about whether I looked ridiculous. You can go in it, he wheezed. But just be careful. The waves are strong. I dashed away from him before he could finish his sentence. As soon as I hit the sand, I tossed my shoes behind me. My feet sank into the soft ground, and it was difficult to run as quickly as I wanted to. I pushed harder, careful not to step on any of the rocks as I descended toward the beach. Sweat poured down my back as I ran, and I knew then that simply dipping my toes in this vast blue ocean was not going to be enough for me. When the sand leveled out, I quickly pulled off my pants and shirt, just like we'd done at the hot springs. Worried I might get nervous and back out if the water was cold, I ran full tilt into the waves. The water crashed first into my knees, then swept over my midsection and took my breath away. The cool water swirled around me and knocked me off balance, and I spread my arms and legs to stay upright. Alec whooped behind me, and I turned, but as I did, a wave swept in and knocked me off my feet. I went under, tossed in circles under the water. I gurgled and gasped as I searched for my footing, but strong arms wrapped around my hips and lifted me from the surf. My mask had been ripped from my face, but thankfully still hung around my neck. Hopefully it would still work after getting wet. I coughed and sputtered as Alec helped me stand straight in the water. It stings, I gasped and frantically wiped at my eyes. Salt water. Alec chuckled as the waves knocked against our bodies. Every time I tried to open my eyes, the burning set in, and I had to close them again. He moved us forward where the waves weren't as intense. Am I going to go blind? No. He lifted his hands off my hips and pressed his thumbs against my eyelids. With gentle pressure, he wiped them as best he could. Just give them a second. Your eyes are made to clean themselves. I blindly gripped onto his shoulders as the water surged up to my chest. My eyes watered, and eventually the stinging sensation faded. I blinked, and there Alec was, right in front of me. His wet hair tousled around his face, the blue water ebbing and flowing over his stomach. Goosebumps raced across my skin. It had been a long time since we were alone and standing this close. What do you think? About what? I licked my lips and tasted the salt on my skin. Southwest Territory. I smiled. It's incredible. I turned my head and took in the shoreline. The colors were muted with dark rocks jutting out between the soft pits of sand. It didn't need augmentation to be breathtaking. I'm glad you're safe. Alec moved his thumb against my lower back. The water felt cool against my skin where his hand had been. I tilted my head up to look at him. Here, he was the old Alec. The Alec who was sure of himself, who had all the answers. I loved this version of him, but wasn't sure I fit him anymore. I'd lost something in P7, and I desperately wanted to gain it back. Alec's eyes narrowed. What's wrong? I shook my head, not sure I knew how to answer that question. What was wrong? 
So many things I couldn't imagine where I'd start. Alec pushed the wet hair from my forehead. You haven't told me. What happened in P7? My arms tensed and he noticed. The wall inside me crept up again, but it was small enough now that I could stop it if I wanted to. With a few words, I could burst through and keep it from stifling me again. I closed my eyes as the waves washed around me. I'd fought so hard to keep control when I had none. If there was ever a moment when the universe was trying to teach me to let go, this was it. In the middle of a vast ocean with the one person who had shown me over and over again that I was safe. When I blinked my eyes open, Alec was still right there. I drew a shaky breath and started talking. Chapter 36 When I finished, Alec was quiet. He glanced down at my arms and noticed the goosebumps on my skin. I'd started shivering when I told him the truth of what I'd done, but the chilly ocean water wasn't making it easy to warm up. Alec pressed against my waist and turned me back to the shore. It was even colder on the outside now that we were wet, but we walked across the sand and splayed out on top of a flat, black rock. Its surface was soothing and warm, and I sighed as I pressed my skin against it. Alec grunted. I would have done it. I turned my head so I could see his face. I would have killed him. I don't think so, I scoffed. I probably would have done worse. Worse than kill him? I laughed, grateful that he was trying to make me feel better. Alec lifted himself up onto his side and propped his head in his hand. A weight settled on my chest. I keep seeing it, Alec. I feel the scissors. I see how he bled. You weren't thinking. You acted in self-defense. Exactly. I know I wasn't thinking. That was the problem. Maybe I could have done something different, found a way to take him out of the equation without violence. He was linked, so maybe, I don't know. I shook my head. Hindsight is twenty twenty. He grinned with anticipation because he knew I wasn't going to get that phrase. I smacked his shoulder and he laughed out loud. It means you can see perfectly when you look back on things. In the moment, it's not that easy. True but it didn't make me feel any less awful. My brain was going to keep puzzling over that moment until I found a million different options that would have been better. Until I convinced myself that I'd chosen the worst one. I laid back on the rock. I did get something. I downloaded the last 48 hours of data from the console they were linked to. Really? I nodded. Mila described something. An experience she had while she was in there. I want to analyze it and see what happened. I rolled to my side so I could face him more comfortably. His eyes wandered over my face and I wanted to shrink the way I had when he'd first been this close. When he tried to look inside my eyes at the lake. This time, I held myself steady. Hey. I suddenly remembered what Cass had said to me in P3. I lifted myself to sitting and scooted closer. I learned something you might be interested in. What? He sat up and watched me with curiosity. I found out you can see my implant. His brow furrowed and I laughed. Not the actual implant, but you can tell if someone has one. I turned my face to the side. I've never seen it, but Cass said light will reflect blue from the back of my eye. Stop. Alec reached out and held my chin still. He moved his head from side to side in front of me. Blue? I nodded. I think I see it. It's slight, but there's a glint when I move right here. He shifted my head back and forth a few more times before he dropped his hand. Kind of cool, right? I missed the touch of his hand. He smiled, then leaned in a little closer and every nerve ending in my body lit up. I told him everything. He knew every ugly part about me, and yet he was still sitting on this rock, looking at me like that. If he didn't think I was an awful person, maybe I could believe it too. Someday. He reached out and ran his hand over my hair. 
now more than a centimeter long. His hand was warm against my skin. I'd thought about kissing Alec more times than I could count since I'd left him in San Francisco. Now I wondered if my memories had done any of it justice. His breath whispered across my cheek, and my heart slammed against my ribs as his nose brushed mine. I closed my eyes and... Alec! A voice echoed against the cliffs behind us and we broke apart. Channel! Mila tore down the hill and waved to get our attention. The transports are here! I groaned internally. Now? Of all the times they could have arrived. We scrambled off the rock with our underclothes still slightly damp and threw on our clothes. Quickly brushing the sand off our feet, we slipped our shoes on and ran up to join her. When we reached the square, all of us jumped in to help pack in as many supplies as we could fit. I'd continued to talk with Tree since we arrived to make sure they were ready for us. Since so many people in P3 had already been linked, there were plenty of shelters available. The supplies we brought would be shared and distributed, but Tree assured me there were plenty of resources available for our group. With reels and unreels working together, it took us less than an hour to load up. Alec walked with his family back to their house and I stayed with the transports, not wanting to interrupt their private moment. Even though I'd left my home like they were leaving theirs, my departure wasn't initially a choice. I didn't know what it would feel like to leave with the people I cared about. But for a moment, I let myself imagine. We prepared for a 10-hour drive to P3. I placed the transmag behind my ear, ready for transmission in case of emergency. Leaving now. I imagined the words just as I had so many times before. I wasn't adept enough at interpreting the flashing lights to have long conversations with Tree, but I was dying to know what had gone down when they arrived there. What had the council told the Paradise Three Committee? How many people were left there? What had happened with the people in the stacks? I had to settle for the few short answers I'd received. Safe. Starting work. See you tomorrow. It wasn't nearly enough. I made one final turn and took in the land around me as I saw the others approaching. The lack of green shoots in this part of the country was striking, considering we'd been surrounded by so much greenery out east. I'd always thought climate was similar everywhere, but after pulling into Southwest Territory, that belief was shattered. It was warmer here, drier. My skin was less sticky than it had been in P7. It was fascinating. Ready? I looked to Mila, Alec, and their parents. All four of them stared wistfully at the place that had been their home for so long. I'm sorry, I can give you... No. Alec and Mila's mom smiled at me affectionately. We're ready. Just then, Zane trudged around the back of the transport. How'd you get away? Alec asked. Zane shrugged. I told the old man I had an assignment to fulfill. Alec raised his eyebrows. He was fine with that? Zane shook his head. I told him we'd have to find a way to check in. He has the transmitter, Alec's dad added. I'll talk with him as often as I can. Zane nodded. I think he'd appreciate that. Thank you. Alec's dad walked closer and put a hand on Zane's shoulder. This is a great service your father's doing for our community. Zane clenched his jaw. I know. You should be proud, he added, and Mila's eyes were glassy. Load up, Pash commanded, and we obediently walked to our transport doors. Chapter 37 we arrived in P3 at first light. Pash had wisely stopped and charged the transports for the last half of the afternoon and evening. Then we drove the final stretch during the night. I didn't sleep a wink. I was too nervous. I offered to help drive when I noticed Case growing sleepy, but he wasn't willing to take me up on it. My heart pounded as we drove through the boundaries. It looked both how I remembered it and nothing like I remembered at the same time. The communities often felt that way to me. I had no connection to the way this place looked in the real world, at least not any connection I wanted to keep. I missed the trees springing up in the distance. I missed the beautiful dome of the grid, the blue sky, and the brilliant shades of green in the grass. 
I missed the way the unreal world looked and how it used to make me feel. Now, all of it is tainted. Real and unreal, you don't have a home anymore. We are going to build a new one. Kenna and Tree waited for us inside the community building. I handed Tree the transmag before even saying hello. It was a miracle that nothing had happened to it, given the circumstances surrounding our rescue mission to P7. I didn't want to hold on to such valuable tech one second longer than I had to. They whisked us away to the community center offices, and Sloan, Case, Alec, Zane, Mila, and I met with Kenna and Tree. I glanced at the chair Cass had sat in on our last visit here and shuddered. Congratulations, you made it. Kenna gave a grim smile. Things are going that well, are they? Pash chuckled. Kenna sighed. It's going well, it's just a lot. She sat down behind the desk where Alec and I had been interrogated. I thought we should talk about some things before we meet with everyone. Everyone? Darius asked. The community leaders, world builders, other representatives. The ones that are left, anyway. By the time we got here, they received word of the contract. Over half of them bailed. That would explain why we saw Cass in P7, but I still didn't understand how she got there so quickly. Kenna continued. From what we've seen, Cass has been working quite closely with Bryn. I think she was gone long before we got here. I shook my head. It figured. Of the few community leaders I'd met, it made sense that those two had found each other. What about the people that are linked here? Kenna pulled up a projection on the tablet in front of her to illustrate the various locations within P3 where people were being held. I found the stacks we'd entered immediately. Your mom and Ave's parents are still here. Kenna pointed right where I'd expected. They're not doing well, Channel. After we left, P3 continued to roll out Cerebrolink aggressively. Nearly 75% of this community has been linked. I clutched my midsection. But it's only been a couple of weeks? How was that possible? I'd witnessed the push to link, but never in a million years did I think it could have gone that quickly. They're all without resources? No. Kenna pointed at one of the other buildings on the map. They've designated three locations for linked members. Each of them operates under a different protocol. Vera is here. She tapped. It seems they were testing a different variable here. I looked at her quizzically. A different variable? Kenna's eyes flicked to Tree. They have truly been experimenting. Tree stepped forward with a disapproving look. Creating different scenarios within the edge and collecting data on how people react. I think that's what they're doing to us. Mila glanced at Zane and Sloan. Bryn was trying to force us into something. He was making it torturous inside Cerebrolink so we'd go. I don't know. A red light. I don't know what that means. Pain flickered across her expression. A shiver traveled down my spine. Whatever he did, I think it worked. Maybe not for what he was looking for, but it certainly did something. What do you mean? Kenna leaned forward. I subconsciously touched the drive in my pocket. When she came out, Mila mentioned something that sounded out of the ordinary, at least to me. I downloaded the data, and I'm planning to analyze it in the grid. Kenna nodded, her interest piqued. I want to hear more about that. We don't know what he was trying to accomplish. I wish we had more definitive information, but we don't. That doesn't change the fact that we still have a lot of decisions to make. We're working on getting the reels from Southwest Territory situated, Sloan explained. They're not happy about the fact that they have to rely on us to provide them with resources. More like they want to be helpful, Darius corrected. You need to put everyone to work, or you're going to have unhappy people on your hands. Tree smiled broadly. You are people after our own hearts. Darius nodded proudly. I was hoping you'd say that. Kenna reached across the desk and picked up a tablet from a stack that was sitting there. Would you be willing to be our real advocate and coordinator? Kenna handed the tablet to Darius before he could accept. He nodded soberly. I've done some research on you, and I know your history. 
I assume you'll be comfortable using a simple database. Darius grinned. It hasn't been that long since I left. I wasn't finished. Sloan cut in, and all eyes turned to her. She swallowed hard. One of the reels was injured on our journey to Fowler's Bluff. He was critical to our escape from the community troops. He's blind. She swallowed hard. He won't ever be able to see again. I'd like to request Cerebralink on his behalf. A low murmur broke out around the room, but Kenna held up a hand. I find it hard to believe a real from out east wants to be linked. Sloane's expression hardened. When you can't see, your priorities change. Kenna nodded. I'll discuss with the Unreal medical team. They can set up a time for an assessment. Sloane nodded appreciatively, then deflated as she stepped back into the group. Kenna straightened, her expression becoming serious. We're also considering activating the edge. Isn't it already activated? I asked reflexively. Yes, but not for us. Not for you. Since you're linked, that connection to your implant was deactivated. Same situation for him. She nodded toward Darius. His IP address was deleted from the system years ago. I inhaled slowly. You're talking about our implants? Kenna nodded. It would make things a lot easier if we could communicate that way. Darius shook his head vehemently and held out the tablet. Happy to use this. Thank you very much. I figured. What about you, Channel? I glanced nervously at Alec. I'd never gotten used to using a tablet. It was going to be clunky. On the other hand, it made me nervous to give anybody access to my mind again, in any capacity. It would only be me. Kenna read my thoughts. It will be minimal. Only allowing you access to the functions you need for this mission. Nothing more. That was better. I pursed my lips, then finally exhaled. I think that makes the most sense for me. I didn't look at Darius or Alec to see their reaction to my decision, but Kenna nodded approvingly. We'll get that set up immediately. She opened a new projection. I've given all of you, those who will be helping with the unreal side of things, that is, access to the P3 database and our group folders. You need to familiarize yourself with the information we've already collected and organized. The Vivientes are working day and night to get the energy system up and running. For right now, we are being as efficient as possible. As you can imagine, with so few people functioning normally here, production on food and sanitation has dramatically slowed. And now with our arrival, we've nearly doubled the population. She pulled up a chart and showed the detailed numbers. We had a meeting with everyone last night, and we'll be meeting again with P3 community leadership tonight at 1800. We'll be making decisions there. So if you'd like to be a part of it, please do your reading immediately. I didn't know what time it was, but based on our arrival, I figured we only had a few hours to get ourselves up to speed. I need to see them. Kenna's nostrils flared. She knew what I meant. You have access, Channel. You don't need to clear that through me. Your mom may not have much time left. Based on the information I've seen, Vera's vitals are just fine, but her linking is quite extensive. It's going to be difficult to pull her out. My breath hitched in my throat. Alec slipped his hand in mine as Kenna nodded resolutely. That's it for now. Our meeting this evening will be in the auditorium. Where exactly is that? Sloan asked. I pointed down the hall. I'll show you on the way out. We stood and strode toward the exit, but didn't make it before Kenna's voice rang out. Edge access should activate within the hour. Chapter 38 After showing our group around the community center, I slipped out the doors near the auditorium and jogged down the street, then took a left and headed directly for the stacks. Channel. A man's voice called out behind me. I turned and blinked when I saw who it was. I spun back around. If I was looking for company, I would have asked for it. Don't you think it's appropriate that I come along? Darius hustled to catch up. Appropriate? I scoffed as anger bubbled up in my chest. You think she's really going to want to see you? He didn't answer. Besides, 
What are you even going to do? It's not like you can link up with her. Darius had longer legs, and he easily caught up. You heard what Kenna said in there. She might not have very much time left. Why does that suddenly matter to you? I slowed to a walk. It always mattered to me. I was the one who wanted to stay, remember? His eyes bored into the side of my head, but I refused to meet them. I know you were listening to my side of the story. In the transport? I rolled my eyes. It doesn't matter. Even if your version of events were true, it doesn't explain why you never made contact. You said you had helpful skills, right? Was there no way for you to contact us? Send us a message? Even if you couldn't come back? Darius was silent a moment. The only sound between us the slapping of our shoes along the dirt path. You're right. I should have tried harder. I was upset. And more than a little afraid. I didn't want to do anything else that would potentially harm you or your mother. She told me you were dead. I shot back. Darius flinched. I guess, all things considered, that wasn't the worst story. Wasn't the worst story? I wanted to scream at him. But instead, I walked faster and balled my hands into fists. Then, I thought about what I would have done if she'd told me the truth. I didn't have to go far down that path to find my answer. I would have left. Maybe not right away, but it would have happened eventually. I'd already found reason enough to question the state of things within the communities. That would have tipped me over the top, and I would have gone looking for him. I think Mom knew I wouldn't have been able to leave it alone. I think I always hoped you wouldn't. We walked in silence past Vera's house, and I barely gave myself permission to scan the facade. It was the same as when I'd left it last, which made sense. Not much time had passed since I was standing here on the street with her, since she took me inside and cared for me or helped me find Ave. Yet so much had changed in P3. The sameness also seemed impossible. The relief I felt at knowing that Vera was okay helped numb the grief steadily building within me. Why was I doing this again? I don't know what she's going to be like. I beheld the stacks, looming closer and closer with every step. You saw her in there before? Darius asked. I nodded. I tried to bring her out with me. When I got Ave. Darius inhaled sharply. She wouldn't come. I don't know if she didn't believe me or if she was just too scared. Probably a little bit of both, don't you think? Darius slowed as we approached the entrance. I'm sure you already know this, but your mom is a rule follower. It makes her very uncomfortable to do something in opposition to guidelines she's been given. I rolled my eyes. Oh, I'm well aware of that fact. She wouldn't let me overdraw our rations, even when I'd been more physically active than expected. Darius laughed. <laughs> I believe it. But surprisingly enough, that's exactly what attracted me to her. Really? I couldn't imagine that rigidity and blind obedience would be an attractive quality, especially seeing how things ended up. Definitely. There was something comforting about being with someone that you knew would always do what she said. She was so consistent. She made it easier for me to be. His answer made me think, and I realized it had been the same for me. It would have been so easy for me to slack off in my studies or get distracted from the things that were most important. But Mom never let that happen. Since I'd grown up with her reminding me to plan ahead and pay attention to details, that rational voice was what guided me today, even if I didn't always follow it. I hadn't ever thought to give her credit. I scanned my own wristband this time to open the door and step inside the building. The smell invaded my nostrils, and I gagged. No part of me wanted to be here. I hated to admit it, but I was glad I wasn't alone, even though I wouldn't have chosen Darius as my companion. I have to call her number on the console. Give me a sec. Darius nodded, his face stricken as he took in the pods in front of us. I scanned my wristband again, and just like Kenna had promised, it gave me access to the database. 
I easily pulled up Mom's number, and one of the stacks hummed into motion. I stepped back as the belt rotated and waited for the tables to stop. This is insane, Darius growled. I know. There wasn't anything else to say. You were linked? Darius glanced down at my neck. I was. I used to be right here in one of the stacks. I stared straight ahead and willed the conveyor belt to move more quickly. Darius's jaw clenched. I thought you were with the Coalition. Who told you that? I've been asking questions. I shot him a glance and he held up a hand in defense. I turned back the tables. Nobody told you about our mission here in P3? Darius shook his head. Well, to make a long story short, Ave and I came back here to try and find a way to shut down Cerebralink. We'd seen enough to know something was wrong, that community leaders were doing something unethical, but we couldn't prove it, and we didn't have enough manpower to jump in and stop it. Darius looked at me skeptically. So, that was their solution? Send in a couple of teenagers to try and bring down a system created by the council? I shrugged. I happen to have a very useful set of skills. Darius chuckled. I talked with Abe for a moment when we stopped in San Francisco. He's grown up. That he has. The stack slowed and ground to a stop in front of us. I walked forward and wondered if Darius was going to have the guts to follow me. Hi, Mom. I reverently touched her cool skin and tried to ignore the details of her skeletal frame. It had only been a couple of weeks, and yet she'd wasted away to almost nothing. I'm going to go in, I announced. I wanted to see her how I remembered her. How? Very carefully. I unrolled the wires connected to my implant, then showed him how I'd been able to attach them to the panel in Mom's console. That allows you to go where? He tapped his temple. Into her mind? I nodded. It takes a little bit of getting used to. My heart thrummed nervously in my chest. It had been a while since I'd done this, and now standing here, I remembered how disorienting it was, how nauseating to be pulled through the lights in the tunnels. Just make sure I don't fall or do something weird, okay? Darius nodded, and I connected the final wire and braced myself. Chapter 39 I flew, zipped through streams of light until I finally landed in a space I remembered. Glowing threads and tiny dew droplets surrounded me. There were more than last time. So many I could barely move without touching one. Without hesitating, I dove further, and my stomach lurched as I shrank and expanded, eventually materializing in my form. I waited for my head to stop spinning. Mom? I called out hesitantly. In here, she answered, and the sound of her cheery voice hit me square in the chest. I thought I'd remembered the way she sounded, but I didn't. Not exactly. I crept forward and put out a hand just in case I lost my balance. This house wasn't the same as the one I'd been in last time. It was smaller and less grand, more modern. Lush greenery filled the space outside the windows and my feet slipped easily along the wood floors. Channel? She turned from the counter with a smile, then observed me quizzically. That's not how you were dressed earlier. You know me. I laughed nervously. Always have to change something up. She smiled and her whole face lit up. In here, she looked healthy and strong. No papery, translucent skin or sunken... No papery, translucent skin or sunken cheeks. You're right. I do know you. She waltzed forward and put a hand on my cheek. What's wrong? I shook my head, trying to clear the tears that were forming in my eyes. It's really good to see you, Mom. She laughed, high and tinkling. The sound pulled me back to evenings where we ate dinner together in the kitchen. I'd say something particularly angsty, and instead of rolling her eyes, she'd laugh like this, as if she knew something about me that I didn't. 
it had been impossible to stay grumpy for long. You're funny, you know that? You see me every single day and then suddenly look at me as if we're getting together for the first time. Mom shook her head and turned back to whatever project she was working on. I followed and peeked over her shoulder. What are you making? Croissants, she announced proudly. I went to Paris a week ago, remember? I saw how they used to do it, when people had to make their own food. There's something so satisfying about mixing the dough and making it just right. She ran her fingers along the smooth, buttery surface. I nodded. Of course. I didn't understand what she meant. I'd never made anything like this for myself or anyone else for that matter. I'm dead set on mastering these if it's the last thing I do. She smiled and flicked her hair behind her ear before she pressed down on the lump of dough. I swallowed hard. Is Dad here? She shook her head. He comes and goes. He likes to adventure. He always has. I wished I could ask her for her side of the story. I wanted to hash things out and find out why she never told me the truth. But I couldn't do it. If she didn't have long to live, I didn't want to make her miserable. I only wanted to stand here with her and watch her press air bubbles with her rolling pin. It's called lamination. You roll the dough into thin layers, then stack them on top of each other. I nodded, not really listening. It didn't matter why she did what she did. I'd never once doubted that she loved me, even if I didn't agree with her way of showing it. She wanted to do the safe thing. Always the safe thing. The problem was, safe didn't always exist, even when we could convince ourselves it did. Standing beside her, I realized there was nothing else I wanted or needed. I wasn't going to try and force her to be the mom I'd created in my fantasies. She'd done the best she could, and given me everything she knew how to. Now, it was my job to accept it, and decide it had been enough. Mom, I whispered. Hmm? That dough looks amazing. Thank you, sweetheart. I wrapped my arms around her shoulders and squeezed her tight. Thanks for everything. I love you. Aw, oh, thanks, Channel. I love you too. She smiled and the lines around her eyes crinkled. I think I'm going to go. With Ave? He always stops by and asks for you. A lump formed in my throat. Right. I'm going to go hang out with Ave. Still working on your world build competition? Yep. Still trying to make progress. I choked out. I know you're going to win that eventually. A tear slipped down my cheek and I wiped it away. Thanks, Mom. See you soon? She asked with her back still to me. See you soon. I woke to find Darius holding my hand. I lifted my head and the smell of cleaning solution enveloped me. Had it been that strong when we walked in? Are you okay? Darius's face was a mask of concern. I nodded and reached with a shaky hand to carefully unhook the wires. My cheeks were wet, and I hastily wiped them dry. What happened in there? Darius asked. He stepped back to stand. She was baking. He nodded, eagerly waiting for any other piece of information I had to offer. I told her I loved her. I said goodbye. He watched me and his eyes grew misty. She's a good woman. She was. I walked forward, not able to look behind me at the bodies on the tables. Within a week or two, these people were all going to be gone. These pods would be empty. And for what? Curiosity? A desire to reduce resource usage across the community board? Even if it had sounded right on paper, it was not a good look in real life. Where are you off to next? Darius asked as I opened the door and stepped out into the afternoon glow. I'm going to find Vera. Darius had seen Kenna's explanation of how the buildings differed. He didn't know who Vera was, but he knew that she'd be in better shape than the linked members we just witnessed. I didn't have the energy to give him any more explanation than that. Do you want me to come with you? He asked. 
I thought my answer to that question would have been an absolute no. But it had been comforting to have somebody with me as I walked these streets. Even though I logically knew there was no threat here, not anymore, I couldn't convince my body of that fact. Every step I took was mired with trepidation and laced with fear. I shook my head. No, there's a lot to be done with the reels. I'm fine going on my own. Are you sure? I nodded, trying to convince myself. It shouldn't take long. All right, then. I'll see you back in our section of town a little later. His face screwed up in thought. I don't even know what to call it. P3 is a lot bigger than I remembered it. I shrugged. We didn't really have a naming system. We just described things in relation to the grid. You said that word in the meeting, too. What is it? He shifted on his feet awkwardly. It was strange to explain our home to the person who should know it best. It's a simulator, a place where we can experiment with code easily, mostly used for group projects. That's where you want to take that information you got from P7? I nodded. I have a feeling. I think there's something on there that we can use. Nothing like the grid existed when I was here, he mused. We'd talked about building something like that, but nothing had been finalized. It's nice to know what happened. Hopefully it was more successful in preparing future world builders. It doesn't really matter now, does it? I muttered. If you want, when I get some time to analyze everything, I can show the grid to you. He smiled. I'd like that. I started away from him toward the street that led to the building Vera was held in. You should probably get going on that homework in the meantime, I called back. Darius chuckled. Shouldn't it be the other way around? Me telling you to do your homework? I gave a small wave and walked as fast as I could away from the stacks. Chapter 40 This building wasn't a monstrosity like the other one. Only two stories but longer and somehow curved. The brick on the outside was crumbling, just like all the structures in P3, but the inside looked a lot like where we'd found Mila, Zane, and Sloane in P7. Sterile. Utilitarian. A more intense setup with state-of-the-art consoles. I quickly assessed the circuitry and wondered if these people were linked together like they'd been in P7. They weren't. These cords traveled into communal ports just like they'd done in the stacks. I knew where this data was ending up. The room in the community center with all the data banks, where Alec and I had been when Vera sacrificed herself to give us an out. I stood and scanned the room for an access point. I thought back to our conversation with the principal when we were in San Francisco. Why was Bryn doing this? I'd accepted that he was on a quest for information, but the principal was right. There had to be a reason for it, an end goal. Information for what? Curiosity for curiosity's sake would be difficult to justify. My mind kept spinning, weaving together all the pieces as I walked down the aisles and scanned each face in case it was one I recognized. Bryn used to hold the keys to the communities. That much had been made clear to us by Straya. He owned the technology, and most of the population was dependent on it. Even the real populations relied on community resources to survive, though they wouldn't easily admit it. Who knew where all of that stood now? What would we be facing next? If there was anything we could learn from the past, it was that even the smallest of changes could affect our ability to survive. If more plants started growing, how would that affect bacteria levels, viruses, Weather patterns. I spotted the central console and quickly swiped in and searched for a map to orient myself. These pods were only stacked three high, and from where I was standing, it looked like they spanned the entire length of the building. It wouldn't be the end of the world if I had to check everything manually, but I wouldn't be getting back in time for that meeting. Through a series of searches and taps, I finally found what I was looking for. Vera was on the other side. Row 32, bed number one. I put the console to sleep and started walking, still puzzling over the strands of information we had to work with. 
Maybe I needed to start thinking more like Bryn. What he was doing didn't make sense from our perspective because we were focused on different things. We had different goals. If I could orient myself correctly, just like I'd done with the map, maybe something would come into focus. A face suddenly caught my eye and I stopped. The table on my right held a girl I recognized. Pale skin, freckles, and strawberry blonde hair. Glynn. Looked like she was one of the lucky ones, linked here instead of the stacks. This was depressing. All of these people that could be thriving in our communities were instead living in a solo world to satiate one man's quest for knowledge and power. I felt for the drive in my pocket as I walked forward and finally stopped at Vera's row. There she was, lying still on the bottom bunk as if she were sleeping peacefully. I hadn't even bothered rolling up the wires after visiting Mom, so it was going to be easy to quickly plug them in here. The port was different, and it took me a minute to find the access panel. I pried it open and my stomach grumbled. I hadn't eaten since we'd gotten out of the transports. As soon as my edge connection was back online, I needed to set myself an alarm for meals. This was getting ridiculous. I sat down on the floor and connected my wires, then leaned against the wall and closed my eyes. Back through the lights, back to the silvery beads. Then suddenly, I was plopped down in the middle of a field of green. The color was breathtaking, and I quickly scrambled to my feet. There were hills and trees, wildflowers growing in patches, all the colors forming whimsical, swirling patterns through the grass. A channel? I turned to find Vera dressed from head to toe in black tactical gear, much like what Ave and I had worn in my version of reality when we were linked. Vera. I was just as stunned by the juxtaposition of her intensity next to the softness of the landscape as I was relieved to see her standing there. What are you doing here? She blinked in the bright sunlight. I was about to ask you the same thing. She snorted, her blonde bob waving forward across her face. I don't exactly have a choice. I'm always here. No, I meant this meadow. It's beautiful. Not what I expected. I'd anticipated colorful walls and tapestries. Vera shrugged. I figured if I had to be here, I might as well look at something pretty. But there's not really any point. I'm just waiting for it to be destroyed again. Destroyed? Vera nodded. Anything I create here, it only lasts a few hours. Days, at most. Her brow furrowed. I don't know exactly how long, to be honest. I lost track of time a while ago. I know the feeling. I took a step closer. I'm glad you're okay. When we left, a lump formed in my throat and I swallowed it. I'm so sorry we had to leave. I chose to come back, Channel, she stated matter-of-factly. She swept a piece of her platinum hair behind her ear. Vera looked exactly like she had when Mom and I met her for the first time. Besides, that was a long time ago. I cocked my head to the side. Not that long ago. Only a couple of weeks. What? Her face pulled into a grimace. I nodded. A lot has happened, Vera, and we need your help. Her face blanched. I don't know how useful I'll be. I tried breaking out of here the way you described. I couldn't do it. Every time I tried, it was like I was knocked back. Like something was physically forcing me behind a wall. You're not in the same facility I was, I explained. We think Bryn was carrying out experiments, changing the variables. Vera held still. I knew I was linked within the first few minutes of being here. There were too many things that happened in strange ways, and I remembered the way you described your reality here. But then parts of myself seemed to shut off. She snapped her fingers. Just like that. Like my hearing wouldn't exist, or I suddenly couldn't process the things I was seeing. Then, as quickly as they'd gone to sleep, they'd pop back up into existence. Totally normal. I know that probably doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have to. I worked to understand what he'd been trying to accomplish. I needed to get inside his head. We're here now. The Coalition is in charge of this community. 
We made an agreement with the council, and I'm going to help get you out. Her eyes were hopeful for a moment, but then her face fell. How? I don't know. But I do have access to your link, your data, everything. I figure I'll start there. Vera nodded. Is my family here too? I blinked, realizing I hadn't even thought to look for her partner. How stupid could I be? I'm not sure, but I'll find out. I was focused on finding you. I'm so sorry I didn't check. Vera nodded. We know that in order to safely remove your link, we have to decrease the number of connections Cerebralink has made with your brain. That's what I'm going to work on. I don't think I'll be able to come here like this often, but I should be able to send you messages. Can I send information back? She asked. I shrugged. I guess we'll find out. Chapter 41 I left Vera's and hurried back to my housing unit. I'd been assigned to stay with Mila while Alec and Zane were staying next door with Alec and Mila's parents. The two of them had to share a room, and Mila and I couldn't get over how hilarious that was. We were sure they either said nothing to each other or talked until late hours of the night, telling one another all their deep, dark secrets. The whole group of reels and not-so-unreels was in the section of abandoned houses directly next to the bathhouse. It was strange enough being back, but even stranger not being in my own home. I hadn't been brave enough to walk up and look at it yet, and I didn't know if I'd ever be ready to see it empty and abandoned. As I walked along the dirt path toward my new home, the edge suddenly flickered to life. My stomach flipped, and I stopped in the middle of the street waiting for it to calibrate. Just as Kenna had promised, my world didn't suddenly light up with beauty and color like it used to. Instead, I saw my console, my clock, and essential applications. I had easy access to the folders she'd referenced, and I had the overwhelming urge to stand there in the street and read them from start to finish. I breathed a sigh of relief. I'd never have to search for a console again. I started reading on my way home. Kenna hadn't been kidding. There was a lot of information to sort through, and there was no way I was going to get through it all before the meeting. I began with the most important. Basic community statistics, project goals, and current proposals for real integration. We were going to have to study up on how to rewrite our algorithms using a new blockchain system, but that was simply a matter of technical understanding. That decision had already been made. These other things, they still needed to be figured out, and we didn't have any right answers. If I had to guess, this was what we'd spend most of our time talking about in the meeting. The issue that most concerned me was how to treat Cerebralink and augmentation moving forward. There was a place for these things, there had to be, but it wasn't going to work the way it was currently instituted. Not only did some of the Unreals like me have issues with it, but the Reels would never be convinced to use Unreal technology. They didn't have control over it. Yes, with our new system, everyone would have control, but that also meant that nobody would. Our world would be in the hands of those who built it. The reels were coming from complete self-reliance. No system besides cooperation, the occasional community handout, and neighborly kindness. Somehow, we had to find a way to make both work. If we were going to continue to use this technology, which, in my opinion, wasn't optional, we had to find a way to make it variable and customized. A system where people could opt in on the daily or even hourly, not a one-time decision. For augmentation, this was simple. We already had contact lenses and devices for people to use externally when they wanted to. They weren't perfect and had some definite drawbacks, but they could work. For those of us with implants, though, we didn't currently have a choice. Either we were in or out, and being in felt scary to even me at this point. It wasn't practical to change the implants themselves, because they were already there, in our eyes and brainstems. For future implantation, adjustments could be an option, but that was so far beyond our current set of issues, I didn't even want to go there. If we couldn't change things on the physical side, that meant we were left with code, the programming. 
There had to be a way for connectivity to the edge to be optional. I spotted Alec returning from the transports and realized I'd gone past my house and his. I'd been so caught up in my thoughts, I hadn't been paying attention. He assumed I was walking toward him, and I pretended he was right. He smiled. How'd it go? I swiped away my reading. It was hard. I'm so sorry. He shoved his hands in his pockets. His shoulders sagged, and I could almost feel his exhaustion. There would be plenty of time for us to talk about what happened with Mom, but now was not the right moment. I reached out and gently brushed a bit of dirt off his forearm. How's everything going here? Alec looked back at the vehicle. Pretty well, I think. Is everyone nervous? I asked. Definitely. I think some of the people back home are still convinced they're going to be assimilated. Any second now. Well, that is the goal. I smiled deviously. Have you been doing your reading? Alec shook his head. When exactly would I be reading? I can't figure out how to use that thing anyway. What thing? The tablet. I laughed, then clapped a hand over my mouth. I'm sorry. I know it's not funny. I'm pretty sure you think it's funny. I kept my hand over my mouth until I could compose myself. I can show you, if you want. He shook his head. How about you fill me in? Walk while we talk? I nodded and fell into step with him as we turned back to his parents' house. I summarized what I'd read, then cautiously brought up the topic of the edge and augmentation. We walked inside, and Alec picked up a box, then walked down the hall. His brow furrowed as he listened intently and unloaded their personal items into the drawers and cupboards of the kitchen. They hadn't brought much since they'd known the houses would be outfitted and furnished, but there were a few items they couldn't live without. I don't see how any of the reels are going to get on board with that, Alec commented when I finished. If you're connected to the edge, there's always a chance that someone could override the system. Hack it, right? I smiled. It was adorable when he tried to talk digitally. No, but that's just it. I hopped up and sat on the counter next to him. That's how the current system is set up. That's why our community leaders opted to remove their implants. I'm convinced of it. They knew it was susceptible, and they weren't willing to take the chance that someone could take control. But with this technology, it wouldn't be possible. Wouldn't be possible? Alec asked skeptically. I nodded. Right. It builds in a way that makes it impossible for people to change everything all at once. Even if they were lucky enough to change a few things, all of us who've contributed to the system own the entire record of everything that's been created. So if one person owns something that gives a different set of instructions, it will automatically show up as being wrong when compared to the rest of our logs. Alec frowned. So, if you all have a record of everything from the beginning of the system, then to change anything permanently, someone would have to change it for everyone. Mm-hmm. I nodded excitedly, grateful he understood. That might be easy in the beginning when there are only a small number of contributors, but once we get bigger, imagine, Alec, every single person in all of the communities worldwide building into this. It's like what's happening with Cerebralink right now, except nobody will be lying on tables close to death. Alec blanched at my comparison, but moved on. Everyone would be contributing. All of us building the system. Nobody's in charge, but all of us are. When enough code comes together from any of these sources, it creates a block that is added to the blocks before it, creating a chain. In the beginning, it would be small, but the amount of data that could be added is infinite. Alec folded up the box and set it on the floor next to the cupboard door. Someone would have to hack every single access point to be able to change anything? Exactly. It's virtually impossible, especially because everyone would be able to set up their own security for that port. Even if someone attempted it, they'd be caught as soon as one person noticed their code didn't check out. People would take the time to check that? I shrugged. 
they don't have to. It will be built in. The system will be constantly checking and alerting system maintenance of any issues, just like it currently does with viruses. Viruses? He grimaced. Pieces of code that are built to mess with or destroy other programs. Viruses. Like the ones we get in our bodies? Alec asked. Kind of. But these ones people have to build. Alec pulled the trash out and held up the bag. You guys compost here, right? I laughed. Just set it on the counter. I'm sure sanitation will be on the agenda for discussion at the meeting. I glanced up at my time display. We only had an hour before we needed to be back at the community center auditorium. Alec reached for my hand. Passion Ames are distributing food, up at the top of the street. Really? I asked, a little too excitedly. Alec chuckled. He nodded toward the front door, and we pulled our masks back up. Chapter 42 Alec and I stood in the food line. The sky was still hazy outside, but mostly clear of ash or debris. I remembered that first glimpse of my community during the reveal. That image was still burned in my memory. You look like you're about to pass out. Zane handed me a food packet and a drink. It looked exactly as I remembered, and I smiled from ear to ear. You already know this, but wrappers go in the compost. He pointed to a tall cylindrical bin on his left. How are you? I asked. Zane scowled, and that was more comforting than anything he could have said. Alec and I walked away from the tables and sat down on the fake textured grass. What is this? Alec asked immediately as we sat, and I shrugged. Nobody knows, but when it looked all green and beautiful, it was nice to sit on. Alec shook his head, then grimaced at the food in his hands. What's this? I clicked my tongue. You're about to have an experience. This is a typical lunch in P3. He tapped the middle ball with his fingernail. It's hard. I laughed. Just bite into it. The middle is soft. He reluctantly lifted it to his mouth and obediently bit in, chewing slowly. It's not bad, but I wouldn't say it's good either. I took a bite. You have to get used to it, but this is a complete meal. Everything your body needs in three conveniently packaged spheres. Alec groaned. It's like you're trying to sell them to me? Maybe I am. Maybe that's the whole reason I brought you here, to convince you to obsess over community food packets. Alec smirked. Sounds like something you'd do. We finished our meal and made our way up to the auditorium. Halfway there, we found the rest of our group. Darius looked relieved to see me, and Mila gave us an excited wave while Zane acknowledged us with a slight nod. Can you believe we're actually doing this? Mila asked. I sighed. No. I honestly can't. I never thought we'd get here. Yes, you did. Mila planted a hand on her hip. You believed this would happen all along. I hoped. That's different than believing. Sometimes hope is enough, Zane added, and I looked at him in surprise. Since when had he gotten all poetic? The nervous energy was palpable as we approached the community center doors. None of us knew what to expect, but we all understood that whatever happened within these walls tonight was going to be important. A bad combination for nerves and anxiety. We walked through the doors and Kenna, Pash, and Tree stood in front of us. Do none of you check your messages? Kenna asked in obvious frustration. My eyes flicked up toward my notification bar. My eyes widened when I saw the blinking light. I'm sorry, I didn't notice. You four, and especially you she pointed at Case, are not allowed to attend the meeting. She crossed her arms over her chest as if waiting for a fight. What are you talking about? I looked between Sloan, Mila, and Zane. Had she pointed at Alec? She ignored me. Straya has decided to attend. I frowned. So? She knows who we are. Exactly. That's the problem. I mirrored her stance. Why was she always trying to cut us out? If important decisions are being made in there, we want to have a say. Kenna sighed. Channel, 
I want you to have a say too, which is why I invited you. But unless we want this entire thing shut down, you need to keep yourself out. What is this all about? Darius pushed to the front. Oh, and you too, Kenna muttered. The two of you are fine. She nodded to Alec and Mila's parents. You're fine too. She smiled at Alec. The rest of you were involved in an attack on P7 and won't be admitted to the auditorium. Part 7. Mila. May 11, 2161 through August 26, 2161. Chapter 43. Channel's jaw dropped. What attack? If you'd checked your messages, you would have seen that I received a report from the council an hour ago listing how a group of vigilantes, who they believe are connected with the coalition, attacked P7 Cerebralink patients, killing two highly ranked community leaders. They were able to capture one of these attackers, unfortunately not alive. Kenna's hands clenched into fists, which meant they weren't able to get information on the partner she was working with, but they assume one of the P7 trained guards was in on it. She looked purposely in Case's direction, and he swallowed hard. Kenna continued, I've assured Straya through official communication that we had nothing to do with this attack. I told her these people were working outside of our orders because they believed P7 was holding reels without permission. But that's true, Zane growled. Kenna's eyes flashed. Obviously that part's true. What's not true is that the people who entered P7 that day weren't associated with the coalition. So again, unless we want this entire operation shut down, what I just read to you is the truth we're operating under. I glanced at the others. Channel stood seething. I couldn't believe they were trying to nail us with a contract violation when they burned down our home base and integrated us, pulled us out of Fowler's Bluff, after she and Kenna had already signed the agreement. We have to stay out, Channel repeated through gritted teeth. I want to hear what you have to say, but yes, we can't risk her recognizing any of you, Kenna repeated. Channel fiddled angrily with the wristband around her arm, then gasped. I know how we could do it. Do what? Kenna's worry transformed into annoyance when she realized Channel wasn't talking about the meeting. She motioned for the approved attendees to walk through the auditorium doors. I gave mom and dad a quick hug. I know how to allow people with implants to access the edge with complete autonomy, Channel continued. That topic is going to be on the agenda tonight, right? My ears perked up. This was something all the reels had been talking about on the transport. Kenna blinked, but quickly caught up. She nodded. I was thinking about an activator of some sort, a device they wear. No. Channel shook her head. We can use the one they're already wearing. She looked down at her wrist. These are removable. People can take them off and put them on whenever they want. Obviously. Well, what if these held their access key? An activator, like you said. We could program the software within our implants to respond and activate the edge only when the key is present and optimized. Kenna considered this. We'd need new wristbands with added functionality. Obviously. Kenna ignored Channel's smart mouth comment. It would be a lot simpler to add a button than create a new device, she mused. I'll present it as a possibility. Channel drew a relieved breath. Alec brushed a hand across her lower back then smiled apologetically and walked through the doors with mom and dad, leaving the rest of us in the foyer. At least they'd be there to advocate for us, to make sure our voices were heard. Still, disappointment welled up inside me as I slid to the floor and propped myself against the auditorium wall. Hey, did you hear? We're vigilantes. Zane sat down next to me. Not you, Channel muttered. You were the ones being rescued. I helped you escape. I think that counts. Zane reached over and pulled me closer to him. I inspected his face and searched for any sign of a headache. Ever since he passed out in San Francisco, I watched him like a hawk. So now what? Sloan asked. We just wait? Looks like it. Channel sighed in frustration. Darius clapped his hands together. We don't have to wait and do nothing. He pointed at Channel. Didn't you want to take a look at that drive? 
Channel blinked. Do you think we'll have time? Darius shrugged. You said you could show me the grid. Channel hesitated and looked our direction. What? I asked. She pursed her lips. The grid requires augmentation. You don't need an edge connection, but you need to have the capability. Otherwise, you won't see anything. Zane shrugged. We can come along for moral support. I wasn't sure I wanted to be just moral support. I met Channel's gaze and she raised an eyebrow. Are the offices still open? Or is everyone in the meeting? When all of us were silent, she smiled mischievously. Come with me. We walked down the hall behind Case and Sloan, and Channel rushed forward when she saw someone seated at the front desk, facing the glass doors of the administrative entrance to the community center. Hi. She approached her a little too eagerly. We're with the Coalition, and I wondered if you had any smart contact lenses available for use. The woman adjusted the pins in her hair. Unfortunately, those are only for community leaders. Darius walked forward. I'm the real coordinator, and I believe Kenna has given me access for equipment. The woman looked at him skeptically, but then motioned for him to scan his wristband. She raised an eyebrow as her console dinged happily. You seem to be approved. How many pairs do you need? Two, Darius answered. Three, Channel corrected, and I was sure I knew who the extra pair was for. The woman nodded, then retreated to a thin door in the back wall. Channel stiffened, suddenly on edge as she watched her disappear behind the door, then reappear with a handful of thin cases. The woman walked to her desk, leaned over her tablet, and swiped each one. These are connected to your information. You'll be responsible if anything happens to them, she explained to Darius sternly. He nodded. I promise we'll take good care of them. She passed them over and Darius slipped them into his pocket. Thank you. Channel smiled and the woman nodded demurely. We exited the building and pulled our masks on as Channel led us down the path toward this magical place they'd been talking about. The grid. I'd heard it mentioned in our meeting earlier, and Channel had described it in the past. She'd used it in some way for her schooling and world-build projects. All of that meant nothing to me. Are we going to wear those? Contacts? Or whatever they are? Zane nodded toward Darius up ahead. They're just lenses. Case scoffed. They're removable? Zane asked, and Case nodded. Remember how we talked about that? I asked. How Channel told us that people high up in the communities removed their implants. Zane shrugged. I wasn't paying attention. I nudged him. Well, maybe next time you should. The corner of his mouth turned up and I smiled. He'd been more on edge since we arrived here in P3 and I couldn't blame him. Especially when we already struggled to keep his mind steady. When I got stressed, I got quiet. When Zane got stressed, he got surly. What? Zane asked. Nothing. I shot back. You were grinning. I'm not allowed to grin? Zane shook his head and I grinned at him until he finally cracked a smile. I sighed. I trust Channel. I don't think she'd give us anything she knew wouldn't be okay. I know. But this kind of thing makes me uncomfortable. I reached out and squeezed his hand, grateful that my parents were in that meeting so I could touch him freely. They'd figured out I had feelings for him, but I wasn't ready to throw it in their faces. Channel stopped in front of a set of long stone steps set in front of crumbling columns. Beyond that, there was a line of doors. Is this it? Zane asked, and I smacked his chest. This is the grid. Channel ignored his less than impressed comment. It doesn't look like much, but I promise it's infinitely cooler on the inside. If you open up your cases, you'll find two lenses that fit over the front of your eyes. We can help you put them on. It's weird to touch your own cornea. Zane chuckled, and I smacked him again, this time a little harder. What will happen with them on? I asked. Yeah, are we suddenly going to see everything in color? Zane asked. Nothing is going to change dramatically at first, Channel explained. But as soon as Darius activates things, you'll have options. You don't have to see anything you don't want. The most important part is that you'll have access for the simulator. I have to activate them? Darius asked. Channel shrugged. I assume that's how it works. They were assigned to you, so you should have access. Maybe under your assignments? 
or possibly settings? I think I found it. Darius tapped the air in front of them. Yep, here it is. It looks like there are varying levels. Channel and I are set to the most basic, which I can add for you too, or... Or we could see this place the way you used to? I asked, and my stomach fluttered. Alec was going to kill me, but it might be worth it. Channel had talked about the unreal world, and the version I'd experienced was nothing like it. I wanted to see through her eyes. Channel grinned. Sure. You can always change the settings back later. I nodded and glanced nervously at Zane. He pursed his lips, but when he saw my face, he softened and reluctantly nodded, too. I squealed with excitement and wrapped my arms around his waist. Really? I need something to replace that nightmare we lived in P7. His expression clouded over. This will be nothing like that, Channel promised. A pit opened up in my gut as I remembered Zane's back arched in pain. Nothing like that. We can turn it off if you don't like it, I promise. Zane nodded and reached for his case. Chapter 44 Darius placed the case in my hands and I carefully opened it. Two pale blue pools of liquid stared up at me. There's nothing here, I murmured. There is, you just can't see them at first, Sloane called. I dipped my finger into the liquid, my eyebrows furrowing, and gasped as something smooth attached to the end of my finger. I pulled it out and found what looked like half a bubble, resting on the tip of my finger. Here, I'll help you. Channel stepped forward. You've done this before? She shook her head. Nope, but I'm pretty sure we can figure it out together. I gulped as she lifted her fingers to my eyelid and pulled my eye wide open. She pursed her lips in concentration. Now, carefully put it close to your eye. I think it will stick. Stick? I asked nervously. She nodded. It's okay, it won't stay there forever. You'll be able to take it out. I tried to blink when the lens brushed against my cornea, but Channel kept my lids from closing. Okay, now pull your finger away, she instructed, and I slowly lifted it as she allowed my eyelids to relax. I blinked. It was the strangest feeling. I could tell something was there, but it was barely noticeable. We followed the same procedure with my left eye, and then she moved over to help Zane. If you've never done this before, do we even know they're on right? Zane asked. Channel shrugged. We'll find out soon enough, but I don't think it's possible to mess it up that bad. We gave our cases back to Darius, and Channel put her hands on her hips. Do you think you can activate it for them? The whole thing? Darius tapped the air in front of him. I'm not sure how much is currently active, but I'll load whatever's available. Ready? I reached out and held Zane's hand. I didn't think ready was something we'd ever be but this was as close as it was going to get. For a moment, nothing happened. I stared forward and waited for, well, I didn't know what. Then, colors burst into existence. One minute we were looking at dull colors and plain buildings, and the next? Oh, I breathed. This. I didn't have the words to finish that sentence. Structures appeared around me so unique and detailed I could barely process what I was seeing. Lush green trees popped out of nowhere, standing around the buildings in front of us and stretching far into the distance. Flowers adorned the pathways near our feet, and I turned, seeing the beautiful stone facade of the grid, supporting a gleaming dome at its peak. This is what you saw every day? Amazing, isn't it? Channel beamed. I turned back and did a double take. Channel looked different. She had hair again, for one thing, and there was something about her body that looked altered. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Two figures stood next to me, blank avatars with human-like outlines, and then there were two other people I didn't recognize. Both were impressive. One male, one female. The man was tall and muscular, wearing a t-shirt that showed off every curve of his shoulders. The girl? I simply stared. Was it even possible to have that narrow of a waist? My mind did the math and realized I was looking at Case and Sloane. The other two had to be Darius and Zane. I guess we could have taken a minute to set up your profiles. 
channel watched me gawk. Right now, you three are on the default settings, which is kind of boring. And creepy, I thought. I stared at the placeholders. Which one is which? I asked. There were numbers listed above their heads, but that didn't tell me anything. I'm here. I'm here. Zane's form brightened when he spoke. Check this out. Channel reached up and tapped. Her appearance suddenly shifted. Now she had purple hair and she wore a sparkly top that hung off one of her shoulders. That's what you were talking about! I shrieked excitedly. You can do that? With the touch of a button? Channel laughed. I'm not going to lie. I kind of missed this part. I spun in a circle and took it all in. I could see why she'd been so unimpressed with the real world. This was like nothing I'd ever experienced before. And I'd been held hostage by Cerebrolink. I think that's enough for me, Zane announced abruptly. Darius nodded and the colorful overlay disappeared. Channel winked at me, then turned and walked into the grid. My mind buzzed as we followed. Were we going to talk more about this? Because I couldn't just see something like that and move on like nothing had happened. I looked up at Zane, but his eyes were trained straight ahead. I sighed. I was going to have to geek out about this later with Channel at home. We're going to need a larger station, so follow me this way, Channel instructed. We stopped in front of a circular alcove with individual standing ports. I know this looks weird. You're going to move into your station like this. Channel moved forward and placed her head against a curved bar after adjusting it for height, then wrapped her fingers around two black protrusions on top of the railing. Your hands will go around the drivers, which will allow you to control things inside the simulation. She pulled herself back out and turned around to face us. I could try to explain everything, but I think it will make a lot more sense once you're inside. Inside what? Zane became more tense by the second. I put out a hand and brushed his arm. Channel pointed. It's a digital workspace. You're not going anywhere. At least not physically. I nodded and my heart raced. Channel motioned for us to take our places in the semicircle. I leaned forward, placing my head against the bar like I'd seen her do, noticing a low humming around my forehead. Lenses are active, Darius announced. Perfect. And I've got everything powered up. Channel brushed past me and took her place in one of the stations on my left. Put your hands on the drivers and slowly push forward. As soon as I wrapped my hands around the joysticks, the world lit up in front of me. I gasped and took in the swirling circle in the center of my vision. Push forward? Right, with the drivers. Gently. I did as she said, slowly pushing forward with my palms and watched the screen expand. Then suddenly, I dropped into a room. More than a room. I stood on green grass with a clear blue sky overhead. I felt a bit dizzy, but my breathing regulated as soon as I was stationary. Everyone else appeared around me, looking exactly as they had outside in the unreal world. So what's this thing capable of? Darius asked. I can display anything we want, Channel explained. But normally we use it to experiment with new code. Show us something, I blurted, hungry for more of this newness. Channel laughed. What do you want to see? I opened my mouth to answer but couldn't think of anything. This reality was so foreign to me and I couldn't even begin to imagine the possibilities. Here, what about something we tried a few years ago? Channel suggested. I think I still have all the files. Our group was trying to think of something to help with nightmares. When we're not in the grid, the edge sleeps when we do. Even when we close our eyes, the edge's default setting is to go dark. So people still sleep normally? I asked. Correct. Darius answered. At one point, we tried running sleep cycles digitally, attempting to calm and improve sleep, but it didn't have the desired effect. Channel scoffed. I didn't know that. We weren't trying to do anything that fancy, but we were trying to create a mode where any time you opened your eyes during the night, before seven in the morning, you'd see this. The room changed in front of us, dimming slowly, then illuminating with a pale, calming glow emanating from the edges of my vision. The light cycled between soft white, pastel pink, and then it evolved into a calming fresh green. As it cycled, 
whimsical images began to flit and float through the space. Butterflies, birds, flowers and trees in bloom. The effect was gradual but powerful. I was calm. My breathing slowed. This is incredible, I whispered, not wanting to break the spell. You built all of this? Channel smiled. With Abe's help. You said this was for a competition? Zane asked. Our world build projects weren't nearly this cool, Sloan muttered. Case shrugged. I wasn't into all this, hence the reason I got a security placement. Sloan barked a laugh. I obviously never made it to world builder status. The lights and images faded, and Channel again stood in front of us. We didn't win. But our group used this all the time over the next year or so, before we thought it was too little kiddish. Darius sighed. It's incredible. The program and the simulator. I wish I'd had this when we were experimenting with new projects. What did you want to look at? Zane spoke up. I was dying to know what he thought about all of this. Right. Channel reached up and built something in the air in front of her. My eyes widened as strings of numbers materialized in front of us. I already plugged in the drive, Channel explained. So now I only need to find the code around the moment where you jumped. You think that was real? Zane's voice was low, but his expressionless form gave me no clues as to how he was feeling. That's what we're going to find out. Channel scrolled for a long time, and I wished I could do something to make things easier. I had no idea what she was looking for, even though I'd been the one to experience it. I don't remember what happened, Zane whispered. I remember my head feeling really full, like there was something competing for my focus. I nodded, and my head brushed the bar it was resting against. The feeling was jarring. Experiencing physical sensation from outside the simulation. This isn't real, I reminded myself, taking a moment to ground my body that stood in the workstation. I tried to take myself back to that moment with Zane, how he looked, crawling across the dirt, how I joined his thoughts, his feelings and emotions, his memories. My cheeks flushed, remembering the way he'd looked at me. Darius let out a low whistle that snapped me back to the present. Channel stared up at the numbers between us. I've never seen anything like this before. You found it? My heart raced. We found something. Darius inspected the strings of code that looked like gibberish to me. It's... I don't even know how to describe it. It looks like spontaneous creation. It's her consciousness. Channel stared in awe. It's encapsulated. Look here. She pointed. This branch, do you see that? Darius's eyes widened. Mm-hmm. Then look. It disappears. Channel shook her head. She traveled. Literally traveled outside of herself and entered a new location. Here. You can see their signatures are combined. It's insane. Darius gaped. It shouldn't be possible. Mila, do you remember what was going through your head when this happened? Channel asked. I thought back to how Bryn had told us the pain wouldn't stop. How I'd begged Sloane and Zane to stay put. There was so much pain. Sloane spoke up. I couldn't focus on anything else. I remembered how Zane dragged himself toward the red column. Yes. I swallowed hard. Zane was in trouble. The pain was so intense, I knew I could get out. Get out of what? Channel asked. Whatever Bryn was doing. I'd done it a few minutes before, pushed through and stopped hurting. But Zane and Sloane didn't know how. I tried to do it for him, and the pain of going to him didn't add much to what I was already feeling. It hurt? To go to him? I nodded, then realized she couldn't see my reactions. My forehead was going to be rubbed raw at this rate. Yes, I answered. It felt... It actually felt a lot like it had earlier. When I'd walked toward the tube. Hot. Like I was going to melt. A few minutes before? Channel scrolled back. Here. She pointed to another string of numbers and Darius stared. This happened twice, but the first time there wasn't any migration, so it couldn't have been the catalyst. The heat got intense whenever I approached the red light. 
Same for me, Zane corroborated. What was the light? Channel dug deeper. I don't know. Bryn told us it was a way to escape. That's where he wanted us to go. Channel stared at my avatar. Say that again? It happened when I got close to the portal that Bryn was trying to push me toward. The place he told us we had to go to make the pain stop. Channel's form stood very still. He's been testing variables, Darius repeated, pushing his linked patients physically and mentally in different ways. Channel inhaled sharply. It was painful, so he searched for ways to force them forward. What are you talking about? Zane asked. I could tell they had landed on something important, but for the life of me, I couldn't follow. I think Bryn was looking for this. Channel scrolled down to the code we found earlier. What if he wasn't working toward any of the other goals we assumed? What if he was trying to find a way to make people jump? To get the formula for this kind of separation? The breath whooshed out of me as her words sank in. He'd been using us, testing our minds. But if we could jump like this, we could exist, outside of our body. I remembered how I'd stared at myself, collapsed in the dirt. If he'd figured out a way to do this, wouldn't he have stopped his experiments? That meant he never got there. Now he was gone, which meant we were the only ones. The numbers in front of us suddenly scrambled and blurred. What the? Channel swiped and refreshed the code to stop the glitching. It snapped back into focus. I've never seen it do that before. I doubt this place has seen much use in the past little while, Darius suggested. True. Channel's hand sat frozen in midair. They don't have this information, right? I asked, still stuck on what Channel had just revealed. I saw you fry that console we were linked to. I didn't see any external connections, and I downloaded this information before destroying the hard drive, Channel assured me. I think, at least for now... We're the only ones who have access to this code. Darius frowned. We have to take this to Kenna. If this is what they've been trying to accomplish all along, then a lot of our assumptions have been wrong. And Cerebralink, the reasoning and whole story behind it, has been a lie. Chapter 45 I had a lot to think about on our way back to the community center. What had just happened? In less than an hour, my entire world had been turned upside down. I wondered if that was how Channel felt when she was ripped from this place and forced to live in ours, forced to see the world completely differently and yet missing the simplicity of the way you viewed it before. Those few seconds in the unreal world were enough to make me feel conflicted about everything I'd ever been taught. I understood the dangers of making everything too perfect, of getting used to a beauty standard that didn't exist in real life. Our brains were changeable, and they were going to adjust based on the input we gave them. But at the same time, the unreal world was beautiful. I understood why people would want to live the real world behind. If the coalition was trying to find a way for reals to be in control of our own participation, excitement rose within me. Would it have to be a bad thing? We walked through the doors near the auditorium and found the foyer still empty. Not surprising. We hadn't been that long, and I'd seen the agenda for tonight. This meeting was going to go long. We resumed our seats on the floor, leaned against the wall, and waited. Unfamiliar faces came out of the auditorium doors first. We didn't dare go in without seeing Kenna, in case Drya was still there remotely. Channel's knee bounced impatiently. Eventually, Alec and my parents exited and I jumped up, running over to them. Channel and the others followed. How did it go? I asked. But before they could answer, Kenna stormed out into the hall. That doesn't look good, Darius muttered. Sloane pursed her lips. They shortened the time limit to six months, Alec muttered. What? Channel gaped at him. It was going to be a stretch to make this happen in nine months, but six? Do they know that will be virtually impossible? Kenna nodded, pacing next to us. We're going to have to make it possible. That's not a thing, 
We can't just speed up the coding process. You know what's at stake here. She hissed, and Channel snapped her mouth closed. She waited for Tree, then motioned for us to follow her down the hall toward her office. I wanted to tell Alec and my parents all about my experiences, to change the subject and lighten the mood, but then realized they may not be as excited about it as I was, especially after what they witnessed in the auditorium. I didn't know where they stood on this technology, and something told me this wasn't the moment to find out. Kenna took us into her office and closed the door. Straya and the two other council members that attended were livid over Bryn's death. Apparently, it's caused quite a number of complications for them. I wanted to laugh. Of course, that was their concern. They didn't care that he was dead, just that his passing created problems for them. A perfect representation of what I'd come to know community leadership to be. What kind of complications? Darius asked. Kenna threw out a hand. Control of assets? There are a lot of people who think they have a legitimate right to partial ownership of what he left behind. Like the entire technological world? Channel asked sarcastically. Kenna nodded. So that's why our timeline has been shortened. They don't know how that's going to end up. They blame us for the issues in the first place, and they aren't willing to risk more loss of resources. But we'll be providing them with resources, Darius argued. Isn't that the goal with the carbon reuptake? Kenna sighed. They don't see that as a sure thing. Sloane's brow furrowed. But if they do, eventually when it's actually happening, would they reconsider? Kenna shrugged. It didn't sound like it to us. Dad put a hand on Mom's shoulder. Then we'll just have to build things faster, I suggested. Which means we'll need more help. Can you teach me? To code? Kenna asked in surprise, and I nodded. Channel turned. Mila, that would be... I'll work hard. I cut her off. I want to be a part of this, to make beautiful things like I saw back there. Channel pursed her lips and looked nervously at Alec. It's only a brand new language. How hard could that be? I joked, then noticed my family all staring at me. Since when do you know anything about what the unreal world looks like? Alec asked. Channel's expression suddenly made sense. Was what we'd done earlier allowed? Was Darius, or worse, Channel, going to get in trouble? I took them to the grid, while you were in your meeting, Channel admitted. We checked out a few pairs of smart contact lenses. Kenna's eyes widened. They worked? Channel nodded excitedly. We took a look at what I found on the console at P7, after giving them a glimpse of P3 augmentation. And? Kenna leaned forward over her desk. I think they were impressed. I mean, how could you not be? The picture quality is... I meant about what you found on the console. Kenna cut in, unamused. Darius cleared his throat. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. The smile faded from Channel's face. It was program synthesis. Mila created a source code for a program that doesn't exist. Or didn't. It takes a segment of code and transforms it so it's transferable. In this case, the code was her. Her consciousness. Kenna's eyes narrowed. That's not possible. That would be too much information. Too complicated to transmit. It was condensed. I don't know how to describe it. She didn't write it. She just did it. Being inside Cerebral Inc. and connected to a console allowed for a record of her digital actions. It's all there. While the instructions and variables are complex, I think we can reproduce it. What are you saying? Kenna asked. Channel drew a breath and exhaled. I'm saying that I think with the information we have, we could write a program to pull a mind from a body. Chapter 46 From that moment forward, our discussions in P3 changed. Should this technology exist? What were the ramifications? Did Bryn know this was possible before he died? Had he been seeking it out altruistically? That question was a no-brainer. Absolutely not. Sloan made some good points about it being useful for people with permanent bodily injury, 
but we all knew she was only thinking of Sean. But mostly, our time for ruminating about the ethics of tech was used up by the amount of work on our plates. We had six months to build a new world, which meant we barely had a moment to eat and sleep. The benefit was that none of the reels had a second to complain about their new situation. We were all too needed and too overwhelmed with our tasks to think twice about it. Each of us was thrown into responsibilities and tasks we knew nothing about. We learned as quickly as possible, making plenty of mistakes along the way. And the unreals in P3 were surprisingly patient, even the ones who we knew wished their lives could go back to normal. They helped us fall into roles with sanitation, food preparation, edge maintenance, community relations. We did all of it, side by side. Before we even blinked, a month had gone by. The Vivientes completed their carbon reuptake system days before we hit that mark, and the rewards were already palpable. The council gave us the green light on processing the waste we'd collected over the past few weeks, heating compost piles and using equipment to rotate them in the ground. But my favorite benefit? Kenna, my parents, and Darius organized the installation of lights in each of our houses. Channel and I had been living together the past few weeks, but before we had light, we barely spoke. By the time we got home, it was dark, and our hand lights didn't exactly facilitate easy conversation. Now, we easily dropped into a new routine of talking to each other for at least a few minutes while we had a snack before bed, which was my second favorite part about having more energy production. More energy meant more food. I'd gotten used to going to bed a little hungry, and it felt absolutely luxurious to have an extra portion, albeit a small one. I'd barely walked in the door and sat down in the living room when Channel came in behind me. As usual, she was bleary-eyed and exhausted. Without even taking off her mask, she walked in and collapsed onto the chair next to me. A good day? I asked, about to rub my eyes before I caught myself. I loved using the smart lenses. They were infinitely more convenient, especially when completing my lessons. But my eyes felt dry by the time evening rolled around. I pulled out my case and removed them, allowing my eyes to breathe. Channel pulled the mask from her nose and mouth, letting it hang around her neck, and nodded. I think we've got about 3% of the algorithms inside the old paradise system built and recategorized. I know that sounds like a pathetic number, but it's actually pretty impressive. I'll take your word for it. I smiled. I learned how to build a binary search tree today, so same. Channel laughed. We got our eighth port up and running today. There are eight people doing the work? I asked. Exactly. Two more world builders passed the test. They're trained and qualified to mine code and rewrite it. But they don't create it separately, right? I tried to wrap my head around what this new system would look like. Channel took a deep breath and yawned. Everything they build is simultaneously recorded and logged permanently. When we have enough, it's sealed into a block which then becomes a part of the chain. So anything they build is added for everyone? Channel nodded. It's looking really good. And in a week or two, we should have our first prototype of the new wristbands. I suggested you as someone who could be the first to try it out. She smiled at me and waggled an eyebrow. I grinned, and my heart leapt with excitement. Much to my parents' relief, my experiences with the unreal world hadn't led to a full-on obsession, but I really liked taking glimpses. Hopefully, if a few of you can try it out and convince people of its safety, we'll have a little more success persuading the other reels to jump in. I put up a hand. Don't expect me to do any persuading. I think everyone has to make this decision themselves. Channel sighed dramatically, then leaned back and stretched out her arms and legs until her body dripped over the side of the couch. I know. I'm not asking you to say anything you don't believe. But if we don't get more people on board, none of this is going to be very convincing to the council. The whole point is to create something that the reals are comfortable joining. If we can't do that, it doesn't matter if our system is efficient. I nodded. I'll do my best. Channel closed her eyes, and for a second, I thought she was going to fall asleep right there next to me. I quietly stood up to go get my snack solo, and she blinked. Do you think you could at least talk to Alec? Channel, I know. She sat up. But I still can't get the reels to try anything besides those lenses. 
and only for messaging, really. Nothing I say will convince them that this new program is inherently safe. Maybe he's just waiting until it gets bigger. More tried and true? Channel shrugged. I don't know. I want him to trust me. He does. I opened the cupboard and pulled out a small bar. But Alec trusts himself more than anyone else. It's not personal. Channel stood and trudged over. I tossed her a bar. You might just have to give him some time. Isn't a month enough time? I laughed out loud. He and the other reels are going to need more than that to rewrite the story they've told themselves about the unreal community their entire lives. She planted her hands on the counter. I know. I shouldn't complain. Everything is working exactly as we'd hoped. And the reels will get on board. Just give them time. Chapter 47 Another two months went by, and our hybrid community continued to grow and thrive, at least by measures of efficiency and resource production. We were nearly self-sufficient with our energy production, but Tree and the Vivientes weren't satisfied yet. They wanted to be producing and selling energy back to the communities by the end of month four. True to our agreement, they'd still been the only ones to touch or handle the energy system and any of its surrounding equipment and connections. Tree acted like it was her own progeny, smiling and talking proudly about the quirks and problems they encountered. She'd blab anyone's ear off about troubleshooting when she could find someone willing to listen. It was funny and endearing, and I volunteered to be that person more than once. I'd been looking forward to this particular night for weeks. Our team had realized after month number one that our breakneck pace was not going to be sustainable without some sort of respite. We knew we both didn't have time for a break and also desperately needed something to look forward to. Channel suggested we have a mini world build celebration and the idea immediately took hold. It wouldn't be nearly as grand as what they used to have in P3, but it sounded more over the top than any party I'd ever attended in my life. All of us, including mom and dad, had been working to put together something special for this event. Nothing huge, and nothing that would take away too dramatically from the work we each needed to be doing. Mom decided to teach basket weaving, and she'd been preparing strips of bark for weeks. Dad and a few of his friends were planning on a whittling station. Part of me wondered how many reels would actually be interested in learning those types of skills now that we didn't need them. But the unreals? Maybe they'd find it charming. We'd spent time with some of the Unreal families, and some of them were definitely more pleasant than others. I understood. I wouldn't have been too thrilled about Unreals moving into Southwest Territory, so I tried to give them the benefit of the doubt. The children were more open to our way of life than their parents. Using Kay as my example, I tried to always answer their questions and even join in their games. I played Target Match for the first time last week and failed abysmally. How did children so young have such impressive hand-eye coordination? Channel promised that she'd practice with me and Alex so we wouldn't be embarrassed the next time. Channel was working on something for the kickoff, but she wouldn't admit it. She'd been extra secretive in the evening at home, and any time I asked about it, she made up some mumbo-jumbo about world-building. I let her get away with it, but only because I didn't want to ruin the surprise. The rest of us offered to help in the food department, Ames gave us tasks, and we obediently put our heads down and worked. I wasn't sure how everything was going to come together, but I'd seen bits and pieces of her menu, and my mouth was already watering. Pash and Kenna were the only ones we hadn't been able to convince to join in the festivities. They insisted on continuing to work, but promised they'd at least attend dinner tonight. I'd believe that when I saw it. A knock sounded at the front door, and I gave myself a final once-over. Channel told me I needed to wear my contacts tonight, but when Darius asked if I wanted to complete edge access, I answered no. There was no way Zane and Alec would be opting into that. Zane's memories had come back slowly, but surely. He was a good sport about experimenting, but the unreal world still made him nervous. Tonight, I didn't want to be the odd man out. I hurried to the door and opened it, my breath catching as I saw Zane standing on the doorstep. He was all cleaned up. Instead of opting for his community-issued clothing, he was dressed in one of his old go-tos, a button-up shirt and pair of slacks, all crisp and freshly laundered. I had a hard time speaking. 
My heart was beating so fast. Ready? I squeaked out. Zane smirked. I am standing on your doorstep. Right. I smiled nervously. Let's do this. We walked toward the square. Tonight marked the beginning of a two-day rest. I couldn't tell what I was more excited for, the celebration tonight or the sleeping and lazing around I was about to do over the next 48 hours. What do you think Channel's planning for tonight? I asked, and Zane shrugged. Probably something weird. I laughed out loud. It's not weird just because you don't understand how to do it. Oh, here we go, he groaned. Now that you're all learning to code, you think you're so much more enlightened than the rest of us. I reached out and smacked his arm. You know I don't think that, but I do think it might be good for you all to learn a little bit about this stuff, if not just to better understand the unreals. I'm wearing these lenses. Isn't that enough? Zane asked. How much more do you want from me? He grinned and my heart flipped in my chest. How much more did I want? Everything. I wanted every part of him. After leaving Fowler's Bluff, I didn't think there was any way that I could love him more. But now that we'd settled into a more consistent routine, no more excitement or danger, all my feelings had settled deeper. They were calm and more consistent. That attraction and flutter in my stomach when he was around still existed, but it was different. Not better or worse, just new. You're zoning out again. Zane whispered, and I reached out to take his hand. I'd stopped apologizing for my daydreaming. He knew who I was, and I was pretty sure he mostly loved me for it. We approached the square, and though it wasn't nearly as exotic and colorful as in the Unreal world, it had been completely transformed. There were booths set up and someone had strung strips of fabric between tall poles, creating ribbons of color around the perimeter. Ames and Tree were setting up their food booth, and we headed their direction. Do you need any help? I asked as we approached. Ames shook her head. You've put in your work. Tonight you get to be kids. And enjoy. I raised an eyebrow. I heard that didn't go so well the last time Kenna suggested it. Ames chuckled. Well, good thing it's not Kenna suggesting it this time. I smiled, and she handed me a small cup with a spoon. My eyes lit up. This looks incredible. She motioned for me to hurry up and try some. I licked my lips and took a bite. My mouth exploded with flavor. Fruity, with warm spices and the perfect amount of crunch. Ames beamed at me. We're calling it Summer Love. If love had a flavor, this would be it. I reveled in the deliciousness. We have one other surprise for later, so make sure and come back. Ames grinned as Zane reached out and snagged a cup for himself. Feeling bold tonight, are we? I teased. She said it tasted like love. I needed to see if I agreed. Ames caught my eye and winked. By the time we made it to the next booth, the square was beginning to fill up. Reels and unreels came together, trying new things and briefly glimpsing into each other's lives. I'd never put much stock into celebrations before. Back home, it had seemed frivolous. But here, watching how people from polar opposite backgrounds could be brought together over something as simple as a few days off work, it made me wonder if the frivolities were what would ultimately save us. Both mom and dad's booths were so popular, I barely had the chance to wave before meeting up with Channel and Alec. Fun, isn't it? Channel's eyes lit up as she scanned the square. I think it's safe to say this is the best idea you've ever had. My heart soared. After the heaviness of the past half a year, we all needed to remember what it was we were fighting for. And this was it. Channel bounced on the balls of her feet. Are you guys ready to see what I made? My eyes lit up. I knew you were working on something. You're not as good of a liar as you think you are. Channel scoffed. Is it so bad that I wanted to surprise you? Alec shifted on his feet. How is this going to work? You've got your smart lenses on like I asked, right? Channel asked. We all nodded. Alec, slightly begrudgingly. All right, I'm going to send a message with a link. You're going to tap on it, and then the program will take care of the rest. 
Didn't you say that was one of the first rules of computer programming? Alec asked. Never click on a link. Channel laughed out loud. First of all, I didn't think you were listening when I said that. Second of all, you forgot the most important part. Never click on a link you don't trust. What if I don't trust this? I smiled at the two of them bantering back and forth. Alec was as stubborn as all get out, but Channel was too, which meant she didn't let him get away with it. Channel shrugged. All I'm saying is that you're going to massively miss out if you don't click it. Oh, and I'll be mad at you forever. Alec grunted. Ignoring him, Channel tapped the air in front of her, and before she'd even lowered her hands, a notification blinked into existence on the right side of my field of vision. I still didn't fully understand how it worked for me to tap it. Channel had explained the mechanism, how my motion was tracked by my wristband, but it still made no sense. Trusting the system, I reached up and tapped the space with the blinking light. Soft music began playing over a speaker, and I looked at Channel in shock. Had they figured out how to send sound through our wristbands too? It's through the speakers. I got them to approve it. We should have music the rest of the night if we want it, she said proudly. As the program loaded in my field of view, I scanned the square, noticing more and more people tapping the air in front of them. Did you send this to everyone? I asked. What? Channel grinned. You thought I made it just for you? I laughed, watching Alec and Zane stand uncomfortably as we waited. I did, though. Channel whispered, nudging Alec with her elbow. I made it just for you. Chapter 48 Words appeared in front of me inviting me to look up. I followed the instructions and gazed up into the hazy night sky. Suddenly, pricks of light appeared. Just a few at first, then more added to it, and eventually the entire sky was lit up with stars. Wow. I took it all in. A few of the stars began to glow brighter, and words appeared next to them. What's that? I asked softly. It's one of the constellations, Alec answered, and I watched with rapt attention as those stars faded and new ones began to gleam. Constellations? How long had it been since I'd heard that word before? Dad used to talk about them, told us that people used to navigate by them but I'd never seen them in my lifetime. I didn't think anyone had. How did you do this? Alec slipped an arm around Channel's waist. The constellations popped in and out of focus as they traveled across the night sky. I did some research. When did you have time? Alec's voice was low. Odd. He was touched, and all of his normal edge had been swept away by the twinkling lights. It helps that I've researched stuff like this for most of my life. It's a pretty quick process at this point. You studied the stars? Alec asked. I was beginning to feel like Zane and I were interrupting a private moment. No, I studied history. Programming, obviously. But I didn't start studying stars until after I met you. Zane must have been feeling the same thing that I was, because he reached for my hand and leaned close want to get out of here? His breath sent a shiver down my spine. I nodded, and as I looked down, the stars disappeared. Zane put an arm over my shoulders, and we strolled across the street heading away from the square. I hadn't walked over here often, but it was perfectly quiet, just far enough away from all the excitement that we had a little privacy. We walked for a few minutes until Zane spotted a bench and pulled me toward it. We sat, and tilted our heads upward and admired the stars. The program channel had coded started over, and it was possibly even more beautiful the second time through. We could still hear the music from the square, but just barely. I leaned my head on Zane's shoulder. This is incredible, isn't it? It is. Do you think we'll make the deadline? I really do. From everything channel said, we're right on schedule. They wish there were more coders, which is why I've been trying to learn. The faster we can get the information migrated over, the faster we can show the council some results. You think they'll accept it? The stars blinked in and out of focus. Why wouldn't they? We've successfully shown that reels and unreels can exist together. 
The system isn't perfect yet, but it's a start. They can't possibly expect us to have every bug worked out, especially after they've only given us six months. Zane breathed in deeply and his ribs expanded against my side. I've been wanting to talk to you. Zane's fingers fidgeted nervously around mine. About what? I shifted so I could see his face. The stars from Channel's program appeared in the sky behind his head and outlined his profile with glitter. We're in the middle of a world crisis. Probably not the best time to be making decisions. But the two of us have been in a crisis our whole lives. We're not going to be out of it anytime soon. I nodded, wondering where he was going with this. He paused and his brows pulled together. Do you still love me? I smiled broadly. That question was easy. You know I do. Even though I'm not into all of this unreal stuff, like you are? I laughed. You're not nearly as bad as Alec. Plus, I don't think I'm that into it. The corner of his mouth turned up. But yes, I realize you're very not into it, and I'm completely okay with that. It takes me a little longer. I can see how it's useful. I can see how it could do some good. Make things easier, in some ways. But it still makes me nervous. I understand. I don't know if you do. Zane smiled affectionately, then reached up and tapped the tip of my nose. You have a knack for trusting people. He wasn't wrong. I knew that personality trait would probably get me into trouble, someday. But so far, it had served me well. What exactly are you getting at? His heart sped up, pounding against mine. I had a long talk with your parents the other day. I frowned. By yourself? It happens more often than you think. We're living in the same house. I scoffed. You're not the most talkative person. Zane feigned offense. I'm talkative when I want to be. Exactly. He shook his head and sighed in defeat. I waited for him to explain, but he didn't. Okay, I'm curious. What did you talk about with my parents? Zane didn't speak for another long moment. My palms began to sweat. I wondered. His lip twitched, and he formed the words so slowly it was physically painful. I wondered if you might want to get married. My jaw dropped, and for the first time in a long time, my mind went completely blank. Nothing. Nada. He cleared his throat. To me. I wondered if you might want to... To get married, but specifically to me. He stammered. I sat straight up on the bench and gaped at him. I turn 19 in two weeks. He stumbled on. That's when my parents got married. I've been thinking a lot about what I want life to look like moving forward. His face flushed and he struggled to breathe. Any and every possibility includes you. I'm glad you think this whole thing is going to work out and I hope you're right. But even if it doesn't, my future still includes you. Real, unreal, easy, hard, it doesn't matter. I want to be together for the rest of our lives. I want to start a... I put a finger to his lips. I needed him to stop talking. He wanted to get married. A flurry of emotion flooded from my head to my toes. He'd been thinking about what he wanted life to look like. At some point through all of this, I had stopped thinking about my future. I wasn't convinced there was going to be any future. I'd been so focused on the next step, making it to the next day, the next week. I hadn't allowed myself to think about what I wanted or what my life would look like because I knew it would hurt too much to make plans and then be disappointed. Now Zane wanted a future with me? He thought we had a future to think about? I swallowed hard. Zane reached up and tucked a loose strand of hair back into my ponytail. If you don't want that, I... You talked to my parents about this? The question came out far more accusatory than I'd envisioned. Zane's cheeks flushed and he stiffened. I should have talked to you first, but I wanted to hear what they thought. I don't exactly have parents I can ask. No, I cut in. I'm not upset about it. I'm surprised. I'm surprised they didn't mention it to me. I asked them not to. 
I wanted to be the one to ask. My heart beat so fast I could barely think. We don't know what our future is going to look like. Zane nodded. Our parents didn't either. We don't have any way to throw some fancy party. I thought back to everything I'd ever heard about weddings. He nodded again. My parents didn't have a party. Neither did yours. My parents didn't even have someone to marry them. I remembered my parents retelling that story when we were kids. There used to be laws, my dad had said. You had to have someone who was licensed for marriage. They'd recite certain things and you'd sign papers that were registered with the government. Those gave you societal rights and benefits concerning each other's property and life decisions. Those papers connected you in the eyes of the state. But when they'd gotten married, there wasn't any state to register with. I remember Dad smiling at Mom each time he repeated his punchline, which meant there were only two sets of eyes that mattered. So, how would it work now, here in P3, I asked. Are you asking because you're curious? or because your answer is yes. Zane watched me nervously. I lifted my hands and put them around his neck, briefly considering teasing him a little longer. I couldn't do it. Of course my answer is yes, are you kidding? How do we do this thing? Zane's face broke into a massive smile and he laughed, holding a hand to his chest. You're serious? You'll marry me? Yes! I jumped onto his lap and ripped off both our masks, I leaned down and kissed him, pressing my body against his and running my hands through his hair. Zane and I? My head started to swim. Zane and I, together, just like mom and dad. I pulled back, breathless. Married people, they live together. So we'd do that. We'd move in together? Like, live in the same house? Zane laughed heartily and wrapped his arms around my waist like he never wanted to let go. Yeah, that's kind of the point. He reached up and traced my face, then guided it toward him and brushed his lips against mine. My body begged for more, but I pushed back. We'd be together all the time. We'd eat together, sleep together. My eyes widened as I processed what I'd just said. My cheeks flushed furiously and Zane raised an eyebrow. I'd thought about it. I'd wanted to. But talking about that new potential part of our relationship and fantasizing about it were two very different things. You don't think you'll get sick of me? The weight of this decision settled on my shoulders. But even as worry set in, another puzzle piece clicked into place inside of me. I won't get sick of you, he answered gently. I'm scared, too, Mila. All of this. He shook his head slowly. It's all new to me. I'm not sure if I can be good enough. We'll figure it out. I cut him off. Together. He nodded, then hugged me close. I breathed him in. So what do we do next? Whatever we want. His heart sped up. But, I was thinking, there's already a party happening tonight. My breath caught, and every nerve in my body buzzed. Are you serious? You want to get married tonight? Zane shrugged. We don't have to. I was just... That's perfect. I kissed his neck. I didn't want to wait another second to be linked to this man. We have a house if we want, Zane added. I sat up abruptly. A house? Since when? When I talked with your parents. They helped me set it up. A little presumptuous, don't you think? Zane smiled sheepishly. I wanted to think through everything, make sure I'd be able to take care of you, before I asked. My eyes grew misty. How long had he been working behind the scenes? All this time he'd been making plans and preparing on top of his regular duties. I was getting married to Zane. It changed everything and somehow didn't change anything at all. I knew absolutely nothing about how a melding of lives was supposed to happen, but I knew intimately what it was supposed to look like after it did. Zane and I already had that part down pat. Chapter 49 Two weeks after Zane and I made things official, I spent the day expanding one of the food production lines with Alec. We arrived home to the real section of P3 hot and sweaty, and I immediately trudged to the bathhouse. 
I could do this whenever I wanted, and it still hadn't gotten old. I walked in and dropped my clothes, no longer worrying about whether other women were present. The one person I used to be most nervous about seeing my body had already done so. Who cared about anyone else? Walking to my stall, I hit the sensor and allowed the warm water to wash away the stress of the day. After finishing off with a cleansing and moisturizing mist, I redressed and walked home. It still felt strange coming home to Zane waiting for me. Strange in a blissfully good way. Though I did miss my evening chats with Channel. Mom and Dad were having us all over for dinner tonight, and while a part of me wanted to collapse in bed and sleep, another part couldn't wait to catch up with everyone. We'd all been so busy. We hadn't been good about making time for each other, and this was our plan to remedy that. Hey, I called out as I dropped my mask on its hook. I wasn't sure if Zane had beaten me home. Sometimes his days went longer than mine, but I hoped. I walked into the kitchen and frowned when I found it empty. I checked my message center, and sure enough, there was a note waiting for me. Late. Meet you there? I grinned, turning and heading back to the door. No point staying here if I was going to be all alone. I didn't bother putting my mask back on since mom and dad were just up the street. On the way, I decided to stop and knock on my old door, see if Channel was ready to go. No answer. Seemed like everyone was working long nights these days. I finished my walk up the road and went inside, then jumped in with Alec to help mom and dad prepare things for dinner. We humored mom by setting the table even though it was completely unnecessary. Everything was prepackaged. Zane arrived and I walked down the hall to give him a hug and a kiss before he entered the kitchen. I knew it wasn't a big deal for everyone else to see us be affectionate, but these hello and goodbye moments were too good to have to share them with anyone. I wanted them all for myself. Zane scooped me up in his arms and I breathed him in. He hadn't made it to the bathhouse, but I didn't care. His skin smelled earthy and warm, and I loved the way the stubble on his chin rubbed my cheek. Good day? I asked. I don't know if I'd call it that, but it's better now. I brushed a kiss along his jaw as he set me back on the floor. What happened? We cleared out another section of the stacks. My heart dropped. That was all he had to say. Quinn, Channel's mom, had died at the beginning of month two. I stood next to her when they removed the body, held her as she'd cried. Because of that experience, I knew exactly what clearing the stacks entailed, and I was in no mood to hear details. I'm so sorry. He smoothed the hair from my forehead. At least by next week it will be completely dismantled. What are they going to do with that space? Zane shrugged. Lots of proposals, but most likely it's going to be saved for databanks. To support everything Kenna and Channel are creating with their world-building group. They've already used up that entire other building? Zane nodded. Almost. Storing information for an entire digital existence takes up space. Especially in order to keep everything at an operable temperature. I smiled. Look at you. Learning all about data storage and operable temperatures? He grinned and playfully nibbled the lobe of my ear. Is that Zane? Or Channel? Dad called from the kitchen. I sighed reluctantly. Zane planted one quick kiss on my lips and we walked in to meet them. It's Zane, I announced as we entered the room. It didn't escape my notice that Alec looked slightly disappointed. Have you heard anything from Channel? He asked. I shook my head and glanced up at the top corner of my visual console to make sure I hadn't missed any messages. Are you still wearing those things? Alec asked, and I blinked. What things? Your lenses. I thought you took them off when you got back from your assignments. Sometimes I do. My hackles rose. But sometimes I keep them in, for reasons exactly like this, so Channel can get in touch with me. Do you know where she was working today? What's with the 20 questions? I asked. You know as much as I do at this point. Alec's face drew into a frown. Mom shushed us. That's enough. I'm sure she has a good reason for not being here yet, but I think we better start. You'll all be less grumpy if we eat. We sat at the table, but Alec remained standing. I'll wait for her so she doesn't have to eat alone when she gets here. Mom sighed audibly. At least sit with us. 
Alec pulled out a chair and sat down without a word. I didn't like the look in his eyes. Something was definitely bothering him. And while I wanted to believe it was one of the usual reasons, something felt off. I'm sure she'll be here soon. Alec nodded. But Channel didn't come home that night. She didn't come home the next day either. Chapter 50 On day three, Alec and I both decided to go looking. She'd sent a message to Alec saying she had a lot on her plate and she was sorry she missed dinner. It just wasn't like her. And I didn't want Alec to have to do this alone. We went to Kenna's office first, but came up empty. Searching through the rest of the building, we eventually found Pash near the auditorium. Hey, do you know where we could find Kenna or Channel? Pash's face was tense and he shook his head. They'd most likely be with the world builders. There's an actual location for them? Alec asked. Pash nodded. What did you think? They worked here? Alec shrugged, more than a little embarrassed that he didn't know where his girlfriend spent her time during the day. I'll show you. Pash pulled up a projection on the desk. Right here. If you follow this road like you're going to the grid, then turn right and follow it for a minute or two. You'll see this building next to the other Cerebral Link holding area. I nodded. That's where Vera is. Sean, too. Channel and Sloan took me to see them the other day. Alec nodded grimly. Channel should be there. Pash shrugged. It's my best guess. She's been working nonstop. I'm pretty sure she thinks all of this is her fault. All of what? A pit opened up in my stomach. Pash frowned. You haven't heard? I shook my head. Channel hasn't been home in a few days. I haven't heard anything. He wiped a hand over his face. It hasn't been publicized widely, but someone hacked into the system. Alec stiffened. I thought that was impossible. It's not that it's impossible. It's just difficult to get in and actually make any changes. Any permanent changes. All of the information in the blocks can be compared against each other, so it's simple to tell if someone tried to alter any of the data. Alec nodded. It should be fixable, right? Pash shook his head grimly. Multiple ports have been attacked. Channel's been working around the clock to repair the damage. That's why I say she's probably with the world builders because every time we go into the system, something's been fixed. Ken has told her multiple times that this isn't her problem to solve, but she's not listening. Alec's shoulders stiffened. Sounds a lot like Channel. And someone else I know, I muttered. Alec shot me a glance. We have to find her, Alec. You know as well as I do that if she thinks this is her fault, she's not going to stop until it's resolved. Until we figure out where these attacks are coming from, nobody's going to be able to resolve it. Pash looked between us nervously. Kenna doesn't want to admit it, but this is serious. If we can't stop this person or group of people, we won't be able to make any headway. Any theories about who it is? I asked. Pash shrugged. That's all I know. Kenna's been tight-lipped about the whole thing, and as you know, Channel isn't around to comment. What about the other world builders? Alec asked. Not my assignment. Pash sighed wearily. I'm not trying to cause any more drama than necessary. I ran to keep up with Alec's long strides as we exited the building. Do you think she's there? With the world builders? Alec asked. I didn't even know there was a world building area, so I'm not the best one to ask. I jogged next to him and searched my memory for anything Channel might have said. Alec veered to the right and I followed. Where are you going? The only place I can think of. If she was that worked up, I don't think she would want to be around people. She'd want to be efficient. Have the flexibility to try things without Kenna looking over her shoulder. You think she went to the grid? That's a great idea. I know it's a great idea. I rolled my eyes. Leave it to Alec to be arrogant in the middle of a crisis. We didn't talk the rest of the way there. Alec, because he was too worried about Channel, me because I was too out of breath. We sped up the steps, swiped ourselves in, and searched the workstations until we finally spotted Channel sprawled on the ground next to one. Is she okay? I rushed behind Alec as he ran and knelt down beside her. He leaned down and checked her breath. I think she's sleeping. 
Channel startled awake, either because of our voices echoing off the walls or the fact that Alec hovered inches above her face. She stared at us a moment before realization hit. What are you doing here? She asked groggily. What are you doing here? Alec growled. You haven't been home in three days. You're my babysitter now? Channel pushed herself up off the floor. Alec's jaw clenched as he moved out of her way. I don't have time to come home right now. I have to keep working, Pash told us someone hacked into the blockchains. Alec stared at her intently. He also told us you seem to think it's your fault. Channel's face blanched. Not seem to think, she muttered. I know for a fact. How? Alec shoved his hands in his pockets. It's not like you built this entire thing on your own. There are plenty of other people who've... No, Alec. It's my fault because we can't figure out who's doing it. But Pash said that everyone's been working on it. Alec! Stop! You're not hearing me! Channel paced down the hall. We know where the attack is coming from. We just don't know how it's happening. Alec looked at her in confusion. He cleared his throat and took a deep breath. Where is it coming from? Channel swallowed hard. From right here. You think it's someone inside P3? I asked. Channel threw up her hands. No, it's coming from here. From someone who's working inside the grid. And there's exactly one person who uses these stations regularly. Part 8. Channel. August 26, 2161 through September 1st, 2161. Chapter 52. You think you're hacking the system? Mila asked. I laughed out loud. No, I don't think I'm hacking the system, but that's what I can't figure out. The attacks are coming from here, every one of them. She balled her hands into fists. Nobody else uses the grid besides me. Can you show us? Mila asked. The hacking attacks you're talking about. I glanced at Alec. Are you wearing your lenses? He nodded reluctantly. I was too tired to care that he was still fighting our technology. I motioned for him to follow me around the corner to a group workstation. I didn't know how showing them code that wouldn't make the least bit of sense to them was going to help, but nothing else had helped. At least I didn't have to stare at the same data again by myself. They stepped into their sensors and held onto the drivers. I didn't have to remind them how it worked. We pushed forward into the simulation, and as all three of us appeared on the ground, I nearly fell over. When did this happen? I gawked at Alec's form. When had he created a personal profile? How had he created a personal profile? I didn't think he knew how to access anything other than his messages inside his console. He hadn't done anything out of the ordinary, but his hair was a little wavier than it was in real life. Alec grunted, and I decided this was not the moment to tease him about it, especially since I'd missed dinner with his family the other night. I'm impressed. I turned and pulled up the new operating system. Opening the source code, I expanded the screen and plastered it on a wall in front of us. We're only at a fraction of the size we'll need to be eventually, but this is what we've got so far. Mila and Alec's eyes widened, taking in the massive amount of data. I stepped back and tried to see it all through their eyes. We were building something incredible, and sometimes it was easy to lose track of that when I only focused on the final result, especially when I felt like the goal we were shooting for was in jeopardy. Here. I pointed to a section of code after I'd given them a moment to take it all in. This is brand new from yesterday. I pulled up records from three of our ports. Do you see how this branch doesn't line up with all the others? Mila nodded. It's such a small change. A small change that negates half of what's written here, I explained. It's also replicating itself, which means it's going to take hours to get it under control. Not good. Alec quipped. No. Not good. He sniffed. So how do you know the attacks are coming from here? I swiped and opened an entirely new screen. I've been able to isolate the signature of whatever this is. Initially, we thought it was a virus, something that possibly the communities wrote to piggyback on our software and make it difficult for us to succeed. 
That makes perfect sense to me, Alec commented. The motivations, not the logistics. I know. I smiled at his self-deprecating joke. His wavy hair looked good. If only it were that simple. I highlighted a large chunk of data and pulled it to the forefront. This is what's causing our issues. It shows up in every circumstance, and I traced it back to the source. It exists here, at this connection point. But the problem is, we can't figure out who wrote it or how they got it here. Do you think it could have been someone from P3? A community leader or world builder who doesn't like what we're doing here? Alec asked. It was a good idea, which was why I'd considered it days ago. That was one of my first thoughts, but I couldn't find any link to this virus. It's like it spontaneously erupted out of nowhere. Mila's form froze. When she spoke, her voice was a whisper. How long has it been since you looked at that information on the drive? The one you took from P7? A long time, I think. I downloaded the sections of code I was interested in studying, but I haven't looked back at it for at least a couple of months. You still have access to it here? She asked. I was already way ahead of her. As soon as she'd asked about it, I searched and pulled up that old file. Here. I scrolled until I found the section where Mila had jumped. This time, she knew enough to understand at least parts of it. She reached out and scrolled a little ways. Huh. What are you looking for? I asked. I don't know, exactly. It was just something you said. Spontaneously erupted? It sounded like how you described this. When my consciousness moved. I looked back at the viral code I'd pulled up earlier. There were similarities, but I didn't see how it could have been the same thing. Code can't write itself. It had to be coming from somewhere. I sighed. So now you know what I've been doing all day every day. Running debuggers, which haven't been helpful in the least. Attempting to find a link to, well, anything, really. And last night, I gave up. Don't you think it might be good to take a break? Alec asked softly. We just had a break. Our world build celebration. That was two weeks ago. I blinked. Had it only been two weeks? We could do something together, Alex suggested. I told Darius I needed to take some time off today. There was vulnerability in his tone. He'd asked me to take off time before, but now he was asking. I wanted so badly to say yes, to drop everything and go do whatever, anything with just him and me. But I also knew what it meant for all of us if we didn't solve this. The only way we were going to solve it was if I kept hammering away. I'd love to, I answered. Could we meet up this afternoon? Sure. What time? I knew he'd hoped I would leave with him now, but I couldn't go without least setting some of this data right. 1400. I can meet you at your place. I've got to head back, Mila sighed. I wish I could see more of you too, Channel, but Ames isn't nearly as forgiving as Darius. Not true, Alex scoffed. I pulled back so I could say goodbye in the real world. I stepped away from the sensor and Mila gave me a quick hug before she waved and jogged toward the exit. I laughed. She wasn't kidding. She doesn't want to be here for any awkward moments, Alec muttered. My eyes narrowed. What awkward moments? He shrugged and a slight flush crept onto his cheeks. I'm sorry I missed dinner. I really am. I know you think it didn't mean anything to me, but it did. I've been so worried. We can help with that, you know? Alec cut in. I've been trying for so long to help you see that we're in this together. It doesn't have to be only you. Don't you think I know that? I frowned. Why do you think I went back for Mila and Zane? Or why I'm working tirelessly to make this thing work? Because I want all of us to be safe. Alec shook his head. No. You want to be the one to make us safe. You want to be the one who has all the answers. Oh, that's rich, coming from you. I ran my hands through my hair in frustration. This isn't about me, Alec. You've always had the answers, and now we're in a place where you don't. I don't want this. But it just so happens that this is exactly my skill set, and we don't exactly have a plethora of other coders here who can do what I do. He clenched his jaw. 
Good to know that's how you feel. He nodded and brushed past me and headed to the doors. Alec, I called out, but he didn't turn around. Before he swiped out, he paused, and I waited, hoping I could say something that would make what I'd just spouted out sound better, less hurtful. I think I'm going to work the rest of the day, after all. He walked outside and pulled up his mask. Chapter 52 I dropped to my knees and let out a scream of frustration as soon as I was sure he was out of earshot. Alec was so... He said he wanted me to be around, wanted me to let other people take on some of the load, but that was easier said than done. Even when we were together, he never wanted to hear about the work I was doing. I understood that. It wasn't like he got a lot of what I was doing here anyway. But it left me lonely. A lot of the time. At least I could talk with Mila, but now that she and Zane were living together, I hardly ever saw her. I needed someone to listen. To get me. I wanted so badly for that to be Alec. We understood each other in so many ways, but right now... Coding was my life again. And it just so happened that was the one topic he avoided at all costs. Which meant, despite the lip service he was paying to spending time together, he was avoiding me too. I stood up and drew a deep breath, then exhaled slowly. I hated this. I wanted to make it all go away and go back to who we were when we were with the Coalition in the real world. It was so much easier then. That thought made me laugh out loud. How bad was it when I was pining for the days when we were being actively hunted? I forced myself back into my workstation, not bothering to go back to the single one around the corner and opened up the files I'd been staring at for days. Where to start? You've been busy, I muttered as I pulled out a section of degraded code. Within a few minutes, I was back into a flow. Run debugger, find, quarantine, delete, repeat. It was relentless. I found no joy in the process because I knew I'd have to wake up and do the same thing the next day. It was maddening. As I was cutting and pasting, my mind replayed what Mila had said earlier. It was just something you said, spontaneously erupted. I mulled this over, curious about what that could mean. Was it possible that someone had introduced a program that could write its own code? Could they have introduced it somewhere else and then somehow lodged a virus here without someone's help? It seemed unlikely, but I couldn't get the thought out of my head. I pulled up the file from P7 and scrolled back to the point of interest. It did look similar. I scrolled down like Mila had, realizing the data continued for pages, but we'd stopped the stream when we'd disconnected everyone. Why would there still... My breath caught. There was still data because even after we'd pulled everyone out... We hadn't pulled everyone out. There was still one person linked. Bryn. I scrolled faster and scanned the screen. I didn't know exactly what I was searching for, but this was a record of his mind, an accounting of everything he'd been doing and thinking inside Cerebralink after Mila, Zane, and Sloane were gone. There had to be something. An aberration blipped across the screen and I froze, then quickly moved back to find what I'd passed. I stared at the screen in front of me. It was another event, just like Mila's. What was this? How could there have been another event? Bryn was the only person connected, which meant he had nowhere to go. Nobody was torturing him or forcing him to move toward the light. I copied the code and transferred it over to my other window, then ran an analysis. As the code fragmented, I gasped. It couldn't be. I stared as the lines began to blur. This piece? matched the viral signature exactly. Which meant, I scrolled further, there was no return. If Bryn had jumped just like Mila had, he didn't come back. But how? He had nowhere to go and there hadn't been a catalyzing event. How was it possible that this impossible thing had happened twice under two totally different sets of circumstances? I stared at the number so hard my head started to throb. And then it hit me. The blood drained from my face and I dropped the drivers, yanking myself away from the sensors and gasping for breath. I fumbled in my pocket and reached for the empty drive I still carried there. There had been a catalyst. I had been the catalyst. 
The moment I'd plunged those scissors into Bryn's heart, I'd forced his jump. Then he'd gone the only place he could. Chapter 53 I ran down the road from the grid, my legs pumping faster and faster. I couldn't outrun what I'd just discovered, but I had to try. I hadn't meant to cause any of this. Everything I'd done was because I wanted to help. I wanted to make things better. Bryn had hurt so many people, and he wasn't going to stop. We were all just data points to him. He'd shown us that time and time again. I'd been living with the guilt of what I'd done. I'd relived it a thousand times, hashed it out, and searched deep within myself to figure out whether it was justified. Now, it turned out, I hadn't even completed the task. Bryn was alive. And because of my hubris and this stupid thumb drive, he had full access to everything we'd built. When spots appeared in my vision, I finally slowed. I panted and tried to catch my breath as the moisture from my mask collected on my skin. When my eyes focused, I saw our bench ahead of me. Mine and Aves. I slumped onto the seat. I couldn't do this. I couldn't go to Kenna and tell her that not only had I been the reason our timeline was shortened, that same rash decision had destroyed our chances of making this whole thing work. It was too much. Just like Bryn wasn't going to stop in the real world, he wasn't going to stop in the unreal world either. I leaned over and rested my arms on my knees. Maybe I didn't have to say anything. Not yet. Now that I knew what was going on, maybe I could delete him from the system before anyone had to know. I could work nights, build a better debugger, sandbox him. I could do this. Whatever I had to do to keep him out. Is anyone sitting there? I looked over and did a double take when I saw Darius. Before I knew what I was doing, I shook my head. Busy morning. What are you doing here? I asked. Alec told me he was on his way to work. It was only 10 in the morning and Darius was not one to slack on the job. I needed some fresh air. I pointed at my mask and raised an eyebrow. Hilarious. Did Alec say something to you? Darius leaned back and folded his arms over his chest. I'm glad he did. I hadn't realized you were spending so much time at the grid. I turned away from him so he couldn't see the angry tears collecting in my eyes. How dare Alec go and tattle on me to Darius? So, you're here to tell me it's not my fault and I should just let this whole thing burn to the ground like everyone else? He chuckled. No, definitely not. I kept my mouth shut not trusting myself to speak. Do you remember when you and Ave used to come here? Almost every day I'd find you two here on this bench at some point. That comment did me in, and a sob escaped my lips. Darius must have seen my shoulders shaking, but he didn't reach out or try to comfort me. He merely sat next to me while I cried, and allowed me to pretend I was keeping it a secret. When the worst of it had passed, I wiped my cheeks and sniffed as quietly as possible, collecting myself. I need to get back to the grid. I stood up. He stood next to me. You can carry this on your own if you want to. I paused with my back still turned to him. I can see how strong you are, and I know you can do it. But you have to know the cost. What cost? I hated that I'd let him draw me into another conversation when I needed to be finding a way to fix everything I'd messed up. I think you know the answer to that. I did, back when I made the same choice. He paused again, and I waited for him to continue. It was so easy to convince myself that your mom was the problem, that she didn't understand the pressure I was under, how I couldn't just sit by and let our community indoctrinate people and use them to force integration. How could she be okay with that? I turned back and sat on the edge of the bench. My legs still trembled from my impromptu run. He smiled to himself. I asked myself that so many times, but it wasn't the right question to ask. How so? Because it didn't matter. It did, but it didn't. The fact was, she felt differently than I did. I knew she was a kind, thoughtful, amazing woman, but because she didn't agree with me, I started treating her like the enemy. He exhaled. She wasn't the enemy, Channel. This sentence hung in the air. I thought about everyone I'd been fighting. 
Alec, Mila, Kenna, and especially Darius. Had I made them my enemies? No, that was ridiculous. They were fighting me. They were trying to force me to do things in a way they felt comfortable with. And all I wanted was for them to set me free. Because I knew I could do it this way. I had proven it time and time again. It was the only process I had a history with, and I knew if I could throw myself into this project, breathe it, live it full time, I'd be able to figure this out. I'd be able to find a way to delete Bryn once and for all. I'd be able to make our programming more efficient so we could make better use of our coding hours. I could do this. I just needed everyone to wait, to watch, to stop trying to be a part of it. I collapsed against the bench. What if the enemy is me? A slow smile spread across Darius's face. Now that's the right question. He turned and strode back toward the real section of town. Dad, I called out, and he stopped. When he turned back, his face was unreadable. I think I did something. Made a mistake. Kind of a big one. He nodded, considering this. When he finally spoke, he took his time. Mistakes can be our biggest opportunities, if we let them. Our biggest opportunity for what? For fighting our enemies. Chapter 54 Darius walked down the hill. I'd been fighting so long, but I didn't know if I had the strength to take on this battle. To admit that I'd ruined everything. After I'd acted so high and mighty. I groaned and dropped my head into my hands. This was going to be so painful. I didn't even know what it would feel like to stop trying to force everything to happen. To let go. To ask for help. It had been easy to do that in the real world, but here? Mistakes can be our biggest opportunities. I sat up and drew in a deep breath. I made a mistake. I spoke the words out loud. I made a mistake, but I wasn't going to allow that to lead me into making another one. I tapped my console and quickly dictated a message to Alec, Mila, and Zane. They were working, but I figured they could possibly sneak away for their lunch break. My eyes were puffy and I was still sticky with sweat, but it didn't matter. I was going to meet with my friends. I was going to tell them the whole story. And then... I was going to let them help. Zane let out a low whistle after I finished my explanation. The four of us sat in the grid, but we only had a few more minutes before all of us needed to get back to work. I know, I groaned. It's bad. All I heard was that something I said helped you figure it out, Mila grinned. Alec watched me and I couldn't tell what he was thinking. I swallowed hard. I know I've been a little over the top with all this. But I want you to know you're my priority. I just don't know how to do both. What do you mean? Mila asked. I looked down at my feet. I don't know how to not be fully consumed by a project. It's the only way I've ever been successful. My only friends were usually consumed by our project just like I was. I don't know how to give something my all and still have something left over for the people I care about. Mila nodded. Alec still watched, but his face gave nothing away. There has to be a fix for this, Mila mused. A way to pull him out. And that's what I'd normally do with a virus, but it hasn't been working. Now it makes so much more sense. Because he's not a virus, Alec stated. I nodded. Right. He acts like one, but he's not confined by the same variables. He isn't a program that somebody wrote. He exists. He's alive, which means he's writing himself. He's had months of access to everything we've been working on, every single project, every bit of code. He's seen it. Who knows what he's been doing with that information? He could have whole secret files that we don't even know about. But don't you think there's something to be said about the fact that he's only employing these tactics now? Mila asked. Maybe he doesn't really know what he's doing either. I highly doubt he understood what was happening when it happened. She looked down at her hands, and I put an arm on her shoulder. I would love to believe that's true. But Bryn has a lot more experience with the unreal world than you did. 
Is he a coder? Alec asked. I nodded. He used to be a world builder. With those words, they finally started to get it. Alec tapped his fingers against the wall. I don't know the first thing about coding or digital viruses, but I do know a thing or two about infection. What do you mean? I asked. A few years ago, we had an infection break out in the chicken house. Mila nodded. I remember that. Me too, Zane added. Dad and I noticed the sickness early on, and we were able to quarantine the chickens showing symptoms. I nodded. I see where you're going with this, and quarantining... Sandboxing is a thing, but not when they're able to reinvent themselves like this. I know, Alec continued. I mean, I don't know, but I believe you that this is an extreme circumstance. Hear me out. I nodded. It turned out we had an extreme circumstance on our hands as well. Quarantining didn't work, and more and more chickens were getting sick. Dad started to get worried that whatever they had could transfer. To you? I asked. Alec nodded. Or other chickens in the area. The longer viruses exist, the more opportunity they have to learn and evolve. Kind of like what you were talking about with Bryn. I nodded. My interest peaked. What did you do? Killed them. My face blanched. All of them? All of them. Then burned their bodies. I shivered, imagining what that would have meant for their family. For the entire town. How did you survive? Mila shrugged. We were hungry. But we were safe. Alec finished. We were able to start a new flock with healthy chickens from another person in town. So, you're suggesting... I started, then realized I wasn't exactly sure I'd made the connection. If we could kill Bryn and burn the body, I'd have jumped to that first thing. Mila pursed her lips. Shut it down. What? I asked. Shut it all down, she repeated. Kill the hosts. If the edge doesn't exist, he won't be able to exist either. But my mind was reeling. Shut it all down? Was that even possible? What would that mean to shut down our entire system? No food production, no energy production, no ability to mine data or work on our software. We can't. I shook my head. We'd all die, and our project would fail. Alec swallowed hard. You said it yourself. It's already doomed because he exists. Mila nodded. Nothing to lose. It would only be until you figure out what to do next. We wouldn't all die, Zane added. We've survived our entire lives without edge access. We can figure out how to do it again. But you don't have any of your grow houses or systems... You're underestimating us. Alec raised an eyebrow, and I crossed my arms over my chest. Let's talk more tonight. Mila looked almost excited about a meeting where the topic of discussion was the ultimate demise of all our realities. I've got to get back. She reached out and grabbed Zane's hand, pulling him with her. Let me guess. I sighed as they disappeared through the doors. Avoiding more awkward conversations? Alec looked up at his timestamp. No. I think this one was legitimate. I grinned. Alec, I'm so sorry. Before I could finish my sentence, he was there, pulling me into his arms. I'm sorry. You can't be sorry because I was sorry first. I breathed the words into his neck. It felt so good to be held by him. I almost couldn't force myself to let go when he began to pull back. I'm going to try to let you in. But it's hard for me to talk about this because I know how much you hate it. I don't hate it. He cut me off. You kind of hate it. I don't. He started, but then shook his head. What? I scrutinized his expression. He looped his arms around my waist. When I left earlier. You were mad. He nodded. I was mad. But as I walked back to our site, I started thinking. About what? Alec chuckled. Can you stop interrupting me and let me get this out? I lifted a hand in mime, zipping my mouth shut. I was thinking about how you listened. What do you mean? I asked. Then realized I'd just interrupted again. Alec shook his head as I smiled apologetically. 
when we first met. When you knew nothing about the real world, you listened to me. Even when you thought you already knew, when you had your mind made up. I nodded. You were very persuasive. Alec leaned down and brushed his nose against mine. I still am. I grinned and my skin prickled as his hair fell across my cheek. But I think it's time for me to start listening to you. Haven't you already? He exhaled and traced his hands up the backs of my arms. On the outside, yes, but not here. He placed my hand on his chest. I kept saying I was okay with all this because I wanted to be. Then when we got here, it felt, I don't know, like I was losing control. I know that feeling well. Alec nodded. But I do trust you, Channel. I sometimes question if I'm what you need here. I don't have much to offer in your world. I think that's the point. I don't have much to offer in yours either. I think you're exactly what I need. Even though I'm stubborn? I do kind of hate that. Alec laughed out loud and my heart leapt. He leaned close and pressed his lips to mine. I sighed and folded into him, wondering how I'd ever convinced myself that any project was worth giving this up. Don't you have to go back to work? I asked when I came up for air. I told Darius you sent a message. He kissed me again, and my whole body seemed to light on fire. He told me not to come back. I grinned, giving in to the moment and allowing Alec's touch to heal me. As his fingers brushed my skin and his heart beat against mine, all the worry from the last few hours seeped out of me. Alec knew who I was. He'd seen the good and he'd certainly seen the ugly. He knew what I'd done, and he now knew the intricate details of how I'd royally screwed up. He was still here. That's all I needed. Just one person to see me and still be here. Our lips slowed, and though I wanted to escape into this reality, I stepped back into the mess I'd made. I laid my head against Alec's chest and listened. Kenna will never go for this, shutting everything down. Alec smoothed my hair and let his hand rest gently behind my ear. You might be right, but we could give her the chance. Chapter 55 Kenna stood in her office when we arrived at the community center. She motioned for us to enter. How was I supposed to start this conversation? Hey, Kenna, you know how we've been dealing with this virus? Yeah, it's actually a human being that I downloaded and released inside our system. I'd been living with the guilt of physically attacking another person for months. Now, to know that not only did I do something violent and rash, regardless of whether it was justifiable or not, I'd also kicked off a spiral of events that would destroy our goal. I thought I'd been doing the opposite. I thought I'd been clearing the path so Bryn couldn't mess this up. It's good to finally see you out in the daylight. Kenna moved from her console. I steeled myself. Kenna, there's something I need to tell you. She looked around at the four of us, concern growing on her face. I found it. The virus? Well, actually, Mila had the idea. She clued me in on where to look. Kenna's eyes lit up. That's incredible news. Why does everyone look like someone died? I flinched. Funny you should say that. I launched into an explanation of what we found and shared the screen with her in real time to make sense of it. Kenna tensed as I talked, her face pulling into a frown. So you're telling me that Bryn, his mind, his consciousness, is roaming free in our system right now? All of us nodded in unison. I could almost see her mind flipping through the horrifying possibilities I'd cycled through moments earlier. I think our only choice is to shut it down, I finished, and Alec nodded. Shut what down? Kenna asked. The edge. Everything. If he's allowed to continue messing with our programming, we'll have nothing left. Kenna stiffened. If we have to shut everything down, we're not going to be able to meet our deadlines. We're barely making enough headway with the number of coders we have right now anyway. What does it matter? What does it matter if we make our deadline but the system is compromised? 
with me having to run damage control every single day, we're losing hours and hours of production time. We don't have enough access points yet to keep everything safe. He could easily get in there and change something without us noticing. Or worse, find a way to take everything public. Why would that be worse? Mila asked. Because it's not functioning yet. If the council sees this the way it is now, especially with the mess he's already made, they could decide to shut us down early. You think they would do that? Zane asked. He may have already sent information, Kenna muttered. My brow furrowed. How? P3 is a closed system. We're not projecting our network anywhere beyond the boundaries. Kenna's eyes darted between us. And that's not exactly true. My heart started to race. What do you mean it's not exactly true? Kenna dropped her hands to her side. How do you think we've been communicating with the Council? I froze. Right. Communications. From the first day we were here, I'd known Straya was joining in on meetings. That would have to go through satellites, which meant Bryn had an option for reaching outside P3. Kenna ran a hand through her hair and sat back down at her desk. We have to shut everything down, I repeated. It's even more imperative given that tidbit of information. What about our production? The cerebral ink patients? My mouth opened and closed. I hadn't even thought about them. We could close their system, I suggested. Make it so there's no communication in or out of that building. It's not like we're doing anything with their data right now anyway, so it shouldn't affect anything, including them. Kenna bit the inside of her cheek. Then what? I don't know. We get everybody together. Brainstorm. Kenna nodded slowly. I think we have some energy reserves. I'm not totally positive I'd have to ask Tree. We can charge up the masks. Make sure we have enough water filtration. Get the solar panels out. Alec was already forming a plan of action. We survived like this for a long time. And we can help you do it too. He's not going to go away, right? Mila asked. Shutting things down won't delete him. No, I sighed. He'll still be in there lying dormant, waiting for us to run whatever program he's piggybacking on. How much time will you need? Kenna looked to Alec. Eight hours? He scratched his chin. Maybe give us twelve, just in case. Kenna nodded grimly. I'll put out the word. By the time I woke up the next morning, our network was dead. Everything was shut down. Kenna and I, along with the other world builders, had worked the rest of the night to secure the Cerebral Link network. We'd cut off power to the stacks the week before, so at least that was good timing. Kenna wanted us up at the community center first thing, so I quickly ate a breakfast bar and walked out the door. Alec was on the street waiting for me. How long have you been out here? I asked. He shrugged. Not long. You could have knocked. I could have. A slow smile spread across his face. He reached out, recognizing my nervousness. We're going to figure this out. What if we don't? I walked quickly to keep up with his long steps. Then we don't. Then we figure that out. I laughed out loud. You really have that much confidence in us? Alec squeezed my shoulder. So far, we have a 100% rate of success. I'll take those odds any day. All of us sat in the foyer, our group too big to fit in Kenna's office. We'd pulled out chairs and arranged them into a circle. Looking at the faces across from me, I realized it had been a while since I'd talked with any of my team members and friends. Some of the world builders I hadn't even met officially. I had no idea what Case had been doing the past few weeks. Same with Tree. I felt a pang of guilt watching her arrange her robe around herself as she sat down. If I felt lonely... What had she been feeling here in P3 so far from home? Sloane sat down on my right, and I smiled. How's Sean? He's doing great, she answered, but as she turned, the dark circles under her eyes told a different story. What about you? I'm doing all right, she yawned. I spend a lot of time linked up with him there. Turns out this has been convenient. She motioned to the back of her head. Ha, huh, I laughed. Now there's an adjective I've never used for Cerebral Link. Sloane chuckled and swept her hair off her forehead. It's really nice in there. Oh, I know. So nice it's hard to come back. 
Sloane's smile faded as she looked down at her feet. Kenna stood and lifted her voice. As you're all aware by now, we've moved into emergency shutdown. Do any of you have questions about the information I sent out yesterday? Nobody spoke up. I'd normally pull up a projection to visually show what we're working with here, but obviously that isn't an option. As I mentioned in my message, we asked you all to be here because we need to figure out what our next step is. Our goal in shutting everything down was to make sure our digital friend can no longer access the files or change your programming. But every day we're closed means we're losing time. We only have two months left to salvage this, and the only way we can do that is to figure out how to delete Bryn permanently from the system. Darius spoke up. Can we treat this like we'd treat any other virus? Sandbox it? I spoke up. I've tried. I think it might be possible to keep him contained for a time, but he has the capability to rewrite himself, to reinvent his own code. So nothing we do is going to keep forever. We'll need a debugger, a man called out. I nodded. A very powerful debugger, but the problem is we don't have a way to build it while everything is shut down. It will take weeks to get something like that written, a woman spoke up. We don't have time with everything else we're trying to accomplish. Kenna nodded knowingly. We need more people. We've needed more people from the day we started, which is why I wanted to suggest something. She leaned back against the front desk, tapping her finger on her elbow. The only system we currently have running is our Cerebralink building. It's closed, disconnected from anything outside with no data transfer. I shook my head. Bryn may be in there. He might have gotten lucky. Kenna nodded. We can scan for that. Make sure it's clean before we start. You're suggesting we build the code there, with those who are linked? Darius asked. Exactly. Kenna exhaled. Build the debugger by linking in. There are other coders there, good ones. My mind flashed to Glynn, lying on the table not too far from Vera. They may be willing to help. I stood. No. Those people are wildcards. We have no idea how that would even work. Plus, if Bryn's been there? I looked over at Sloane, wondering if she'd seen anything while she was linked. She shook her head. There has to be another option. What if we booted up the system in maintenance mode? Darius suggested. Allowed for essential functioning only. We'd be hoping he hasn't jumped onto any essential programming, Kenna muttered. I consider this. It's a good idea. That would allow us to continue to build our blockchains while working on the debugger. Kenna threw her arms out. With what army? The only people we have to work with are sitting right here in this room. Tree stood up, looking regal and stately. She demanded attention without even saying a word. She motioned toward the front door, and Kenna looked at her with confusion. Tree walked forward. You've expressed your need for help since we arrived, and rightly so. At the time, our people were stretched thin and we didn't have anything to offer. But I realized last week that we might be able to help. You have your only two coders working with the energy systems, and that takes precedence, Kenna argued. Tree shook her head and smiled. Not our only coders. I think if you'd be willing to step outside, you'll see what I'm talking about. Chapter 56 We exited the room and walked out front to the street. It was empty. Kenna ground her teeth and scanned for tree. Just then, a cloud of dust appeared in the distance and approached at an impossible rate. I squinted, and Alex stepped closer, putting an arm around me protectively. What is that? he asked. I didn't have an answer for him. We watched in stunned silence as the singular cloud of dust turned into three. Had to be vehicles of some sort by how fast they were moving. They looked gray, but as they got closer, I realized their tops were only reflecting the sky above them. I watched in awe as they barreled down the road, then skidded to a stop in front of us. The top of the car closest to us popped, lifting up into the air in a single piece. Before I could wrap my brain around the engineering, my eyes dropped to look inside the vehicle. There, in front of me, was a shock of blonde, wavy hair. Woo! Ave pulled himself to his feet and pumped his fist in the air. 
Can you believe they trusted me with this thing? He pressed up on the bar to his side and jumped over onto the dirt. I gasped, and Alec dropped his arm as I bolted forward. Whoa! Abe laughed as I slammed into him. You're going to knock me over. How are you here? How? When? I stumbled over my words and stepped back to get a good look at him. We got word that our coding skills were needed, Abe answered with a goofy grin, fully enjoying the attention. Motion caught my eye and I looked in the back seat. Anton! I laughed and put out a hand to help him over the side. He pointed back to another friend in the back who'd also helped with the Spider-X project. I was so full of joy I thought I might burst. The other two transports held more coders, including a few from the coalition who stayed behind with the Vivientes. We had help. Good help. Nine more coders, Tree announced proudly. Abe stood tall and gave a salute. At your service. With that kind of manpower, we were able to persuade Kenna to try maintenance mode. Over the next 24 hours, we leapt into onboarding meetings with little to no preparation, making sure everyone was on the same page before we booted up. Pash pulled me over before I left with Alec, Mila, and Zane for dinner. My meal alarms weren't up and running, which meant I hadn't eaten since the night before. Yeah? I asked impatiently, noticing that Sloane stood on the other side, waiting to say something. I held up a finger to let her know I'd be quick. When we were in with the Cerebral Link patients, did you happen to take a look at Vera's stats? Pash asked. No, I didn't even think to. I was so worried about shutting everything down. I stifled a yawn. I figured that was the case, but I did. I think she's ready. It's a big risk, I sighed. If we pull her out and she's not? You've done everything you can at this point, he assured me. I wanted to let you know, considering the situation. You have clearance to remove her connection when you see fit. I nodded, not sure what to do with that information. We did need the help, but I also didn't want to be distracted in case things went sideways. Pash retreated and I turned to Sloan. Sorry about that. I know you're in high demand, she teased. I'm going to spend some time with Sean, before things get crazy tomorrow. Got it. Do you want me to come a little later and pull you out? I asked. She still looked exhausted, but at this point, we all did. No, just come whenever you plan to get Vera. I can help you with that. I nodded. I can't decide whether I want to do that before or after we boot up. Sloane shrugged. I think Pash knows what he's talking about. True. I glanced up and saw my friends ahead of me on the road. I'll come first thing in the morning. Sloane gave a small wave and headed toward the Cerebral Inc. building while I jumped ahead and caught up with the others. We hid our rations, but as soon as we finished eating, we walked back to our section of P3, too tired to be social. I stumbled inside and went directly to my bed, flopped onto my pillow and closed my eyes. Even though I was exhausted, my mind wouldn't slow down. My body could barely function, but my brain refused to sleep. It was more than maddening. I counted, let my mind drift, breathed deeply, held my breath. Nothing I did could make me stop thinking about what we were going to do tomorrow. What if Bryn was active when we booted up? What if we couldn't get the debugger built fast enough? Endless streams of questions rolled through my head. Eventually, my body was so restless and uncomfortable, I had to get up. I walked into the kitchen and pulled out my lunch portion that I'd wasted. At least it would go to good use now. But eating had the opposite effect of what I'd been hoping for. I felt refreshed and wide awake. Groaning, I grabbed my mask from the entryway. I tromped outside and headed up the road. At least by moving, I could clear all of this nervous energy. I walked with no plan or destination, but when I looked up, I found myself in front of the Cerebral Link building. I didn't love the idea of pulling Vera out right before I needed to stay focused. But maybe I could pull her out tonight, give her a little time to adjust. If she needed to rest, she could easily do that at my place. She'd done it for me. Maybe then I'd be able to sleep as well. I walked up to the door and scanned my wristband. It opened easily, and I slipped inside. I'd been here so many times, I'd memorized the route to Vera's table. I didn't realize I'd forgotten to hit the lights until I was almost halfway down the aisles. I turned, and something hit the floor next to me, clattering on the tile. 
I reached for my pocket, wondering if I'd dropped the memory drive. Before my hand hit fabric, something knocked me off my feet. I slammed into the table next to me and dropped to the floor. Hard. Chapter 57 I struggled against the body on top of me and tried to right myself, but a knee jabbed into my spine. I yelped in pain as they yanked my arms behind my back, bending me so violently my spine flexed and cracked. I couldn't see anything in the pitch black, and I was beyond panic. Strong arms forced me up and held my wrists so tightly I could barely move without straining my shoulders. They pushed me forward and slammed me face first onto one of the empty beds, then lashed my wrists together with a cord that bit into my skin. They repeated the process on my ankles, and as I whipped my head to the side, I made out a shadowy outline in the dim bluish glow. I strained, trying to capture any identifying characteristics, but it was useless. Once I was incapacitated, my captor finally stepped back. Footsteps moved away from me and my heart leapt. Maybe they'd leave me here and I could roll off the table, inch myself forward and find the door, yell as loud as I could. I winced as the lights flicked on, blinding me. Blinking, I tried to clear my vision and orient myself. Where was I? I looked over at the bed next to mine and my brows furrowed. I knew that face. I looked at that face every time I came in to check on Vera, which meant, you really couldn't wait until tomorrow morning? A woman's voice said, and I craned my neck. Sloane stood in front of me. Her arms crossed over her chest. I must have looked shocked because a sneer spread across her face. What? Didn't expect to see me here? Not exactly true. I knew she was here, supposedly visiting Sean. I just didn't expect to have her attack me, tie me up, and look at me like that. What motivation would she have to do this? I'd done nothing but help her, and she'd seemed invested in what we were trying to achieve. It made zero sense. Another figure came into view, and this time, I audibly gasped. Vera, I called out, but as the words left my lips, I knew I wasn't going to get any help from her. Vera put a hand on Sloane's shoulder and smiled wickedly. What was happening? Had I gone crazy? Was my lack of sleep making me hallucinate? Why would Sloane attack me like this, and how was Vera awake and somehow a part of it? I lay there in catatonic shock. You know... I was quite impressed that you thought to power down the edge, Vera purred. I thought you should know that. I stared at her in confusion. She didn't sound like herself. Her voice was similar, but the way she spoke, it wasn't like her. It would have been more helpful for you, at least, had you done it a few weeks ago, she continued. But it was a good strategy, nonetheless. Again, I gaped. What was she talking about? Sloane laughed gleefully. You really had no idea? About what? I grunted as frustration built within me. Combined with the fuzziness in my head, I thought I might throw up. She didn't. She didn't know. Sloane laughed gleefully. You'd think you'd know your friends better than that. I wanted to scream. Had I just entered into an alternate reality? Had I been linked without knowing it? This couldn't be real life. I'm sure this is all very confusing. Vera's mouth pulled into a pout. Let me clear a few things up for you. She motioned to Sloane's body. I'm not sure who this used to be, but she isn't here anymore. She was very consistent, like clockwork, which was extremely convenient for us. Sloane wasn't there anymore? She was standing right in front of me. Hi, Channel. The corner of Sloane's mouth curled up. I know you thought I didn't see you in P7, when you opened the door and spun around, leaving before I could say hello. She walked a step closer and leaned down so her face was inches from mine. Granted, I wasn't expecting the man you brought with you to be so brazen. That was on me. But look how it turned out. Better than if I would have done something then. A chill traveled down my spine. What she was saying, it couldn't be possible. How? Was the only word I could get out. Sloane, 
Cass, smiled and stood back up. It was simple, actually. Kenna regularly sent messages to the council, which made it simple for Bryn to find me. His address had never been removed from those group communications, and I just happened to be checking in. He gave you the code? I breathed. The formula? He taught you how to jump? Cass smiled. Now you're getting it. A quick procedure and I was ready to travel here. I have to say, your friend's body is incredibly fit. Much better than the one I left. I struggled against my restraints. Where is she? What did you do with her? I'm actually not sure. Cass looked over at Vera. This time, when I looked at her face, I knew. Bryn. Very good. He smiled, and I wanted to rip him apart more than I had the first time. All you need to know is that your friend didn't put up much of a fight. She was apparently very happy in her linked existence, or if not happy, at least scared enough not to ask questions. This couldn't be happening. I'd done the right thing. I told everyone what happened, and we had a plan. We were going to take care of this tomorrow morning. You look tired, Channel. I think it's time you went to sleep. The tone in Cass's voice made me flinch. Come tomorrow, you won't have to worry about any of this. She reached out a hand and patted my cheek. What are you talking about? I asked through gritted teeth. We heard all about your little meeting, and we thought it would be a great opportunity for Straya to join. Unannounced. My heart began to race. If she showed up and saw... I had to get a message to Kenna, to someone. Cass and Bryn looked like our friends, and nobody was going to know the difference. Cass's fingers scratched the back of my neck. Shh. You can relax. This won't hurt a bit. She pushed me further up the bed and forced my head to the side. You'll find it's not as easy to get out of this link. We've made a few adjustments. No! I tossed my head from side to side. I hated that I was begging, but what else could I do? I was so tired, and every time I thrashed, my shoulders felt like they were going to break. Good night, Channel. Sleep tight. This couldn't be happening. Someone had to be coming for me, or notice I wasn't home. But then I realized I hadn't told anyone I was coming here except for Sloane, which obviously wasn't going to be helpful at this point. I was on my own. Nobody knew I was here. Absolute despair dragged me down, pulling me under as I slipped between the lights. Chapter 58 I floated, moving slowly through something viscous. Water? Air? Whatever it was, it made me sluggish. There were lights in the distance, and I pushed forward, trying to reach them. But the more I pushed, the slower I moved, like I was attached to a band that could only stretch so far. It was so much work, and I was so tired. Suddenly, the bubble burst and I fell, slowly at first, then picked up speed. My stomach lodged itself in my throat and I opened my mouth to scream, but nothing came out. Any minute now, I was going to hit the ground, any minute I was going to land so hard my legs would break underneath me and I would cease to exist, just like that. I couldn't see a thing in the pitch black, couldn't look down to see when I'd hit the surface of whatever was under me. Then, it was suddenly over. No landing or slowing down. I was simply standing, firmly on the ground in P3. The sky was dark and the air hazier than I'd remembered. I turned in a circle trying to make sense of what part of the community I was standing in. Was it early morning or night? My breath caught as I realized I was outside of my old house. Though all the habitations in P3 looked the same, I knew ours because it was the second one in from the corner, and my bench stood up the street on my left. Why was I out here on the street? I didn't want to stay. Ignoring the panic rising in my chest, I jogged forward and burst through the door. Mom? I ran into the kitchen. No answer. I opened the back door, but she wasn't there either. Where was everyone? 
Retracing my steps, I exited to the street and ran toward the community center. Maybe I'd forgotten about a presentation or something? The streets were eerily silent. Nobody walked to and from their placement or the grid. Nobody headed to pick up their food portions or meet with a friend in the square. The utter stillness made me nervous, and I pushed myself faster. I swung the doors open and walked into the foyer of the auditorium. Dead silent. The auditorium sat open, but all the seats were empty. My heart pounded and I started to panic as I ran down the hall toward Kenna's office. A flash of red caught my eye, and I skidded to a stop, peeking through one of the doors in the hall. Cass smiled. You made it. Blood rushed in my ears. What was she doing here? I was wondering when you'd finally show up. She picked up her tablet. What are you talking about? I took a step back as she rounded the desk. She looked exactly as I remembered. Long blonde hair and a curvy figure hugged in all the right places by a red wrap dress. But this wasn't Cass in the real world. Everything outside and inside this building had seemed real until right this second. I'm here to give you a tour, she announced, then stopped in front of me. I've got so much to show you, and we've already wasted half the morning. I looked out the front windows. It looks like it's the middle of the night. She laughed, and the sound echoed off the walls in the hall. That's funny. My brow furrowed, and as much as I didn't want to, I fell into step behind her. She walked slowly, purposefully, toward the doors, the points of her heels clicking on the floor beneath us. Why is P3 empty? I built up the courage to ask a question as we stepped out into the square. It's not empty. You and I are here. You know what I mean. She shrugged and hugged the tablet she held in her hand against her chest. We're the only ones left. She leveled her eyes at mine. I promised everyone I'd stay until you arrived. Nobody wanted to retire P3 without you seeing the final results. Results of what? My breath came in bursts. I didn't know what she was referring to, but the look on her face told me it wasn't good. She spun on her heel and continued walking. After your experimental hybrid community failed, the coalition disbanded and the council moved on with the plans Bryn had set out from the beginning. Since P3 was nearly consolidated already, it made the most sense to use a different site for real integration. We... we failed? My legs began to feel numb. Of course you did. We all knew it was going to happen, but thankfully it happened sooner than we thought. Oh, she raised a finger in the air. Thank you for the plans for our new carbon reuptake power vaults. They're running incredibly well in P7. My head spun as we turned down the street toward the stacks. What was happening? Where were all my friends? That's not possible. My voice shook. That was Viviente's technology, and it wasn't promised to you in the event in the event of our failure at the end of the contract. Cass somehow increased her pace in her heels, and I forced my tingling limbs to keep up. She didn't respond to my comment, simply pressed on toward the ominous building in front of us. We kept them here for you, your friends. We thought it would bring closure for you to see them before we left. We? Right. We're leaving in an hour when our transport arrives. She walked up the steps and swiped her wristband, then opened the door to the stacks and walked in. As much as I didn't want to step foot inside that building, I had to see what she was talking about. If my friends were in there, if they were still alive, then I needed to see them and find a way to get them out. Cass flicked on the lights, and I froze. The room was empty. No tables or data banks just a long black sheet hanging near the back wall, suspended on cords from the ceiling. Cass moved to the left and hit another button along the wall, and the sheet dropped. I gasped. My friends stood in agony, their hands clamped together and stretched above their heads with their faces twisted in pain. Let them go! I dashed forward to Alec, the closest person to me. Channel? His voice was gravelly and weak. It's me. I'm here. 
I reached up and desperately pulled at the cuffs around his wrist. I'm going to get you out. Get away from me. He used his weight to shove me off the wall. I caught my balance and stared at him in confusion. Alec, I... Why would I trust you? After what you did? His eyes seared into mine, his gaze cold and dark. I didn't do anything. I just woke up and... You were working for them the whole time, Mila accused, lifting her head next to him. I can't believe we listened to you, had pity on you that day at the grid. I stumbled backward and scanned the row. All of them, Sloane, Tree, Kenna, Ave, and Darius, glowered at me. I wasn't... I don't know what you're talking about. I wasn't working for anyone other than the Coalition. Honestly, I should have known. Alec flinched as he shifted his weight. You told me so plainly, so clearly, that you hated the real world. I tried to cut in, but he talked over me. You said it so many times, and I didn't want to hear it. I didn't think anyone could be as callous as that. I wrapped my arms around my chest and started to shiver. This couldn't be happening. I hadn't done anything wrong. Why are they saying this? I choked out. Why do they think I'm the problem here? Cass chuckled lightly. You're definitely not a problem for us. I don't know what we would have done without the access codes you passed along. That was instrumental in us getting the energy blueprints. I whipped my head toward her. Don't you dare. I didn't pass along any access codes. I always thought I'd be proud of you. I turned back to the wall. Darius looked at me, his eyes bloodshot and his face drawn. I always thought when I met my daughter, she'd be a fighter. I never thought she'd be fighting for the wrong side. I walked toward him. Dad, I... That's enough, Cass called. Time to go. She moved to the left and pressed a button. Darius's body tensed, and a strangled sound left his lips. Stop! I ran toward him. I wouldn't touch him if I were you, Cass called out. There are 300 volts running through his body. Electricity? She was electrocuting him? I thought of the woman in P7, how she'd slumped to the ground when the taser had gone off. She'd never gotten back up. Stop! Please! I stared in horror as every muscle in his body stretched under his skin. This is your fault, Channel. Tears streamed down Mila's face. You dragged us here, and for what? The pain in my chest became too great, and I dropped to my knees. Next, Cass announced cheerily, as if she was calling up her next cerebral link appointment. Sloane's body went rigid next to Darius. I pulled at my shirt, gasping for breath, but unable to take in any air. The acrid smell of burnt plastic filled the room and I gagged. I couldn't speak. I couldn't scream. I fell forward and my forehead hit the concrete floor. Make it stop, I begged internally. I'll do anything. Just please, make it stop. Part 9. Mila September 1st, 2161 Chapter 59 Alex sat down next to me and Zane in the auditorium. Where was Channel? I was sure she would be the first person here this morning, but she still hadn't shown up. Neither had Kenna, though, so maybe they were working on something together. Better yet, maybe they'd already figured out how we could clean up the mess inside of our programming. Sleep okay? Alec asked. I was tense, understandably. We all were. We were dealing with something we didn't understand, and I wasn't saying that because I was a new coder. Even the experienced ones didn't comprehend the situation fully. I'd overheard a conversation this morning as I was coming in with a couple of the world builders. They were asking things like, could he replicate indefinitely, or how can we debug sentient code without preempting the next evolution? Booting up in maintenance mode wasn't going to answer those questions, or tell us what to do next we were going to have to figure that out together. I slept fine, I answered, which was only partially true. I'd slept. That was the fine part. But I'd spent a lot of the night tossing and turning next to Zane. He always slept like a rock, which didn't seem fair. Zane put an arm around my shoulder and pulled me close. 
just as Kenna walked through the lower doors and approached the stage. This room was massive, but at least being down close to the platform like this made it feel a bit more manageable, like we could talk to each other without having to yell. Good morning. Kenna's voice easily carried throughout the room. I glanced to the right as Sloane and a friend I didn't know with cropped blonde hair walked down the aisles and took their places in the seats ahead of us. I hope you've all been brainstorming, Kenna continued, because in a few moments I'm going to activate. Who's this? Alec leaned forward and tapped Sloane's shoulder. She turned, looking a bit startled. Oh, she followed Alec's eyes. This is Vera. Vera? Alec's brow furrowed. Channel's friend? Vera nodded, flashing a smile our way. I thought she... You were still linked. She pulled me out this morning. Vera tucked a strand of light blonde hair behind her ear. Do you know where she is? I asked, knowing Alec was likely wondering the same thing. Vera shrugged. She said she had to take care of something at home before she came here. I sat back in my seat. It wasn't like Channel to do something like this without at least letting us know. But then again, she'd been keeping a lot of things from us lately, the virus being one of them. I thought our conversation the other day had helped her understand she didn't have to hide, but old habits die hard. Maybe I'll go see if she needs help. Alec rose from his seat, but I put out an arm. No, I shook my head. We need to be here for this. I looked back toward Kenna. She and Pash were in the process of turning on a portion of the edge so we could at least see the code we were working with. Alec didn't sit. I'm not going to be able to help with this anyway. I don't know how to code or get rid of code. I'll be back in a second. Or I'll send a message. Suddenly, a screen opened up above Kenna's head and Alec was momentarily distracted. This is the viral code we've isolated. Kenna underlined a branch of text on the projection. She must have been working on her tablet. We need to figure out how to find it and delete it permanently without... A blue circle at the top of the screen blinked. Kenna paused. It was the same notification I got when I had messages, but this one kept coming. I'm sorry, I don't know why or how someone's trying to call me. She leaned closer to the standing desk next to her. We all got a front row seat to her flipping through screens, attempting to decline whatever communication was coming through. As soon as she'd shut it down and stood up to speak, another notification blinked persistently. Kenna was flummoxed. She tried again, this time searching for the location of the call, but no name or identification showed up. This time, instead of disappearing, the dot turned red and the call screen opened, expanding to cover the entire projection. A face appeared, a woman's face, and eyes peered out at us. What the? Alec's body stiffened. I looked up but didn't have time to say anything before Sloane stood up in front of me. The woman's eyes flicked our direction. Kenna, the woman said crisply. I thought you said you knew nothing about the attack on P7. Kenna frantically swiped the screen of her tablet. Estrella, I'm in the middle of a meeting with my team. Answering my calls is a requirement in our contract. I'm not available at the moment. Kenna shot back through gritted teeth. Straya pursed her lips. Clearly you are. I'm disappointed you didn't include the council in this meeting in the first place. When I received word of a complication, I was shocked you hadn't been the first to come to us. Kenna gave up trying to shut the call down and instead stared desperately at the rest of us. Straya, a member of the council which meant, I can plainly see that your group here includes one of the individuals involved in the attack. Straya stared at Sloane, who then stepped to the side, revealing Zane and me. Straya's eyes went wide. Three. All three of the patients linked in Paradise 7 community, taken without consent and at the loss of one of our council members and multiple cerebral link technicians. My heart pounded wildly in my chest, and Zane tightened his grip on my shoulder. We weren't supposed to be here. Straya had seen us, and that meant she knew. She knew the Coalition had been involved in that attack. She'd already shortened our timeline when she suspected it, but now? Kenna cleared her throat. I can explain. 
The group that acted of their own accord eventually had nowhere to go. They became desperate and came to us. We... There are the other two. Stria pointed to Darius and Case, crawling low to the ground, attempting to hide behind the seats in front of them. I assure you, whatever explanation you were about to give cannot make sense of you including terrorists in your meeting this morning, Kenna. Which means you've confirmed what I suspected all along. My breathing had become quick and shallow, and I felt faint. Maybe we could do something, say something that would make this better? Pretend it was all our fault and convince this woman that Kenna had nothing to do with it. The coalition is not operating under the terms we agreed to, which means this operation is being shut down. Indefinitely. Her screen winked out of existence, just as voices erupted around us. I closed my eyes and tried to drown them out. Sloan? Alec called out next to me. What are you doing? Leaving. You heard what she said. So, that's it? He asked, incredulous. You're giving up? I opened my eyes, braving the noise and lights to find Sloane standing back in the aisle with Vera. We have to fight this, I argued. We can't give up when it wasn't our fault. But it was our fault. Sloane sighed. It's time we grew up and accepted life for what it is, what it always has been. She climbed the stairs next to us. The real world is over. The sooner we can all let that go, the better. I watched her back as she ascended toward the aisle, leading back to the doors we'd come through. What was she talking about? She didn't actually believe that, did she? After everything she'd been through? Everything she'd helped us through? Come on, Alec growled. He ran forward toward the stage. Zane and I followed him, arriving with half of the room next to Kenna, who stood rooted to the spot, her head hanging and her shoulders slumped. People shouted out questions, asking whether we were going to shut down like Straya said, or whether we were going to fight this. She was only one council member, wasn't she? There had to be a way to show her what we were doing was working. Regardless of what happened in the past, she had to be able to see that. Wasn't she on our side? With Bryn out of the picture, why did it still feel like we had to scratch and fight for any sort of momentum with the council? Enough! Kenna shouted. She wobbled unsteadily and put out a hand on her desk to find her balance. Enough, she repeated, her voice small and defeated. We've done everything we can. There's nothing else we can do at this point. We don't know how to get rid of Bryn from our system, and the fact that Straya showed up? That tells me he's somehow been able to communicate. You think he told her to show up? Darius called out. Who else would have tipped her off to our meeting? Kenna looked up. I highly doubt it was anyone here. The murmur in the crowd died a second time. Her eyes narrowed as she scanned above our heads. Where's Channel? Darius looked directly at us. I shrugged and opened my mouth to say something. But before I could, Alec had already taken off up the steps. Chapter 60 We burst through the doors to the grid. Alec ran forward, followed closely by Darius. Zane stayed behind to do damage control with Pash and my parents, but I couldn't stand the thought of not knowing what was happening. I'd forced Alec to let me come along and look for Channel. They ran in opposite directions around the circle of workstations, eventually making it back to me, panting and out of breath. Alec shook his head. She wasn't here. She wasn't at home. I'd thought it was odd that she wasn't waiting for us when we stopped by to pick her up this morning. Why hadn't I listened to that feeling? Why hadn't I started looking for her then? Where else could she be? Darius asked. I scanned my memories, trying to think of anything she might have said the night before. Vera, Alec blurted. Channel was working on pulling her out of her link. I nodded. Vera was in the auditorium. Alec tore toward the doors. Where? The Cerebralink building! I called behind to Darius, running as fast as I could to keep up. We bolted down the street, turned right, and within seconds we were standing at the doors. Our wristbands didn't give us access, so we stood there wheezing while we waited for Darius to catch up. Alec motioned for him to scan us in, then nearly pulled the door off its hinges as he entered the building. 
It was dark in the room, a bluish glow the only thing illuminating the area since there weren't any windows to let in natural light. Do you see anything? I narrowed my eyes and scanned the tables. I could barely make out their features as I waited for my eyes to adjust. No. Alec growled. Suddenly, the lights blinked on, and I looked back to see Darius next to the switch. Where was Vera's port? I asked, gaining confidence now that I could see. You know as much as I do, Mila. Alec jogged down the central aisle and scanned the tables on both sides. He hopped up to check the top beds, then moved on to the next row. I went the opposite direction, inspecting faces as fast as I could. Before I'd hit my fourth row, Alec's voice rang out across the building. Here. She's here. I jumped and banged my shin against one of the tables as I rushed his direction. Channel. I heard him shout. I could barely breathe. Channel. He called again, just as I found him and Daria standing next to one of the tables. I stopped next to them and leaned over, attempting to catch my breath. As I did so, I saw two things at the same time. Cords wrapped around Channel's ankles and something protruding from the back of her neck. What the? My voice caught in my throat. What had happened here? Why was she tied up? Why in the world was she linked? Who did this? Darius and Alec didn't answer. How could they have answered? None of us had any explanation for what lay in front of us. Was this Vera's table? Had Channel pulled her out and then been attacked? But then, why had Vera been at the meeting? Wouldn't she have noticed that her friend wasn't with her? Maybe Channel stayed behind to do something, but who would have done this to her? Can you find scissors? Darius switched positions with Alec. I'm going to pull these cords out. It shouldn't hurt her. She can't have been in there for long. Alec nodded, his face pulled into a grimace as he pushed past me in search of something sharp. Channel. Darius pulled the plug on her cerebral link connection and turned her head to face us. I expected her to wake up, to open her eyes or something, but she didn't. She was lifeless and still. Channel. Darius shook her shoulders. Here. Alec dashed toward us with wire cutters. They weren't scissors, but they'd do the trick. Darius nodded toward her hands and Alec went to work. He clipped the cords, careful to avoid nicking her skin, then moved on to the cords around her legs. Wake up, Channel, Darius commanded, his cheeks flushed and his eyes frenzied. As soon as the cords were removed, he rolled her onto her back. He gently ran a hand over her forehead, then swept his fingers down the side of her throat, checking for a pulse. Channel, Darius said, you need to wake up now. We're here, Channel. You need to... Her body convulsed, and I jumped back, this time hitting my knee on the table she was lying on. Alec reached out and held down her legs as Darius gripped her shoulders. Shh, Channel. It's okay. Darius whispered. It's me, Dad, with Alec and Mila. Dad? She choked out between sobs. You're here? Of course I am. He ran a hand over her head soothingly. We're all here. I thought you were. She pressed herself up to her elbows and stared at Alec and me. Where am I? Cerebral Ink Building. Alec didn't take his eyes off her. She blinked, confused and disoriented. I, I tried to sleep, but I couldn't. I went for a walk. She rubbed her eyes. When she opened them again, they were focused. The blood drained from her face. Where are Sloan and Vera? They left, I think. Alec turned to me. After the meeting, didn't they leave? I nodded. It's a little chaotic out there. After. Channel started, then froze. You already had the meeting? You already booted up? Darius nodded. Straya showed up. She saw us. All of us. She knows the coalition was part of the attack on P7 and she shut us down. No. Channel threw her legs off the table and tried to stand up. No, no, no. Alec reached out to steady her. They aren't who they say they are. Who isn't? Alec asked. Vera and Sloane. She groaned and slumped into Alec's arms. Bryn found a way to communicate. That's what Kenna said. Darius cut in. Channel nodded, still not looking up. 
He was talking with Cass in P7, and he gave her the jump code. She came here. Cass came here? Where is she? Is she the one who did this to you? Alec asked, his muscles tense and his eyes blazing. No, Alec, she isn't here, not her body. She's inside of Sloan. All three of us blinked. Darius shifted on his feet. What are you talking about? Channel took a deep breath, lifted her head, and stood to her full height. I came here last night to pull Vera out. I couldn't sleep, so I thought I'd get started on that, get her out before the meeting. Sloane attacked me. But it wasn't her. It was Cass? Darius asked, and I tried to wrap my brain around what she was saying. Not only had Bryn jumped, or taught Cass to jump, but they'd actually figured out a way to take over someone else's body? Exactly. Channel wobbled on her feet. She traveled through the system. It had to have been before we shut everything down, and she was here, just waiting for someone to link up. When Sloane came to meet with Sean, Cass took control. And Vera? Alec asked. Channel bit her lower lip. Bryn. My heart stopped. Bryn? He'd been sitting in front of us in the auditorium the whole time? We have to find them. Right now. I backed away from the table. Maybe we can catch them. Maybe... They left that room as soon as Drya signed off. Alec's chest rose and fell in quick bursts. They're probably already in a transport by now. Straya was a setup, Channel groaned. Bryn and Cass knew she'd shut us down once she had proof that the Coalition was involved in that attack. Bryn was probably there, in the auditorium when Straya first cut our timeline. She wiped her nose, sniffing. He's been one step ahead of us the whole time. They got exactly what they wanted, I choked out. Darius crossed his arms over his chest. They think they did. They did get exactly what they wanted, Channel repeated. They have the jump code they were searching for, and now they're free to go wherever they want. No. Darius shook his head. They aren't free to go. Channel looked at him quizzically as Alec helped her toward the doors. You said they already left. Sure. They may have a head start, but they aren't free to go. Fire burned in Darius's eyes. Come on. There's a room in the community center I've been dying to check out. Part 10. Channel. September 1st, 2161 through September 14th, 2161. Chapter 61. I clung to Alec as we made our way back to the community center. How could this have happened? How could I not have seen this coming? I felt so stupid for going to the building alone last night, for not being able to warn everyone before the meeting. Now Vera and Sloan could be well on their way back to P7 or wherever they planned to go from here. Darius wanted to walk quickly, but Alec and I together could only move so fast. It took us a good ten minutes to get to the community center doors, which was time we didn't have to give. Case waited for us as we entered the hall near Kenna's office. You have access? Darius asked, and Case nodded, his mouth curling upward. I've been looking forward to this since I got here. Darius clapped him on the shoulder. What were they talking about? Looking forward to what? Alec, Mila, and I followed, my feet beginning to feel much more steady under me. Now, I held on to Alec more for comfort than out of necessity. Case marched toward the back of the hall, past the offices, close to where we'd turned to go to the auditorium. I didn't think there were any other rooms back here, and I was about to say as much when he stopped and scanned his wristband along what looked like a bare wall. A green light blinked into existence, and a doorway appeared, sliding into the wall next to it. I stared in disbelief. Case and Darius pushed inside the room and we followed. The room wasn't huge, maybe the size of three large closets, but the shelves were full. Case pulled a gun just like I'd seen the guards holding in P7 off the rack closest to him. He turned toward us. Take your pick. They didn't snag one of these? I asked in shock as Alec helped me into the Viviente's vehicle. 
Darius tried to insist I stay behind, but there was no way that was happening. If we had the chance to catch Bryn and Cass, I wanted to be there. Nope. Probably too suspicious. Or they didn't know they had the option. Alec jumped into the back with me. Case is coming. Darius dumped an armful of weapons into the small back compartment. He cleared the bar and settled into the driver's seat. Case hopped in after him. I settled into my seat. Thanks for helping us out. The roof closed above us. Case scoffed. Are you kidding? This is the kind of thing I live for. Killing people? I asked before I realized how rude it was. Killing the bad people, he corrected. He was joking, but his words still made my stomach twist. What if Vera and Sloane are still in there? I whispered to Alec. They aren't. He nodded firmly, and I chose to believe him. None of us knew definitively where they were, but there wasn't any time to figure it out. The engine purred to life, and Darius slapped the wheel. Let's see what you can do. He peeled out, and I slammed back against the seat. Whoa. I struggled to catch my breath. Alec looked over with wide eyes. This couldn't be safe. We were going too fast. I gasped as our speed picked up a second time. Darius, this is incredible. He pushed the vehicle forward even faster. I didn't say another word because I couldn't physically get the words out. Do we know where they are? Alec yelled. Tracking was never disabled. Darius called back. Looks like they're heading to P7. I gripped the seat as the transport tore forward. I hoped he was right. They're 45 minutes ahead of us, but at this speed, we should catch them within an hour and a half. Darius grinned in the rearview mirror. An hour and a half. That's how long we had to figure out how to take Bryn and Cass down. There were four of us, two who had actual defensive training. Alec and I were scrappy, but we were not taking the lead on this one. My job? to seek and destroy any digital information I found. We weren't stupid. Bryn would have done everything possible to make sure he wasn't vulnerable, which meant he'd backed up his data. Kenna had likely already booted up in maintenance mode and debugged the Cerebralink system. That would stay closed until we were sure we'd gotten everything out. We'd branch out from there. Our local system, then P7s. We'd look anywhere we had to. Bryn had been a world builder, it was true, but he'd been out of the game a long time. Now that we finally knew what to look for, our coalition team would work until the system was debugged and our task was complete. I reached up and felt the transmag behind my ear. Grateful Darius had thought to snag one. Closing my eyes, I sent a quick message, letting Tree know we were safe. It was comforting to know she was there. Not that she'd be able to help. No one could at this point but at least Kenna and Tree would be apprised of what was happening. My body finally adjusted to the speed we were traveling, and I shifted to a more comfortable position. I leaned into Alec. This has to end. Why can't they just let us be? Alec raised an eyebrow. Because they know we're winning. People like Bryn only maintain power when people believe the lies they're selling. That reels and unreels can't coexist? that the world is too damaged to ever recover. I nodded. He made us believe we were each other's enemies. It's a strategy that's worked since the beginning of time, and somehow none of us ever see it coming. We were going to finish this. We were going to finish our mission. I stared out the front windshield and waited as the transport sped across the terrain. Up ahead! Darius called out nearly an hour later, and I jolted upright. Seriously? We'd found them already? That's a P3 transport, Case confirmed as he stared through a pair of binoculars. He pulled the lenses away from his face. It stopped. My brow furrowed. Probably had to pull over and charge. The land around us was no longer flat. Rocks jutted out and created hills and valleys along the road. Something niggled at me. Why would they have to stop and charge two hours into their journey? Stop, I shouted, and Darius immediately took his foot off the accelerator. What is it? Case turned in his seat. Before I could answer, his eyes lifted over my shoulder and his mouth dropped open. I spun around and gasped. Four, no, five, transports were behind us in pursuit. Two people outside of the vehicle up ahead. 
Darius called out. Suddenly, it all made sense. The quick exit, leaving me alive and linked, the tracking still functional in their vehicle. They wanted us to find them. I closed my eyes and repeated one word after visualizing Tree's contact number. Trap. Chapter 62 How could we have been so stupid? We jumped into this without taking two seconds to think about anything. And now, we were walking right into Bryn and Cass's carefully plotted plan. They knew my friends would come after me when I didn't show up to the meeting. They knew we'd immediately rush after them once I told everyone what I knew. Now they had us surrounded, in the middle of nowhere, with four people and a trunk full of weapons. What do we do? Alec's voice was low. We can outrun them, Darius offered. Their transports can't keep up and we don't ever have to stop and charge. What? I asked in shock. He smiled. Carbon reuptake, built in with a lithium carbon dioxide battery. How had Clearwater approved that? Okay, so we run. Which meant Bryn and Cass went free. They would have time to do whatever they wanted, and all the reels died in the process. I shook my head. We can't run. We have to take them out. Darius frowned. We'll die, Channel. We might be able to kill those two if we get lucky enough to take the shot but we can't take everyone on and walk away. I shrugged. Then so be it. We can't let them win. If they get out of here alive, we all lose. Everyone loses. The reels, eventually the unreals. We all get put into Bryn's system, and now that he has what he wants, he doesn't have any reason to keep experimenting. The vehicle was silent as we continued forward. The vehicles behind us drew closer, and soon we'd have to stop or swerve off the road to avoid hitting the P-3 transport in front of us. Case! An idea slammed into me. Can you see where those transports are from? He didn't even have to pick up his binoculars. P-7. They've got the logo up front. My heart raced. I knew what we had to do. I paused and looked between the three men in the car. I have an idea that I think might work. Might? Case asked. I nodded. I believe it will work. But I know I'm not the only one with an opinion on this. It's all of our lives at stake. Darius eased off the accelerator. We had to make a decision. If you want to run, I'll run. Alec pursed his lips. I'm with you. Just tell me what to do. Case nodded. I'll take out as many of them as I can. He motioned for me to pull down the back of our seat and pass up the weapons he'd stowed there. I moved to the side, and Alec worked to retrieve them. Dad? The vehicle slowed even further. I'm in, he answered. I love you. If we don't make it out of this, I love you too. I cut him off. We weren't saying goodbyes. Not yet. Now listen closely. The transports surrounded us, and we held our hands high in the air as the top lifted on our vehicle. Troopers stepped out of the vehicle and leveled their weapons. I'm a P-7 trained captain, Case shouted. My companions and I are unarmed. We only seek asylum, protection from real sympathizers. We kept our hands in the air as Case repeated this message a second time, turning his body in all directions so they could see his face. Get out of the vehicle, a trooper yelled. Keep your hands in the air. That was going to be difficult, given the fact that we had to step over a bar. Darius left the vehicle on and attempted it anyway. He stepped over and tried to maintain his balance, but toppled forward and landed on his face in the dirt. He kept his arms raised. One of the troopers walked forward, his weapon trained on Alec as he and Case did the same. When it came to my turn, one of the troopers had pity on me and hoisted me out by the waist, setting me down next to the others. A few of the soldiers stared at our transport curiously. Clearwater was going to kill us if we lost this to P-7. We have orders from the committee to kill anyone in this zone who resists transport into P-7, one of the troopers announced. I looked over his shoulder and saw Bryn and Cass. Affirmative. Case projected his voice. We will not resist. I was taken against my will from P-7 in May of 2161, 
and I have been kept for months in P3 by real sympathizers. They led the attack on P7 and killed council member Bryn Lee. My heart beat nervously in my chest, and my hands trembled. Case? One of the troopers said, lowering his weapon slightly. They told us you were in on this attack. Negative. Those two there were responsible. He pointed toward Vera and Sloan, still keeping his hands high above his head. I was taken and kept against my will. Hands above your heads, a trooper called out, and I winced. Cass stood tall. Your orders are to take care of this group. I'm the committee member who gave them to you, Cass Staley, operating under Bryn Lee, member of the Community Executive Council. That is not Cass Staley, Case cut in. Access security photos of the attack. This woman's name is Sloan and she worked on the docks. Her vessel was named the Breeze. I was one of the soldiers who brought her into P7 initially. She was linked, and I watched guard per Bryn and Cass's orders. As Case spoke, I breathed a sigh of relief. He'd remembered the names perfectly. I couldn't have been more grateful in that moment for Mila and her extreme attention to detail when she'd given us a recap of their journey and capture out east. Can you access Cass's profile image? That should clear things right up. I'm Cass! You idiots, she hissed. She marched forward, then froze when three different guns pointed her direction. He's lying to you. I gave you your orders, and you don't look like Cass, one of the troopers muttered. The picture doesn't match, like he said. I held my breath, waiting to see what would happen next. That woman next to her is Vera Nolan, Case continued. She fought against Cass in P3 with the coalition. The guns were no longer pointing in our direction, but we kept our hands in the air. My shoulders began to shake. Captain, there's a mandatory kill on sight order for anyone linked to the P-7 attack. My heart stopped in my chest. Darius and I had been there too. We had masks on and his face was currently covered in dirt. My hair was longer now too. I hoped they wouldn't make the connection. There's an explanation for this. Bryn refused to hold Vera's hands in the air. It's not a simple one, but I know you're all incredibly intelligent and should be able to follow. I grimaced, disgusted by his words coming out of Vera's mouth. She deserved better than this. He continued. Like I told you, my name is Bryn Lee. One of these coalition members successfully killed me while I was lying defenseless on a cerebraling table, but my mind was able to survive. Digitally. I traveled through the edge and eventually found my way to this body. He pointed to himself, and I nearly laughed out loud. It sounded ridiculous, and I knew that what he was saying was true. He took a step forward. Cass did the same thing. We had to. In order to shut down the coalition and their senseless attacks on innocent community members. You're saying you're inside there, but this isn't your body? The trooper in front of us asked, Exactly, Bryn smiled. We were forced to. Permission to fire? A soldier called out. Permission granted. The gun went off with a hollow thump, and Cass, Sloan, dropped to the ground as flesh and blood spattered on the transport behind her. Chapter 63 I gasped, then clamped my mouth shut. People running from attackers wouldn't care when their attackers died. Alec flashed me a warning glance, and my eyes widened. Where was Darius? He wasn't standing next to Alec like he had been. You'll need to come with us. The trooper pointed to all of us, then singled out Bryn. You're lucky your name and photo aren't on the list, but you've got some explaining to- Hers is! Bryn's voice shook as he pointed directly at me. Alec flinched. Case says he was taken without consent. Then why is he here with another vigilante? Lower your mask the second trooper commanded. I did so, barely able to grip it with my numb fingers. Is it her? The first trooper asked. I can't tell. I wasn't involved in the attacks, I insisted. She's lying. She's already told you lie after lie, and you can see proof of it right in front of you. The troopers looked at each other. Then the first one turned back. All of you, let's go. One of you gather that body. After watching Cass die, Bryn didn't put up a fight like I'd hoped. I started to panic. We couldn't get in that vehicle. We couldn't let Bryn get into that vehicle. 
As soon as we got back to P7, he'd be able to find some way to prove his identity, and then he'd be gone, protected by the council. Then the roundup of all the reels would be in full swing. We have supplies in the back, I blurted. Can we... Another hollow thump sounded through the air, and I screamed involuntarily. Bryn went down, blood blooming across Vera's chest before she even hit the ground. The troopers scattered, running toward the vehicle for cover. Move! Darius yelled, and we scrambled over the bar into the transport. He stood behind the vehicle, aiming and shooting again. Shots sounded around us, and I dropped to the floor. Get in! I shrieked as the roof began to close. I lifted my head in time to see Darius scrambling over the bar. Alec threw himself over me, stretching across the back seat as Case cranked the wheel, sending us back the way we came. My breath caught as the transport picked up speed, the chaos dying behind us. My breathing was heavy as I lay on the floor under Alec's weight. I was okay. Nothing hurt, besides my shoulder that was pressing into the back of Dad's seat. Are you hurt? I asked. No. Alec's voice sounded behind my head. I don't think so. Tears sprang to my eyes. Had this actually worked? Alec was safe. We were all safe. And Cass and Bryn were dead. Somehow, I fell asleep on the transport floor. Probably a combination of no sleep the night before and a crash after too many adrenaline spikes. I woke when we pulled to a stop, and Alec helped me lift my stiff body to sitting. Friends swarmed the vehicle as Case lifted the roof, but Kenna rushed ahead of all of them. They're dead! I preempted the question I knew was coming. Both of them! He needs medical attention! Case yelled, and I looked over. My heart sank when I saw him reach for Darius. He's lost a lot of blood. What? I clambered over the bar to get a better look. The front of his shirt was stained red, but his chest still rose and fell. My voice became hysterical. Why didn't you say something? Tell us he was injured. We could have stopped and we could have put pressure on it. Ave appeared beside me and gently put his arms around me, pulling me back from the vehicle. Alec leaned over the seat, blocking my view as he helped Case carefully extract Darius from the front. Pash ran up to help, and Tree motioned for the three of them to carry him into the community center. Tree's the best, remember? Ave whispered. She saved me, and she can definitely save your dad. I craned my neck as they disappeared into the building. Ave forced me to turn and walk away, leading me back toward our houses. This wasn't right. Dad couldn't have been shot. He shouldn't have been the one to stand up. I should have done that. I should have grabbed one of the guns, a smaller one. I could have hit it in my waistband. They didn't even check us when we got out of the vehicle. I could have shot first, and then we could have... Hey. Ave wiped my cheek. I didn't realize I'd started crying. He pulled me into a hug, holding me tight. Whatever happened out there, it wasn't your fault. Classic Ave. He knew me well enough to know exactly what was going on in my head. You don't know that. I do, actually, because I know you would have tried your best. Trying my best wasn't enough, I whimpered, thinking about how I'd lain on the floor, slept even, on our way back not even thinking to check and see if everyone was all right. It's always enough, Ave murmured. It's always enough. Chapter 64 I sat on the community center steps with Ave, Mila, and Zane for what felt like hours. After Ave had taken me home and forced me to eat something, I'd finally convinced him to let me come back and wait here. I didn't want to talk to anyone, and my friends didn't try to force me to. What happened after we jumped into the transport? I watched Dad jump over the bar, but after that, I saw nothing. Thump. Sloan and Vera falling lifelessly to the ground played in my head on repeat. Sloan's swoop of jet black hair splayed across her face. Vera's soft features and tan skin. It had to be done. But when their bodies hit the ground... They didn't look like anyone other than my friends. Channel. Mila scooted closer and put an arm around me. I'm fine. I sniffed and wiped the tears from my cheeks with a shaky hand. She shook her head. You don't have to be fine. I leaned on her shoulder, but before I could catch my breath, the door to the community center swung open. Kenna met my eyes. 
channel. Can you come with me, please? My body shivered uncontrollably. Kenna had never asked me nicely to go anywhere. Do you want me to go with you? Mila asked, and I nodded. As much as I wanted to be strong right now, I couldn't be. We walked together into one of the offices Tree had commandeered for a makeshift triage center. Alec, Case, and Pash stood soberly against the far wall as we entered. She had Darius hooked up to more tubes than Ave ever had. His breathing was shallow, and his skin a ghostly white. He is stable. Tree intercepted me before I could run toward Darius. But I do not know how long it will last. He suffered an extensive amount of internal bleeding, and we have not been able to stop it entirely. He sustained damage to his right lung. Four of his ribs are shattered. And without surgery— Do the surgery! I commanded. Why was she explaining all this? I do not think we can. She shook her head. He would not survive. I blinked. So, what then? I couldn't process what she was telling me. He is stable, she repeated. For now. I pursed my lips, refusing to nod or acknowledge what she was trying to tell me. They had to find a way to help him. That wasn't optional. She finally allowed me to step past her, and I rushed forward to kneel on the floor next to Darius. Dad. He blinked and forced his eyes to focus on my face. Channel. Hey. His voice was barely a whisper. We did it, huh? No. Tears streamed down my cheeks. Not yet. We need to... Shh. He smiled. It's okay. It's not okay. My throat constricted. I barely got you back. He smiled weakly. I didn't ever think I would get you back, so it's been a win for me. His eyes drooped, as if he'd taken all his energy to form that sentence. I patted his hand gently, then stood up and walked over to Kenna and Tree. Mila stayed close by my side, and Alec, Pash, and Case looked up as I approached. We have to do something. My eyes bore into Kenna's. Before Tree could repeat what she'd already said, I continued. I know his body won't last long, but we could save his mind. Kenna's face darkened. Channel. We could save him, Kenna. I was desperate, and we'd done it for Sean. He was fighting for us, for our cause. Doesn't he deserve a chance? Kenna opened her mouth, then closed it. We could help him jump, and then... What? Tree asked, stepping forward. Then what? My chest tightened. Then we could still be together. He'd still be alive. At what cost? Tree said gently. Do you really think Darius would be happy, living in the unreal world permanently? I drew a breath as I considered this. He wouldn't have to live forever as a chunk of code. We'd find a way to give him a body again, wouldn't we? I thought back to Sloane and Vera. How disturbing it had been to see them existing with the wrong consciousness inside them. Was that what Darius wanted? Would I be willing to take another life to save his? A deep sense of guilt washed over me as I realized right now, in this moment, I didn't have any hesitation. But I'd made decisions based on how I felt in an intense moment before. Those feelings were all-consuming, and I struggled to see past them. It didn't occur to me then to pause and anticipate the consequences. I glanced at Alec, pressure building behind my eyes. He watched me, as if seeing every thought spinning in my mind. With a slight nod of his head, he said everything I needed him to. I turned and looked back at my dad, lying on his back, his chest rising and falling with shallow breaths. I didn't want to lose him. I didn't think I could lose him. Turning from the group, I walked back to kneel next to him as tears blurred my vision. I blinked, and they dropped onto my cheeks as I placed my hands softly on the blanket covering his chest. I love you. I barely choked the words out. Hey. He blinked slowly and watched my face as if he was seeing me for the first time. You can do this, Channel. The blanket lifted as he tried to find my hand. It's okay, Dad. I'm right here. He relaxed, swallowing with effort. When he opened his eyes again, 
He focused on me intently. Channel, you're not the enemy, okay? He drew a ragged breath. Do you hear me? I sniffed. I hear you, Dad. You're not the enemy. He repeated as his eyelids fluttered closed. I hear you. I leaned in and rested my head on my hands. His chest lifted, and as his breath slowly left his body, I sank with him into rest. Chapter 65 Darius died the next day. I left him in Tree's care overnight, and then stayed with him all morning until his body finally gave in to his injuries. Then, I stayed with him longer. Hours later, Tree gently shook me and told me it was time to take his body for disposal. He wasn't there anymore, but that didn't make it any easier to walk away. Saying goodbye to Darius felt different than saying goodbye to Mom. When she left, it had been her choice. It was what she wanted. Somehow that both hurt more and less than losing my dad. It hurt that she hadn't found some monumental new drive within her that allowed her to rise above her fears. Really, it hurt that I hadn't been enough to inspire it, even though it ultimately didn't have anything to do with me. As much as I wanted people's choices to be a reflection of the value they saw in me, that wasn't the real world. She stayed because of her. Which was why losing Darius cut so deep. He'd never left on purpose, not even once. He would have chosen to stay if he could have, but I chose to let him go. Not because of him, but because of me. Because I could finally see that what I wanted, even desperately, wasn't always best. Because I learned to look past the moment. Because I wasn't the enemy. A week later, I lay breathless, staring up at Alec's face. That was the weirdest experience I think I've ever had in my life. Weirder than the bathhouse at the Vivientes? I laughed. Oh, definitely. Much weirder. He reached out a hand and helped me up to sitting. I could see it in your body. When you came back. Really? I stretched out my arms and ducked so I didn't hit the table above me. How long was I gone? He checked his timestamp. About four hours. Felt like more than that. Or maybe less? I stood up. Time is really strange in there. We'd started this jump at first light, which meant it had to be late morning already. Were you able to find anything? He asked. I nodded. I scanned Cass's files, every council member's files, including Bryn's old address, and all the committee members. Oh, and the people they were close to. You did that all in four hours? He asked. Not all of it. I did a big chunk yesterday, too, but I told you, time is different. When I left my body, it was insane. I could move so fast, but it was hard to figure out where I was going. It took a second to orient myself, and code looked less foreign, if that makes sense, like it was a part of me. Or maybe I was a part of it. But then, when I pulled back... All right, all right, I get it. He laughed and pushed my hands to my sides. I countered by looping my hands around his waist. You're going to have to listen to all this eventually. He grinned. Happily. Just not when I've been sitting on a table for four hours wondering if you died. I lifted myself to my tiptoes and kissed him. Thank you for keeping watch over me. Thank you for coming back. We walked hand in hand next door to join the others in the World Builders area. This building still didn't have a name, and I was okay with that. Hopefully it wouldn't need to exist much longer. In another month, all areas would be World Build areas because anyone who wanted to could contribute to our new edge. That network did need a new name. I was pushing for the Viren, short, sweet, and exactly what the world needed more of. It's clean. I stalked up to where Kenna was working. Totally? She didn't look up from her tablet. I nodded, fully understanding her desire to double-check. After Stryer refused to give us access to the network in P7, I'd been the only one with the necessary skill set who was willing to jump, which meant there wasn't a second set of eyes on my work. 
What about our local network? I dropped into the seat next to Kenna. Alec walked over to Mila, and she smiled. It meant a lot to her when he took interest in what she was doing. Kenna shrugged. Looking good so far. His copied files were all over the place. I even found one in an obscure sanitation temp file. Gross, I muttered, and Kenna actually laughed. We should have it wrapped up soon. I kicked my feet up on her desk. Do you need any help? She pushed them off. No, tomorrow it's back to the grindstone. I was hoping you could take some time with Anton and his friends in the grid. Of course. I stood, and Abe waved from across the room, then formed a heart with his hands. He was such a softy. Did we get anything else back from the council? No. Ken aside. Straya wasn't happy about reinstating our timeline, but after showing her the damage Bryn had caused, she didn't have much choice. We're even, so to speak. Kenna scoffed. Exactly. Her face hardened as she tapped the air in front of her. Though, after losing Vera, Sloane, and Darius, I would hardly agree with that assessment. I drew a deep breath and fought against the tightening in my chest. Ready? Alec appeared next to me. He always seemed to know right when I needed him most. I patted the drive in my pocket. Kenna, we're deleting all of it, right? Like we agreed? She nodded absently, already deeply focused on whatever was on her console. I wanted to let it go, but something told me I couldn't. We can't let that code exist. I pulled out the drive, then dropped it on the floor and crushed it under my shoe. Kenna looked up startled by the sound of crunching metal and plastic. I looked her in the eyes. It's not safe. She put a hand on her hip. I'm well aware. We'll delete it all, Channel, I promise. She looked slightly annoyed that a barely 18-year-old was giving her instructions. I felt for her, but I also wasn't going to stop. I nodded, then reached down and cleaned up my mess, dropping the shards in the electronic recycling bin by the door as we left. We all knew I'd be showing up early tomorrow, just to double check. Alec and I walked back to his place in comfortable silence. His parents didn't ever come home for lunch, but his mom had insisted we stop by whenever we could and use up their extra meal portions. You're growing and we aren't, she'd insisted. I wasn't sure how true that was, but we knew it would make her feel better to see their resources being used up. Lights flickered in my field of view and I put out a hand, stopping Alec before we walked inside. Message from Tree? he asked. I nodded, watching carefully. She's back in San Francisco. I smiled, then laughed as I translated the rest of her communication. What? Alec watched my expression with a grin. Clearwater said we owe him a new transport. Alec shook his head. Of course he did. I gasped. Alec, they're taking a group back to the warehouse. They're going to start rebuilding. Really? The flashing stopped and I turned to him. Can you believe that? I thought of the colorful shelves, the hustle and bustle of that place, and the soothing relaxation of sitting in the hot pools. Alec pulled me close. I can believe it. He brushed a strand of hair off my cheek. You know you did this, right? I looked at him quizzically. Did what? If it weren't for you. He exhaled slowly. I don't know where we'd all be, Channel. He pulled off his mask and kissed my cheek. He brushed his cheek against mine and his breath feathered across my skin. He pulled back and raised an eyebrow, then led me inside the house. My heart raced and I shook my head, trying to clear my thoughts. You did this. His words echoed within me as we walked into the kitchen and pulled out cups to fill with water if it weren't for you. My mind raced through the moments that led to this one, to Alec and me standing comfortably in a kitchen in P3, alive, safe. If it weren't for mom pushing me to be my best, if it weren't for Glynn making me so mad I chose Cerebral Link that night, if it weren't for Kenna pulling me out of P3 in the first place, if it weren't for Case giving us an out, if it weren't for Vera protecting me when I was most vulnerable, if it weren't for Talia and Pash risking everything to save our friends. If it weren't for Sloane taking Mila and Zane on the breeze. The list could go on forever. 
If we'd missed even a single one of them, a single moment, I didn't know where we'd be right now. If it weren't for Ave, or Mila, or Zane, if it weren't for Alec, if it weren't for Dad, each part of them was a part of this story, my story, our story, reels and unreals, making a mess of things and then imperfectly blundering along and stitching it all back together. I stared out the back window as Alex set my water on the counter and smiled as I spotted a beautiful green shoot peeking its head above the back step. As much as I'd wanted to find the answer, to know once and for all whether real or unreal was the pinnacle of human existence, I'd accepted there wasn't one. That peak was different for all of us. Our experiences and the lessons we needed to learn were as varied and ongoing as an infinite programming loop. There were no termination conditions while we existed on this earth, unless we wrote them ourselves. The real world taught me that. I understood now more than ever that life wasn't about finding the real. We didn't need to push and fight and struggle to hunt it down. The trick was learning how to let it find us. To recognize when it presented itself and refuse to push it away or back down. Then, when we were brave enough to sink just as low as we wanted to soar, it could finally take our breath away. It felt a little like seeing a fresh green leaf for the first time. A little like the ocean crashing against your hips. A little like a first kiss in the dark in a strange new place. It felt a lot like coming home. We hope you enjoyed this production of Unleashed, book four in the Unreal series, written and read for you by Cindy Gunderson. Copyright 2023, Button Press.